Ah, oh, welcome to the sounds of the dryer. <clears throat> um, Why the fuck can't you get doors to stop all the noise? Somebody actually suggested something. If I got like a soundproofing thing and I put it in the in the door that like closes to my washer dryer, maybe that would help actually. But the door that closes to it has like slats or whatever. So it doesn't, it's not actually like a door that like, is a, I don't know if that makes sense what I just said. But. I was re-watching that video of the German-Israeli girl getting trucked around. Um, I don't know if you can tell or whatever, but it kind of looks like... Uh, something I didn't notice, or maybe people were saying this before, it kind of looks like if she got shot in the back of the head or whatever, it looks like she was already bleeding by the time she was in that truck. I don't know if anybody's mentioned that or not, but... Or I, I know, I mean, actually, people have mentioned it, that's why I went back and looked at it, I was, you know... <clears throat> She already looked pretty dead. Yeah, I mean, she did, but yeah. Her mother said she was alive even after that night. Yeah, but like, I wonder what her mother saw or what, I wonder what her, I, I, yeah, I wonder why she said that or I wonder what drove her to think that or if she was just hoping or, yeah. They just told her that she never actually saw her daughter. Oh, maybe. Mm, okay. Um, <clears throat> remember Terry Schiavo? <laughs> yes. Okay, we'll do uh, other stuff today, but um, I want to. Um, I hold on. Destiny, why are you spending time researching this? You could be using the time to research debate topics field debate Ben Shapiro, and Shapiro debate is the pinnacle moment of your career in for liberalism. Uh, the the research that I want to do for Shapiro is probably going to be, it'll be similar to this, but it's going to be me taking notes and listing like every major piece of legislation that uh, the Biden administration has passed, um, the impacts of said legislation, um, and then probably just going over a few like foreign policy issues or whatever. It, it should be significantly easier than this because I'm already like pretty familiar with most of that. My mother got an alert. Her credit card was used in Gaza, plus Hamas was lying for PR. <laughs> really? Are you going to listen to what Shapiro said in the past? Yeah, maybe, yeah. But, um, okay. I'm going to, um, before we get into other stuff, let me just, I'm just going to start, um, yeah, I'm just going to start reading, like, right away. I'm going to do, like, an hour of this, and then we'll see, um, See so if I can get in this in an hour. It's probably too idealistic, but I wonder if I do like, if I can keep her kick tonight with this Israel Palestine shit. Uh, I have no idea how that's gonna go, but um, Yom Kippur. This is the last war. Let's just go. The Yom Kippur War, also known as the Ramadan War, the October War, the 1973 Arab-Israeli War, or the Fourth Arab-Israeli War, was an armed conflict fought from the 6th to the 25th of November of October 1973 between Israel and a coalition of Arab states led by Egypt and Syria. You ready to argue? People will be saying some wild shit. Yeah, maybe. I'm trying to think. Um, first war was in 48. 
The second, the first war was the Arab-Israeli War in 48. The second war was 56 with the Suez Crisis. The third war was 67 for the Six-Day War. And then this is the fourth one in 73. Okay, I think... <clears throat> was an armed conflict fought okay, between Israel and a coalition of Arab states led by Egypt and Syria. The majority of combat between the two sides took place in the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights, both of which had been occupied by Israel in 1967, with some fighting in African Egypt and northern Israel. Um, African Egypt. None of the Sinai Peninsula counts as uh, African Egypt, right? I'm guessing that means it crossed... I don't know what the name of the... Um, where you would go right after crossing the canal. I'm not sure. Whatever. Okay. But... <sighs> well, I love you, Rudy Mendoza. I love you too, buddy. Delore got unbanned. Surely D-Man too. What did Delore get banned for? I don't even remember. Oh, this guy follows me on Twitter. That's literally the Suez Canal. Yeah, is it? Does it? Once you cross the Suez Canal, that's like the dividing line between like Egypt, African Egypt, I guess. Be interested in Destiny reading a few, a few paragraphs on the Arab entry. of the Six Day War. <laughs> oh shit. If I had more time. That's interesting, reading the intro to this. The war led to the death of 15 to 25,000 people in the Arab countries compared to 800 in Israel, and the destruction of 70-80% of the military equipment in the Arab countries compared to 2-5% to in Israel, in addition to a similar uh, disparity in the number of wounded and prisoners. The displacement of bomb, geez, yeah, nice. That's our perspective, what about it? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, they found the German girl naked and beheaded. There are pictures of it online and all. They found pictures of her beheaded? I have not heard that yet. Don't think that's true, but. Who said that? Person in kick chat. Jesus, I'm sorry, man. Oof, who's right? What if we, what if we're the victims of propaganda? I'm sorry, this is very interesting. The Arabic Wikipedia. Um, Operation Al Aqsa Flood. The Al Aqsa Flood operation, and in Israel, the Iron Swords operation, as some sources refer to it as the Third Intifada, and informally referred to as the Battle of October Seventh is an extended military operation launched by the Palestinian resistance factions in the Gaza Strip, led by the Hamas movement through its military arm, the Martyr is al-Din al-Qasim brigades, in the early morning hours of Saturday, October 7th, 2023 AD, corresponding to Rabi al-Whatever, I don't know, 
as the commander-in-chief of the brigades, Mohammed al-Dif Daif, announced the start of the operation in response to Israeli violations in the courtyards of the Blessed Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Israeli settlers' attacks on Palestinian citizens in Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the occupied interior. Operation Al-Aqsa Flood began with a large-scale missile attack launched by the resistance factions. Thousands of missiles were directed at various Israeli settlements from Dimona to the south of uh, to Har Hasharon in the north and Jerusalem in the east. The launching of these missiles coincided with a ground incursion by the resistance factions using four-wheel drive vehicles, motorcycles, and aircraft. The sailors and other towns adjacent to the Strip, which are known as the Gaza Envelope, where they took control of a number of military sites, especially in Sderot, 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 I think it's Sderot, maybe Sderot, uh, and they reached Akafem and stormed um, Netivot, Netivot, and fought violent clashes in the three settlements and in other settlements. They also captured a number of soldiers and took them to Gaza, in addition to seizing a group of Israeli military vehicles. On October 9th, the Israeli occupation army announced that it had regained control of all the towns seized by the Palestinian resistance factions around the Gaza Strip, with the, with the continuation of some scattered skirmishes. The Israeli Defense Ministry, Yoav Gallant, announced the start of a comprehensive siege of Gaza, including a ban on the entry of food and fuel. What a... that's quite the summary. Um, yeah. So, somebody's... One of us is very propagandized. <laughs> Maybe it's us. Jesus. Interesting. Hold on one second. Lots of soldiers at that rave. Yeah, true. The combo you had yesterday with that girl who couldn't wrap her head around a hypothetical was prime content. Oh yeah, I wish I would have pointed this out at the end of the combo. I should have, but I didn't as much. Um, I think that, um, <clears throat> I feel like cry bullies are probably some of the most manipulative and toxic people. Uh, if you find yourself around people that, like you always feel bad around a person or they make you feel bad, but anytime you try to bring it up, it's always like your fault somehow. Um, cut these people out of your life. These are like the worst kinds of people um i should have pointed that out by the end of the conversation but she's like an, somebody who's like incredibly emotionally abusive um super obvious by dealing with her like that she can do uh tons of insanely inappropriate and personal attacks but then still try to like victimize herself by the end of it that set, sort of mindset is an insanely abusive mindset um i don't care cry bullying doesn't work because i don't care if you cry <laughs> it doesn't like so if i don't care if you cry then you're just a bully to me but um yeah, for people like that, just yeah, always be aware of that. Stay stay away from those types of people because they will destroy you if you have like a normal amount of human empathy or whatever. Yeah. Egypt's initial objective in the war was to seize a foothold on the eastern bank of the Suez Canal and subsequently leverage these gains to negotiate the return of the rest of the Israeli-occupied Sinai Peninsula. The war began on the 6th of October, 1973. Huge respect for seeing our principal defending Ela. Wow, no problem, Brian, I guess. Launched a surprise attack against Israel on the Jewish holy day of Yom Kippur, which had occurred during the 10th day of the Islamic holy month of Ramadan in that year. Following the outbreak of hostilities, both the United States and the Soviet Union initiated massive resupply uh, efforts to their allies, Israel and the Arab states, respectively, during the war, which led to a confrontation between the two nuclear-armed superpowers. 
Fighting commenced when Egyptian and Syrian forces crossed their corresponding ceasefire lines with Israel and entered the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights. Egyptian forces crossed the Suez Canal in Operation Badr and advanced to the Sinai Peninsula. The Syrians launched a coordinated attack in the Golan Heights to coincide with the Egyptian offensive and initially made gains into Israeli-held territory. After three days of heavy fighting, Israel halted the Egyptian offensive, resulting in a military stalemate on that front, and pushed the Syrians back to the pre-war ceasefire lines. The Israeli military then launched a four-day-long counteroffensive deep into Syria, and within a week, Israeli artillery began to shell the outskirts of, Syrian ca of the Syrian capital of Damascus. Oof. Um, Damascus is quite a bit past um, the Golan Heights. Um, Damascus. <clears throat> so if we are... Um, I believe the Golan Heights are like this thing here. Um... And if they got to Damascus, that means that they pushed... How many miles would this be? Um, fuck. There's a thing on the keyboard that you could do. Is it shift? Fuck. What? There's a shortcut that I can do to, like, measure. Does anybody know what it is? You're saying it wrong. Is it Damascus? 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 I thought it was Damascus. Is it shift right click? Oh, no, wait, hold on. It's like directions from here. Measure distance. Oh, about 20 miles. I guess actually nothing is really that far in this region of the world. I keep forgetting that. <laughs> this is like... <laughs> this. I keep forgetting. It's. I think it's like Miami to Orlando is like top to bottom of Israel. But um, I believe this would be the furthest that Israel has ever pushed into Syrian territory. I don't recall them ever getting to um, Damascus and any other conflict they've had here. Sorry if this has been asked or answered. Are Israelis to blame for the lack of electricity, food, water in Gaza when Egypt is on the other border? I don't know yet, anything about that yet. We'll see. Cairo is pretty far and Israel pushed pretty close to it. Prior to this? Um, I'm trying to think. Did they, did they get closer to Cairo in the Six-Day War? I don't remember. Or, or is that during this? We're still reading this. Okay. Um, during the Yom Kippur. Okay, don't spoil. The Syrian girl is straight up delusional or just grifting? Yeah, I've seen her shit is insane. Yeah. Damascus. Oh, Damascus. It might be Damascus. Sorry. Or Damascus? Hold on. Have I ever heard somebody say the name of the city? Let's... One second. Good morning from Damascus, my very... Damascus. Okay, fuck you. Damascus. Okay. Israeli artillery began to shell the outskirts of the Syrian capital of Damascus. Egyptian forces, meanwhile, pushed for two strategic mountain passes deeper within the Sinai Peninsula, but were repulsed, and Israeli forces counterattacked by crossing the Suez Canal into Egypt and advancing towards Suez City. On the 27th of October, an initial ceasefire brokered by the UN unraveled, with each side blaming the other for the breach. By the 24th of October, the Israelis had improved their positions considerably and completed their encirclement of the Egyptian Third Army and Suez City, bringing them within 100 kilometers of the Egyptian capital of Cairo. Okay, so they were kind of getting there. 62 miles from Cairo. That can't be that far from the Suez Canal, is it? Google Maps Cairo. I feel like it, Cairo has to be within 100 miles from the Suez Canal, no? Wait, it's this is the Suez Canal, right? This thing? Um, right click, right click, measure distance to here. It's about 64 miles, okay, yeah, so yeah. But maybe on like roads and shit, it's... I guess they just got to the other end of the canal and advanced a little bit. Search really quick international recognition of Israel on Wikipedia real quick. It is an interesting table. Is it? International recognition of Israel. I don't know who currently does. I know what their stances were in the 60s, 70s, but we haven't gotten there yet. Countries that have recognized Israel. Countries that have never recognized Israel. Oh, did I see Egypt there? Egypt has... <laughs> So Egypt has this guy here. Um, Jordan has this guy here. Um, Syria has not. Uh, Lebanon has not. Saudi Arabia has not. Um, 
This is the UAE, oh yeah, okay. Uh, UAE has, interesting. Um, this is Bahrain has, yes. And then Qatar, or Qatar is, what does the red mean? Fuck you, I hate you. Countries that have suspended and cut bilateral ties with Israel, okay. Countries that have withdrawn their recognition of Israel is Iran. I wonder when that happened. We don't know, we're not there yet, okay. All right. Egypt and Israel are pretty cool now. Oh, well that's, <laughs> that's impressive, okay. Um, okay. The Yom Kippur, oh, pre-revolution possibly. Sure, okay, that might've changed things, okay. Okay, stop. I just wanted to spend an hour reading this. Why are you getting me? Why are you making me? Baiting me with this shit. What do you think of the black pill belief that guys who are successful with women should stop being greedy and reject most of them to be fair to incels? Okay, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of like women's relationships with like high value or whatever the fuck guys or whatever. A guy, if there's like a really wealthy celeb guy and all he agrees to do is fuck a woman and not date her, I don't think women consider that to be like successful. Women don't consider that to be gains. It's not good for them. Like they're still getting screwed over. The idea that like a woman has a goal to just fuck high value guys isn't how that works. The goal for them would be to date them. <laughs> um, it's just dumb, but okay. Bruh, it's 10 minutes. Watch this. It's really insightful. The name of the video is Israel is becoming a fascist state. I'm good. Destiny, do you get the point of all the fighting over the Sinai? Um, the fighting over the Sinai, I imagine there's probably two big reasons. One is because the canal itself is like pretty strategic, right? It's a massive shortcut through, um, so you don't have to go all the way around Africa. So one is that it's strategic. Um, and then the second thing is it's theoretically a massive buffer for Israel or they would say for security purposes, right? I have this huge piece of land that is basically giving me a ton of buffer between when I get invaded and when my like, like serious cities and shit are hit. Um, although supposedly now today, Egypt and Israel, I guess are cool, but um, that, I imagine those have been the two big arguments in the past. There's like a buffer zone between them and Egypt and then control over the Suez Canal, which is strategically uh, and economically very important, right? XQC's newest watch. Good one. Okay. You remember the girl you debated yesterday and you asked about Israel-Jordan relations? The only answer she, pro she provided, she read off wiki. I know, you could tell she was reading. That's why I started laughing. It was obvious she was just reading something. I, that girl is insane. Yeah, actually a crazy person. The development, this development led to dangerously heightened tensions between the U.S. and the U.S.S.R. A second ceasefire was imposed cooperatively on the 25th of October, 1973, to officially end the war. The Yom Kippur War had far-reaching implications. The Arab world had experienced humiliation in the lopsided route to the Egyptian-Syrian-Jordanian alliance in 67, but felt psychologically vindicated by early successes in the 73 conflict. The Israelis recognized that, despite impressive operational and tactical achievements in the battlefield, there was no guarantee that they would always dominate the Arab states militarily, as they had done consistently throughout the first, second, and third Arab-Israeli wars. The first being in 48, the War of Independence, um, the second being in um, 58, that Suez crisis, um, or 56, wait, 56 or 58? Wait, hold on, I'm trying to, I have to, I repeat these a lot just so that I can remember it forever. Um, 56, the Suez crisis. Um, and then the third one being in 67, the Six Day War, right? Okay. Um, these changes paved the way for the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. At the 1978 Camp David Accords that followed the war, Israel returned the entire Sinai Peninsula to Egypt, which led to the subsequent 1979 Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty, marking the first instance that an Arab country recognized Israel as a legitimate state. 
Following the achievement of peace with Israel, Egypt continued to drift away from the Soviet Union and eventually left the Soviet sphere of influence entirely. Oh, well, cute. That's nice. Okay. Oh, cool. Okay, so this one has a, almost a happy resolution with one of these states. <laughs> okay. Um, but also... Um, um, something I thought was it was interesting... What was this article? Oh, was it this one? <clears throat> I guess this historian said as much, even if he's part of like the new, part of the new four Israeli historians, the idea that Israel essentially had this idea. Who piloted this idea or who was the first one? Um, fuck, there was a name given. Was it this Jabotinsky guy? The idea that if Israel wants to establish itself and be recognized in the Middle East, the only way it can do, th do so is with extreme military um, uh, intimidation. That you have to be a massive military force and that only once you've established that you are a force to be reckoned with and you will destroy your enemies, only then can stage two happen um, where negotiations occur because people realize like, okay, well, fuck, we can't roll over Israel, so we're gonna have to negotiate with them. If, if this is the thing that finally gets Egypt to uh, make a deal with Israel, saying, okay, fine, you're a real country, okay, we get it. Um, it seems to reinforce that idea that the only way Jewish people can establish themselves in the Middle East or get respect from fellow Arab countries is to speak their language, which is war and conflict, right? That like only if we can show you that we are literally breathing down your neck about to capture capital, will you finally it's like, okay, fine, fuck it, you guys are real, we'll, we'll bounce, you know? Um. <clears throat> the Yom Kippur War, we already read this. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, thank God. We're finally going to get to some real memes. The Camp David Accords, maybe today. First instant, okay. See also the closure of the Suez Canal from 67 to 75. Did Israel try to close this or from 67 to 75? Because this would have been when Israel occupied it, right? Because, well, they'd only been on one side of it, huh? On the 6th of June, 1967, the Suez Canal was closed by Egypt. Oh, okay. Shortly after the start of the Six-Day War on the 5th of June, Israel bombed most of Egypt's airfields. <laughs> Wait, was this after the Six-Day War? Did they try to close it right after they lost the entire Sinai Peninsula? No shot, right? Um, April, May, June. Six-Day War, mobilized. Okay, May, yeah, April, May. Oh, so it would have been literally next month. Okay. Um, the Suez Canal was closed by Egypt shortly at the start of the Six-Day War on the 5th of June. Uh, Israel bombed most of Egypt's airfields and then entered and occupied the Sinai Peninsula all the way to the Suez Canal for 15 years. Um, Nasser, 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 the leader of Egypt at the time, was lining up with the Soviet Union and had the Suez Canal closed earlier from 56 until March 57 during the Suez Crisis when he nationalized the Suez Canal. No, 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 no. Oil embargo. Take back the Sinai resulting in the oil, cutting oil... Oh, I'm trying to figure out, wait, my assumption would be that after Israel captured the Sinai Peninsula, the Suez Canal reopens, right? This, the way that these dates read makes it sound like it's it was closed the entire time. It might, is it just conf like... Oh, I'm sorry. I should have said this. The canal opened again in June of 1975 after the 1974 Suez Canal clearance operation of mines and debris. So this canal was just closed for seven years? Jeez. Okay. It seems like a huge pain in the ass to... I'm trying to think of which European countries would need... If Let's say that you're like in Sweden and you want to trade with like India or China. Are you going through the, the Suez or... Or are you like going up north? Are there other passages through Asia that I'm not aware of? Like, what is the um, what's like your what's your what's your route? Is is everybody in Europe traveling through this canal to get to India or China? So is or Cape? 
Wait, Cape Canal. Yeah, because I know, I think the north, I think a lot of those waterways are frozen in, um, wait, what am I looking for? Wait, what is Cape? I don't know where Cape is. Everyone uses Suez. Going all the way around Africa, they TP the stuff, it's the shortest route. He means the Cape of Good Hope. Cape, oh, okay, Never mind. Yeah, when you said Cape, I'm thinking South Africa, but you mean South Africa. Okay, so literally going all the way around Africa. Yeah, fuck that, okay. Damn, damn, for seven years. Okay, well. Yellow Fleet. I'm not sure how many countries traded with India and China en masse in the 70s. That's probably a good trip too. That, that's a good point as well. I don't know how much of like a blossoming like manufacturing base or trading partners um, India and China were at that point. That's true. I'm, I'm projecting modern day like trade deficits and shit. But it's, yeah, that's probably not that, not as big a deal as I was thinking in my head actually, yeah. But it's still probably annoying. From 67 to 75, 15 ships in the cruise were trapped in the Suez Canal after the Six Day War between Israel and Egypt. The stranded ships, which belonged to eight countries, were nicknamed the Yellow Fleet after the desert sand that coated them. During the war, Egypt blocked both ends of the canal to prevent its use by Israel. Scuttled ships, sea mines, and other debris continued to block transport through the canal until the wake of the Yom Kippur War after the blockade was lifted. 15 years. They couldn't, they didn't live on it. They must have like disembarked or were supplies brought to the ships. Or not 15 years, I'm sorry. Eight years. There's no way they were, they must have gotten off at, at some point, right? I can imagine. I have no idea, bro. Uh, eight years of war legacy. Stranded ships. Where would they have disembarked? Into, I guess, over into Israel or into Egypt? Wait, there is a really cool YouTube documentary about the Yellow Fleet literally forced to stay in their ships? No shot. Can you really put mines in the canal to close it? I feel like mines striking and hitting civilian ships would be like a huge Cassius belly to uh, like other have other nations like declare war in you. That seems wild. The Yellow Fleet trapped in the 67 Arab-Israeli War. In Djibouti's West Canal, but we had a wait time in Karachi of three weeks. From Karachi, so we're going to go to Aden, Yemen, and we're going to take petroleum, also brennstoff, these fuel oil. And in Aden was a stand. Four days before we Aden reached, we got from the agent the word. Aden is closed. We can't bring anyone. We should go further to Djibouti. Djibouti, because of the fact that Aden was closed, that there was no one there, had in Djibouti a big wait line built. In Djibouti, to the Suez, to the Suez Canal, which had a clear warning that we could not go to the Suez Canal. My name is uh, Sean Dring. I was uh, an able seaman on the MV Port Invercargill, which was a British cargo ship which predominantly sailed to Australia and New Zealand from the UK, um, taking general cargo there and bringing back vegetables, fruit, meat back to the UK. That was basically our run. Um, on this particular journey, we had been out um, to Australia and had loaded cargoes back for the United Kingdom. We left Fremantle to cross the um, Indian Ocean and come in through Aden and the Suez Canal. When we arrived, uh, Aden is a city in. Is this, is this Oman or? Oh no, it's in Yemen. Fuck! I always mix up these two countries. Oman is the one on top. Is this country over here? I don't know anything about Oman history, Omanese history. I just know it's on maps. What? Ha what does anything happen in this country ever? <clears throat> like what? What? What is this country? Do is anything here? I don't think I've ever heard this referenced or heard anything about it or seen it as part of history or like there's nothing I've ever heard about this. I only know that it exists next to Yemen on the map. I have no idea like what what anything happens here. It's the oldest continuously independent state in the Arab world. Oil reserves ranked 22nd globally. In 2010, the UN ranked Oman as the most improved nation in the world in terms of development during the preceding 40 years. Recognized the high income economy, ranks at the 64th most peaceful country in the world. Is that a good rank? I'm not sure. Weird. Okay. Hmm. 
Apparently their previous king was gay. I feel like you gotta be a little bit gay to be a king, right? You got all the jewelry, the crowns. You get to wear your capes and your fabulous outfits. To the, uh, They've got their own Islam different from Sunni or Shia? Okay. The vessels were moored outside and a convoy of 14 ships would commence the next day, first night, through a little bit of lake, and then we would progress the journey through to Port Said, which is roughly a 24-hour journey. I just say, I'm from Oman and we have nothing going on. Okay. Well, you have like this like massive civil war right next door. I'm sure Oman's got some interest or some influence or something in there, right? I don't know. That would be my guess. I have no idea. I truly have no idea. That morning, we up anchor and the convoy began to move into the bitter lake. The crown the lies heavy on the gay. Between the superpowers of East and West. Rumors, intelligence, and espionage were the currencies of the day. And on the 13th of May, 1967, Soviet intelligence warned of an imminent attack by Israel. The attack, they said, might begin on the Syrian front, where Israel had assembled troops. Egypt, which at the time had a defense agreement with the Syrian allies, prepared for battle. These were extremely tense times in the region. A decade earlier, in 1956, the Suez Crisis had seen Israel invade the Sinai Peninsula, part of Egypt, in a conflict that drew in the world's major powers. A large number of Egyptian ground forces crossed the Suez Canal and dug in at the Sinai Peninsula. Israel's response was to put its own army onto a state of alert. Oh, we know this guy, right? Moshe Dayan, the... Oh, fuck, I'm trying to think. Was he... Oh, fuck, I don't remember the exact position, but obviously, like, military-oriented commander of troops, all that shit. Yeah, yeah. Alert. I'm a, on the well, I'm just assuming this because I see the eyepiece, actually. It might not be him. I could be totally fucking wrong. <laughs> that would just be my assumption because we're talking about military and there's a picture of a dude <laughs> with a fucking eye patch. Second of May, 1967, yeah. Egypt closed to Israeli ships access to the Strait of Tehran, a strategic waterway leading to the port of Elat in the south of Israel. The next day, Egypt also closed the entrance to the Gulf of Aqaba to all ships carrying the Israeli flag, as well as to international oil tankers bound for Elat. The rhetoric between both sides ramped up and war appeared to be imminent. But to crewmen on a brief supply stop in Aden, now part of Yemen, the geopolitics of the Middle East were not uppermost in their minds. On the way home uh, from the Far East, we bunkered, uh, we stopped in Aden and bunkered there to pick up fresh water and oil, and we picked up some supplies there as well. Um, during this time, the sixth engineer and I decided we, we asked the chief if we could go ashore just for a last minute bit of shopping before we go into the Suez Canal and up the Red Sea. Um, as a result of that, we were on shore and we met a couple of British soldiers, uh, Marines, and uh, they were on patrol and they said to us, uh, I think you two had better get back to your ship because it's going to kick off around here. We didn't really know what that meant, so we went back to the ship. Anyway, we finished bunkering in Aden with the oil and water and supplies and we headed up the Red Sea. Uh, I think it was before we went up the Red Sea or during this time, we had a meeting uh, with the ship's officers. It's no coincidence that the poster child for Israel's war campaign is a conventionally attractive white female, especially given the type of photos people choose to represent her. It's like her dancing at a party. I mean, she is pretty conventionally attractive, but I mean... Um, yeah, people are going to identify probably with like pretty people or people that look like them or whatever. Um, that's just like a, I, like, this isn't like Israel or about war, blah, blah, blah. That's just like normal. That's like a normal human thing. Um, it's sad, but it's true. People tend to identify with like innocent, pretty women or whatever, or children over like other types of people. Um, a really good example of this is, um... Spell this wrong. Uh, was I believe the Reagan administration was it his wife too? They like denied that AIDS was a real thing. I think nobody in the United States. The thing that drove most people in the U.S. to care about AIDS, it wasn't evil, immoral gay people having sex and musicians and blah blah blah. It was when the little kid got um, HIV via a blood transfusion, right? This Ryan White kid. And it was only when that happened, I, well, I don't want to say only when it happened, but I'm pretty sure when that happened, I think there began to be a major shift in the United States. You could argue maybe this was coming uh, anyways or whatever, but I think this was a huge push for 
when the U.S. started to take HIV more seriously because it was like a sad little kid. You're like, oh, kid. Now, is that right? Is it okay? Like, probably not. It's not good, right? We should be empathetic towards more kinds of people. But it's not like this isn't the a pretty girl. Um, yeah, it's not like a yeah. This isn't this isn't like exceptional. Like, oh my God, Israel's doing engaging some crazy propaganda or whatever, right? But I mean, like. Yeah, if you get a, also, if you didn't want her to be a poster child for this, if you want her to be a poster child for this, you probably shouldn't have, like, shot her in the back of the head, thrown her in the back of a truck with her limbs all broken and fucked up, and had people spitting on her body while you drive her around a town where the innocent children of Gaza were all cheering and whooping and hollering in, in celebration of her body being paraded. Like, I mean, Jesus, if anybody made this person a poster child of this conflict, it was Hamas, not fucking Israel or the IDF. Like, Jesus, come on. Like, what? Like, Jesus. There's a reason why nobody knows where bin Laden's body is, okay? There's a reason why um, we scuttled that shit in the middle of the ocean or shipped it to some fucking U.S. cryo facility so that people couldn't turn it into some holy martyrdom site. Like, this is so stupid. But, listen, that's mind waves for you. I'm getting a lot of waves from that mind. <laughs> you there. Sorry, okay. ...in the captain, and they knew something was going wrong, but they said, should we carry on? Uh, they took a vote whether they should carry on. Why don't you on. use Claude slash chat GBT slash bar to check or ask some questions? It could be hard to find answers by searching WP alone. May I, maybe, listen, maybe in the future I will. I've argued with people and seen people using chat GBT for like research related questions, and I've looked at studies that chat GBT has analyzed, and I've seen it give the exact opposite answer sometimes to what's in the actual study. So as long as I've got the time, the desire to actually do some reading or research of my own, why would I ask a bot? up to the Suez Canal, or turn around and go back around uh, the bottom end of Africa. However, you can literally see the hole in her head while her body was on the truck. Yeah, or you definitely see it's like really bloody. Yeah. Carry on. For me, it was clear that it was interesting to follow what in the press stand. We had every day had we had a side bekommen, schreibt machine side, die der Funke aufgenommen hat. When I started back in 2009, five billion of goods went through the canal daily. Remember, you can get Turkey through. You can get to Turkey through the Mediterranean. Um, oh yeah, that's true actually, right? Um, can you get up to, and, and um, probably Ukraine as well, right? Hold on, Mediterranean. Mediterranean is an important uh, thing of water, I think. Yeah, hold on, let's. <clears throat> because you can cross through here, Istanbul, right? You can cross through here and you get up to, oh, and I guess, Yeah, because Ukraine, Crimea, Russia, um, the Suez is here. Man, the sea is OP. Okay, we needed. To, <laughs> should have put more. More passages somewhere in this continent. Was los war in der Welt, in Deutschland und in der Welt? Und da zeichnete sich das schon ab. Dass es wohl zu Schwierigkeiten kommen würde zwischen Ägypten und Israel. Also Bad Map Design, Schiffe true. Anker, lang fest also, getrennt, 14 Schiffe. Wir sind Seewache weiter durchgegangen. Wir waren, als ob wir auf See waren. Es wurde Wache weitergegangen. Die Schiffe waren alle im Dunkeln. Es ist keine Licht, wir durften kein Licht anmachen. Alles, nichts zu sehen. Is there any argument even for canals like these to not be internationally controlled? Well, you don't really want to give up sovereignty to your, of your country to like international controls. I think the scary thing about having quote unquote internationally controlled things is that when international conflict happens, sometimes there's gonna be a lot of pressure to politicize the use of these things. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of examples throughout history. I just don't know any because that's just, I'm using an intuition here and I don't personally know any. Um, I can think of other things that are supposed to be kind of internationally neutral that get weaponized. Um, one would be the uh, like the international connection of banks and banking systems, SWIFT. That's supposed to be a way for banks to like keep track of I think like money and transfers and all sorts of shit around the world. Russia getting kicked out of SWIFT in response to the Ukrainian war would be uh, one such example of a thing that's supposed to be, I think, relatively neutral, relatively international, that could get weaponized politically, right? So countries probably don't want to give up any of their um, sovereignty to quote unquote international bodies because there'd be a worry that there'd be like international pressure to change how you run things in your country, right? Destiny, America blocked usage of the Panama Canal during the World Wars. Okay, that might be true. I don't even know that. It might be true, but I'm, I'm not really sure. <clears throat> okay, there we 
man uns nicht sieht. Und am ersten Tag im Suezkanal fingen alle an, in ihre Nationalfarben auf die Luken des Schiffes zu malen und aus Bords auch die Nationalfarben drauf zu malen. Nach dem Motto, wir sind neutral, wir haben nichts damit zu tun. Less than a month after its shipping was barred from the state of Tehran, Israel launched a series of attacks on Egyptian positions, triggering the 1967 Six-Day Arab-Israeli War, which drew in not just Egypt, but also Syria and Jordan. It was Monday, the 5th of June, 1967. I was on watch when, all of a sudden, we heard an amazing noise of a jet engine. And as we looked up, we seen a formation of three fighter planes coming across from the Sinai side, just above mast height, and flew between ourselves, the last four ships, the three planes crossed. They immediately climbed to a high altitude, and as we looked at them, they began to do what we now know was a means of blowing up the runway at the airport or the Air Force base. We could see it, it was less than a mile and a quarter away, our binoculars. We watched the jets bomb the runways first, and then the Israeli warplanes, which were parked out by the hangars, were then attacked. Those three, that formation of three Israeli jets, once they dropped their payload, They came back across towards Sinai again, again, very, very low, and mast height, and then across back over Sinai. No sooner had they gone, they than came another back. wave of three uh. came in and did exactly the same. And we watched these formations over the next couple of hours. Every four minutes, five minutes, they would be coming across, doing absolutely as much damage as they could to the Egyptian Air Force base, which they literally obliterated. Have you seen something as mask off as this before for the left? I'm used to one or two people being retarded, but this seems like genuinely unhinged and scary. It is genuinely unhinged and scary. But I will reiterate again, um, of anything I've ever looked at, and I mean, take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt, I've only had too many historical conflicts. Uh, Israel-Palestine seems to be one where you could very, very, very easily write up why each side is the bad guy and have very compelling arguments for both, um, depending on which collection of facts you decide to talk about. what was going on, we just, just saw everything that was going on because it was only a mile from the Ismail airport. So we saw the planes, we saw uh, everything. So, I mean, night times, we stayed out on deck and we were just watching the, the, the battle going on shoreside around, around um, Ismail and the surrounding areas. We watched all the uh, tracer bullets, all the red bullets. We could hear all the, the explosions going and all sorts. But the captain still said to us, you know, please, you know, be careful. So we still watched it. So we really didn't sleep much for those six days. And you can justify either side, both on the right or the left. Yeah, that's probably true too, maybe, yeah. Six days after the war began, hostilities ceased. Israeli tanks and troops attacking Egypt's Sinai Peninsula reached the Suez Canal. Israeli troops stood on the eastern side of the waterway, while Egyptian forces were amassed on the western side in a standoff that gave both control of traffic on the canal. The Egyptians reacted by closing the Suez Canal. Their goal was to physically prevent Israel from having access to the canal, so old ships were scuttled to make the canal impassable. Passenger ships would be allowed to complete their journeys, but cargo vessels could go no further than the Great Bitter Lake. There, they were instructed to drop anchor and wait for further developments. <laughs> This decision brought together 14 ships of different flags. Jesus. Four British, two West German, two Polish, two from Sweden, one French, one Czechoslovakian, one Bulgarian, and an American vessel. War and politics had unwittingly assembled the Yellow Fleet. It turned out we became trapped um, because we noticed uh, very soon afterwards, within a matter of days, that a dredger had been sunk, it seemed to us, training our binoculars on it at the northern entrance. And as we understood it, they'd probably done the same thing to the south of us. So the idea of us making an escape, something like that, certainly to the south, seemed were, were doomed. That there was probably no possibility whatsoever. Wait, hold on, I'm so sorry. Israel was established by international law. I suppose it boils down to whether or not someone thinks the concept of international law holds legitimate or not. I don't think you can say that. I don't think Israel was established by international law. No? The U.S. and the U.S.S.R. recognized it as a country, and I I think they're part of the U.N. now, but, like, they established themselves via a war of independence, and I don't believe they have... I don't... Well, fuck, I haven't gotten to its current day, but I don't believe currently today. I don't know if Israel has, like, internationally recognized borders. Um, or... Or they would. They have international organized borders and armistice lines, I guess. Um, I'm not sure. We need to get to modern. I don't know like what everybody's stance is on that. Like when when the whole world, when other people are recognizing Israel as a country, I don't know what that recognition looks like from country to country. But I don't know if it makes sense to say that like Israel was like an internationally established country or was established by international law. Like it was via a war of independence where they fought and pushed out like military boundaries, right? Like there was no satellite navigation. There was no internet or no telephones or anything like. That. Um, 
oh, fuck. I wonder if I should have been reading each of these Security Council resolutions. In the aftermath of the Six Day War, the resolution sponsored a British ambassador versus the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war and the need to work for blah, 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 withdrawal of Israel. Consultations over the implementation of 242. Does this really establish official boundaries for Israel? Um, paragraph one affirms the fulfillment of the charter. Okay, number one is withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from territories that occupied in the recent conflict to its termination of all claims or states of belligerency and respect for the acknowledgement of the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of every state in the area and their right to live in peace within secure and recognized boundaries free from threats or acts of force. Oh, okay, maybe. <clears throat> who were the, um, who signed on to this? Or like who agreed to this? You'll quickly learn that resolutions mean jack shit unless the country's directly involved except them. Yeah, I kind of noticed that. I noticed that that's happening where Syria and Egypt kind of do that, and even Israel will do that, where um, everybody will be chill. I think Israel's done this a few times, where everybody's chill, and then people get word of like, okay, there's a ceasefire coming. And then Israel's like, okay, all right, well, the ceasefire's coming. We need to get like, th like 10 more miles of land. We need to capture some important positions. Like, let's fucking go out there before the ceasefire is like official. Or if it is official, like, oh, let's capture a few more players. Like, you know, yeah. yeah, I noticed that, that like people try like, <clears throat> it's like when you play, um, fuck, what am I thinking of? Like games you're doing like red light, green light or whatever, and people like moving a little bit after the time. It seems like people do that, yeah. Destiny, everyone agreed it was unanimous. It says it in the right-hand section. Right-hand section where? Are you talking about the voting summary? Because voting summary is just, um, it's a Security Council resolution. Oh, but does that even matter? Because it's not like, um, it's not like any of the important countries are on the Security Council, right? These are like internationally important countries, but but like Jordan, um, Egypt was on the Security Council, were they? Like, the, like all of the surrounding Arab countries aren't on the Security Council, so I don't know how much it matters if it's like, a, also wait, hold on. Am I right or am I wrong? Doesn't every single Security Council resolution have to be unanimously voted for? Can't a single vote, or is it only the permanent members whose single votes can can destroy a Security Council resolution? Like, can not does, maybe non permanent vote downs don't destroy it? I thought Security Council has to be unanimous. Only the permanent members have veto rights. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha, okay. So China, France, the UK, the US, and the Soviet Union are the only ones who can no veto, gotcha. Um, Destiny, what do you think of the Ukraine, of Ukraine, sorry, of Ukraine voting to abstain at the UN when a ceasefire in Israel was brought to the floor? Um, I don't know. I don't have to learn their reasons for doing it, right? But I imagine Ukraine probably is going to feel a certain way about Israel having a right to defend itself when they are obviously fighting for a right to defend themselves, right? Um. Okay. We don't need to watch this. I'm just, I'm just curious. It just seems kind of crazy that you're trapped here for eight years. The authorities allowed an air corridor from Athens through to Cairo. I was one of the skeleton crew. I was a young man, I was 20, I was a seaman, and all the captains wanted that. In the event that the canal would open, we just needed sufficient crew to man the vessel and take it out to port side. Oh, okay, so they rotated out skeleton crews just to keep the ship afloat, so that when they were ready to leave, they could... Mediterranean side. I didn't really um, understand or appreciate what the dangers might have been at that point. I just thought, well, okay. Thoughts on China being removed from the Security Council? Wait. Wait, what? I'm sorry that he's talking about the Republic of China before the CCP was Taiwan on the Security Council. They aren't removed. There's been talk of it. Oh, you can't remove China from the Security Council. The whole point of the Security Council is to have like the biggest and baddest people part of it as permanent members with the idea that they have veto votes because you want to be able to avoid like 
massively escalating World War III tier international conflict. The Security Council doesn't really work if you kick off like China or Russia. That's the whole point of like the permanent members of the Security Council. The big problem more recently is the idea that the U.S. will veto any measure critical of Israel, thereby making it difficult for the U.N. to do much of anything. I understand that. Um, oof, okay, I'm gonna venturing into international political theory territory that I'm, I'm on shaky ground on. But the United States, the un, okay, let's see if we can do this. Let's see if we can make this argument. The United States vetoing anything that's critical of Israel is a function that the Security Council was supposed to have. And it's probably a good thing that the United States is able to veto those things. Because my guess is going to be that if it was the case that the UN could critically sanction or affect Israel in these ways, if Israel, due to said sanctions or due to said UN Security Council resolutions, became under significant threat such that its collapse was imminent, then the United States involvement in Israel becomes far more dramatic than it would otherwise. So I think the idea behind the Security Council being able to veto things, or the US being able to say like, no, nah, we're not gonna go for that, is that um, if that were to begin to happen, then the types of interventions the United States would take in Israeli affairs would become far more severe, rather than letting Israel have, I don't wanna say free reign, but like the ability to like manage their own shit free of like UN. Now that's not to say that Israel should never be criticized or that the United States should unambiguously always defend Israel, blah, 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 blah. But I think arguably this is the function of like the Security Council, the idea that you um, do have these single nations like Russia or China or the United States that can say, fuck you, um, that's not going to happen because we're not okay with it. And then it prevents like further, yeah. I know disagree is more giving context to the criticism of the UN. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that's why people criticize the UN, but I think people misunderstand sometimes the United Nations um, is that like, I think the United the UN in, in some cases is supposed to be a little bit bogged down or slow because you don't want to have the world's nuclear powers in disagreement over positive actions the UN takes over things that they're doing. All these guys need to agree before anything happens. So even if you're like, oh, like why the fuck can Russia veto shit from the UN? It's because well, Russia has a ton of nuclear weapons, and all of us need to if we're going to pass a UN resolution or something relating to the Security Council, everybody has to be in agreement. Like at least the big nuclear powers need to be. That's like the point, right? Um, yeah, but okay, okay. I think we're I'm done with this. I don't have. I'm not married. I haven't got children, or I'm not. Or, you know, yeah, it should be me that stays here, and for whatever or however long it takes for this conflict to. The end. United States vetoed aid in Gaza. Did we? My understanding was the United States was sending aid to the Palestinian people. United States, Palestine, aid Biden. I thought that was a thing that we approved. Is that not the case? <clears throat> President Biden announced today in the United States that he's providing $100 million in humanitarian assistance for the Palestinian people in Gaza and the West Bank. This money will help support over a million displaced, conflict-afflicted people, affected people with clean water, food, hygiene, support, medical care, and other essential needs. We provide humanitarian assistance through trusted partners, including UN agencies and international NGOs. Where do you get this idea that the UN or that the U.S. vetoed aid to Palestine? The U.S. vetoed a ceasefire. Oh, that might be true. I would believe that, but. Not saying that ChatGPT, Claude Bard are always correct. Rather, sometimes there's a gap or complicated question without a clear answer. The AI can guide you where to dig. It helped me in the research. Oh, maybe. We'll see. Okay, sorry. Quick. Okay. We don't need to do this. We don't need to watch any more of this. Interesting. The yellow fleet. And then quick stream update for old friend of the stream, Mr. Batman. He's going to hell because we are her parents. A Scottsburg man is being accused of harassing a lesbian couple while preaching in the town courtyard. You're watching Wave News at 11. I'm Noelle Friel. John Bull is off tonight. The couple who owns businesses in the area claims he shouts phrases condemning their lifestyle, pointing to religion. This is all happening on the Scottsburg courthouse lawn. Wave News reporter David Ochoa looked into the claims. Yeah, the man has videos on his Facebook and YouTube showing him doing what he calls street preaching, but not just in Scottsburg but sometimes he'll come down to Louisville to do it at Pride events. It's led to a group of counter-protesters meeting him in Scottsburg every Wednesday. This is Mr. Batman, which is what he calls himself. 
And since he hasn't been charged with a crime, we decided not to identify him. So Mr. Batman and Darth Dawkins are probably the two most famous, I think, um, Discord uh, presuppositionalist Christian debaters. Um, yeah. I wonder if my shit ever got uploaded. It's this guy. Evolution. Oh, okay. Well, let me ask you another question then, sir. Is it going to be, what is your ultimate truth? What is your ultimate source of truth? Um, would you agree that if we're going to actually study something and use what we call the scientific method, are you familiar with the scientific method? I, I think so, yeah. Right. Do you know what it is? Can, do you need me to explain it to you? Um, I, my understanding is you start with a problem that is with a phenomenon. Um, not quite, but close enough. It's basically repeated experimentation and observation of those experiments to gather data. It's going to be, it's always a line of questioning that leads them to asking, what is your ultimate source of truth? Um, Darth Dawkins says the same thing. Data, and compare that data from your past data to your present data to make future predictions. And, and again, sir, would you agree that you'd have to actually use the laws of logic in order to perform science? Hold on, let's get um, there. Generally, I would say, yeah, that, that we would appeal to logic or, or rational, rationalizations to formulate like statements, right? Good like, one. if this, Dish then it. this. No one cares. Yes. Right. So that's the law of identity. It's the eternal... Um, it, I'm going to guess that's an axiomatic thing that we get... I'm saying that it's a fun... Identity. Can you tell me, sir, where does that come from? Um, it, believe it just because you believe it? I'm saying that it's a fundamental assumption of a formal logic that is unjustified. I think that most of those things are. Oh, no, sir. Actually, it's a requirement of the physical world for the physical world oh, to be boy. here. These Hold laws on. of we, logic. We... Okay, I'm not going back to this. But yeah, these guys are unhinged. Also, Mr. Batman says that he had a uh, incident once with, a, with his house where black mold was growing for years. And some people on Discord theorize that he's like brain damaged from that. I, I don't know if that's true or not, or if that even leads to brain damage, but... He's a pastor in Indiana, and in June, he started preaching on the corner of the Scottsburg Courthouse lawn. Destiny, why would a ceasefire be undesirable? Wouldn't it be a starting point for negotiations? I'm unclear on your position on this. Well, because Israel probably feels like they have a very good justification right now uh, to go into the Gaza Strip and eliminate what they consider to be a terrorist group. That's So the idea that a ceasefire would be called after an attack by that group, right? Israel probably wouldn't be okay with it. The United States probably wouldn't force that on Israel, be my guess. Lawn. I love being in homosexuals pictures uh oh look photo bomb okay kids avert your eyes sexual perverts at work emily deaton and marf are married and have businesses right across the street they say when he saw them he targeted them with his words when we both came out onto the sidewalk he turned it into a direct thing at us and his comments were very directed and just really hateful this is one of his preaching no videos he posted on his youtube page some of it directed at gay people unfortunately homosexuals put their sexuality in the face of the living god that's a problem the women say he told them their child doesn't have real parents because they're gay this was very direct comments but yeah anyway that guy's crazy Wait, what is this? People who are calling for a ceasefire. Uh oh, okay. Our opinions of Hillary, my opinion of Hillary Clinton steadily increased over the years as I became a little bit more politically, um, uh, there's a word I'm looking for. I became a little bit more politically aware, I guess. Um, let's see if she says something super retarded about this. All right, Hillary, Hill dog, let's hear it. People who are calling for a ceasefire now do not understand Hamas. That is not possible. It would be such a gift to Hamas because they would spend whatever time there was a ceasefire in effect rebuilding their uh, armaments, you know, creating stronger positions to be able to fend off uh, an e eventual um, assault by the Israelis. So we're in a very different... This is true. And then, ugh, not to use this argument, but historically speaking, that's what every ceasefire in all of these Arab-Israeli wars have been for, both on the Israeli side and on the Arab side. Ceasefires have been, and we've read this, that during ceasefires, both sides um, basically use these opportunities to, uh, to, to, to fortify their positions. <laughs> like, it just happens over and over and over again. Um, I don't know if I actually wrote down what this is happening, but like, yeah, it's like everybody just like starts reinforcing their armies, moving more troops, like securing better positions. And then after the ceasefire is over, they're ready to fight even harder, basically. Sub Destiny, love listening to your work. Um, I appreciate your live streaming research. Oh, thanks. Good time to listen to the past time. I love you, buddy. The world, I don't think it had to be the world we're in, but that's where we are, and we've got to figure our way uh, forward through it. Huh. Okay. Ah, oh, 
don't I don't want to do more Hassan stuff. It's it actually is like watching these people is like infuriating me. I haven't been watching anything related to these guys. This is the only link I'm clicking on this. We're not doing any more of this. I uh, think the anti-Israel protesters in this country are extremists. What I can say is what we've been very clear about this when it comes to Wait, what was this question exactly? This is important. Hold on. What changed your mind on Hillary? I always thought of her as kind of a snake. Um, I think she's very intelligent. I give a lot of credit for intelligence. Um, I just think, um, I don't want to sound like a Hillary simp, but she's been the victim of like conservative attacks for decades. <laughs> and I think that's where most of the negative opinions come from. I don't know if I can think of like, these are things that Hillary Clinton has been involved in or done that are just like horrible, evil, terrible things or she's fucked up a lot. I feel like she's pretty politically intelligent when I, when I listen to her speak and I listen to things a little bit more. But my, my first introduction to really paying attention to Hillary would have been in 2016 when I was way more a fan of like Bernie Sanders. Uh, and I think my mind got spun a lot more negatively of her back then than it did when I had a little bit more political awareness developed, you know, especially four or five years later. A really good example of this would have been initially um, because I remember, I think it was around 2016 is when that public-private position came out. And I remember thinking, along with like everybody that supported Bernie and everything, like, yeah, the public-private position shit, that's really shitty. Why would you lie to your constituents about what you want um, in private, which is probably to back like your major donors and like in public you're lying and saying that's right. But then if you actually listen to the context of that speech and what she's talking about, I think she even cites, she might even cite Lincoln as an example, but the idea that privately as a politician, you have goals in mind or things you want to affect to change the world or do things, but like the things you push for publicly have to be far more incremental than your grand, like what you would truly want for the world. Um, which, which made a lot more sense when I was this. And I started to realize that a lot of the hatred that I had for Hillary was just coming from kind of like sound bites and clips, and I wasn't actually getting the full context of like what she was talking about. And I was like, okay, fuck me, yeah. But um, yeah. that's not to say that I necessarily agree with all of her foreign policy positions and everything. Um, I'll probably do more specifically re reading into like Libya and Gaddafi. But everybody that defends or says the United States made a big mistake in Libya um, also seem to be like simps for people like Gaddafi who say, I don't even know what the right answer is there, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, also, saying Pokemon go to the polls <laughs> was dumb. <laughs> True. Doesn't Biden think the anti-Israel protesters in this country are extremists? Does Biden think the anti-Israel protesters in this country are extremists? Okay. What I can say is what we've been very clear about this. When it comes to anti-Semitism, there is no place. We have to make sure that we speak against it very loud uh, and, be, uh, and be very clear about that. Been very clear about this. When it comes to anti-Semitism, there is no place. We have to make sure that we speak against it very loud uh, and be uh, and be very clear about that. Remember Stop saying, hold on, you're doing this in chat. This is why, okay, <sighs> I hate the word games you guys play and you pretend you don't do it. Here's what people say. People say 47 or 55% of Gaza are children, okay? And then I'll counter, well, hold up. When we say children, what do we mean by that, okay? Because a child could be a 17-year-old male with an AK-47. Okay, and then people's like, okay, well, obviously, when we say children, we don't mean like they're all like two-year-olds, okay, obviously destiny, but we're just saying like they are young. It's like, okay, fine, that's fair. But I feel like that's not what you mean when you say it. You're trying to invoke something different, right? And now I see a guy in kick chat saying, killing 3,000 plus babies and then claiming because they were human shields. This is the goal, and I know that's what you're trying to do when you evoke that image and you say that. When you say half of Gaza are children, okay? They're young, I agree, and it, a loss of life at any age even even remotely near 25, 30 year old people, that death is tragic. They're young people, even when you're in their 30s, as a young person, that's sad when those people die, okay? But you're clearly trying to evoke a certain type of image when you say that. And I can see that come out when you people talk about it. When, like when that guy in kitchen chat was like, oh, babies, they're all babies, fuck you. Remember what the president decided, to, when the president decided to run for president is what he saw in Charlottesville in 2017. When we, he saw uh, neo-Nazis marching down the streets of Charlottesville uh, with vile, anti-Semitic, uh, just hatred. And he was very clear then, and he's very clear now. Uh, he's taken actions against this over the past two years, and he's continued to be clear. There is no place, no place for this type of vile and despite, despite this, this kind of rhetoric. Did she just... She kind of sidestepped the anti-Israel thing and went into anti-Semitism, but... Rhetoric. Did she just compare pro-Palestinian activists to Charlottesville? And now Hassan is taking it even a step further. She didn't, um, she didn't address the anti-Israeli protests. She talked about anti-Semitism. 
Um, now, if she goes into the anti-Israeli stuff afterwards, that's fine. But now Hassan is taking anti-Israeli and anti-Semitism to mean pro-Palestinian. <laughs> what a seeing like the whole propaganda pipeline right here in real time is so interesting. <laughs> okay, dude. Like the Nazis that said Jews will not replace us. Am I am I misunderstanding? Yeah, I mean, dude, I'm gonna be honest. I don't think I, I don't think I'm. <sighs> I don't know. I might not vote for uh, Joe Biden. Uh, I I don't know. I'm in California. It doesn't fucking matter all that much. But goddamn, and I voted in every fucking election. Uh, I don't know. You can yell at me all day, every day. But holy fuck, something's got to change and change dramatically and immediately. And a reverse, an immediate reversal is a necessity. This is absolutely unimaginably disrespectful. It's fucking gross. This equivalence is like. This equivalence is completely mind-boggling to me. I, I don't- It's not- wait, when was this press conference? Um, this clip was posted yesterday. Was this after the Dagest Dagestan stuff? Because if so, it isn't mind-boggling why somebody would say that. Um, I'm trying to be more realistic about what leads to what. There is a very, very, very thin line between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. You can, I think that anti-Zionism is an okay position to have. You can be an anti-Zionist, but you gotta be so careful because these two things bleed into each other very fucking quickly. And I think we're kind of seeing that in different things that are happening around the world right now, that these things bleed into each other very quickly. To pretend like they don't, it makes you so naive and stupid. It's like when, I, when an old white guy is talking to me, he's like, I really don't like rap music. I don't like thug culture. I don't like the type of people that listen to that trash. I don't like the fact that they're all criminals. I don't like the fact that they don't do shit for society. They don't, they don't take care of their kids. And when you say they, what do you mean by they? And they're like thugs. Like, what do you mean by that, right? Like, technically, it's all true. There's nothing wrong with that. But like, you understand that these things bleed into other things very, very quickly and easily. Bro, I can't believe ST Philly, or Philly, STV Philly ate the, the, the genes, the warrior gene argument. Oh my God, I, my brain got destroyed. It was like when Leela Rose during that abortion debate was like, if you replace somebody's head with the same person? And she was like, yeah, I think so. And I'm like, oh, fuck me. I, wasn't, I didn't actually pave this road of my argument. I don't know where to go from here. Fuck me disrespectful it's fucking gross this equivalence is like this equivalence is completely mind-boggling to me I, I don't know how he has the audacity the, the administration has the audacity to say such horrifying things that was hor yeah what a horrifying statement that we have strong stance against anti-semitism in the united states can you steal man zionism um Maybe, maybe we'll go over Herzl's, uh, the founder of Zionism, maybe his arguments. My, my understanding is the steel man for Zionism would literally be that in like the mid to late 1800s, Jewish people felt like they needed a home because they were being killed everywhere in the fucking world. Everybody was doing pogroms. Everybody was oppressing Jews. Like it's just all sorts, of, especially throughout the, um, the Russian empire, even pre-Soviet Union. Uh, there's a ton of anti-Semitism. Um, and people were like, damn, it'd be nice if we had like a place to go chill where we weren't getting killed all the time. And then this was before the Holocaust, okay? And after the Holocaust, people were like, we really want a place to go because holy fuck, fuck this shit. Um, that, that'd be my, that's like the steel man. That's a very short story my version of it. But okay, listen, we have not made it far in this article, okay? Destiny, would you accept the argument <clears throat> if it was on the other foot? Would you say there's a thin line between anti-Hamas and anti-Palestinian, that those things are closely related? My, no. My feeling right now is Maybe this will change because we got 30, 40, 50 more years. Um, I don't view the Palestinian people and the Israeli people in the same light so far in these 50, 60 years. Um, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see when we get there, okay? Destiny, I risk a permaban, but where does the history of anti Semitism come from? Like, why have Jews been hated so much for their history? I don't know. Maybe we'll get that later, too. I, I, I just don't know. People like Flinders would say, well, look, there's a reason why everybody hates them, you know? But, okay. Um,
Boom, boom, boom. <clears throat> the war was part of the Arab-Israeli conflict, an ongoing dispute that included many battles and wars. Uh, many battles and wars since the founding of the state of Israel in 1948. During the Six-Day War of 67, Israel had captured Egypt's Sinai Peninsula, roughly half of Syria's Golan Heights, and the territories of the West Bank, which had been held by Jordan since 1948, during the First Arab-Israeli War, um, during the Ankara, al Ankara. That was the name for what they called it, right? Was that, am I correct on this, or did I fuck this up? al um, No, the Nakba, not Ankara, sorry, the Nakba, Al Nakba, which means catastrophe. On June 19th of 1967, shortly after the Six Day War, the Israeli government voted to return. Um, what part of this? Okay, this is in the lead up to the war. Okay. Call this lead up. <clears throat> the Israeli government voted to return the Sinai to Egypt and the Golan Heights to Syria in exchange for a permanent peace settlement and a demilitariza demilitarization of the returned territories. This decision was not made public at the time, nor was it conveyed to any Arab state. Israeli Foreign Minister Abba Iban has said that it has been had said that it had been conveyed, but there seems to be no solid evidence to corroborate his claim. No formal peace proposal was made either directly or indirectly by Israel. The Americans, who were briefed by the cabinet's decision by Iban, were not asked to convey it to Cairo and uh, uh, Damascus, Damascus, I think Damascus, as official peace proposals. Nor were they given indications that Israel expected a reply. Iban rejected the prospect of a mediated peace, insisting of the need for direct negotiations with the Arab governments. Um, so who's claiming that the Israeli government voted to return um, capture territory to Syria and Egypt in exchange for peace and demilitarization, but these um, These wishes, uh, this, um, but this proposal, or these proposals, I should say, because it's to different states, these proposals were never transmitted to either Arab state. Doesn't seem to be the case. Or, if I'm being generous, but these proposals were never proven, never proven to have been transmitted to either Arab state. Are you going to patch this up with Catnip privately? Absolutely not. Um, that is a massively abusive person. <laughs> um, no, I have no desire for, yeah, she has serious issues. Um, yeah. Um, the Arab position, as it emerged in September of 1967 at the Khartoum Arab Summit, was to reject any peaceful settlement with the state of Israel. The eight participating states passed a resolution that would become known as the Three No's. Um, we cover this up here. This is in 67. This is before. We kind of jumped around a little bit in time, but yeah, we can um, do this. Um, you look up Gober Matea. No, but apparently there's like videos of that Gober person talking to, who is it? We've come full circle, boys. Oh, no, no, it was Miriam Wilson. I'm sorry, fuck. I thought it was uh, Dr. Gotland or whatever. Dr. the whatever. Everybody, our, our security. Apparently it talks to, to this person. What happens on the realm of the machine, which is we know is just the realm of the symptom. It has nothing to do with root causes. And uh, the 21st century is far more holistic, whole person. And one of the ways that my candidacy has been peripheralized, marginalized, is, oh, she's fringe. And as you okay, so. Okay, in the Khartoum Arab Summit, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, Algeria, Kuwait, and Sudan all agreed to the three no's. Meaning, no peace, no recognition, and no, wait, 
no recognition, recognition, um, and no negotiation with Israel. Prior to that, King Hussein of Jordan had stated that he could not rule out a possibility of a real permanent peace between Israel and the Arab states. Um, the cat person had that video on her background for hours while she was gossiping with her chat, and I guarantee if you ask her, she would say she was researching all day. <laughs> yeah. Whose name is that? Thanks for seven, buddy. Armed hostilities continued on a limited scale after the Six-Day War and escalated into the War of Attrition. Um... War of Attrition takes place from 67, 1967, 19, 67 through 1970, um, an attempt to wear down the Israeli position through long-term pressure. And I believe the War of Attrition was across both uh, borders between Egypt, Jordan, and the PLO, yes, um, across the Egyptian and Jordanian borders, I believe is where most of it is including both their militaries and the PLO under, I believe, Arafat is around this time, right? Yes, her Arafat comes up around 1970 or a little bit before. Am I... Uh, uh, in terms of PLO. In the latter part of the 1960s, Arafat's profile grew. In 67, he joined the PLO, and in 69, he was the chair. Okay, so, okay. that's He's a good person to know about. Okay, because he's pretty historically important. Um, Arafat coming to the head of the PLO in 1969, I think that was. Okay. <clears throat> Aren't you worried your violent thoughts about the left at the moment might develop into something worse? No, I'm not gonna, wait, I'm not gonna go kill somebody. Also, you guys shouldn't kill anybody either. Um, it becomes very relevant for the Oslo Accords. Yeah, okay, Directors' rights said, okay. December 1970, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat, Sadat, if he's the new Egyptian president and Egypt seems to have so much interest here, we should um, learn how to pronounce his name. Anwar Sadat. Anwar Sadat, okay. The only way I pronounce Middle Eastern things, I just try to put the emphasis on the last part of the <laughs> Anwar Sadat. I'd signaled in an interview with the New York Times that in return for a total withdrawal from the Sinai Peninsula, he was ready to recognize the rights of Israel as an independent state as defined by the Security Council of the United Nations. What do you think about Chatter's going to Catnip's chat yesterday and continuing the debate ended? I think continuing the debate is fine as long as you're not like harassing her or anything like that. Destiny has never promoted killing anyone, lol. If you're so damn dumb, you go out and kill someone because a streamer told you um, that that person killed themselves. You kill yourself. Maybe, kind of. Telling, if you are, uh, if you're telling people you should go kill yourself, you could, there's a legitimate argument that you're like signaling your fan base that like violence against this person is okay. That's, that's the big reason, that's my main argument for like why I probably shouldn't tell people like, oh, I wish this person would kill themselves, right? Because you're kind of like, in a way, you're green lighting violence against that person. Even if you're not directly saying it, that's the reason why you shouldn't, especially in like the political world, like be telling people like, oh, like you should go kill yourself in like a serious manner, right? That's the, that's the strongest argument against it, which I think I actually largely agree with. Um, to recognize, okay. On the 4th of February, 1971, but God damn, it's hard. It, I was, the only reason I said this, the only reason I marked on this is because it's hard to listen to somebody talk about settler babies and just for the killing of actual babies um, in a terrorist attack. That's a wild statement. That's an unbelievable statement to hear somebody who's the largest online political streamer make that comment. That's unbelievable, but Jesus. Okay, but anyway, um, on February 4th, 1971, um, actually, this is a pretty important statement. Hold on. In December 1970, Anwar Sadat um, agreed for a total, oh wait, agreed to recognize Israel as an independent state in an article to the New York Times. You know, I'm kind of phrasing this weirdly. December of 19, let's, 70. When I do our next conflict, my I already have way better ideas of how to do notes on this, okay? <laughs> what I should have done for this, for instance, I see this now. I should have created like a small timeline where I just link every conflict and then every single conflict should have been a different note that I did in Obsidian. That would have been a way 
smoother way of arranging this. I see this now. I'll do this in the next time. But now I have experience, at least with the program, so I understand better. So 1970, an article in the New York Times, Anwar Sadat agreed to recognize Israel as an independent state in exchange for, um, in exchange for uh, a full withdrawal from the Suez Canal, or from the Sinai Peninsula. We don't need, yeah, obviously. From the Sinai Peninsula. Oh, along with other occupied Arab territories. Do you somewhere you have these notes stored? And if not, is there a chance you should? I'll make this public after, sure. But the um, my note taking is not very good. You can take way better notes than me. Destiny, what is your main defense when arguing against more politically zealous people? Even with others more like minded, I can't get past some wild positions against something. I mean, it depends on the position. Eight percent interest on a mortgage. That's wild, dude. Um, Swedish diplomat Gunnar Jaring coincidentally proposed a similar initiative four days later, on the eighth of February, nineteen seventy-one. Egypt responded by accepting much of Jaring's proposals though differing, uh, differing, 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 differing on several issues regarding the Gaza Strip. For example, and expressing its willingness to reach an accord if it also implemented the provisions of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 242, that was the first time an Arab government had gone public declaring its readiness to sign a peace agreement with Israel. These were called the jarring missions or something, or the gunning missions, what were these called? Oh, the jarring mission. But this was during the um, Six Day War, I think, right? And these failed. I wonder what afterwards, what was the proposal? Um, come on, Sam. Report no results. Okay. Because because it's important here, because thus far, so here's something I'm like trying to look for a lot. It seems like there's a pattern of Israel saying like, listen, we'll be peaceful, let's do this, blah, blah, blah. And the other air countries are like, no, fuck you, we're not doing this. So it would be interesting if I could find notes or put pins in history where um, Arab countries were like, actually, listen, we'll make peace, we'll do this shit, but like, can we just have this like a reasonable concession? And then Israel going like, nah, actually, fuck you, we're not going to make peace. Um, so I'm, I'm keenly interested in finding like examples of this through here. So I'm really interesting, or, or interested in what... Um, like this stuff in particular is. It would be good to make notes of this. Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir reacted to the overture by forming a committee to examine the proposal and vet possible concessions. But the committee unanimously concluded that Israel's interests would be served by fully by full withdrawal to the internationally recognized lines dividing Israel from Egypt and Syria, returning the Gaza Strip, and in a majority view, returning most of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Meir was angered and shelved the document. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> okay, so it sounds like she put together a committee they said it would probably be good for us to do this, and Meyer was like, fuck you. The United States was infuriated by the cool Israel response to Egypt's proposal, and Assistant Secretary of State Near Eastern Affairs Joseph Sisko informed Israeli Ambassador <clears throat> Yitzhak Rabin that Israel would be regarded responsible for rejecting the best opportunity to reach peace since the establishment of the state. Israel responded to Jaring's plan on the 26th of February by outlining its readiness to make some form of withdrawal while declaring it had no intention of returning to the pre-5th of June 1967 lines. Explicating the response, Iban told the Knesset that the pre-5th of June 1967 lines cannot assure Israel against aggression. Jaring was disappointed and blamed Israel for using to accept a complete pullout from the Sinai Peninsula. Um, Golda Meir put together a committee. <clears throat> to examine um, the Egyptian peace proposal, but rejected said proposal, um, feeling as though it would not ensure Israel's security, despite the committee unanimously concluding that Israel's interests would be served. By fully withdrawing the international right lines dividing Israel from Egypt and Syria, returning to the Gaza Strip, and a majority of you returning most of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. They don't even talk about the Golan Heights here, and she shut it down. I'm so curious, what was her rationale for turning this down? 85, what is the source here? Pode, page 106. Nice. Is that a book? Is that an author? Missed opportunities, peace in the Middle East. Is it a paper?
Um, uh, it doesn't look like whatever the fuck this is. But it, but it does. Transfer piece, missed opportunities for the Arab. New second thought lore drop. I found a video that second thought deleted from his channel years ago because he didn't want people to see it. Oh, geez. Okay. Um, cited by 272, please. The Arab is really confident in history textbooks. Oh, fuck. Oh, wait, what is this? Hold on. Missed Opportunities for Peace by Ralph Silliger. This is not the same author. Huh. I'll go. What is the... Okay, hold on. What the fuck does this reference mean? Is Pote an author and this is a page in a book? How am I supposed to know what the fuck book is this? Am I retarded? Am I not understanding this? Or... It's the book. They only wrote one book. It refers to an earlier source, I believe. Oh, Pote and Ellie. Oh, never mind. Okay. Chances for peace, missed opportunities, and the Arab Israeli conflict. Oh, this is what it's referring to. Um, okay. Fuck. Do you think this book exists online anywhere? This might be a good link. I would just love to read um, like two pages of this book. I'm just so curious why Golda Meir would shut down. Like, what was her rationale? I'm just curious if that's written about in those two pages. Yeah, try to find that book. I'm so curious. I would, just, I would love to see what the rationale is because this seems like, an, um, seems like an absolute misstep for Israel um, in terms of, like, securing a peace agreement with a, a hostile Arab country. I'm just I'm curious what her rationale would have been. I'm so curious. And that's the page that's cited to right there. But... <clears throat> Okay, does Amazon have sample pages? A sample page is usually only the beginning of the book, I think, right? People are linking, it says no ebook available. I don't think the sample page is gonna let me read that deep in. <clears throat> what is this? Chance for peace? Oh, it's a torrent, <laughs> fuck me. Somebody download the torrent and upload the page, okay? There's only those two pages. Destin doesn't read YouTube channel, unfortunately. True! You've either reached a page that is unavailable for viewing or reached your viewing limit for this book. Can I go down to page 106? Oh my god, wait, there's so much of this book here. Hold on, please, please, please. <clears throat> awesome, okay. All right. The first official response to Jering's proposal came from Egypt on February 15th. Its document stated in her aliyah that Egypt will be ready to enter a peace agreement with Israel containing all of the aforementioned obligations provided for in Security Council Resolution 242. In return, Egypt demanded full Israeli withdrawal from Sinai and the Gaza Strip, the establishment of demilitarized zones of equal size on both sides of the border, the formation of a UN peacekeeping force. That's nice. Egypt wanted to bring back the UNEF that they kicked out. Well, that um, Nasser had kicked out during the Suez Crisis. So that's nice. On the UN peacekeeping force and the settlement of the refugee problem, according to UN resolutions. 
Its tone made it clear that Egypt considers that the just and lasting peace cannot be realized without the full and scrupulous implementation of Resolution 242 and the withdrawal of the Israeli armed forces from all Arab territories occupied since the Six-Day War. So they did want Israel to leave the Golan Heights as well. Okay. The response deviated from the drawing framework in several respects, particularly regarding Gaza, the refugees, and the linkage to withdrawal on other fronts. Yet, historically speaking, as the Israeli senior diplomat Gideon Raphael asserted, it was a far-reaching development for the first time the, governments of an, the government of an Arab state had publicly announced its readiness to sign a peace agreement with Israel in an official document. Israel was not caught unprepared when news of the resumption of the drawing mission broke out. Prime Minister Mayer nominated a high-level committee to lay down possible concessions within a real peace process. The committee unanimously agreed on full withdrawal to the international line on the Egyptian and Syrian borders. Most members were willing to cede the Gaza Strip, most of the Western Bank, and East Jerusalem. When Mayer met the committee in early January 1971, she expressed vehement criticism of the document and decided to shelve it. When Mayer met... Fuck, and then this links another footnote. Fuck. Okay, but it sounds like, it sounds like most people in this committee weren't willing to give up the Golan Heights. Um, most of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. That's what it sounds like. The first formal Israeli reaction to the idea of the Suez interim settlement came on February 9th during a Knesset meeting at, Sadat, at Sadat's initiative. There, Prime Minister Mayer expressed willingness to discuss the initiative under certain conditions, demanding the holding of direct talks and recognition of Israel's needs for secure and recognized boundaries, which meant, for all intents and purposes, a refusal to return to the pre-war lines. Her main opposition was to the idea that the interim settlement would not be part of a comprehensive agreement leading to peace. On the other hand, she was afraid that a partial agreement would bring more pressure to bear on Israel to withdraw without receiving the desired peace. Her speech attempted to emphasize all the negative aspects of Sadat's initiative, the absence of a time frame, the depth of withdrawal, the crossing of the canal by Egyptian forces, without attempting to see its potential stabilizing effects on Egyptian-Israeli relations. She censored Sadat for his inability to use the term Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. Mayer did not encounter any serious resistance of the Knesset, even the opposition party, Gahai, led by Menachem Begin, I hate these fucking names, which, as noted earlier, left the unity government as a result of the Rogers Initiative largely supported her position. It was not only the parties on the extreme left that criticized the government for not responding positively to this historic initiative, which reflected in their view significant change in the Arab position and one that was begging for a counter-initiative. The Israeli response did not reject the idea of a, of a partial settlement, mainly because it did not want to antagonize the United States which supported the idea, but anyone reading, anyone reading between the lines would have sensed that the conditions raised and the reservations expressed were tantamount to rejection of the initiative. Israel delivered to Jarring uh, a response to the document following extensive consultation with the foreign ministry and the government, and in contrast to veteran diplomat Gideon Raphael's recommendation that Israel should present a draft peace treaty, the paper reiterated the main principle of Israeli policy. To the somewhat ambiguous text, withdrawal of Israeli armed forces on the ceasefire line with Egypt to secure... Uh, so now withdraw to pre-June. Jarring did not hide his disappointment in the report of the Security Council in early March. He announced the mission's failure, laying the blame on Israel's re refusal to fully withdraw from the Sinai. Okay, I understand a little bit better. I wonder what this footnote three is in this book. <laughs> what I wonder what she's sourcing here for. When it says Mayer expressed vehement criticism of the document, I wish that criticism was listed. Because in my mind now, I'm wondering, I, I feel like Israel has two legitimate criticisms of the Egyptian peace three. One is that Egypt won't even really recognize it. They're, they're not even saying the name Egypt-Israeli peace treaty, which, I mean, Israel has to protect their political interests. Um, um, the Sadat guy probably doesn't want to throw himself under the bus with every other Arab nation. That's fair for Egypt, okay? It's also fair for Israel to be a little bit mad, but that's more fair for Egypt. Um, but two would be making a unilateral peace agreement with Egypt while also losing security on the borders with Jordan and losing security on the borders with Syria. That I could see being a major concession. Um, that is not fair. And then two is not having other countries being involved with this, which kind of goes along with the second one. If those were her vehement criticisms, I think that's probably fair. Um, how do footnotes, how do footnotes, usually when I see historical books, usually footnotes are at the bottom of a page. Oh, I see, okay. Oh, but her footnotes at the end of the chapter, I see. Okay, hold on. I'm sorry, hold on, I'm almost done with this. Thank you for finding this book, whoever had this here. Um... Let's see, footnote three. This is called the Yakutan Plan. The story became known only in 1999. See, Bavli, 2002, page 82 to 83. I want 
know if there's anything online about that. The Yakutun plan. Is that even the correct reference? This is on page 106. Um, when Mayer met the committee in early of January 1971, she expressed vehement criticism of the document and decided to shelve it. And then her footnote for that is the number three. And then when I scroll down to the end of the chapter here, am I misunderstanding how these footnotes work? Notes, three was, this is called the Yakuntan plan, the Yakuntan plan. The story became not only an identity, Babli 2002, 82 to 83. Is her footnote incorrect, or am I misreading this? Different edition, maybe? Huh. I'm not sure. Fuck. Whatever. I, okay, we have a little more background. All right. The U.S. considered Israel an ally in the Cold War and have been supplying the Israeli military since the 60s. Just watched The Human Factor 2019 last night. It's tragic how close Israel and the PLO were to achieving peace. The Oslo Accords basically died after Rabin was assassinated. No spoiler alert. Okay. The U.S. considered Israel an ally in the Cold War and began supplying the Israeli military since the 1960s. Let's have this here. U.S. was supplying um, Israel with uh, military force since the 1960s. Please debate Lycan about this. <laughs> we'll see, okay, we want, okay. Um, considered it an ally during the Cold War. UN National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger believed that the regional balance of power hinged on maintaining Israel's military dominance over Arab countries and that an Arab victory in the region would strengthen Soviet influence. Britain's position, on the other hand, was that the war between the Arabs and Israelis could only be prevented by the implementations of the United States Security Council Resolution 242 and a return to the pre-1967 boundaries. Ugh, okay, this is being brought up so much. I just need to know this. Um, we need to know what this is. Okay. Resolution 242, ex uh, the Security Council expressing its continuing concern with the grave situation in the Middle East, emphasizing the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war and the need to work for a just and lasting peace in which every state in the area can live in security, emphasizing further that all member states in their acceptance of the Charter, the United Nations, have undertaken a commitment to act in accordance with Article 2 of the Charter, affirms that the fulfillment of Charter principles requires the establishment of a just and lasting peace in the Middle East, which should include the application of both the following principles. One, withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict, and two, termination of all claims or states of belligerency and respect for and acknowledgement of the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of every state in the area and their right to live in peace within secure and recognized boundaries, free from threats or acts of force. From sort of the necessity for guarantee... Okay, there is no way that the Arab states would have acknowledged this resolution, though, right? Um, let's just... Resolution 242 called for... I just want to make a note here. Called for Israel to abandon all of its six-day war territorial gains and for every state in the region to have an official recognition of their boundaries. Uh, boundaries and right to exist. <clears throat> My girlfriend's boyfriend loves you, Destiny. Cool. Uh, boom. Boom. Okay. Point of view, this guy just hit all the edibles in the dispensary. Hey, hold on, wait, real quick. Before you make fun of that other, the um, guy that that girl was referencing, uh, I'm not claiming that he's a bad source on stuff going on in the Middle East. He might be a good source. That might be the case, right? I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't trying to disparage him. I was disparaging her. Um, because one, she seemed to cite him as like a major scholar or somebody that would have influence on the Middle East, which as far as I'm aware is not true, number one. And number two, she wasn't familiar with anything he had said. Um, that's why I was making fun of her. I'm not saying that particular guy is an idiot or doesn't know anything. I don't know anything about that guy. I can't make a statement on to, for, as far as like his knowledge or whatever. Okay, just saying, yeah. Okay. Number 
return to the pre-67 boundaries. Sadat also had important domestic concerns in wanting war. The three years since Sadat had taken office were the most demoralized in Egyptian history. A, des a desiccated economy added to the nation's despondency. War was a desperate option. Almost a full year before the war, in a meeting on the 24th of October, 1972, with the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, Sadat declared his intention to go to war with Israel, even without proper Soviet support. It's probably good to know. October of 1972, facing mounting domestic pressure, Sadat declared his intention to go to war against Israel, even absent Soviet support. How did Anwar Sadat die? Who was the culprit? Oh, we haven't got it. Whoa, spoiler alert! I didn't know he was dead! Spoiler alert! In February of 1973, Sadat made a final peace overture that would have included Israeli withdrawal from the Sinai Peninsula that he relayed to Kissinger via his advisor, Mohammed Hafez Ismail, Ismail, Ismail? which Kissinger made known to Mayer. Mayer rejected the peace proposal despite knowing that the only plausible alternative was going to war with Egypt. February of 1973, Sadat made a final peace overture towards Israel via Kissinger. I like that, like, they won't even talk to Israel directly because they won't even acknowledge. That's funny. Uh, via Kissinger, which Mayer rejected, most likely with the understanding that war was inevitable. Um, Kissinger is Jewish. It's concerning the Gabor Monte quoted. What? Okay. Lead up to the war. Four months before the war broke out, Kissinger made an offer to Ismail Sadat's emissary. Yeah, they're basically like talking through LSF clips. Yeah. Kissinger proposed returning the Sinai Peninsula to Egyptian control. Okay, hold on. Um, Ismail was the, uh, was this like the ambassador, the UN fucking Israeli ambassador or whatever? Or what is, hold on. Um, his advisor. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, no. Um, Sadat's emissary. My bad. Okay. Ismail said he returned with Sadat's reply, but he never did. Sadat was already determined to go to war. Only an American guarantee that the United States would fulfill the entire Arab program in a brief time could have dissuaded Sadat. Um, okay. Boom, boom. except for some strategic points, sorry. Uh, Ismail said he would return with Sadat's reply, but he never did. Sadat was already determined to go to war. Only an American guarantee from the United States that they would fulfill the entire Arab program in a brief time could have dissuaded Sadat. What was fulfill the entire Arab program mean? I don't know, I'm not sure what that means. Sadat declared that Egypt was prepared to sacrifice a million Egyptian soldiers to recover its lost territory. From the end of 1972, Egypt population. I wonder what Egypt's population is. Now they're huge. What were they in the 70s? Okay, in the set, uh, 35 million people. All right, based. Um, what is that, 3% of your population? That's the, what? Okay, got it. Okay, sacrifice a million Egyptian soldiers to recover its lost territory. From the end of 1972, Egypt began a concentrated effort to build up its forces, receiving MiG-21 jet fighters, SA-2, SA-3, SA-6, and SA-7 anti-aircraft missiles, T-55 and T-62 tanks, RBG-7 anti-tank weapons, and the AT-3 Sagar anti-tank guided missile from the Soviet Union, and improving its military tactics based on Soviet battlefield doctrines. Political generals, who had in large part been responsible for the route in 67, were replaced with competent ones. Good job. Israel's taking a while, but they have learned learning from their mistakes. 
Um, the Soviets thought little of Sadat's chances in any war. They warned that any attempt to cross the heavily fortified Suez Canal would incur massive losses. Both the Soviets and Americans were at that time pursuing um, Dedente. I don't know what the fuck this means. Is the relaxation of strained relations, especially political ones, through verbal communication. The diplomacy, the diplomacy term originated around 1912 when France and Germany tried unsuccessfully to reduce tensions. Gotcha. Okay. Refers to a period of general easing of geopolitical tensions during the Soviet Union and the United States during the detente. Okay. Why is it that between the United States and the Soviets, why are we using fucking French terms? In June of 1973... Meeting uh, with American President Richard Nixon, Soviet leader uh, Leonid Brezhnev had proposed is, um, Israel pull back to its 67 border. Brezhnev said that if Israel did not, we will have difficulty keeping the military situation from flaring up, an indication that the Soviet Union had been unable to restrain Sadat's plans. Between May and August of 1973, the Egyptian army conducted military exercises near the border, and Ashraf Marwan inaccurately warned that Egypt and Syria would launch a surprise attack in the middle of May. Who the fuck is this? Am I just supposed to know who this person is? It was an Egyptian billionaire who worked as a spy for both the General Intelligence Director of Egypt and the Israeli Mossad. Was he, like, both sides in it, or...? Egyptian officials claim he was a double agent who also worked for them. <laughs> was he actually, or were they getting played, or was he actually a double agent, or...? In 2002, it became known that Marwan had been recruited, recruited by Egyptian intelligence and may have provided misleading information to the Israeli Mossad during the period leading up to the 73 Arab-Israeli War. Marwan's name serviced in the Suisse Secrets Revelations as he had been able to open a credit Suisse? I don't know the fuck this word. His bank account in 2000, even though he's a politically exposed person. He died under mysterious circumstances from the, on the 27th of June, 2007, falling from his, the balcony of his house in London. His wife accused the Mossad of his assassination. Ooh, and keep in mind that, uh, well, was was the operation of the Mossad hunting PLO operators around the world ongoing through 2007? Because the Mossad was doing international assassinations of people that they were holding responsible for things like the Munich, um, uh, the Munich massacre and stuff. It's just kind of Swiss. So I don't know what evidence there is that the Mossad does it, but this isn't like, this is kind of part of what they've done internationally. Um, at least in the years prior to this. Interesting. Okay. Um, his wife was Nasser's daughter. Oh, shit. Wait, really? Wait, I didn't even read that. I'm sorry. Hold on. Spouse is Mona Gamal Abdel Nasser. Oh, okay. Huh. Okay, so his wife, okay, that, okay, well that, that doesn't mean that Mossad didn't do it, but makes a little bit more sense now why she would make that accusation, definitely. Um, okay, gotcha, gotcha, interesting. They assassinated somebody as recently as 2010. Big news because they used forged passports to get around, gotcha. The Israeli army mobilized with their blue-white alert in response to both the warnings and exercises at considerable cost. These exercises led some Israelis to dismiss the actual war preparations, and Marwan's warning right before the attack was launched as another exercise. <clears throat> in the weeks leading up to Yom, uh, Yom Kippur, the Egyptian army staged a week-long training exercise adjacent to the Suez Canal. Um, didn't Russia do something like this um, in the lead up to the Ukrainian invasion in 2022? Three? Three. Wait, my sense of time is destroyed. 2022, not 2023. Has it already been over a year? Holy shit, a year and a half. Damn, okay. Um... That's wild. Almost two years. Yeah, Jesus. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the Egyptian army staged a week-long training exercise adjacent to the Suez Canal. 
Israeli intelligence detecting large troop movements towards the canal dismissed it as a mere training exercise, or dismissed them as more training exercises. Movements of Syrian troops towards the border were also detected, as were the cancellation of leaves and a call-up of reserves in the Syrian army. These activities were considered puzzling, but not a threat, because Israeli intelligence suggested that they would not attack without Egypt, and Egypt would not attack until the weaponry they wanted arrived. Despite this belief, Israel sent reinforcements to the Golan Heights. These forces would have proved critical during the early days of the war. On the 27th to the 30th of September, two batches of reservists, 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 right, were called up by the Egyptian army to participate in these exercises. Two days before the outbreak of the war, on the 4th of October, the Egyptian command publicly announced the demobilization of part of the reservists called up during the 27th of September to lull Israeli suspicions. Around 20,000 troops were demobilized, and subsequently some of these men were given leave to perform the Umrah, a pilgrimage to Mecca. Okay, good job. Israel's finally, ca or Egypt's catching up. Okay, they got the 150 IQ tactics going on here. According to Egyptian general El Gamasi, on the initiatives of the operations staff, we reviewed the situation on the ground and developed a framework for the planned defensive operation. We studied the technical characteristics of the Suez Canal, the ebb and flow of the tides, the speed of the currents and their direction, hours of darkness and of moonlight, weather conditions, and related conditions in the Mediterranean and Red Sea. He explained further by saying on Saturday, on the 6th of October, 1973, was the day chosen for the September-October option. Hey, Destiny, you should check out this video, Why the Camp David Accords Matter by Casual Historians. Pretty unbiased take on the Egyptian-Israeli peace negotiations. Okay, later. Okay. Conditions for a crossing were good. It was a fast day in Israel, and the moon on that day, a fast day, meaning a day of fasting, right, I think? The war coincided that year with the Muslim month of Ramadan, when many Muslim soldiers fast. On the other hand, the fact that the attack was launched on Yom Kippur may have helped Israel to more easily marshal reserves from their homes and synagogues because roads and communication lines were largely open, easing the mobilization and transportation of the military. <laughs> okay, 90 IQ part, I guess. Despite refusing to participate, King Hussein of Jordan had met with Sadat and Assad in Alexandria two weeks before. <laughs> well, I feel, I, might, I need to do, maybe at some point we'll do Jordanian history. I feel like Jordan is just like, gets fucked in all of this. They're like, listen, I don't want to do this war. In the first one, they're like, just give us the West Bank and we'll chill. And then Egypt is constantly like, listen, we're going to get Israel this time, okay? They keep dragging Jordan into these wars that Jordan's getting crushed in, okay? At the beginning of the Six-Day War, Nasser literally lies to King Hussein. He's like, look, look at the planes flying back from Egypt. That's our shit. We're destroying them, okay? Meanwhile, the Egyptian airfields are a mess, okay? And Hussein's like, all right, fuck it. We're going to go in and attack. We're going to attack Israel. Israel's like, bro... Come on. And he's like, we're going to get you this time. And they just keep getting, I feel like Jordan keeps getting fucked over and over and over and over again. The PLO is like taking over Jordanian territory, the Palestinian fucking terrorists. Uh, Jesus Christ. Jordan seems like it's a very tragic history. I mean, I say tragic, but I mean, it's not like they're making better decisions, but <laughs> Jesus fuck. Um, everybody in the Arab world hates them because they, they're seen as like sellouts to like, the Brits and I guess the United States, even though Britain and the U.S. aren't really helping Jordan that much. Um, yeah, they're, they're like the team rocket of like the Middle East. Given the mutual suspicions prevailing among the Arab leaders, it was unlikely that he'd been told any that he'd been told any specific war plans. But it was probable that Sadat and Assad had raised the prospect of war against Israel in more general terms to fill out the likelihood of Jordan going in. I believe for the first few wars, I don't even think Jordan had its own military, like, commanders. It was, like, Egyptian commanders who already suck shit, like, going over to, like, you know, boss their troops around. Um, in the 68 war, they participated only because they were afraid of backlash, too. Sure. On the night of the 25th of September, Hussein secretly flew to Tel Aviv to warn Meir of an impending Syrian attack. Are they going to war without the Egyptians? Asked Miss... Mrs. Mayer, the king said he didn't think so. I think they, Egypt, would cooperate. This warning was ignored, and Israeli intelligence indicated that Hussein had not said anything that was not already known. Like, he's such a, like, the king is such a joke at this point, they don't even believe him. The actual king is flying to Tel Aviv, in a country, by the way, that none of these Arab states are recognizing, and the king's like, listen, I think some real shit is happening. And the prime minister's like nodding her head. It's like, all right, dude. 
I don't know. Jesus. Um, Throughout September, Israel received 11 warnings of war from well-placed sources. However, Mossad Director General Zvi Zamir continued to insist that war was not an Arab option, even after Hussein's warning. Zamir would later remark that we simply didn't feel them capable of war. Um, Israel did not think war was coming, despite multiple repeated, war repeated credible warnings from well-placed, because this is well-placed warnings, including a warning from King Hussein himself. Um, in the Six-Day War, was it the Jordanians got a false alert from Egypt, or was it that they just saw Israeli air forces going back from Egypt and they interpreted it to mean Egypt is winning? I don't think Egypt themselves told them anything. I thought that Egypt themselves had transmitted that they were winning. I thought that they lied to bring Jordan into the fight. Am I wrong about that? Um, fuck, hold on. Let me check the um, their entrance into the war. Maybe that maybe it was a bad assumption that they yeah. So he's already not controlling his army. He gives the control to Egyptian generals. Um, Egyptian Field Marshal Amir used the confusion of the first hours of the conflict to send a cable to Amman. Um, Amman, like their DC, that's the capital of Jordan, that he was victorious. He claimed as evidence a radar sighting of a squadron of Israeli aircraft returning from bombing raids in Egypt, which he said was an Egyptian aircraft en route to attack Israel. And this cable, sent shortly before 9 a.m., Riyadh was ordered to attack. So, yeah, no, Egyptians were literally lying, okay, as their fields were on fire and, and all of their air force was destroyed, okay? He sends the cable over to Amman, a total lie to, to bring them into the war, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah, we do a little bit of, a little bit of trolling. Um, <clears throat> still lying. They also lied to Syria as well. Oh, they might have, I don't remember reading that part. Taiwan was removed from the UN resolution passed on the 20th of October, 1971, recognized the Beatles Republic of China as the only legitimate representative of China of the United Nations. Okay, cute. Um, <clears throat> let's see, where are we? What do you rate the FNAF movie? I'm seeing it in a few days. I'll stop by Nebraska on my way to the Texas thing and then I'm going to watch it with Nathan. Um, where are we at? Zamir's concerns grew on the 4th and 5th of October as additional signs of an impending attack were detected. Soviet advisors and their families left Egypt and Syria. Transport aircraft thought to be laden with military equipment landed in Cairo and Damascus, and aerial photographs revealed that Egyptian and Syrian concentrations of tanks, infantry, and surface-to-air missiles were at an unprecedented uh, high. Um, hold on, I gotta tell Lycan. And I return, I leave on the 4th of night, and I return on the 7th in the afternoon. Um, have you seen this thread? It's an absolute battleground. Oh, I think I saw this in the morning. I haven't read through it yet, but... How is this upvoted in the sub? What the fuck, guys? Okay, first of all, this is a 311 comment thread. It has six upvotes, so I don't think this is massively upvoted, but I just wish Europe would kick out all the Muslims at this point. The, the sufferer, little purpose, other than just being disturbingly incompetent and evil. I only know one Muslim out of the hundreds that I've met that is sane, and the only reason this Muslim is sane is because he's barely religious, does tons of haram activities, and is so illiterate on the issues of Jews that he doesn't have any... This is a pretty unhinged comment, though. Um, this should probably be downvoted, but Jesus. Um... This is a pretty unhinged comment. Where is forethought at? Um, you're on a subreddit of a debate streamer that pulls an audience from across the political spectrum, including the bigoted ones. Please stop doing the soy woe jack, pointing at something um, whenever you see a single digit upvoted shitty comment, reported, debated, or whatever. I half agree, but I think it is important to, um, <clears throat> I think it's important to point out when stuff like this happens, because you don't want to be like pointing this out when it's got like 500 upvotes. I don't think it's necessarily bad. Um, I wish that the titles were like a little bit less soy, right? How is this upvoted, guys? What the fuck? Right, like, 
chill. All right, it's got a few of those. It's a pretty bad comment. Like, yeah, your mod endorsed that. Yeah, I can see that this is my mod. I'm aware of that. But okay, our destiny's gone all right. Yeah, true. Um. Nah, bro, this recent Palestine shit with the worldwide crazy protest kind of blackpilled me on Islam. Well, remember, um, it's, this isn't, okay. Here's an intuition that I've had for a long time about the Middle East. I felt this strongly when I studied um, the Iraqi, Syrian, so the Syrian civil war, um, ISIS, um, the Iraq war and all of this, okay? This is an intuition that I had, okay? Without having as much historical background. Um, now this intuition is being strengthened, right? Something I've said in the past is we oftentimes in the West view these conflicts in the Middle East through like a religious lens perspective. Um, notice how like in all of this history with Palestine and Israel, okay, which is literally the fucking Jews versus the fucking Muslims, okay? It's about as religiously uh, conflicting as you can get. None of this conflict so far has been religiously driven. None of it. In fact... I would say that the conflict that we've studied so far between Israel and Palestine and the rest of Arab states, it's actually a contraindication of religious conflict, right? Because if this was purely religiously driven, Israel wouldn't exist. All of the Arab states would be like, yo, we're all fucking Muslim, right? Let's fucking kick these Jew rats out of the Middle East. We can do it. Let's group up and get the fuck out of here. Let's get rid of these motherfuckers, right? But they can't do it because the individual Arab leaders are more concerned with growing their own power of their own nation states and their own influence in the region than they are with coming together with some sort of like global Islamic jihad against the fucking Israeli people, right? It's not happening. Um, now, that's not to say that there aren't some people that... Um, are driven by extremist religious ties or that extremist religious groups um, can't recruit that way. I'm sure this happens in cases. I'm sure it is a part of this. But largely speaking, okay, largely speaking, a lot of these conflicts are driven geographically, okay, and the politics regarding the geography of these regions. Just keep that in mind, okay? Because, like, isn't this a bit reductionist considering the massive internal split in the Muslim world based on whether you are a Sunni, Shia, et cetera? Uh, I mean, no, I don't think so. I, I, yeah. Like, we haven't reached a part yet where it's like, oh, they were so close to a peace agreement, but then he realized that you're a Muslim and we can never coexist. Or, oh, they reached a part where, you know, all of the people in Egypt were like, we are going to kill them because they have the wrong God. Or like, it's not happening like that, right? All of this conversation is geographically and politically driven, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, just keep that in mind. Like, none of what we've studied so far, at least in regards to this conflict, okay, none of what we've studied so far is a, is a religious conflict, you know? Destiny, I mean, the geography that they are fighting over is the holy land that they think both belongs to them. Yeah, but the, the Arab claim to the land is that they were already there, right? Again... I'm not saying that religion plays nothing here. Religion plays no conflict. I'm just saying that if you're framing this as a holy war, or if you're framing this as a largely religiously driven conflict, I feel like you're probably missing out on the majority of what's going on here, right? Like, keep in mind, where did the biggest mistreatment of Jews historically and Arab nations come from? It didn't, co it didn't coincide with Muhammad dictating something from the heavens. It didn't coincide with Jewish holidays. It coincided with Israeli uh, military victories in the Middle East. That's where a lot of these pogroms, that's where a lot of the discrimination, that's where a lot of the massacres were inspired by. It was is Israeli territorial expansion. I say that, right? Um, okay, sorry, I don't, yeah. But, Netanyahu quoted passages, Destiny, it's a holy war. Yeah, and George Bush told him that God told us to go to war in the Middle East. Like, I mean, like, that doesn't make it a holy war. Like, only idiots like you, like, that's religious propaganda, it literally for idiots like you, and it works, right? I see why it works. Obviously it does, because dumb folks like you are like, oh, he said war, blah, 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 right? It's, there's more to it than that, okay? Okay. Um, Picasso. 
I love you. You're so close to getting a weak time out from all of my chats. I see your comments. I'm reading them. I just not respond to everything when you do. You don't have to type the same comment over and over and over again in both of my chats. You're schizophrenic. Calm down. Take your medication. Stop seeing hallucinations, okay? Jesus. Okay. On the day before the war, General Ariel Sharon was shown aerial photographs. This guy's been a general for quite a while, right? I think he played a big part in the Six Day War and everything as well, didn't he? Oh, and all the way from the... 48 Palestine were the first war as a platoon commander. Ooh, and he was part of this Kibya massacre. Um, this was the one where uh, I'm trying to, I don't remember what inspired this, but uh, Israeli forces massacred more than 69 Palestinian villagers, two thirds of which were women and children. Oh, it was a response to uh, the Yehud attack in which Israel, an, an Israeli woman and her two children were killed. There have been a few of these where, especially in the Jordanian territory, <laughs> um, I don't know why Jordan gets fucked the hardest on all this. Maybe because that's where that huge um, uh, Arab-Palestinian population is, but um, where Israel does these uh, reprisal attacks and they're pretty disproportionate, but um, okay. Um, okay, Sharon. Wait, was he still alive? No, he died in 2014. Okay, Jesus, that's a long fucking life. Okay. Was shown aerial photographs and other intelligence by Yehoshua, 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 Segui. Sagwi, his divisional intelligence officer. Sharon noticed that the concentration of Egyptian forces along the canal was far beyond anything observed during the training exercises, and that the Egyptians had amassed all of their crossing equipment along the canal. He then called General Shmuel Gonen, who had, him, who had replaced him as head of the Southern Command, and expressed his certainty that war was imminent. Zemira's concerns grew on the 4th through 5th of October. Destiny, it wasn't in Jordan, it was in Transjordan West Bank. Sure, but Transjordan West Bank, after 48, that territory was controlled by Jordan. It was part of Transjordan, right? It was part of that kingdom. It was their territory. Um, that massacre happened in um, 53. So it, that territory belonged to Jordan at the time. Um, okay, where were we? On the night of the 56th of October... Marwan incorrectly informed Zamir that a joint Syrian-Egyptian attack would take place at sunset. It was this warning in particular, combined with a large number of other warnings, that finally goaded the Israeli high command into action. Just hours before the attack began, orders went out for a partial call-up of the Israeli reserves. Um, okay. Israeli preparation. Prime Minister Golda Meir... Minister of Defense Moshe Dayan and Chief of General Staff David Elazer met at 8.05 a.m. on the morning of Yom, Yom Kippur, Kippur, fuck, Yom Kippur, six hours before the war began. Elazar proposed a mobilization of the entire Air Force and four armored divisions, or 100,000 to 120,000 troops, while Dayan favored a mobilization of the Air Force and two armored divisions, or around 70,000 troops. Mayer chose Elazar's proposal. Elazar argued in favor of a preemptive attack against Syrian airfields at noon, Syrian missiles at 3 p.m., and Syrian ground forces at 5 p.m. So trying to replay the, um, bro, say, Mayer, Mayer. Um, trying to replay the start of the Six-Day War, essentially. 
When the presentations were done, the Prime Minister hemmed uncertainty for a few moments, but then came to a clear decision. There would be no preemptive strike. Israel might be needing American assistance soon, and it was imperative that, would it, that it would not be blamed for starting the war. If we strike first, we won't get help from anybody, she said. Oof, okay. It's my year? I thought it was my year. My year? Taiwan was removed from the Security Council on UN 1901 placed by mainland China. Cool. Um, uh, Elazar, the chief of general staff, opted not to attack Syria hours before the war began because he recognized Elazar is a man's name, right? David. Oh, it's David. Yeah, it must be. Yeah. Because he recognized the importance for not being blamed as the um, instigator as the um, as starting conflict in order to recruit American or other international assistance. Prior to the war, Kissinger and Nixon consistently want Kissinger is the what is his official position? Is it State Department guy or what is? Hold on. Yes. Okay. United States Secretary of State under Nixon, right? And who else? Um, Nixon and General Ford. Okay. Um, prior to the war, Kissinger and Nixon consistently warned Meyer that she must not be responsible for initiating a Middle East war. And on the 6th of October, 1973, Kissinger sent a further dispatch discouraging a preemptive strike. Israel was totally dependent on the United States for military resupply and sensitive to anything that might endanger that relationship. Ouch. <laughs> Begin a preemptive war. At 10.15 a.m., Mayer met with American Ambassador Kenneth Keating to inform him that Israel did not intend to preemptively start a war and asked that American efforts be directed at preventing war. Kissinger urged the Soviets to use their influence to prevent war, contacted Egypt with Israel's message of non-preemption, and sent messages to other Arab governments to enlist their help on the side of moderation. Yeah, right. These, last, these late efforts were futile. According to Kissinger, had Israel struck first, it would not have received so much as a nail. And then this will get into the actual battles and wars itself. Um, they have ramifications on the Israel-Palestinian war. Taiwan is a permanent member in the US only. Okay. How do you pronounce? Okay. Golda Meir. What? Come, bro. Give me an English pronunciation, please. Welcome to my channel. I'm going to pronounce a new word. Golda Mayer. Golda Mayer? Golda Why are you Mayer. using a robot to do this? Jesus, what is this all red? Hold on, I'm curious what this is. And uh, we've come back. We've been here before. 2,000 years ago. And we've ago. come back. 2,000 years ago. Yes. What did we take away from the Arabs when we came back? We didn't want to live with them in, in peace. We asked them to leave. We didn't accept the partition of Mr. Churchill in 1922 and the partition of the UN in 1947. We didn't say yes. What difference is there? between Arabs who were on this side of the Jordan and the other side of the Jordan. Arabs in the east. Hold on. I'm sorry. Wait. Golda, Golda Meir pointed out that she was a Palestinian from 1929-1948. She says, we asked them to leave and is upset that they didn't and don't like it. Wait. It sounds like in the beginning here, she's phrasing that as a rhetorical question because they did accept the partition plan. They did. Is the, is the, is the commenter here misunderstanding because they don't understand the history, I guess? Or... Am I, I'm sorry, hold on. I'm reading the comment here, and it, but maybe I'm misunderstanding what she's saying. It sounds like she's remarking like incredulously, like what, are you saying that we didn't accept this, that we didn't want it? But that's what, she's being sarcastic. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. And uh, we've come back. We've been here before. 2,000 years ago. And we've ago. come back. 2,000 years ago. Yes. 
What did we take away from the Arabs when we came back? We didn't want to live with them in, in peace? That's a question, right? Because the initial Jews, I think we're trying in the first few waves. We asked them to leave. We didn't accept the partition of Mr. Churchill in 1922. And the they did accept it, right? She's remarking like sarcastically. This, the person who posted this video doesn't understand that. Oh, never mind. Nice. I'm sorry. The commenters heard this. We asked them to leave is a question she's giving the journalist, asking if she thinks the Jews asked Palestinian Arabs to leave, which they didn't. When the state of Israel was founded, Arabs living in the partition area designated by UN Security Council Resolution 181 were actually offered Israeli citizenship. Nobody was asked to leave. Okay, that's okay. The commenters got this. This guy tried to post like a like a propaganda video, I guess. Yeah. Partition of the UN. But I mean, the name of the YouTube channel is Hands Off Syria. So. 1947. We didn't say yes. What difference is there? between Arabs who were on this side of the Jordan and the other side of the Jordan, Arabs in the East Bank and the uh, West of the border of the West Bank. I mean, where, when were Palestinians born? What was, all, what was all this area before the First World War? When Britain got the mandate over Palestine, what was Palestine then? Palestine was then the area between the Mediterranean and the Iraqian border. You say there's no such thing East as East and West Bank? That's true. There wasn't a nation of Palestine or anything like that. That's true. It was just area that was under Ottoman rule. I don't remember the Kayat or whatever the, or the Ayat or whatever the fuck it was called, like the particular. No, East and West Bank was Palestine. I'm a Palestinian. From 21 until 48, I carried a Palestinian passport. There was no such thing in this area as Jews and Arabs and Palestinians. There were Jews and Arabs. Don't you say, I mean, you deny that's kind of that's kind of true because there were Jews living in that area prior to the the British mandate. There were Jewish Arabs, um, Jewish Arab Palestinians, even although they were a smaller percentage than the Muslim Arab Palestinians. But that is technically true. There were Jewish Arabs living there prior to any British mandate and people coming down. I that there was a Palestine Arab people before, but. There is now a Palestine liberation movement. The history of liberation movements are that they grow. Won't this one grow and become an end? In fact, your if there's no such a nation as Palestine, how are there Palestinian passports who issue those? Well, probably once Britain had the mandate for the territory, they probably started administering to it that way. Let me guess. I would say there are no Palestinians, but I'd say there is no such thing as a distinct Palestinian people of all the Palestinians who live in Jordan. Why have the Palestinians in the West Bank become more Palestinians since the 5th of June 67 than they were before? Why didn't they set up a Palestinian uh, country in addition to Jordan? Sure. Hi, what's up, buddy? Hey, man, what's up? Uh, just uh, jumped in another research screen today. <laughs> yeah, I'm on, I'm on meth-fueled knowledge acquisition. Did you debate or something? Uh, no, I just... Palestine Israel comes up all the fucking time and so many people give so many bad takes on this I've decided to just learn the whole fucking conflict because I'm just gonna fucking do it and then I can fight against all the stupid historical the takes that I hear for all this amount, the amount of terrorism defense I've seen the last two weeks I'd like sign off everything dude yeah it's pretty wild the most insane shit <laughs> but what's up nothing much dude I just felt kind of bad because I missed your kick and keep stuff so I just wanted to come in and just say hi yeah oh well, uh, hi I love you buddy no, I had a I had a family emergency just crop up, so that mm -hmm. got sorted out. But yeah, kind of missed the kick and keep. I had to like call Karantos about it and everything. I was like, I felt bad. <laughs> oh, but well, you know, yeah, you're fine. It happens. It's all good. Yeah. No, but this is uh, this whole Israel Palestine stuff is super duper wild. I've seen so many terrible takes being sent around by like Muslim content creators, like that one girl Frogan or whatever. I had to like unfollow oh, her and everything because yeah, it was Jesus. just. It was just annoying. Like, I have family and friends. Like, one of my closest friends, he's, well, he's Canadian, but he's Israeli as well, too. So, like, his family members, they just, you know, mm -hmm. close friends, they just passed away in the IDF, too. Yeah. And just seeing Jeez. people, like, I don't like what the IDF does as an administration, you know? Like, mm -hmm. obviously, but fucking, the amount of people that didn't even know that Israel was, like, a mandatory conscription is so baffling it's like these people have all this research like tools available like the internet wikipedia everything sources and they still can't confirm the most basic shit mm -hmm. you know yeah it's like hamas has always been this terror organization and it's like if we're gonna agree with the terror organization it's like what the fuck 
It's like, what happened? It's like agreeing with the Taliban or agreeing with Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's like, what the fuck? Dude? Yeah, I think that um, it's just a really good conflict for you to project whatever your personal issues are. Right. Like left versus right. Capitalism versus socialism. Yeah. Second world versus first world during the Cold War. Religious conflict. Imperialism and colonialism versus native peoples. Brown versus white. It's just a really good conflict that you can take any side on based on like how you view uh, through your lens, you know, the world. Right. And then you can project whatever truths you want based on that. Yeah. Like when you've got people I mean, marching as like fucking like queers for Hamas, that's like the funniest fucking shit I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> well, yeah, considering they'd be thrown over a yeah. rooftop any day if they were there. Yeah. No, it's just it's wild because like the normal take should have been like, hey, we don't like fucking Hamas or the idea of maybe civilians dying on both sides is just not a thing we should have. But yeah, probably. it really feels like it just feels like everyone that I like listen to on the internet, it's like either they have like this straight hatred of like brown skinned people or it's just like, you know, fuck Jews or something, you know, it's like one or the other. Sure. It, and it just, it, it's like so obvious that like this conflict is just a thinly veiled like vehicle to just drive, you know, that level of hate for one side or the other. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I don't mm. know what the fix to this stuff is, man. This kind of, this, this conflict has been going on, you know, fucking for longer than we've been alive and shit. Even our, fucking parent so no who knows man hopefully the best but yeah yeah other than that man it's uh what, what else has been happening with you other than researching israel palestine um this is it yeah just this for days and days and days so yeah fuck it all right man uh i'll uh probably hit you up later but yeah next kick and keep them totally down i just felt bad about it so i wanted to come in and just say yeah. you know hi you're good no worries i love you buddy all right man Big love out. you man take care Okay, Israeli friend sent me this. What? This is so quiet, you fucking retard. Golda Meir. I'm not doing this Golda Meir. Okay, Golda Meir, okay? Golda Meir is what it is, okay? Fuck you. All right? Hold on, give me a sec, one second.
I wasn't even talking to you guys, okay? Why did you think I was talking to you, guys? <laughs> Sorry, the TTS uh, thing shut down. Their service is gone, so. Um, okay. At some point today, I need to order an iPhone and a, um, and a Google Pixel, okay? Don't let me forget this. I need new phones, all right? I'm two generations behind. NBC anchor saying Golden My Air. Fifty-four years. I, thought I got a Pixel Seven. I think I have a Pixel Six. I'm one generation, or I'm two generations behind now. Go Golden My Air. I can't believe you're getting an iPhone just to land more chicks. No, it's because it's nice to stream on one phone and have another for chat and everything. Fifty-four years ago, Golden My Air, Israel's first and only female. Golden My Air. Male Prime Minister joined Meet the Press. During the war of attrition, which Israel fought against Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, she called herself skeptical that the world's superpowers could bring peace in the near term, but talked about the long-term prospects. A general uh, from Israel said to me recently that the present situation could easily go on for another 10 years unchanged, but you have grandchildren. They will live uh, presumably into the, well into the next century. What do you see in the long term if we don't get a, a break in the in the present stalemate? Mr. Fell, I am convinced, honestly, sincerely believe that my grandchildren will live in an area of peace in the Middle East. Because there are other grandmothers in Egypt and in Syria and in Jordan that have grandchildren, and they also want them to live. Irrespective of what... What is the... Admittedly, this is a Zionist quote, okay? Or it's like a pro-Zionism quote, obviously. But what is the um, uh, what is the quote where it's like, there will be peace in the Middle East when the Arabs love their children more than they hate ours or something? It's some, it's some kind of quote like that, yeah. The Nasser things are Hussein things. The grandmothers and the mothers want their children to live. Now, if you say, when will that come? I don't know. Those are haunting words. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about... Oh, that's her quote? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, well, there you go. Makes sense. <laughs> Jeez, okay. Okay. Um, you missed out on a free pair of buds or Pixel Watch a few weeks ago. I tried to remind you. I'm not, I haven't been as impressed with Google's side things. Does anybody else have this issue? I'm, I'm starting to think I have sensitive ears. Um, I'm very picky about what can go in my ear for more than like 35 minutes. Does anybody else have this issue? I bought these Marshall Buds when I was traveling because I was curious if they'd be good and because I forgot my other ones at home. And I tried putting them, and it, I can't, if it's in my ear for 30 minutes, it, like, it's, it hurts a lot. Like, it's prohibitively painful. The only thing, I hate to fucking say this, okay? I'm not trying to simp, okay? But the only things I've ever found that can sit in my ear for probably like four plus hours and have no pain are the AirPod Pros. Or, any, or probably the AirPod Normal ones too, but yeah. Use smaller tips. I've used, I've ch adjusted and changed and done all of that, so. Also, fuck, I'm sorry. Now that I'm reading this again, it's triggering me even more. I'm sorry, fuck, this tweet is triggering the fuck out of me. It's so stupid, okay? Another reason why this girl is being used as quote unquote propaganda or whatever, which she is, it's, it's fine. It's fine to say that, right? It's kind of propaganda. Um, it's not just because she's white and attractive. It's also because one, she's a dual citizen. I believe she was a citizen of Germany. Two, she's young. Okay. And three, she doesn't fit the mold for like classic colonial person. She seems like a hippie, like go lovey peace person. She's fucking, what are these fucking dreadlocks or dread ends or something, right? That, now her being white, which I think she's white, although actually now that I'm looking at her, now I'm not 100% sure, but I think she is. But like, um, she probably is. But like, yeah, I don't think it's just because she's a white. It's like, oh, modern white woman. It's probably the combination of everything that she is right? Which seems to be like young, hippie, party person going to festivals and shit. is a dual citizen, number one. And number two, the fact that, um, th that I mentioned, this is what I mentioned before, the fact that Hamas made such a disgusting example out of her, right? 
Th those are the two things that are driving this more than it just being a random pretty w white woman. Um, yeah. But, okay. Destiny, kind of unrelated, but one current fight is Ethiopia building a massive dam on the Nile, and Egypt saying it's a casus, ca casus, casus belly. I, I'm never gonna get this phrase right. I've just, I never heard anybody say this outside of like Stellaris. I've never actually hear these words or people that play um, whatever Hoi stands for. I keep forgetting that. Um, if they fill it too fast, as it would destroy their economy. It's kind of like if other countries threaten war over Egypt closing the Suez. Not sure Suez Canal. It's not sure if it's just for this case. Okay, I don't know anything. Um, about that, but okay. Don't show on stream. Why? Why? Wait. Why can I not show this on stream? Logistical. Okay. Um. <clears throat> oh. Wait, Casus Belly is EU4 shit, bro. Not HOI, not Hoi. Okay, I don't fucking know. Fuck you, okay? Suck my dick. Suck my dick! I don't know. Don't make people jerk off to hostages. Okay. UCLU student members vote in favor for a motion calling for intifada until victory, saying only a mass uprising can free the Palestinian people. Oh, we haven't gotten to the, any of the intifadas. Okay, stop. We gotta keep going. Okay. <clears throat> Kissinger. Okay, we already have this. Okay, we're on the Sinai front. The Egyptians had prepared for an assault across the canal and deployed five divisions totaling 100,000 soldiers, 1,350 tanks, and 2,000 guns and heavy mortars for the onslaught. Facing them were 450 soldiers of the Jerusalem Brigade, spread out in 16 forts along the length of the canal. There were 290 Israeli tanks in all the Sinai, divided into three armored brigades, only one which was deployed, deployed near the canal when hostilities commenced. Large bridgeheads, um, a bridgehead is a strategically important area of ground around the end of a bridge or other place of possible crossing over body water, at which time a conflict is thought to be tenant. Okay, bridgehead. Makes sense, because narrow choke points are probably always going to be really vulnerable points of attack, I, I imagine, right? Will you be coming the will you be co will you be covering the USS Liberty? Oh no, we already went over all of the USS Liberty. Um, that was the one where wasn't Soros the actual plane pilot? I think that was flying the. I think it was an SR seventy one because I think at this point I think Jews had already developed time travel technology to bring back uh, U.S. tech that was funded by um, I think it was the I think it was Hillary Clinton. Uh, and Nancy Pelosi, and then he had flown that mission to bomb the USS Liberty in order to bring the U.S. into the war. But um, yeah, we already we covered we covered the USS Liberty. Don't worry, bro. We went over all the parts of that. No problems. Okay. Large bridgeheads were established on the east bank the sixth of October. Israeli armored forces launched counterattacks uh, from the sixth to the eighth of October but they were often piecemeal and inadequately supported and were beaten back principally by Egyptians using portable anti-tank missiles. Um, did you see that video of the pro-Palestinian protesters clashing with a black Hebrew Israelite? It's funny because neither group believes that Israel's legitimate state. state. Oh, yeah, sure, maybe, yeah. The Egyptians, um, okay, hold on. Inadequately supported. They're often adequately supported and were beaten back principally by Egyptians using portable anti-tank missiles. Between the 9th and the uh, 12th of October, the American response was a call for a ceasefire in place. The Egyptian units generally would not advance beyond a shallow strip for fear of losing the protection of their SAM batteries, which were situated on the west bank of the canal.
In the Six-Day War, the Israeli Air Force had pummeled the defenseless Arab armies. This time, Egypt had heavily fortified their side of the ceasefire lines with SAM batteries provided by the Soviet Union. On the 9th of October, the IDF chose to concentrate its reserves and build up its supplies while the Egyptians remained on the strategic defensive. Nixon and Kissinger held back on a full-scale resupply of arms to Israel. Short of supplies, the Israeli government reluctantly accepted, accepted a ceasefire in place on the 12th of October, but Sadat refused to do so. Interesting. Why do you link this um, Shakya Soleiman's dipshit's tweets or whatever? Um, so he's a fucking moron. Would you at least agree that Israel is more of an ethnocracy than a dema? I don't know what an ethnocracy is. I've never heard that term before in my entire life, so I don't know what that means. You could just say cause war instead of costus, or costus belly? Um, no, we gotta use the fancy terms, okay? The Soviets started an airlift of arms to Syria and Egypt. The American global interest was to prove that Soviet arms could not dictate the outcome of the fighting by supplying Israel. <clears throat> After all this work, can you really shut off at night? I'd be wired to fuck. Uh, all the information just kind of like settles in my brain. I usually just like ask myself questions. I try to ask myself like broad questions about what's going on. Like I might ask myself like, what was Syria thinking in like 1956? I'll just like to try to like make sure that I'm like connecting concepts in my head. But who knows? It'll, it'll come out during debates if I remember any of this or not. I feel like I'm remembering broadly speaking most of this because it fits together pretty well, like narratively, like it all kind of makes sense. It's not, like none of this is random, right? Um, but who knows, we'll see. Short of spies, Israel. I'm sure there's going to be weak points in my knowledge when I start having debates or people bring up things I'm not aware of, and then we look up more, we plug the holes in our knowledge, we keep going from there. That's typically how it works, right? <clears throat> Um, the Soviets started an airlift of arms to Syria and Egypt. The American global interest was to prove that Soviet arms could not dictate. Um, do you dream of the Middle East right now? No. Uh, could not dictate the outcome of the fighting by supplying Israel. With an airlift in full swing, Washington was prepared to wait until Israeli success on the battlefield might persuade the Arabs and Soviets to bring the fighting to an end. The Israelis decided to counterattack once Egyptian armor attempted to expand the bridgehead beyond the protective Sam umbrella. The repost, codenamed Operation Gazelle, was launched on the 15th of October. IDF forces spearheaded by Ariel Sharon's division broke through the Tassa Corridor and crossed the Suez Canal to the north of the Great Bitter Lake. After intense fighting, the IDF progressed towards Cairo and advanced southwards on the east bank of the Great Bitter Lake and in the southern extent of the canal right up to Port Suez, Suez. Israeli uh, progress towards Cairo was brought to a halt by a fresh ceasefire on the 24th of October. Citation needed. Egyptian attack. Anticipating a swift Israeli armored counterattack. The Egyptians had armed their assault force with large numbers of man-portable anti-tank weapons, rocket-propelled grenades, and less numerous but more advanced Sagar-guided missiles, which proved devastating to the first Israeli armored counterattack. Each of the five infantry divisions that were to cross the canal had been equipped with RPG-7 rockets and RPG-43 grenades and reinforced with an anti-tank guided missile battalion as they would not have any armor support for nearly 12 hours. In addition, the Egyptians had built separate ramps at the crossing points, reaching as high as 21 meters to kind of the Israeli sand wall, providing covering fire for the assaulting infantry and to counter the first Israeli armored counterattacks. The Egyptian army put great effort into finding a quick and effective way of breaching the Israeli defenses. The Israelis had built 49 foot high sand walls with a 60 degree slope and reinforced with concrete at the water line. Egyptian engineers initially experimented with explosive charges and bulldozers to clear the obstacles before a junior officer proposed using high pressure water cannons. The idea was tested and found to be a sound one and several high pressure water cannons were imported from Britain and East Germany. The water cannons effectively breached the sand walls using water from the canal. 
Hmm. I guess it's not like a full-on embargo, so they could probably buy like non-military equipment, huh? That's kind of cute. At 2 p.m. on the 6th of October, Operation Badur began with a large airstrike. More than 200 Egyptian aircraft conducted simultaneous strikes, simultaneous strikes against three air bases, Hawk missile batteries, three command center, artillery positions, and se um, several radar installations. Airfields, um, airfields at uh, Refidim and Bir Tamada were temporarily put out of service, and damage was inflicted on a Hawk battery in Ophir. Are all of these areas in the Sinai Refidim? It's an airfield in the Sinai, 90 kilometers east of the Suez Canal. Okay. Because all of these battles are probably taking place in the Sinai. The aerial assault was coupled with a barrage, more than 2,000 artillery pieces for a period of 53 minutes against the Barlev line and rear area command posts and concentration bases. Um, Author Andrew McGregor claimed that the success of the first strike negated the need for a second planned strike. Egypt acknowledged the loss of five aircraft during the attack. Kenneth Pollock wrote that 18 Egyptian aircraft were shot down and that these losses prompted the can cancellation of the second planned wave. Um, What is it about the Pixel you like? I think the notifications on Google phones are infinitely better than uh, Apple ones. That's just my, it's literally the notifications are the biggest selling point for me. In one notable engagement during this period, a pair of Israeli F4E Phantoms challenged 28 Egyptian MiGs over Sharm El Sheikh and within half an hour shot down seven or eight MiGs with no losses. One of the Egyptian pilots killed was Captain Atif Sadat, President Saddam's half brother. I don't believe this, no shot. Um. F4E, F4E, uh, Egypt, Egypt, MIG, uh, Yom Kippur, YouTube. Mia entertaining and educational video subscription service where you can find the answer to everything you've ever wondered about and some things you've never imagined you would wonder about. A careful curated collection of short, gauging experts. Courses of greatest interest to offensive began. Wondrium are giving operation drive to Wondrium today. The Phantom swear into life and race into the sky unaware of what is to come their way. The sky behind them rapidly fills with a swarm of Egyptian MiGs. As the two Israeli aircraft make their way out to sea, behind them, their airbase is consumed by explosions. For the Israelis at Ophir, and these pilots of 107 Squadron, war has just begun. This day would mark the beginning of hostilities between Israel and a coalition of Arab states, including Egypt and Syria. The coalition launches an attack during Israel's holiest day. Territories lost. Blunt the Israeli. Strike their targets at jamming. The Egyptians successfully catch the Israelis off guard. Quick reaction. Off. Across the entire front. And so, unbeknownst to the base personnel at Ophir, some 20 MiG 17s and 8 MiG 21s are racing across the Red Sea at low level towards Ophir Air Base. Their objective is to render it inoperable. As the approaching aircraft close the distance towards Ophir, they appear on Israeli radar screens, smaller in number due to their tight formations. With the aircraft approaching, and with the ground interception controller maintaining that his core NAS fighters remain on the ground, the pilot of one aircraft, Amir Nahumi, breaks with procedure and begins to taxi towards the. You forgot that Arab armies are promoted based on proximity to noble families, not based on ability. That's not true post Six Day War. I think the Egyptians started to reshuffle their commanders and the leaders of their military people to promote people based more on the skills rather than the uh, proximity to families or other bullshit. I think that was one of the big lessons that they learned during the Six Day War, and it's part of why they probably experienced more success at the beginning of this conflict, um, the Yom Kippur. Kippur War versus prior ones. That's one of the things that they uh, tr adjusted dramatically, supposedly. The runway without authorization. His wingman does the same. Both aircraft taxi onto the runway and roll into the air with their afterburners. But yeah, it. obviously you can't fix an entire military in six years, sure. Just as the pair lift off the ground, Egyptian aircraft arrive overhead, beginning their strikes across the airbase. Literally the next line in Wikipedia. What? Okay. It's runway. As Nahumi looks behind him, he witnesses the explosions, realizing that if he had hesitated, he, his aircraft, and his wingman would all be dead. Now in the air, with hostile aircraft to their rear, both cornices rapidly climb towards Napier Island. As they create distance between themselves and the attacking Egyptians, they mark out seven four-ship formations of aircraft. It is here Nahumi... Rage Pope is making mistaking the Saudi Air Force with the Egyptian. Well, no, because the Egyptian uh, military did have this issue prior to this conflict, right? ...realizes how outnumbered he is, yet without hesitation delivers his orders. Both cornices drop their external fuel tanks and break formation. They hope that if they act independently, their chances of survival and the amount of damage they can inflict on their enemy increase. Over Snappier Island, both cornices turn around and race back towards the airbase to engage the mass of MiGs above. Nahumi orders his wingman to move to the west of Ophir, whilst he takes to the east. As Shuki nears the western end of the airbase, Nahumi watches as he dives onto the tail of the first MiG-17. Wait, hold on. 
This was the Israeli Phantoms lifting off as the runway gets bombed behind them. I'm trying to avoid, a lot of people are recommending like kings and generals and all sorts of shit for the Six Day War. I'm trying to avoid, I sh don't even know what I should be I'm trying to avoid watching like war footage or war related stuff relating to the actual fights themselves because to be completely frank and honest, any actual like military accounting for of stuff happening is pure Israeli like pornography propaganda, okay? Because these, <laughs> because these, <laughs> it's, it's just too insane. Oh, Ukraine make 29 takes off from the runway uh, a few seconds before the shelling. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. A close quarters dogfight draws them away from the airbase. Meanwhile, Nahumi dives onto the tail of another MiG-17, struggling to keep his target within his sights. Nahumi prepares to launch his first Sidewinder missile, but is quickly stopped by his navigator, Yossi Yavin, who reminds him that the missile requires a locking beep before it can be reliably fired. With the MiG- At Destiny, what do you think of the Kalergi plan? The reason for open borders and pushing interracial couples everywhere. The Kalergi plan was like some random dude that had written a random article for the New York Times. There is no actual fucking Kalergi plan that was implemented in any country that represents anything. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to find where this stupid shit was written. I've done all this research for Nick Fuentes. I don't know why you're in my chat. If you're a Nazi, you're not going to get like any ground here. Like I'm not here to, I don't even know what you're asking about this retarded shit. Um, Fuck, I'm trying to remember which one. There are two plans that Nazis point to that like a couple of people wrote about in like the 10s or 20s. And they're like, look, this is evidence that planned forced immigration and non-white people are being bred out of existence. One is the Kalergi plan. It was one of the one that Fuentes wrote. It's all fu retarded shit. If you actually look at like, none of these things are like plans implemented on the government level. It's like people writing articles and shit for newspapers and stuff. Um, you're fucking retarded. I don't know, I don't know why you're in my channel. <laughs> <clears throat> flying a series of defensive maneuvers, Nahumi wrestles with his controls until finally a shrill beep fills his cockpit. Nahumi fires, and a second later, the missile hits its target, setting it alight and sending it spiraling towards the ground. Consumed by his success, Nahumi is once again grounded by his navigator, who shouts, Break, as the downed MiG's wingman appears to their rear. Nahumi breaks back towards Afir. As he does, he passes between two further MiG-17s lining up to strike the base. As Nahumi closes in, the two MiGs notice the corners to their rear. They cut their dive short and climb to escape. Nahumi is now directly over the airbase, and everywhere he looks there are MiGs. His wing- Hi, hello? Hey, how are you? Are you on now or whatever, or your show? Oh yeah, we're just reading and watching videos and shit. Yeah, how's it going? Man, Shuki. Uh, I'm good. How are you, Destiny? I'm doing great. I was on your show years ago, and I've since harangued you to try to invite myself back on for, for some years. So that's our background, yeah. Oh shit, well here you are. What's up? Do you wanna, yeah, yeah. what is your, um, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, to? yeah. Uh, my, uh, so I'll just introduce myself. Um, my name's Matt uh, Cockerell. I'm a PhD student at the London School of Economics. In history, I have a modest internet uh, profile called History Speaks, and uh, yeah, that's essentially it. I'm very engaged in the uh, in the crisis gotcha. um, right now, okay. and, and have I have uh, sympathy for the Palestinian side more than the certainly more than the Israeli side. Gotcha. Um, but I'm not uh, I'm not pro Hamas like a lot of people gotcha. online are. For reason, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, hit me up with the, cause I'm trying to, I'm cramming hard cause I've got like limited time before a Ben Shapiro debate. That's probably not going to evolve this at all. So give me your like few minutes. Like, what, what are you going to debate with Shapiro about? Hopefully stuff related to Biden's presidency and what a Trump presidency might look like basically. Okay. So you're not going to debate on the, is there, cause I, I had assumed you were on the, so here is the argument I would make. The argument I would make is not that Hamas are good guys or they're not terrorists. They were justified in massacring people. This sure, is a lot of far left argument. The argument I would make is that the hatred that led young men to produce Hamas, to, to join Hamas, so like the causality, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, would not have happened but for decades of Israeli policy aimed at ethnic cleansing. That's the one, ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. That's the first point. Sure. And the second point, going back to the founding of the country and the founding ideology of the country, really. Mm -hmm. And the second point I'd make is that Israel, and I think this is a relevant point for you because you come at this from a liberal perspective, which actually I share. <laughs> Unlike some of the, a lot of people on my side are like base North Korea, base Stalin. But I come from a liberal perspective. Um, and I think a lot of liberals are siding with uh, Israel and don't realize Israel's a deeply illiberal society. And just to make a couple points in this regard, 
uh, in 2014-2015, Pew surveyed the Israeli population and found that nearly half of all Israelis support a mass ethnic cleansing of the Arab population. This was this question was asked in general terms: Do you support removal of the Arabs? Nearly half said yes, like 46, 48 percent. Um, that's one expression of this. Another expression of this is the vast majority, according to the same polls, said that Jews should receive special treatment under the law. Another expression of this is nearly 90 percent of Israelis, uh, 80, 90 percent. Um, according again to Pew, said they'd never let their child, or they'd, pardon me, not let, they'd, they'd be deeply uncomfortable with their child marrying a Christian or a Jew. So I just, uh, I think that Israel has promoted a narrative in the West that it is a liberal society, it's in compliance with international Western norms, and this is a fairy tale that has been sold through propaganda. And I think that the, the hatred that people in Gaza feel is completely comprehensible. What we can't justify is cashing it out and massacring people, right? We have to condemn that, and they did it. Like it's not the argument that this was all crossfire. This hasn't. They haven't produced evidence, so we have to. If, if we're being rational, we have to assume they massacred pe innocent people, right? And we have to condemn that. Uh -huh. But what is the hatred? What is the source of the hatred? That's what I'm interested in. And uh, here's another point I'd make. The, so the common argument given is, oh, these are just savages. They're Muslims. They hate Jews, blah, blah, blah. That's that's a very common meme on the pro-Israel side. Okay. Well, you have in Jordan, you have in Jordan, a majority population that is um, Palestinian. The majority of Jordanians are Palestinian. Mm -hmm. You have a small Christian minority there. We have like a science experiment. If, if we're looking at Islam, Jews and Christians have the same standing in Islam. They're Ahl al-Kitab, people of the book, but they're lower than Muslim. Where are the massacres of Christian Jordanians by Palestinians? Zero. Where is even the, the social discrimination? It's virtually, unless you're talking about people who converted from Islam to Christianity, Christians are treated very well in Jordan. And this isn't this isn't me saying that. You can look up their socioeconomic standing. They're not subject to violence. You can look up polls of how Muslims view them. They're treated well by the Palestinians there. So what is the difference between the, the radical attitudes of Gazans versus the the tolerant attitudes of, of Jordanian uh, Palestinians to their Christian minority? It's clearly this brutal policy of occupation, which which all, and, and also, well, wait, um, can um, you, here, let's go point by point, actually, because obviously I'm going to challenge you on all these points sure. um, on just on that last thing you said. Um, so you're saying Christians are treated well and we'll say countries like Jordan. Why do you think Jewish people, in Jordan. huh? In Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. Why do you think Jewish people were treated so poorly in every Arab country um, after 48? They certainly were treated very poorly. There was ethnic cleansing. Mm -hmm. There was harassment. Ah, it's unjustified, and it's it's to be condemned. Well, but what um, was the, the reason, what was the Arab justification for it? The, the, no, the the reason for it was the conflict. Yes, primarily. But the conflict um, was it, in it was a sense of collective guilt. Yep. For the conflict. Exactly. No, look. Well, yeah, wait, 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 I just want to be wait, I just want to be really, really, really clear. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you made the claim that in Islam, Jews and Christians have the same standing, and then in Jordan, mm -hmm. you're saying, well, look, Christians and all these people were massacred. Okay. The implication being that Jewish people somehow did something to be massacred in all these Arab countries, but Jewish people didn't, Israel, Israelis did in the Middle East, in Israel. So I'm asking you, what is the, Arab, just, what is the Arab justification for the pogroms, for the seizure of property, for the expelling of Jewish people in Arab states post-48? Because it wasn't Israelis they were expelling, well, it was Jewish people, the right? Justification, so I don't, again, I'm a, I, you know, I'm a liberal Western. I, I do have connection to the Arab world through my maternal side, who is Egyptian, but mm -hmm. I, so I, I do have some bias there. But I am a liberal Westerner who doesn't believe in massacre, expropriate property, and so on. What I, if you want me to tell you what they, what why these people thought it was justified, it was because which is not my position. Mm -hmm. It's because of the 1948 and 1950 ethnic cleansing project in um, by, by Israel of, of of the majority of the Palestinian population. So in the 1948 war, this is according to Benny Morris, who's a Zionist, uh, who's a Zionist and very pro-Israel, although he's a serious historian. I, re I, I recommend him to you the other day in point of fact. Um, sure, than, Benny like, Horus, I believe, is part of the four new um, right. Papa Israeli is a little bit, yes, even, yeah. even for me, who's very pro-Palestinian, mm -hmm. Papa's a little bit tendentious, let's say. Sure. Morris is good. That's fine. But, yeah, okay, um, yeah, we've got a lot of Benny Morris stuff. Yeah, okay, anyway, go ahead. Morris is my, is, is my top guy here. Uh, Morris, uh, his analysis was, there's this national myth, I'm sure you'll hear this on Israel uh -huh. Twitter, that the Arabs just left voluntarily because the Ar because the, their armies were about to attack and so on. Benny Morris found that the vast majority of the people who left in 1948 were uh, either war refugees or they were just physically removed, like ethnically cleansed by the Israelis. Uh -huh. So 
so the vast majority of these 800,000 or so people were either war refugees or were physically removed or ethnically cleansed. And then in 1950, uh -huh. Israel passed a law expropriating their property with no compensation. These are war refugees and ethnic cleansing victims. So in my view, they're all ethnic cleansing victims at that point. If a state, if Russia were to say we're taking all of the all of the property and all of the and you're not allowed to return uh, to Ukrainian war refugees, that's yep. ethnic cleansing. Sure. What you just described so, is what most Arab states did in '48 to Jewish people, and they also did it in '56. Um, uh, after the Suez Crisis, and they did it again in '67 after the Six Day War. Yeah. So every okay. Arab there's state no, seems to be no, doing yeah. There's mm -hmm. no, yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. We'd have to look at individual cases, but if you want to talk about ethnic cleansing in general terms, yeah. I would. I don't think that's an unreasonable characterization of what happened to the Jewish population. No, I, I understand. The I'm only gonna... reason, the, the, okay, so in all the, I, I barely know anything about this conflict so far. I admit, okay, my knowledge is literally no, like, it's good to yeah, it's four or five days old. Okay, so I'm very, very, okay. I'm not just reading your premise, you understand. I'm, I'm talking about what preceded it. Yeah, no, no, I, no, no, but that's what I'm talking about too. Because I think that it's very easy for this conflict to just say what preceded this particular thing um, and then stop there. So for instance, you keep bringing up the 800,000 Arab Palestinians that were expelled um, in 48, right? Which I think is closer to 700,000, but regardless, um, for those people that were, yeah. yeah, for those people that were expelled, why were they expelled in, in, uh, in 48? Why were the Arabs expelled? Yeah. Well, I mean, so the majority were war, war refugees. A large minority were physically removed. There was a plan called Plan Dalet. I'm aware. Which mm -hmm. authorized, now, now the- But the, why did Plan the, the Dalet kind of, come after? Mm -hmm. What did, what came what came before Plan Dalet? What came Plan before? Dalet was not Plan Dalet was not a response to Arab policy against indigenous Jews. It was a response to it was a security measure essentially. Yep. But a security and measure for what? Why informed, did they need a security measure though? Well, because they're at war. They're mm -hmm. at war. Correct. Okay. And they also mm -hmm. had an ideological. They had an ideological vision. Well, of, they did. That's more contentious. That's they're, more contentious. But no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't think so. So like. Now, did they have a vision of actually physically removing them from the beginning? That is contentious. I actually wouldn't even agree with that. Did they have a vision of taking the land by some means? They did. Absolutely. You get this with Theodore Herzl, for example. Uh -huh. uh, for, you know, uh, 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 Theodore Herzl said something to the effect that we must expropriate the land. Sure. In I don't care fashion. about Herzl. Well, Wait, I, under, I understand. I understand. It within, sure. you know, let, me, let me clarify because I don't want to, because some Palestinians exaggerate this quote. He said we have to abide by property rights and so uh -huh. on. But. They had a vision and practice for decades of yep. buying up land yep. from absentee landowners, often Turks, and then expelling the, the propertyless peasants from it. Sure. So they were now that's different than what happened in 1950, which is just theft of land, really. Sure. I mean, they just said, yeah, you can come back. So it's within the bounds of property rights, but it is bound to antagonize the population. And in fact, in 1939, the British Empire turned against Zionism in the white paper in large part because uh, first of all, there was an Arab revolt. There was an armed uh, revolt. Yeah, from 36 to 39, uh, yep. Right. But the British did recognize that, while they, of course, they fought the revolt and lamented what they regarded as barbarism and so on, th they understood that this situation is not sustainable of allowing all this Jewish migration where they come in, they buy the land, and kick off these pro these these unlanded peasants, right? Uh -huh. And that was that's a vision articulated by Herzl. That's, that's essentially what the practice and a vision. So... I mean, I, I see a continuity between that, even though I wouldn't call that ethnic cleansing. It's in the neighbor because it's lawful, right? They're not like taking arms or buying it. But they're, I, I see that as kind of part of a spectrum. And I understand why people who aren't, in many cases, weren't literate back then and are just tied to land seeing them, and, and, and labor, seeing themselves get kicked off the land, these Palestinian Arabs, that there was resentment and anger, right? Um, you know, so I, I don't I think, disagree. But again, like what precipitated the 48 expulsions? What precipitated the inaction well, of there, Plan Dalit? They had, no, so, so they had, this was not, look, they wanted for ideological reasons as much land as possible with a Jewish majority. That might be the case, yeah. but unfortunately, historically, we don't have that counterfactual, right? We don't know well, we if that's true. We have statements from them. We have statements from Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion was clearly happy to see the backs of any Arab who who, who left in 48. Yeah, Ben-Gurion also there. included in a statement of Israeli independence that he would happily live side by side with Arabs. And Ben-Gurion and the Yishuv, the pre-Israeli government, also accepted the 47 partition plan that would have had like 55% of the population of Israel being uh, Jewish Arabs and the other 45% being um, 
uh, Palestinian Arabs. So we have those things on writing as well, right? It's not ju- I understand that we have that one statement from Ben-Gurion, but if we look at the actions that they took prior to okay, the 48 independence, right, about, they're all the statements too, right? You're talking about, okay, so you're talking about the origins of the war where mm-hmm. the Palestinians, where the Arab population does not accept, um, does not accept the, the partition plan. That, that certainly is true. Yep. But I mean, there were two. There were two reasons for that. I yep. mean, essentially, uh-huh. the first was that it violated, in their view, the the, the premise of the UN Charter, sure. which accord which accords self determination to indigenous peoples. Okay. And the second of all, is that, um, is that the land given to Israel was wildly out of accord with their percentage of the population. So they got more land, despite having, uh, they got the majority of the land despite the Arabs having uh, more than twice the population. So, uh-huh. look. I'm not. You can say war is unjust. I'm not defending the decision to go to war. Obviously, it was well, sure. Mistake, I'm not. I'm not trying to defend any decisions. Of, wait, there were no. Wait, wait, not, there were no. Wait, 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 there were no wait, 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 wait. Hold on. No I understand. Hold on. Hold on. I just want to be super clear. Okay. Um, I haven't even taken a hard stance. I'm, obviously, I'm leaning in one direction. I haven't taken a hard stance one way or another yet, okay? I'm just saying that my issue is I notice that when people speak about this conflict, a lot of stuff will be brought up, but people choose the stopping point of history in a very peculiar way. For instance, saying that um, Arab-Palestinian hostility has been fostered by the Israeli state since the ethnic cleansing of 48 ignores what precipitated the ethnic cleansing of 48, which was the Brits leaving and all the Arab countries saying, well, we're going to try to eliminate all the Jewish people here because fuck this, right? And that precipitates well, the... Well, what's the evidence that they wanted to exterminate the Jews? This sounds like a national myth to me. I mean, this isn't well supported. They didn't... They, they wanted war. Yeah, they, they did not want the partition plan because they viewed it... Look, they what viewed the, Okay, wait, wait. Okay, it might myth. not have been the fact that they would have killed all the Jewish people. That could be the case. Um, I don't have a counterfactual. I can't prove that, Okay. But it is strange that when Israel, when Israel won their war of independence, it was just Jewish people that were punished in every single Arab state, right? It wasn't Israeli supporters or Zionists. It was Jewish people that were punished in every state. It could be the fact that all of these surrounding Arab nations that went to war with the newly declared Israel, maybe they would have just like conquered the territory and like made Jews live as whatever citizens there. Here's what you understand about this one. There's two responses I'd make to this. First of all, I agree with you that this is is unjustified. Uh, Second of all, I don't understand what, how Palestinians are responsible for what Egyptians did or what Yemenis did and so on um, in response to the, to the Nakba. And then the third point I'd make is that... Wait, 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 give me the points. Wait, no, wait, yeah, give me the points. So, so, so he, you may ask, why would you talk more about the, the victims of the Nakba versus these Jews who were chased out of Yemen or Egypt? Mm-hmm. The, the answer is that the victims of the Nakba and their ancestors are still in fucking Gaza, or they're in Lebanon with no with no nationality, or they're stateless in Syria in a refugee camp. Whereas the Mizrahim who were kicked out are in a first world country, Israel, and they're happy there. And I'm glad they, they I don't want them to be removed from the land. But do you understand that like they don't want to go back to Yemen? And why would they? Right? They don't want to go back to Egypt. They're happy to be in Israel. So it's like their situation, uh, the consequences of their victimization are no longer being felt. Yeah, because, Whereas, well, because the, because the Jewish people in Israel fought war after war after war to establish their right to exist. That's the only reason why they have a place to live, right? Okay, but I don't understand why that's... Okay, so we can talk about like the origins of the 67 war, the Yom Kippur war, and so on. Who's sure. to blame? But like, well, hell, but I mean, wait, wait, let's, yeah, wait, 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 let's, do it. Let, let's do it, wait, be... let's do it, let's talk about, we can talk about the origins of any of those, because now I know everything about all of these, okay? So the Suez Crisis was Egypt, okay, nationalizing all parts of the Suez Canal, and then cutting off shipment to Israel, which was not only a violation of the 1888 nas- uh, international agreements to not control traffic through that, but it was also most likely a declaration of war, because it probably violated the previous armistice lines that had been established in the 48 war, right? So that was the beginning of the Suez Crisis, which part of that was Israel's fault? Okay, in '67, the fact of the matter, the core fact of the matter is mm-hmm. that Israel attacked Israel attacked Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. Why did Israel? Okay, well we can. Okay, so we'll skip. Okay, we'll go to the. Was, the, the, the why, why did Israel, wait, why did Israel attack? So given that Israel attacked, yeah, you have to justify to me that they had no alternative moves and that war was imminent. War was imminent, and that's why, why? they why did, did attack. <sighs> Let's see. What was the lead up to the Six Day War? The lead up to the Six Day War was, oh, it was Nasser closing the Suez Canal again, which Israel said would be a a cause for war if they try to close off those shipment lines again. This is exactly what we did with the Suez Crisis, like almost 10 years earlier. Okay, so that, that in your view, justified 
the, the Suez matter justified war. Yeah, of course it does. Closing waterways and shipments. Yeah, of course that justifies war. I think that's internationally recognized as a cause for war. Look. And liter- <laughs> like Egypt literally expelled all the UNEF forces there. They got rid of all the UN peacekeepers. They closed the canal and they started establishing uh, tiered, layered military lines. So, of course, what do you think is going to happen, right? They were building up troops. They were getting ready to invade, obviously, because Nasser's not stupid. Ten years earlier, they literally fought a war over exactly this thing, right? So, of course, he knows by closing it again, there's going to be another conflict. That's why he's preparing for it. Yeah, I don't I don't regard the disputes over the rights of Israeli shipping to pass through Suez and the Red Sea to justify a preemptive war. And I think you're very naive if you don't look at the ideological interests. So do you, do you accept that Israel had an ideological interest in expansion they, to okay. the territory they call. No, no, I want to answer this. You wait, wait, no, no, wait, wait, you made one claim. Just as a real quick thing. If you said that you don't consider the closing of shipping lanes as a cause for it, that's fine. You're alone there. Your answer there is ahistorical. And throughout all of history, the closing and fighting over shipping lanes has been absolutely huge parts about why we go to war with people and why people go to war. Um, so this is a very big deal, is closing free travel to certain countries. So I just want to establish that. Now, if you think it's not a cause for war, that's fine. Even though you said it yourself, you brought up in 56, there was the Suez crisis. It was literally fought over this, right? But okay, so 10 years later, the same thing happens. Okay, now go ahead to your point. I just want to establish that. Go ahead. Okay, so yeah, uh, the, the moral question of whether the 67 war is justified or not, mm-hmm. we disagree on. It's not of great interest to me. I do a, not wait, wait, think- how is that not a great interest? That's a really important war. That's where Israel expanded their territory in three directions, right? It's a, that's a Correct. really, yeah. So I think the, okay. I think the starting of the sixty seven wars I think is pretty important, right? Well, we have a we have an ethical disagreement on whether this dis, this this dispute over um, this blockade over access to international waters justifies starting a war. I do not agree on this. Okay. Yeah. And you don't um, think you don't think that Egypt had an interest in going to war again with Israel? You don't think they had it there? Of course they did. They hated Israel. Okay, so they blockaded their straits. Yeah, but there's no evidence. Look, Israel Israel did not ex- – Israel – here's my position. Okay. First of all, we have a normative disagreement that we just talked about. I don't think – since normative disagreements are often insoluble, I don't think it's very interesting to go back and forth on that. Okay. I Israel – here's my perception of the 67 war. Okay. Israel wanted to expand. They were provoked by the Suez issue. They, want, they had a deep ideological commitment to expansion. They think the land is theirs, and then God gave them the land and so on. No, the, of, wait, of they think God gave them the Sinai Peninsula? Yes, they do. Okay. No, not the Sinai Peninsula, but like uh, the West Bank and the Golan Heights, for example. Wait, but the West Bank and the Golan Heights have nothing to do with Egypt Yeah, but they closing. didn't just attack Egypt. They didn't just attack Egypt. Their preemptive war was in multiple directions. That was only because those other countries had signed defensive pacts with Egypt. They told Jordan. They said, they literally explicitly told Hussein. They said, please don't attack us in Jerusalem. And Hussein said, ah, fuck it, I'm going to. And that's why Egypt invaded the West Bank afterwards and took that land. Now, we might say, well, Egypt uh, or Israel would have taken that land anyway. They would have went invaded anyway. We don't know that, though, because unfortunately we can never know because Jordan decided to attack with Egypt. Here's, here's, how, here's how we know better than the origins of the Six-Day War, whether you think they're morally justified or not, which okay. we disagree on this. Sure. I don't think Israel showed an interest in negotiation. I don't think Israel wanted to involve the international community. I think they rushed to war for expansionist reasons. We have a disagreement on that. Sure. We also but to be clear, you have no there. proof of any of that, and I can show you tons of proof on the of other I side. Do. No, I have massive, I have massive proof of this. That Israel, that that the that Israel had a vision that Israeli leaders, um, uh, for decades had a vision of expansion to Judea, what they call Judea and Samaria, and the Golan Heights. Of course, I have proof of this. Okay, well, you know what would have been really good then for Arab strategy? So do you do you did not do you did not? Okay. Wait, no, no, wait, 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 this this is so easy. This is such an easy thing, okay? This is what the Arabs should have done then, okay, for their uh, geopolitical strategy. And the whole world, including the United States and Britain, by the way, would have been on their side. If they think that Israel has territorial conquest on the mind, they should have waited for them to do territorial conquest. Do you deny that is, okay, so even today, what would you make of the, do you actually, so... You've talked about international norms and so on to try to justify the 67 war. Mm-hmm. Surely you'd agree that the fourth, if, if you've been reading up on this, the, and this is the United States position for decades before Trump, that Israel's settlement in the occupied territories in breach of UN 242, which they had agreed to, you would surely agree that this is a war crime un, under the, um, under, and that's not a moralistic term, that's, under the, that's just a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Civilian settlements in occupied territory are a war crime. And one, and two, this is obviously revanchist and ideological in nature. 
it's they call they call the West Bank Judea and Samaria. That's sure. an evocation. Of we can say history. whether so, so that, that's not Western values. Wait, am I going to say let's answer this question? This or, wait, you asked me a question. Let's, let's work. No, no. Okay. I want to make a rhetorical point. They all shut up for a bit. You, okay, that's not. Is it, it is not Western values to say we need to commit war crimes and expand to occupied territory, which we agreed to leave because of God or ancient history. But go ahead. Okay, I don't know when they agreed to leave the occupied territories. Maybe I haven't gotten up to that. I haven't done a thorough reading of the Camp David stuff or the Oslo Accords yet. So maybe they agreed to leave there and they haven't. So I haven't gotten up to that point yet. They agreed to UN 242. (sighs) Okay. And and also, yeah. And also in Wait a second. Hold on. Hold on. You said UN Resolution 242. Was that the same UN Resolution that also called for every Arab surrounding state to recognize Israel's existence and their borders? Correct, and, and Egypt okay. has done so. Egypt Jordan has, has and Jordan so. has, and any other Arab countries? <laughs> Do you see the problem? Okay, so you know, okay, so I understand. So yes, okay. So now, now you West asked Bank me, was what, Jordanian. How, how does the West Bank justify though? The West Bank was Jordanian. You, it was so, Jordanian. Why did they? So Jordan lose has it? normalized ties with Israel. They are now obliged to 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 get out of the West Bank. That's fine. That's fine. Okay that they've normalized ties. I don't know what the agreement is gonna look like on giving that territory back, but historically, one, during the Six Day War, the West Bank was used to stage war against Israel, okay? Not just during the Six Day War, but in the decades prior to that, with Palestinian attacks uh, back and forth coming from that territory, right? Number one, so that's so that's Israel's justification of the Six Day War for capturing it, for quote unquote security concerns, okay? Number two, All of this territory from the western part of Jordan has been used to attack Israel, right? That's where the PLO started. PLO got so big and violent there, led by Arafat, they literally tried to assassinate Hussein twice, and they tried to- There is the PLO done since 2005 in terms of violence. I don't know what they've done since 2005, but I'm just telling you that- So why is it? So settlements for 18 years, the last 18 years are justified because of this this history from half a century ago? Okay, okay. maybe that, listen, I'm being honest, okay? I don't, I haven't gotten to the last 20 or 30 years of history yet. I'm still working my way up there. But I do know that from the Six Day War before and onward, the West Bank was a very good staging area for lots of attacks into Israel, right? I'm gonna guess that if I keep reading, that probably continues to be the case to some extent. Maybe it's not, okay, maybe it's not. Um, My guess is gonna be it's probably gonna be- uh-huh. Do you think civilian? No, no. But why are this is a this is a big fallacy that you're that you're falling for? Okay. Why are civilian? There would be some argument they could have under international law for a military presence if they could articulate that. Why are civilian settlements, which is just like some white girl from Brooklyn coming there and and getting a house and kicking the people off through by buying it or by um, some kind of fake government thing saying oh you've the the, the indigenous people have committed some kind of uh, you know, uh, offense. So there are you. Are you asking um, me like why? Why are why? civilian settlements in the West Bank uh-huh. good for Israel's security? It seems to me obviously about taking the land. My yeah, the that would be. That's my. I don't. Again, I'm not current on this, but my huge intuition, uh, uneducated or educated guess, I guess, is that my go- my guess that Israel probably wants to annex the West Bank officially. That's my guess. I don't know if that's true. One hundred percent. That's my guess. No, but it's civilian settlements are also a war crime. That's crime. fine. I don't care. Do Hold on. I don't care. None of my uh, like calculus in this area has to do with what we consider to well, be like war crime. You mentioned closing waterways has been a historical norm for war, and now now international law doesn't matter. It's no, no. I'm just saying that like when I'm looking at like justifications for either side, what I'm thinking of is like a like a war crime or not is not like I'm just trying to look at the reality of the situation on the ground. Like for instance, it might be the case that. Uh, if Israel stops committing everything that you would consider a war crime, that the next day Israel is eliminated from the face of the earth because the entire Arab League decides we're going to come back and destroy them as a country, right? In which case, Israel's probably probably not very motivated to think like, well, what we're doing in this terms of this military occupation of these um, controlled territories and setting up that's a war crime. They're probably not thinking of it that way. We're not. We're, again, we're talking about civilian military occupation. They'd have an argument to make, but the, what they have done is is systematically state sponsored civilian settlements of occupied territory, which is a war crime and breaches what they agreed to do. So they're breaching treaties and committing war crimes. Okay, sure. But they're doing it on the assumption that all of the surrounding Arabs want to destroy their country, right? But why, why would they, okay, if, the, if, if they want to, if they're all even, they want to destroy you, why would you build civilian settlements there? Maybe you build more bases. Why, why because do you build building the civilian settlements there? probably gives you a stronger claim to eventually annex the territory, It's my guess. Clearly, the people there are going to be in more danger. Probably, yeah. And I assume settlers know that when they go out there, right? That they are at more risk of attack and, yeah. 
So you, you, your your position is that the, the civilian settlements in occupied territory are just fine with you. In, in the West I didn't. Side. I never said they of were like, just fine. I think that the okay. this, that, I'm trying to, that's what I'm asking. I'm, I'm trying to clarify this. Okay. Well, you haven't asked me at all. You're just like making a bunch of statements and then trying to like run around this. My, I think that the West Bank settlements are probably the worst thing that Israel does in terms of its relations to the rest of the world, right? It, it loses them more moral credit than probably any other thing. But what Israel probably feels like is because they've been abandoned so much in the past, because they've been essentially on their own fighting against a sea of enemies, most of which to this day don't even recognize that it's a real country, them making uh, territorial concessions to other people isn't going to serve their interests whatsoever, so they might as well just continue to do what they're doing because nobody else is going to actually help them. That's that's probably like what Israel's uh, thinking thoughts are on this issue. That'd be my guess. Okay, but, 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 but is it, I mean, we can talk about the Arabs thinking and, and why they mistreat the Jews after the neck, but I don't think it's that, it's deeply relevant when we're thinking about bad, provocative war crimes, systematic. I mean, this was also, this is not... Wait, what do you think is not position. relevant? Wait, so what like, do you think is not relevant? I want, I want to make one point here. So, so I want to make one point here. Okay. So the idea that this, these, settle, these civilian settlements are illegal is not some Palestinian leftist meme. This was the position of every American administration until Trump. So George W. Bush, he didn't, he wouldn't have said war crime the way I'm saying it, but impliedly he's saying that, right? Because he's saying it violates international uh, humanitarian law, the Geneva Convention. So he, by implication, he said it's a war crime. The Germans have said this, again, by implication for diplomatic reasons, but they- If this your whole is just argument is just going to be saying it's a war crime, it's war, I don't care. That argument means nothing to I any of the people there. Care. It doesn't mean anything to anybody. It was also a war crime. About it was also a war crime when Palestinians were hijacking planes all over the world. It was a war crime when they went to Germany and they killed 11 Israeli athletes. Um, it's war crimes when they cross territory to go into Israeli territory um, and, and try to bomb and kill civilians. It's war crimes when they try to coup all of the countries that the Palestinian organizations end up in. It's the Lebanese civil war were war crimes when the PLO went out there. They were war crimes when they were in Jordan trying to do it there. They were war crimes when they were in Egypt trying to kill their king. Like, yeah, I mean, what are you talking about? Yeah, there's war crimes all over this place. I'm not going to be holding Israel to some unique standard and a sea of people who have well, outwardly pledged. It is, who, no, no, it is who, a unique standard. Because who else? Who else? You need, who else? So, okay, people say that this is Alan Dershowitz meme about Israel's unique. So first of all, a couple of points. First of all, the founding of Israel was not colonial. It was. It is unprecedented in the history of the world to... Say we're going to go back because we have ancient ancestry uh, to some place and establish a country that has never happened in the history of the world. So it's it, it's not as if we're having it's a novel. Zionism is a novel project, historically unprecedented. So it's not like double standard to condemn it. We we, we have to engage in independent moral reasoning because it's completely novel. Well, yeah, sure, uh, but wait, second, we can't, it's too late. We can't go back a hundred years and say that no, like but I'm I'm just rejecting the Dershowitz meme that. And then secondly, there are not wait, wait, many wait, 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 rejecting what Dershowitz that, that meme? Wait, what are we talking about? Dramatically attempt to colonize occupied territory because they believe it's theirs, which they clearly do. They call it Judea and Samaria. They don't call it the West Bank. I don't. Hold it on. Is normally hold on. Listen. Hold on. Okay. If you want to make a historical argument, okay, we can make historical and policy and government arguments. I can't debate uh, quotes from people or Israel calls it these things, okay? Now, that might be my lack of education speaking, but I found, it, it, I found that when I argue with people, when they tend to throw a quote at me or something, I don't know how to make sense of it. Now, it's not it, a quote, it's no, no, how no. the land is referred to in Israel. That's great, okay? But when I look historically how Israel required that land, or acquired that land, Israel didn't acquire it through territorial, expansionist, militaristic aims. They did it in defense from 10 plus other Again. countries trying to invade and destroy them. So it hurts your argument to say, well, look, Israel's uh, territorial conquest, aren't they? It's like, well, I don't know. Every bit of territory they seem to gain has happened on the backs of every other Arab country okay. trying we to destroy disagree. them, right? We disagree on, on Israel being defending itself in the 67 war. We already discussed that, which is when they got the West Bank. So, you disagree? I mean, we're not so talking them, about- so we're Egypt, not talking about Hold on, wait, wait, wait. Can, I ask, can, can I ask a question, okay? Um, you In 56, the Suez crisis happened, yes? Okay, and in that crisis, okay, Britain, France, and Israel were going to work to free up the Suez Canal. Yes, there was a war over that. Yeah, this correct. Yes, okay. After that happened, and the canal was okay, opened up. Okay, Egypt's president Nasir, okay, the same leader, okay, about ten years later, closes the same strait and starts building military fortifications and mobilizing his entire military back in the Sinai Peninsula. Okay. What do you, you don't think that sounds like a preparation for war? I do not. I think, look, we disagree on this. I disagree that that is 
uh, that war was inevitable, and I think Israel wanted war for territorial expansion. They viewed themselves as vastly superior to the Arabs militarily. Um, you know, um, one of one of these uh, famous Israeli generals, a general, well, you don't like quotes, but he called Arabs monkeys and so on. They, they did not think highly of the fighting capacity of, of the Arabs. Okay, um, but hold on. The Arabs, wanted, thought, the Arabs thought highly, land. Egypt thought highly of their fighting capacity, okay? Egypt thought that they could destroy Israel. They saw themselves as military, militarily superior, right? And then the prior crisis for the Suez crisis, that, that, that conflict ended in three days because of U.S. foreign pressure on Israel, Britain, and France to fuck off, okay? And Britain, France, and Israel, after three days, essentially fucked off. Egypt took credit for that militarily victory. They thought they beat all three nations, and they carried themselves forward with that, and that's why they had the gall to close it and start the Six-Day War, essentially, by doing that 10 years later. So Egypt also thought themselves superior to the Israeli military forces. That's the only reason he was so cocky and confident in trying to start conflict later on. So you can't just say it was like Israel thinking they were monkeys and blah, 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 when Nasser is guilty of the exact same uh, complex. Okay, um, there were Israeli there were Israeli officials who deny this narrative. By the way, wait, deny um, what the, narrative? The Mordecai Bento, that there was some urgent risk of preemptive war and annihilation, and so on. Uh, I would be. I don't even know if the. Um, I okay. And I he was, heard that. He was okay. in the, the government at the time, so I, I just do not agree with this narrative of the war. Um, look, I think I think Nasser, uh, you know, Nasser was making assurances he wasn't going to uh, attack Israel. Um, Israel's foreign minister during the war later wrote that Nasser wanted victory without war. I don't agree with you. Wait, Nasser narrative. made assurances at the same time that he was entering defensive pacts with Jordan? At the same time he was mobilizing obviously, his... It was a, uh, look, obviously, look, obviously closing the Straits of Tehran was a provocative action, right? It, it, it's funny, though, that you're citing customary international law for this. But then it doesn't matter for settlements because I'm not really because I'm not really appealing to quote unquote international law. You, you it's, think the, it's morally justified based on the closing of the straits. Yes, if people start controlling law. your we ability we disagree. to we disagree. Okay. disagree. I think Israel was the aggressor in '67. Now '47, '48, the Arabs were the aggressors based on what they regarded as a, I think rightly as an unfair partition agreement. I wouldn't have gone to war over it, but. No one's talking about the land Israel acquired in 47. Why did Egypt, years. wait, hold on. I just, I can't get over this. Why did Egypt kick out like all the UNEF peacekeepers if they weren't going to war? Why did they kick them all out? Why didn't they just keep them there? Yeah, that's, that's, you're, you're drawing an inference from that. Can I you am, give me yeah, a specific I'm drawing an inference for- to go to war? Because war was likely. War was likely, obviously. They're not stupid. If you're closing, uh, if you're, if you're closing international waterways, that's a provocative action. Okay, so they were provoking them to war. They kicked out the UNEF forces there because they thought war was likely, and they began mobilizing troops to get ready for war. How is this not a, a provocation of war? The, by the way, by the way, the defense, the, the troop movements, the troop movements by an Israeli historian and former diplomat, uh, Michael Oren, the troop movements of the Egyptian military leading up to the so-called preemptive action were defensive in nature. I, incidentally, I had um, I actually had family in the military at the time on my mother's side and the, and the Egyptian side. But I, that's anecdotal. I don't think that's very relevant. Uh -huh. But I, I don't I will say that I don't uh, I don't think that um, uh, I think that the case you're making is weak here. I think the better argument you have is the um, uh, is the war of independence, so-called. Uh, sure, that's fine. That was but I mean, like the, the reality is, is that for the six day war, military fortifications were being built up in Syria, yes. Jordan and Egypt, and they were getting other assistance from every other Arab country. Iraq, I think, was sending tanks. Pakistan was sending pilots. Um, I think Saudi Arabia, I think, was sending uh, military supplies. Um, no, like, the Saudis, every, the fact that, you know, I mean, like, look. I'm just saying that You're every other country about... in the region seemed to think that, like, there was about to be a war, and all of them didn't recognize Israel's right to exist, and there were three huge invading forces that Israel fought up. So the idea that, like, no, Israel just did the preemptive war, and somehow everybody else was ready to invade them immediately after, that's pretty wild. Well, there's no evidence of, tro of troop movements and logistics that would that would make any sense of a plan for invasion. Because you have, you have to have logistics and communications and so on and maps. We just haven't found the evidence of this. Again, I, I quoted for you, or referred you to, a pro-Israel... American Israeli um, uh, historian who was is actually former U.S. Pardon me, Israeli ambassador to the United States, Michael Oren, who rejects this. He's not a he's not a shill. Uh, he was he, he worked for the Israeli government in 2009 under Netanyahu. So Michael Oren, Six Day War. You're telling me yeah. that this guy thinks that the um, prior to the Six Day War that um, 
He thinks that the, the, the Middle East, that the Arab nations weren't gearing up for war against Israel. Um, no, sorry, that, that, that is not Oren. That is not Oren. Let me, let me get this correct. No, sorry, I'm talking about, I'm, I did not mean Oren. I'm talking about Abba Iban. Iban who is also an Israeli diplomat, but he, um, he was not, this is not the same individual. Okay, hold on. Why would I care about what a diplomat is saying about this? He was the foreign this? minister during the war. Yeah, I got but he's not working in the military intelligence of the prime minister. No, Why would I care about what he was the foreign one... minister. So Abba Iban, I'm sorry, I made a mis I, I misstated. I don't know sure. why I got the names. Confused. That's fine. Okay. Abba Iban, was the for he was also a diplomat, but he was the Israeli foreign minister during the war, not some guy in 2009 that wouldn't have been relevant. He was the Israeli foreign minister during the war, and he wrote that Nasser did not want war. Um, okay, that's and, interesting and, because and, that and, seems and, to contradict every single other thing that um, that that I've sorry, read. Sorry, Oren, Oren, Oren argues. So sorry, Oren mm -hmm. argues. Oren's relevant too. Oren argues that there was some ideological project the Arabs wanted to destroy Israel, so Israel had to act. So he does. He dis he, he argues that, but he's supportive of my point insofar as he concedes contrary to his thesis, that the deployments and the in infrastructure and logistics mm -hmm. that the that we that Israeli intelligence found regarding Egypt mm -hmm. um, showed that the Egyptian preparations were defensive. Gotcha. Okay, so if you can, real quick. So Oren is relevant. Wait, okay, his wait. conclusion is agreeing with, with yours, gotcha. but he, he's relevant. The, okay, wait, the wait, guy wait. who was the foreign minister of Israel during yep. the war, yes. um, okay. Aban, gotcha. Ban, I can't pronounce these I people's see. names. That's fine. Aba, Aban, yeah. okay. So, so I'm just, I understand. Yes, Oren I understand. Aban. Oren okay. agrees with your thesis, yes, I understand. but he just. Okay. The, I, I believe the data he he finds okay. is supportive of my thesis, and Eban agrees with my thesis that Nasser did not. Want okay, war. Eban. Uh, okay, Eban no, might. Wait, wait, wait. This is important. I think okay. they rushed to war. Sure. Yeah. Let's just. They maybe they rushed to war. Okay. This was Eban on his on the third day of the six day war. Okay. This was a, an address that he made to the world via the United Nations. I'm just going to read three paragraphs of this. Okay. I've just come from Jerusalem to tell the Security Council that Israel, by her independent effort and sacrifice, has passed from serious danger to successful serious danger to successful resistance. Two days ago, her condition caused much concern across the humane and friendly world. Israel has reached a somber hour. Let me try to evoke the point at which our fortunes stood. An army greater than any force ever assembled in the history in Sinai had against Israel's southern frontier. Egypt had dismissed the United Nations forces, which symbolized the international interest in the maintenance of peace in our region. Egyptian leader Gamal Abdel Nasser had provocatively brought five infantry divisions and two armored divisions up to our very gates. 80,000 men and 900 tanks were poised to move. A special striking force comprising an armored division with at least 200 tanks was concentrated against Elat at the Negev southern tip. Elat being the southern port town that goes into that strait of Tehran eventually, right? Here was a clear design to cut the southern Negev off from the main body of our state. For Egypt had openly proclaimed that Elat did not form part of Israel and had predicted that Israel itself would soon expire. The proclamation was empty. The prediction now lies in ruins. So this was Iban's statement. Uh, I'm not, so right, I'm curious, did he say after? Statement. Okay. Let me describe what Oren says about okay. Iban. I'm sorry for getting these two guys' names confused. Okay. If I need to clarify again. Okay, this is, this was Iban's uh, reaction to, um, <clears throat> Uh, to the to, to, to the Israeli policy. Iban was livid. Unconvinced that Nasser was either determined or even able to attack, he now saw Israelis inflating the Egyptian threat and flaunting their weakness in order to extract a pledge that the president, Congress bound, could never make. So basically they're telling the, the president on 26 May um, that, you know, uh, the Arabs are about to attack us. And Iban is enraged. Um, is in, he says this is an act of momentous irresponsibility, eccentric, telling the president that the Arabs are about to attack us. So he, he, yeah, he, he, he is a patriot. He went. He's not going to say publicly, "My country's lying," right? But he privately thought they're full of shit. He thought they were lying. That's according to this cable cited by Mike, by Michael Lauren, um, who disagrees with Iban. But um, I think the data Oren provides is supportive of, of Iban's thesis, frankly. So the, the foreign minister thought this was fake. That, that the Arabs are not about to attack. Yeah, he may have made this speech publicly because he, what is he going to do? He's like a patriotic Israeli. Okay, hold on one second. Yeah, no, look it up, look it up. I, I, I bet there's some of that online. Um, and the U.S. didn't support Israel in the war, you know, right? Correct. The U.S. was neutral. The U.S. didn't, but, so, you know, we stand for liberalism and so on. Now, what we're doing in Vietnam at the time is... Okay, so hold on. I just want to be clear here, okay? So just as a... Because, okay, I'm just in this paragraph. So 
Iban didn't believe when a message was sent to him saying that war was imminent. He thought that that wasn't the case. He wasn't convinced right. that Nasser was determined or even able to attack. That was his right. position. That was his position as a foreign minister. That's it. But there's no, there's nothing no, here that- he wrote later, he wrote later. He, 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 he um, no, no, that's not correct. Um, he laid, yeah, that's all, that's his position as foreign minister, but he also, um, you know, later wrote in, an, in his autobiography that he didn't, uh, that this, he didn't believe Nasser was about to attack. Um, that's what he says in his in his autobiography. Okay, well, yeah. that's interesting for him. I'd be curious if like somebody that was so more the minister of the country. That's a pretty good counterexample. No, it's, it's not. It's not a good. Country. It's a diplomat. I'm not convinced when I look at the military actions that Egypt was right. taking pre preceding the Six Day War. You don't think the Secretary of State is apprised of of, of military intelligence the situation at a high level? Like, of course he is. He's, he's he knows everything. He knows much more than some general does about the political about the political intentions of the Arabs. Yeah, he knows everything. Like, okay. Knows, well, the historical reality is that Nasser was incredibly aggressive. Nasser was incredibly anti-Zionist. Nasser did see himself as like the potential leader of a new like pan-Arab world. And that Nasser thought that destroying Israel or making military advances into that country would strengthen his position as the head of the new pan-Arab league that he wanted to be a part of. So these are things that sure. I know and, are and all the true. Historic okay. reality is that Israel, and, and you just have to read more if you don't believe me on this, is that Israel um, had an, has an ex had and has an expansionist ideology and believes they're entitled to uh, what they regard as an the ancient land of Israel. Then Most why did they why did they pull back in '56 after the Suez Crisis? Why did they get back the because Sinai Peninsula after '67? Why did Jordan make peace with Israel? People play politics too. You operate in the real world. But they okay, have wait, an wait, ideological Okay, vision. wait, so on one end, Israel is incredibly territorially expansionist, but then when they're not, we're saying that's just because they're being politically efficacious? Yeah, sure. Why not? I mean, Jordan would love, look, Nasser would have loved to destroy Israel, right? But uh, but as the foreign minister of Israel at the time said, he didn't, wasn't actually going to attack in 67. Um, you know, people can have visions, but they have to operate within the confines of geopolitical reality, right? I mean, we'd love for Iran to be, the regime to be changed, right? Everyone in the U.S. government would like that. Everyone in the Saudi government would like that. It doesn't mean we're going to invade Iran, right? So, yeah, I, um, some level of pragmatism uh, and restraint just attests to real politic. It doesn't attest to a lack of expansionist aim. I mean, I, I just, I, I just find it very hard to believe you don't, you don't see Israel as an expansionist state. That's very hard. Israel to might be an expansionist state. I'm agnostic on that. The problem with the claims that Israel's in it's here's the issue. Okay, this is what it's like saying Israel's an expansion state. Okay, imagine I've got a friend who's murdered four people. All right, or killed four people, and everybody claims your friend is a murderer. He's just looking for people to kill. Okay, but let's say that when we go and look at his past of killing four people, every single time was a person came up to him with a knife and they said, "I'm gonna cut your fucking throat," and then they get into a scuffle, and then my friends up and up killing those all all four of those people in self defense. Right, that's the issue that you run into right now. So when you're telling me uh, Israel is an expansion. Uh, you know, colonial state, they're trying to take over more territory. What you're saying, that it might be true. I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's absolutely not true. But what I'm telling you is that you can't support that with history because every Israeli expansion has come off the back of Arab conflict trying to destroy it as a country. So you don't, you well, can't well, make the counterfactual well, to me. It doesn't exist. That's the that's issue. Me. Okay. There are two points here. So first, we've talked extensively about this. I side with the Israeli foreign minister during the war. You apparently don't. Well, no, do I side believe... with the rest of the world, okay? I don't know why the, the Israeli the foreign minister... World. What? What's the rest of the world? The United States did not actively support Israel during the war. No, no, it's not about supporting. It's that thought that Egypt would invade. When UN forces are expelled from an area, usually you think some real shit is going to happen. The Soviet Union was literally feeding intelligence to Egypt, saying that Israel was like mobilizing their fucking army, which ended up not being true, which also caused Egypt to take an aggressive stance. And Egypt also had aims and drives and desires to destroy Israel as a country, as did every other surrounding Arab state. All of these things feed into a pretty logical the desire conclusion. To, the, the desire to do something is like an 80th of the story in politics. I mean, Kim Jong-un has many desires to do things, right? Um, ISIS has had desires to do things that they couldn't accomplish. Um, it, it, it's, the Hutus have desires in Yemen. Okay, it's, that's fine. Okay, but just to be clear then, if you want to side with the foreign, world, if you want, yes, if you want to side with the foreign minister, that's fine. I'm siding with the, I think the, what is the historian consensus, okay? If you want to side with the one foreign minister, that's fine. I'm going to side with the historian. I'm not side with one foreign minister. This is a highly contested issue. This is not, uh, this is not a consensus issue. Okay. Um, but anyway, um, and it wasn't at the time either in the world, which is why the United States didn't actively support Israel. But regardless, um, 
the issue here is not if so let's assume you're right which i absolutely do not let's pretend you're right that israel was acting defensively in some sense in the, in the preemption of an imminent uh, arab attack in the six-day war so nevertheless in order to establish a peace they consent to un resolution 242 and 242 says they have to give up this occupied territory in exchange for uh, the recognition of their right to exist in other states, okay? They give up, they do part of that. They give up Sinai to Egypt, right? Egypt mm-hmm. recognizes them. That's fulfilled there. Both sides fulfill it. With respect to to the West Bank, Jordan controlled the West Bank before the Six-Day War, and Jordan recognized um, Israel uh, in the 1990s. Mm-hmm. So why then didn't Israel at least cease, you can make your argument about military installations, at least cease um, uh, their civilian settlements in the West Bank. So here's Instead, a question. Increased. Here's a question. Okay, I'll ask you this. I don't know the answer. Is it possible that Jordan didn't want the West Bank back? No, it's not a matter of Jordan not wanting the wanting the West Bank. It's a matter of this was you. You made the argument that. Okay, well, wait, 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 hold on, wait, wait, hold on, wait, wait. I thought, I thought, didn't you? I'm sorry. Am I? I thought you just asked no. why they didn't give the West Bank back to Jordan, or am no, I? No, no, they don't have to give it back to Jordan. They have to either they, they can either give it back to Jordan. Or they can give it to Palestine. They can't, but they have no right to be there under 242 because the premise was we took land that belonged to Jordan. Jordan has to make peace with us. Jordan hold on, hold on, wait. Them, you can't, no we can't cite 242. I don't think it's relevant here, okay? Because Resolution 242 uh, literally demands the recognition of Israel by all of the other surrounding yeah, Arab countries. Israel. And, and you know who else recognizes Israel? The PLO in, um, in um, uh, the West Bank. The Fatah recognizes Israel. That's so. That's first of all, I'm not actually even sure if that's true. But, okay, that's like, fine. But I'm just no saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that 242 only works with all of the other Arab countries coming on board. It's not no, a bilateral thing. That's not how it worked. You could argue that with respect to Golan, but you cannot argue that with respect to the West Bank because the, the West Bank has nothing to do with Syria. So why Syria doesn't have anything to do with that? I mean, even they wouldn't argue that. They would just say the civilian settlements are for security. That's how they are. I mean, no one takes it seriously. No one takes what seriously? The Israeli argument that they're not committing war crimes in the West Bank, no one takes seriously. No one is taught because war crimes are the most boring way to bring up any of this thing because Israel is the only one we talk about when we talk about war crimes. So war crimes don't matter here, okay? War crimes so are- Israel is not the only one we talk about when we talk about war crimes. Yeah, Israel that's the only one that I ever hear about brought up when we talk about war okay. crimes here. Well, has any other, has any Western nation been accused, as Israel was in the Goldstone Report, of literally intent, am I talking about indiscriminate or um, uh, poorly um, uh, sourced attacks that kill civilians or collateral damage? I'm talking about literally deliberately murdering civilians. Israel was so indiscriminate. Let me describe the history of the Goldstone Report, because I'll be cons- I'll be called um, I'm misrepresenting if I don't give all the history. So in in the ca- Operation Cast Lead in the aftermath of that, the United Nations fact finding mission found that 90 percent. Wait, what year of, are we talking about? Uh, when is this conflict? Can, can you? Cast Lead is 2008 2009. So we're way. Oh, okay. Ahead. No. Okay. Yeah. So is, it, it, the UN found that 90 percent of cases where civilians were killed, no militarily justifiable objective could be articulated by Israel. And in point of fact, they concluded that Israel was intentionally murdering civilians. That was the first investigation. Mm-hmm. Not, it's hard me. That was the fact-finding mission released in 2009. Mm-hmm. Now, after that, there were two, Israel said this is a blood libel, this is the worst thing ever. There are a bunch of scholars who tried to rebuke this. Um, and two years later, the chief author of the report, Goldstone, retracted this charge. He had been harassed and defamed for two years. Other jurists complained about it. And his three co-authors stood by it. So I don't know whether they deliberately murdered civilians. That's what the UN initially concluded. Three of the four co-authors say that. One withdrew it after two years of harassment. I don't know. The point is, this inference was supported by the fact that Israel was so radically indiscriminate in its attacks, in its bombings. Look, they're going to kill more people than than, than we killed in the whole Iraq war, like probably in a couple weeks. I mean, yeah, if you look at the total Iraq deaths, they're much higher, but that's mostly they were killed by insurgents, not by us. You know, so this country does not abide by Western norms of, of waging war. And, and have you seen like the po- I refer none to none of the other the countries public. around uh, Israel also abide by no, any no, of the but, standards but, of waging but, war. Not, no, but sure, agreed. It's Saudi Arabia doesn't. But like, why, no, no, no. Why do you say Saudi Arabia? No, none of them. None of them in the past did either. No, I agree with you. Okay. I agree with you. Okay. But I, I'm not disputing that. But what I object to is this characterization that Israel is some kind of Western democracy. When, we're not again, talking about Israel is a Western democracy. I don't no, think they're... That is, 
I'm not saying you're saying that. I'm saying that is a very common meme that they share our values. That's fine. Well, they probably do share our values, but they they're don't. okay. Do, do half of Americans support ethnically cleansing African Americans or, or whatever? Careful. Like, no. Careful. Hold on. I'm sorry. How was the United half? States founded? Nearly half. Nearly half. Who See, was here I'm before us? We literally zero. ethnically cleansed from. Sea. What do you think Manifest Destiny was? It was an explicit no. statement. To We're talking about cleansed. today. No. We're talking about the mm -hmm. 21st century. That's fine. That's, I, that's, no, that's no, I agree. Point. With, that's great. And that's this, a cheap point. Hold on. I Come on. I'm not talking about we didn't support that in the 19th century. I'm saying today. Sure. In the I'm, 21st sure. century. Okay, in the 21st no, no, okay. Destiny, it doesn't bother you that nearly half I can't, of the I can't, people I can't in speak. Israel. You're, you're not speaking because you know you're wrong, okay? That's why you. What? If you cut me off like that, I know I'm right. No, no, then let me finish this point without cutting me off immediately, okay? <sighs> the foundation of the United States was far more genocidal, ethnically cleansing, whatever, than the foundation of Israel, okay? Now, are there different standards hundreds of years later? Sure. Should the standard applied to Israel or the creation of Israel in 1948 be the same standard that was applied in 1776, the foundation of standards? Probably not. But I'm just saying that the question of, would we support that as Americans? I mean, our constitution declared that we were all like equally created under God and all that bullshit, and women couldn't vote and black people were slaves, okay? so totally irrelevant because I agree with everything you're saying and it's just a, a, an irrelevancy. Yeah, of course, Israel, look, frankly, like Lebanon and Jordan are have much more civilized standards than the United States did in, in the 18th century. Like in the late 18th century, you could like rape a slave and you're going to get a slap on the wrist. Like, okay. of course, Israel is much more civilized by liberal standards of morality and than the United States was at the fact but that's never been my claim my claim is today do they share sure. our values being matthew and stephen sure no absolutely okay. not okay who do you think is not support. gotcha i agree no, no let me finish this point you made your whole history thing it, which i agree with and is irrelevant but israel would americans would not support 50 percent of americans would not support ethnically cleansing and though this was all arabs this was also arab israeli so we're talking about people with citizenship right um there have been also, polls you're... suggesting that arabs arabs who are oh. who are anti um Hey, we got to do this point by point. We got to do this point by point. It can't be like you yeah. just galloping 27 so, different points. Okay? This is the second point I want to make, though. At the beginning, I said Israel does not share our values. Okay. Right? They are. The United yeah. States, you fret, you said America's want to support ethnically cleansing. I disagree with you. I think Americans would support ethnically cleansing. I think a great example of that is 9-11. That was one terrorist attack whose echoes we still feel, okay, reverberating through American society today. When Trump was elected, he pledged to ban all Muslim immigration to this country. And after 9-11, we wouldn't let people build mosques in New York City, okay? Because we were so threatened by Arabs. That was after one terrorist attack. If the United States had been terror attacked by Arab citizens for decades, I do think that the U.S. people would support ethnic cleansing. I do believe that. We can disagree there, and I can't give you a counterfactual, but I do think that would happen based on how strong a response we had to 9-11. Yeah, I, I don't I, I don't think you can find analogies after 9-11 to support for physically removing entire populations. And by the way, um, the, again, this was for ethnically cleansing all Arabs. That would include Druze and Christians. So the Israelis in this poll, nearly half of them wanted to ethnically cleanse the Arabs. We're talking about ethnically cleansing Druze and Christians as well. So that, that kind of takes Hold on. Away. I'm sorry. Real quick. You can link me a poll showing that Israelis want to yes. mass expel Christians from the, the country they of Israel? They said Arabs. It was not qualified. They said Arabs. I'll oh, send you the okay. poll right now. Sure. Well, no, no. Hold on. Arabs make Arabs sense. Includes, yes. Arabs includes Christians, Destiny. Like, I, I think my interpretation is not tendentious. It, they didn't say Muslim Arabs. They didn't say terrorist Arabs. They said Arabs. And yeah, because Israel's problem is with Arabs. Yes. Okay. But, okay. But that's my point, that that is not a value that we share. Also, like, nearly 80% want special treatment under the law for Jews. Is that a Western value? That sounds like it contradicts notions of individualism, personal rights, and so on. Um, are you asking me like today in this country? Because obviously today, if we yeah, go back today. historically. Obviously I'm not talking about <laughs> when women couldn't vote, people. when black people can vote. Like, okay. Um, that is a silly. No, oh, the idea God, that we have different standards, the idea that we have different standards for different types of people in the United States is not a value that we share with Israel. Right. But okay. Israel has this because they view it as an existential threat to their country. It's not no, an no, existential no, no. threat for us. But again, you have Christians in Israel. Why do they? Why do Jews get special treatment over Christians? I don't know. Jew I'm democracy. sorry. Do Jews get special treatment over Christians in Israel? No, they want it. They, so wait, what are you talking about? They want it. Wait, wait. So they're t you're telling the me that? Wants hold on. The you're telling me that? Okay. What kind of special treatment exactly are we talking about? 
this was a general question: should is should should the law discriminate in favor of Jews relative to other citizens? It wasn't specified. I need I need to just okay, send you on. this poll. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Discriminate field. against Jews or in favor of Jews against other citizens is different than specifically calling out Christians. Those are two different statements. No, but 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 because Christians are a significant percent of the population, by implication, it does that. So if you're saying in the United States. But, you know, we're going to discriminate in favor of whites. By implication, you're going to be discriminating against blacks. If okay. Saying, yeah, so if I, OK, I'm just curious. I don't know the answer to this, but if I Google, I send you this wait, poll. sure. If I Google the Christian population of Israel, is that higher than like the Arab population of Israel? The, the, most of the Christians in Israel are Arabs. Like there, there could be somebody who's OK. There could be then, a that's, Christian. then it has probably more to do with them being Arab than them being Christian. Okay, but why is that okay? Yeah, okay. Sh- why is well, it okay? Hold- wait, 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 you asked me a great question. I can explain. Don't ask me a rhetorical question if you don't want me to answer it. Because that question is a very obvious answer. I think that's why you don't want me to answer that question, okay? So you can keep going. We both understand you don't want me to answer it because the answer is incredibly obvious, okay? But go ahead. Answer it. Go ahead. The answer is I, because not, there's been at least you're, four you're Arab, a lot into There's been saying. at least four Arab Israeli wars where ten plus Arab countries have explicitly stated that their goal is to destroy the nation of Israel. That's probably why they're a little bit dicey about Arabs gaining a significant voting hold in their country. That's probably why. My God, you are you are really into this Israel narrative. I mean, I'm surprised. Hold on, I'm honest. sorry. Did I just say something that was factually incorrect? Yeah, you didn't. But the United States was attacked on 9/11. There wasn't a movement to. There wasn't big support to take away voting rights. Because the Arabs United States is the strongest country militarily that has ever existed in the history of all of the world, and we're surrounded by the two largest oceans on the planet defending us from all foreign attacks. Do you think that our position yeah, is the same as Israel? Israel. Israel I think before seventh October it was fairly comparable because Israel, if you looked at if you look at the amount of casualties they had had since the Yom Kippur War, uh, and especially since the Second Intifada, they were quite low. Yeah, the, and they the were casualties and they're, 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 are they're, quite they're, destiny, destiny, destiny. You have to let me finish. I'm <laughs> you're really emotional about this. I'm a little surprised. Wait, well, hold on, the, wait, 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 wait. Um, I'm not emotional. The issue that I'm having no, is that are. no, no, no. Hold on. Let me just be clear, and I'll say this. And you're going to continue to do this, okay? When people argue against me and they don't fully understand what they're talking about, they do this thing where they lay four, five, six, seven really shitty points on top of one another instead of just going point by point for a discussion, okay? If you want to have like a back and forth, we can. But you keep laying out three, four, five really shitty premises that you know that I know are really bad, and then you want to ramble <laughs> past that point. If you want to go point by point, we can. But for instance, yeah. when I declare. When I said that there were four, there have been four Arab Israeli wars where on the Arab side, I believe that over five to ten Arab countries have been involved in every single one of these conflicts with the explicit goal of destroying Israel. For your response to that, to be like, wow, you really buy into the Israeli propaganda, nothing I said there was false. So I don't know what how I'm supposed to well, engage with that it statement. Was, it, it was false. You see, you think the Yom Kippur War was about annihilating Israel, for example? Um, that's the one that I'm halfway through right now, but uh my hey, guess would be don't know that. Okay, I haven't finished the Yom Kippur War, but my you guess don't, be you don't know the Yom Kippur War. The, then forty-seven, forty-eight. Sure, that's eighty years ago. We can talk. About, that's pretty almost as far away as World War Two. We can talk about whether we should be freaked out of Germany because of eighty years the ago. The Six Day War was uh, in sixty-seven. Wait, so you're telling me that as I go through the Yom, you're telling me the aggressor was we, the, the international community at the time didn't agree. The United States didn't support Israel, so we do not agree. Hold on, that, us uh, not supporting Israel was wasn't because we didn't agree with them. It's just because we didn't have strong military presence in the Middle East. We didn't want to fuck up the balance of power. No, we absolutely, we we absolutely were skeptical of the lines they were giving us. We absolutely were. No, the United States just didn't want to escalate conflict in the in this region of the world. No, 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 no. The, the United States was deeply skeptical of, of they no, were skeptical hold on. of the Arab you're just, side. No, I'm sorry, you're side. just wrong. The Cuban Missile Crisis was in 62. Tensions were huge. There was literally, I read this stupid French word, what is it called, like detente? There was literally a period following the Cuban Missile Crisis of the United States explicitly trying to chill relations with the Soviet Union following all of this because the world was on like the brink of nuclear fucking extinction, okay? So when conflict is starting in the, in the Middle East, the United States is explicitly trying to settle things diplomatically, trying to chill things out, the Soviet Union is still shipping weapons to fucking Egypt. They were still trying to provide intelligence for it. But trying to say that, well, the U.S. didn't involve themselves means that Israel, that the U.S. knew Israel was wrong. That is an incorrect assumption based on all the facts present. Unless you have a point there where you can point to me, some U.S. diplomat, some president, somebody saying like, oh, we didn't actually think they were going to attack. Johnson was skeptical that it, uh- Johnson was skeptical that, uh, that uh, Israel was about to be attacked, and Johnson thought that if Israel is attacked, Israel will annihilate uh, the United Arab Republic, meaning the Egypt and Syria uh, military. So that's what Johnson's opinion was. Like you, you're you're with Hasbar on this and against the United States, basically. Okay, I'm, I would be curious to, to to see that to see that quote or that statement okay, or his assessment of that. Okay.
Um, <coughs> Presence conclusions. Okay, here's the first part of this. The intelligence was absolutely flat in the fact that the Israelis could wipe out the Arabs in no time at all. That's the first thing. Um, that's what Nicholas Katzenbach, the, the Secretary of State, uh, sorry, Under Secretary of State at the time, said. Okay, yes, um, here we go. So, um, again, Destiny, you, I don't know why you were so, so hardcore on this. The Secretary of State at the time, uh, Under Johnson, um, uh, wrote, so Israel said an Egyptian Syrian attack is imminent on 26 May, right? That's when Yvonne wrote with Johnson, the foreign minister of Israel. Rusk's response uh, in a memo to Johnson was that our intelligence does not confirm this Israeli estimate, right? So, uh, and the U.S. intelligence, in point of fact, characterized, as, as the other gentleman I mentioned earlier said, that the Egyptian deployments had been defensive in nature, and that Israeli Israel was inflating the estimates. Like, um, <laughs> Uh, the National Security Advisor, Walt Raustow at the time, called Israeli estimates of 100,000 Egyptian okay. troops. Okay. What, what was uh, the political year? Gambit. What was the year this, this was is, published? This is in 68. Sorry, this is, sorry, I'm talk, these are contemporaneous original sources. Okay, like, first this of all, is so, like a memo I know, and I'm asking, because the timeline on this is very important. You just said it was in 68. That's after the Six-Day War is no, concluded. No, no, sorry, so. I, I, I misspoke. It was obviously in 67. Well, you say, obviously, yeah. I don't know what's up, because I've never seen this before. Okay, so well, why not show me? Destiny. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, like here's, a, here's like a Salon article that summarizes some of this stuff. I, I'll just DM it to you. Okay. No, look, Destiny, my two main points here are that Israeli, this is, I'm not trying, you, I mean, you're just in debate mode. And I wish you wouldn't be because I don't think you're a stupid person. But, and, and we can disagree. But my two premises here, which I'm trying to argue for, are that one, Israel's policy is primarily responsible for the hatred against it, although people who commit massacres are responsible for that because that's completely unacceptable, right? Um, so that's the that's the big qualifier I have that a lot of people don't. But the second part is that Israel doesn't share our values, which I think I've articulated many reasons why that's the, the case. Who do you think? Do you think that if we compare Israel to any of the surrounding countries, no, which of those countries in that area share our values? What? 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 No, 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 they don't. They don't. No, no I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Who's the closest? They do not share about. Who's the closest no, in that region of the world? States. Between all the Arab Lebanon, Lebanon. Hold on, hold on. Lebanon, the country that's hosting Hezbollah, the terrorist militant group funded by Iran, whose explicit goal is to eradicate all Jewish people. That's the country that shares our values more. No, look, most Lebanese. Look, if you're talking about, I'm talking about the population, not Hezbollah. It, the, the situation with Hezbollah is almost like a hostage situation at this point there. They're a very powerful militia. The Christians and the um, Shia used to support them because Hezbollah fought ISIS. That's why the Christians and the Shia liked them. But now Hezbollah is widely disliked except by the Sunnis in Lebanon. Um, so like 29% of the population supports them basically. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, I, I don't like Hezbollah. I'm not condoning that, obviously. I'm talking about the the, the 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 values of the Lebanese people. So if I Maybe look for so if I look for okay, so this is current. So by the way, this is an area that I don't know as much about. Okay, I, I can only go by what I've read in news articles. I haven't studied this. But if I look now, if I look if I look up Hezbollah support in Lebanon, okay, among Shia and Christians is going to be why well, I don't care about Shia and Christians. I'm just looking up overall. No, no the majority of the people, the majority of the people, because <clears throat> most aren't Sunnis. So sorry, 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 sorry. I misspoke. I, among Sunnis and, and Christians, um, Hezbollah is very unpopular. Shia will like them. But again, the vast majority of Lebanese aren't going to like them anymore. If you look up 2006, they'll like them. If you look up during ISIS, they'll like them. But not now, no. I really don't understand this hostility. It's very strange. Like, why? Um, because I feel like people are giving very one-sided, like a historical takes on okay, all of this. What if I let, let's go point by point? What has been what we had a disagreement about the Six-Day War, and I provided evidence from well, just the from, initial from stating of like American officials about that, that disagrees with your. Hold your on, I haven't even finished reading those things. I don't even know if I agree with that yet. Um, because the other source, for instance, you provided me of that foreign minister uh, didn't seem to agree at all based on the statements that I was no, reading. It's really foreign minister did agree. Uh, you're talking about the you're talking about on the, on the you're talking about the, uh, you're talking about the same uh, day when he got that same day message. He didn't agree, uh, and he might not have at that particular point in time. 
Well, in his in his autobiography, it's it's, it's what the balance of evidence is like. It's like the Hitler balance on of religion. evidence is all is most historians agree that you got one foreign minister that agrees with you. Maybe where where do you get the claim that this is a contested, a very contested issue among historians? Where do you get the claim that most historic that there's a consensus of historians that agree that the Arabs started the Six Day War? What, what is that source to? Um, because this is a, is a contentious. The question. only part that I've seen is contentious. No. Is that the is that the uh, is that no. a preemptive strike? Wait, wait, okay. where is it? I'm going to push you on this because I think you're. I think you might be bullshitting here, to be honest. Tra where... I might be bullshitting. These are just the facts that I've read. The collection no, of facts. No, I don't no. see. I I, I, okay. You can have your take, Destiny. But, uh -huh. but what is the but one one thing you are doing to feed your, your your audience credibility on this narrative is that there is a consensus that in '67 we're not talking about the initial the War of Independence or whatever you want to call it. Uh -huh. That in '67 the Arabs were the aggressors. What is your citation for that? Because, which, which, whichever yeah. historians end up getting cited, which I think Ben Morris, uh, I think one of the guys you brought. I've said it pretty often in most of the reads I've been doing. Um, that seems to have been the like just the general consensus of everyone in the area. I can't give you a specific historian. If okay, you want to go so through a specific it, it, what? Because that's an empirical claim. That's an empirical claim. Like if I'm talking about 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 Holocaust denial. Oh, okay. Then go. On, okay. Before, then fine. I could be wrong. Give me a historian and give me a passage and we can read it. I mean, I, I, I already gave you I already gave you multiple people. No, you didn't. You gave me one statement by a foreign minister. That's not a historical analysis. It's a singular statement. I want you to give me one statement by a historian that tells you that the that the Egyptians, Nasser, okay, was not hoping to invade and destroy Israel. That that wasn't the plan of the Arab states. So I, I'll, I'll wait for you to give me one historian. I mean, but, uh, sure, Tom Sagev. Okay, give me, give me the passage. Give me the give me the passage. I'm not going to quote you a passage, chapter, and verse. I haven't read this book for a while. Okay, oh, book, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Wait, is, then give me give me the name, and I'll look it up right Israel, now. Israel, the war, and the year that transformed the Middle East. Okay, so give me the give yeah. me the name of the guy again, and I'll Google. And I'll try to find out. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of the guy? What was the name of the guy again? What was the name of the guy again? T O M S E G E V. T O M. By the way, there are not T O M Tom Segev. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here's a, here's a quotation. I found a quotation from him. There was no uh, there was no justification. There was indeed no justification for the panic that preceded the war, nor for the euphoria that took hold of it. And the other guy I mentioned to you earlier, um, uh, Michael Oren, uh, critiques uh, Segev and provides. An, even though he, he he goes through the evidence Segev provides and and disagrees with it. And also, you have you have uh, you know people like Noam Chomsky and, and Norman Finkelstein. There, are, generally speaking, there are fewer uh, historians in that write about Israel just because of not many people speak Hebrew. It's a small country, and so on. So like, there isn't dozens and dozens you can name like um, a Germany, you know, or the Holocaust or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, like you know, you have like the new historians who are the <laughs> who are these these seminal influences. That they're like what four people. I mean. But no, but but there is not a consensus among uh, among historians that the um, Six Day War was started by the Palestinians. Uh, sorry, by the Arabs. Destiny, are you there? Yeah, I'm just trying to read. I'm just I'm curious what Sega's yeah, arguments are. So, because I'm I want to read this. If it's true, I'm just trying to find uh, evidence for what you're saying. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I haven't I haven't read about the Six Day War for, for to be frank, like for oh god. Since maybe um. Since maybe my master's program. Um, I need to reread it. My like the, the the stuff I know the most about is the um, is the War of Independence, uh, the Nakba, and the aftermath, and so on. But I think I think you're in agreement it was ethnic cleansing, so it's not really much to discuss. I mean, you do agree that the absentee property law, you you emphasize the the Mizrahim who were ethnically cleansed, but and I understand that point. But you do agree that the 1950 absentee property law, where it says war refugees and people who were forcibly removed can't come back and we're taking their property without compensation, you agree that it amounts to ethnic cleansing, correct? Sure, but I'm largely uninterested right. in those claims. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what the Palestinians are interested in. You and just told you hold on. I'm sorry, hold on. You just told me that wars 50 years ago don't matter. Now you're telling me no, that claims of cleansing a hundred years ago do. Okay. No, here's why it matters because they're still stateless, and they're in Gaza and Lebanon and the West Bank and Syria and in Jordan they got citizenship. The reason it matters is because they're still stateless. They're the largest refugee community in the world. So. There's a specific reason why it matters. If if there had been a Palestinian state since 2000, if Arafat had accepted the Clinton parameters, then 
I don't think obsessing over this would be. Uh, Wait, that's be fine. But that. historically, they haven't wanted a state because having a state would mean they'd have to acknowledge the existence of Israel. But come on, so if Israel hasn't wanted two states either for the most part. Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't. Okay, the Likud party well, platform wait, wait. rejects two That's states. fine. You might say that, but historically, you can't support that it's because the what Arab are you country. About? Because it's, because if we go all the way, up, I we're not support that Israel hasn't wanted two states. The Yishuv accepted the UN partition plan, which would have been okay, two that's, states. That's Forty-seven. Okay. I'm talking about 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 2009 to now, for example. Like when Netanyahu has banned the government all but one year. Netanyahu, the Likud party platform does not favor two states. Okay. Netanyahu has said, he said in his 2014, it was either 14 or 15, I can't remember the exact year, election campaign, mm -hmm. that no two states will happen when I, as long as I'm prime minister. So for, if we're talking okay. about contemporary when times, he the says, okay, years, but when he says two states, Megan didn't want two states. Yeah, in 47, 48, you're correct. They accepted a partition plan. That is correct. When they, but, um, Golda Meir didn't want two states, for God's sake. Menachem Begin, who denied the Yassin massacre, didn't want two states. Generally speaking, there have been a couple exceptions. Generally speaking, Israeli uh, leaders have not favored two states. When they don't favor two states, why are they not favoring two states? Because they want – read the Likud platform. They they believe they have a right, um, a right to Golan, to Gaza, and to um, the West Bank, which they call Judea and Samaria, because of – the Hebrew Bible and because of like LARPing about ancient gen genetics. Like I, 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 there's two sides that are very deranged by revanchist and religious ideology here. I mean, the, okay. the meme is it's just the, the, the Palestinians, but it's well, just false. You know what? If that was all true, the Arabs would have such a moral authority to command this region, but unfortunately they forfeited I mean, no, all of the, it. They of forfeit the all of it by never giving Israel an, ex an, uh, an ability or the, um, the uh, opportunity to showcase their territorially horrible fucking expansionist desires because they've constantly been aggressing against them for literally the in since the inception of the country. Um, so it's hard for me to say like, oh yeah, like Israel definitely wants to do this when it's arguably been defensive actions and some uh, reprisal over reprisal actions for almost their entire history. It's, it's hard to it's hard to give much credence to the Arab side yeah, of the argument so, there. So here's my problem with that. I, I I view the civilian uh, settlements in the West Bank. You don't like the word war crimes because I guess it's too sensitive or something for you. It just doesn't mean but anything. It's it worthless is. here, right? It, the Geneva Conventions don't. This is a, this is not like some PC. Uh, um, it is um, some PC you know. bullshit. Yeah, because the, the do you Geneva think Geneva Conventions? Destiny, oh, do you think is, Iran? Do you think? Yeah. To. Does Iran care about war crimes? Again, my argument is not that you Iran can't even is answer good. that question. Does Iran care about war crimes? Don't. Okay. Does Hezbollah no, care about no. war crimes? No. Okay. And Historically, Hamas, Hamas, doesn't, Hamas doesn't. Does the PLO? Does the PA? No. Israel doesn't either. That's my point. Okay. And and none of the other. Yeah. So if nobody in this area cares about war crimes and it's twenty against one, I'm not gonna go to Israel. And go like you guys need to be like super one hundred percent up to date on all of your fucking shit. It's it's hard for me to levy that charge. Should they act in a more moral way? I mean, I would say probably. But damn, far be it for me to criticize them for for not living up to like the Jesus standards, right? Well, okay, so we're, we're talking about Jesus standards, and except for example, like were you? I mentioned the Gold Star report earlier. Where Israel was found ninety percent of of deadly attacks on Palestinian civilians have had no justifiable military objective. And in fact, in the in the initial report, which was withdrawn by one of the authors, not three of the four, they mm -hmm. said they were actually literally murdering civilians intentionally. Like Destiny, let's go kill that guy over there. I, ha I haven't way. read that report. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I my no. understanding so does is that, does that does, my... does that mm -hmm. uh, does that disturb you? Yeah, it's not good. My understanding is okay. there have been times historically where the UN, through third-party verification, has actually declared that the IDF have murdered civilians for no compelling military reason. And even the IDF at the time knew it. That's not good. When they do do that, that's bad. So yes. One premise. No. So I think maybe we're talking at crossroads because you seem to think I am arguing that Israel is not living up to the moral standards of Saudi Arabia or Iran. Right? I'm not arguing this. Syria has, for example, is a much worse record than Israel with Al Assad. We agree on that. That's easy, right? So that is not the argument. The argument is that Israel has sold us a meme in the West that they are they act in war, that they have attitudes as a society and values like the West, and that's a big part of why I believe people in America support Israel, and it is a fraud. But that it's not. They do. They. It's not. It's not that, Ham that Hamas mm -hmm. is better. This yeah. is not the argument. They. They. Israel more closely mirrors U.S. liberal principles or U.S. democracy than any other country in that region. Like it's not there even. There's such a radical departure from it that it's not even worth talking about who's further away. Okay. It, it's such a. I mean, this is a. That's my view. That we disagree on that. And I. I do you. Do you. Okay. Even if you. You. You make that assertion. I understand that's your position. What you just said. Mm -hmm. I believe you believe that. However, I want to press you on this. Do you think 
that the extent to which, even if you think they're number one in the Middle East, that the extent to which Israel shares our values is heavily exaggerated by pro-Israel advocates, by the Israel lobby, and by uh, sympathetic media coverage of Israel in the United States. Um, heavily exaggerated by, like, pro-Zionist factions in the United States? Almost certainly, of course, yeah. These people run around doing an ungodly amount of PR for Israel any, any way they can. So anybody that's, like, explicitly, like, pro-Zionist are these t- sorts of figures, of course. That's where Israel even came from, with these types of people running around the world, right, and building support. The whole attempting to get the Britain to sign off on the Balfour Declaration, all that shit, right? Yeah, of course, I would agree with that, yes. Okay. Okay. Well, that that's that's actually my my second main point. I mean, it isn't we can debate what I say, whether well, the when I say like all of the control. all of the media is complicit in that. I don't think so. And I think the reporting on this most recent conflict has the shown hospital. what. Mm-hmm. Sure. The hospital, the hospital, everything media? else that's being talked about. Yeah. In terms of these, well, how many statements of Israel indiscriminately bombing the Gaza Strip and blah 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 is obviously bullshit. Look, but no, no, no. I just so the hospital thing. I, I mean, it's okay if you don't follow me on Twitter. I'm a nobody, but. Um, I was one of the few pro-Palestinian accounts that when that happened, I said, we need to wait for more evidence. That's still my position, by the way, although the balance of evidence, I think, has shifted uh, toward the Israel side, right? But I never, I, I, if you think I'm so biased, I did not fall for this, right? I said, we need to wait and see. Um, So there's some- I'm just uh, saying that it seems like a a lot of mainstream media is jumping on heavily critical anti-Israeli narratives. So it's hard for me to say, so it's hard for me to say, oh yeah, all the media is super pro-Israel. Right now, I don't know if that's true. I disagree with you. Here's how I I combat that. I mean, the hospital thing, the mistake people made in that gave, didn't certainly gave them an an argument that they didn't have before. But I think it's fallacious because the hospital matter, there are two reasons I think dumb press very briefly reported this as if it were fact. The first is that they they were on a, they had a mistaken premise that the size of the crater and the damage was such that it would that if you believed that premise it was inconceivable that um, Hamas could have done it given their armaments. So I think they were simply making an inference from a mistaken premise, and that mistaken premise of fact, if believed, made it look impossible that Israel was telling the truth. So that's that's the first thing now if you're talking about the casualties the reason people are trusting the hamas uh, the, sorry the, the the ministry of health which is which hamas does have authority over there's no denying that is because they provided um accurate estimates in the past for the most part that's the reason the washington post explained this so it's there's they're not just they're not pro do you really believe that the media like these people who who murdered these people at a concert come on they don't i think the they, they media don't like them. Just, i think i think a lot of like far left c- cringe like oppressor, oppressy dynamic analysis has crept in to a lot of like the left leaning and to some extent the mainstream media. And that has become the singular point of focus that they analyze this conflict through. That Israel is the well, big I, I bad see, bullies. I, just, I have to say, I just see much, I understand people like that exist. And they're silly because like, you know, they're fair skinned Palestinians, they're Jews from the Middle East or Yemen. Or, it, it, so it's, it isn't like a serious analysis of the situation. But I agree with you that there are people who think like, the white people are the Israelis and the Palestinians are the POC, and then they, we have to support the Palestinians for that reason. I think that if you think that dynamic is where the real power lies, as opposed to like the entire consensus of Congress, other than like some the squad or whatever, and and the cancel culture, which has been directed at Palestinians, including like just people or pro-Palestinians who've just done cartoons. There was a guy fired from his journal uh, editorship for tweeting an Onion article. There's a there there are people, uh, university students, some of whom were pro-Hamas, which is terrible. They shouldn't be. They people massacred people, but there are some that weren't that were just pro Palestine that are being smeared by association. And and by the way, it is a very it is a completely coherent. It isn't just some Western LARP review. There are lots of Palestinians who don't like Hamas. There are lots of Arabs who don't like Hamas. Just look at the polling. I'm talking about the Arab world, not like some diaspora LARP. No, this is a completely coherent position to be pro Palestine and anti Hamas. Simply and and that's I based on the fact that tons of Palestinians are in the region according to contemporaneous polling. Uh, most Palestinians did not, so in Gaza even, where the population is definitely radicalized. And that would never deny that. Um, and the West Bank the, as well. I don't know why we part. only say the Gaza Strip. No, sure, they are. They okay. are. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Um, th- they didn't support breaking the ceasefire, according to, to the polling I saw from the, I don't remember the organization's name, Washington. They're really good polling. I don't know why I don't remember their name. Washington Institute or something. Yeah, that must be it for New Year's policy. Yeah, so most of them didn't oppose breaking the ceasefire. I can, yeah, yeah, I can send you this now on Discord, and you can share it with your viewers. Um, and yeah, and Hamas, unpopular with key Arab public. So it isn't. It, my point is two twofold. Uh, one, it isn't a, just a LARP position to say I'm against Hamas and 
for Palestine. A lot of Arabs agree with that in the in the Arab world. And two, two, the people who are pro-Palestine are being just indiscriminately smeared as pro-Hamas. And one, that shows poor ethics on the Israeli side of this. And two, it shows they have the power. They, the people who are advocating for Israel have the power, not people advocating for Palestinians. And that makes me skeptical of your narrative of like a biased media. I, yeah, it seems like I've already I'm said a million times that we might get fed different types of stories based on the social media we consume. But it feels like to me around the world right now, the pro-Palestinian uh supporters and marches seem to have carry way more power on social media and the and the uh, media uh proper than the pro-israeli one now what about the cancel culture though i mean what about like, the cancel there culture labor, what? there was a labor you, you think this is i'm making this up people aren't being canceled for being pro-palestine I think that there have been I think that there have been some people that have been trying to cancel people for pro-Palestinian that probably has happened, yes. But I also think that there were multiple student unions that were releasing statements in explicit support of Palestine post the Hamas attacks. That's insane. I have never in no, my life now I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Wait, wait, wait. I could be wrong, but I have not seen any school ever release a support for the IDF massacring a village of civilians. Has that happened in the last twenty years? Okay, you're talking about radicalized students who have a strange ideology that has come out of like Black Lives Matter and weird leftist stuff, which I have no sympathy for at all. Okay, and that I, narrative like, seems to be carrying very <laughs> far on social media. Okay. I, I, again, I have to, with my shitty little social media platform, uh -huh. on 7 October, I condemned Hamas. From That's great. I'm not asking about your but, condemnations. I'm saying that there are whole student unions that are releasing these statements I, that I, are... I agree. These people are weird. Okay, and there I are whole... Sta it's not, hold on, but it's not just these people. There are marches where it's like from the river to the sea, like all of these people protest. That is not an advocacy of genocide. That's silly. Wait, what That's do you mean? Not. Hold on. What do you from the river to the sea? What do you it's think a, that it's means? It's advocacy for a one state solution. What does a one state solution look like for Israel? A one state solution would look like if you look at the people who advocate this on the Palestinian side, I don't think it's viable at this point. <laughs> it's what I favored. Wait, what does a war. one state solution a look like solution for the Jewish people in be, Israel? You know, yes. I, I'm telling you what people favor. And you can say, oh, they're lying, but this is what people articulate, like Edward Said and so on. A one-state solution would not be the Jews are removed or killed. A one-state solution would be that the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, the, the Gazans are let out of their internment camp, they are given passports, Israeli passports, they can vote in elections, and, the, and uh, as can the people in the West Bank, under the condition, under the condition that no Islamic law is imposed on the Israelis, that would be part of the constitution, like Turkey's constitution says secularism, or Lebanon doesn't have Islamic law imposed on Christians. It would be a, a state where everyone has equal rights and the people are let out of their cages, right? I mean, that's what it would be. It's not going to happen because the Israelis hate them and the Palestinians hate them. So, but the the river to the sea is is a reference to one state solution. It's not genocide. And the fact I understand that you're saying that it's a, I, I understand that it's a no. It is not. It is not. I, I, I have a buddy who uh, he's a master's in history, mm -hmm. denying history. You should have on too. He does not support massacring civilians. He condemned Hamas. He, he uses this. No one is talking about Matt. You're giving the most straw man version of like, oh, no, no, no. You're, you're trying to associate. No, no, you're trying to associate all the advocacy for Palestine with. I'm saying that. I'm saying concept. that. First of all, from the river to the sea is a dual position because people that advocate for the abolition of Israel will say that as well. Number one. Okay. Number two, if you do well, want to, no, if you do want to, they do advocate for the abolition of Israel because if, if Israel is a Jewish state, so a one state solution where everyone has equal rights, where all communities have, have their law, but none is imposed on the other would be the end of Israel, but it wouldn't be ethnic cleansing or killing other people. But okay. You can say that and that's fine. All of the history of the region doesn't seem to point to that. It seems like the desire for the pan-Arab states, for all of the Arabs, Arab League, everybody to come together, seems like it's always been the expulsion of Jewish people from the Middle East. That seems to be certain. Now, maybe in the last 20 years, maybe that's changed a lot. I haven't read as much about that. And I don't see as much about that. But that has definitely been the goal historically, is the expulsion well, of all the Israeli people. The, the PLO, the, the PLO who is in, like in charge and in, in, um, corrupt group, to be sure, uh, they have a history of violent uh, resistance and terrorism against civilians and so on. Um, first of all, the history is not as brutal as we saw. On, you have to differentiate. So the the, the, um, the IRA has killed civilians, right, in Ireland. They're not as brutal as what we saw from Hamas. They've killed even kids, right? They, so they're, they've targeted civilians for the Irish national cause. So the PLO was a terrorist group, no question about it. They kill innocent people. They did not have the same level of brutality that we, we saw in this uh, 7 October. That's one thing. The second thing is... Since Wait, what do you mean they don't have the same level of brutality? What do you mean by that? They didn't massacre a bunch of civilians in a concert. 
At Hold this, on. At this the PLO scale, was or, literally or, like hijacking planes all over the fucking world. What do you mean yes, they didn't have the same yes, level? They, they were blowing up planes in front of- It's IRA. Scale matters. Scale matters. Scale, oh, so the number of people killed matter. Okay, well, the PLO just wasn't as big or it had as much power as Hamas. Probably because they weren't getting as much it's of the insane funding Hamas got from yeah, people they're, like- They're the same. I, I, this is a pedantic point. Maybe you're- maybe okay, I, I'm sorry. Would, maybe okay. I'm, you're right on this. The point is since 2005, surely you'd regard it as relevant that since 2005, uh, they have not the, the PLO as an institution has not practiced terrorists. They've collaborated with the Israeli government. They've met with the United States. Like Biden's they might, but I'm pretty guys. sure they also still have that yeah. fund going where they pay money to the families of martyrs that try to kill uh, Israeli citizens. I mean, you seem very unwilling to draw moral distinctions here. I'm sorry, like, what is the moral dis does the IDF pay You don't think there's a moral distinction between the PLO in, in the West Bank and, and Hamas? You don't think it would be better if Hamas if, if the more that uh, I learn PLO about them, the more that I learn about them, the smaller the sliver of light between the two vanishes. Okay. So initially I thought they were quite different because I've heard this propaganda point a lot. Hamas is so much different. Gaza, those Palestinians are crazy. The ones in the West Bank are super chill and cool. But the more that I learn about all these people in the history, and again, I'm not even current yet, the more that doesn't actually seem to be the case. Okay. They have not engaged in, in uh, militant activities since 2005. So I, I don't understand how there's no difference with that, but nobody, you know, why do, for instance, why is it that after Hamas was elected, why doesn't the West Bank have elections anymore? Look, the, the government is, is deeply corrupt and unpopular with the public there. I'm not condoning it. I'm saying Fatah is <laughs> is preferable to Hamas. I mean, if we can't agree on that, we're in trouble. Okay. Um, like, it's just a, it, also the level of, of commitment to Islamism. Um, like, the West Bank, for example, there isn't, uh, you know, I'm not saying homosexuality is socially tolerated, but there is, there's no law against it. Is that not preferable? to what's going on in Hama in Gaza? It, it might be slightly preferable, but it's like such a non thing that I don't think I care that much. I, like, I don't think it's a, no, I don't think it's a right. meaningful yeah. difference right now in terms of if you're an Israeli person worried about your country getting deleted, I don't know if you're like, well, I would definitely way prefer the PLO okay. or the PRA. Think, I would way prefer these people from us. I don't know if that's the case. I'm not sure. Do you think slowly pushing out, do you think that this, that in term, we're talking about the West Bank now, do you think that the civilian settlements we're not talking about military basing rights. We're talking about civilian settlements. Uh, you don't like it in violation of the Geneva Conventions. You don't think that is provide, which pu are slowly pushing out the Palestinians from their homes and land. Um, have made a two-state solution almost impossible because just if you look at the composition of communities, I've you have all said these this again, and I said it before. Oh, hold on, I've said this before. I said it again. Israel expanding settlements yeah. to the West Bank is not good. It's hurting their moral authority on any issue. I think it's hurting yeah, them. I don't it think it really also good. provokes hatred from West Bank people. Yeah, that's right. a, that's I mean, a, yeah, that's like a following what I just said. That's right. one of the reasons why you have authority because you're provoking the Palestinians. Yes. Nevertheless, they've renounced uh, they've renounced and do not practice a terrorism and other violence against Israel. They don't anymore. They did in the past, no question. Okay. Um, I don't know no how doubt. true that is or what. I haven't gotten that current, but we'll yeah, see. Yeah, look it, look it, look it up. Do you think do you really think Biden would meet with Abbas if he hadn't renounced terrorism? Of course he wouldn't. We wouldn't meet with a with somebody who's who's engaged, who's endorsed terrorism against Israel. I mean, did, weren't we sending Pence and the Secretary of State to go meet with Kim Jong Un? And weren't we? Meet, like, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm just not sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I can't speak to this. I, and and after, after all the history of me so far, I don't really trust. Like, you're just. Okay, I'm going to read this. I got to read if, this. If, if if the PLO had okay, so let me just let's see. You have, you don't you don't know this. That's fine. If since the second intifada ended in 2000. Oh yeah, Clinton literally met with Arafat. Good point. True. Okay. Right. So but, then, but, so then, but, but, so then your answer when you said, your, wait, so hold on, wait, 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 real quick, wait, wait. You just asked me the question: Would a president meet with somebody that and no. endorses terrorism, or whatever? Destiny. So the answer is historically Destiny. yes. Okay. So go ahead. Destiny. You can make the next point. Arafat denounced terrorism in '88, and the second intifada happened after the breakdown in um, in the talks in 2000. So. At that time, at the time Clinton met with Arafat, Arafat had denounced a terrorist. That's fine that he did, but you asked me, this guy might have been pro-terrorism 10 or 15 years earlier. I don't know. That might be the case. I don't know. I'm just saying I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, but the second intifada uh, uh, came after the breakdown in the Camp David talks. So it wasn't like Clinton was meeting with Arafat during the second intifada, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah. So, okay. Um, so you agree on the settlement. At least I have you on that. You don't have me on that. That's always been my position on that. Yes, I think the settlements okay. in the West Bank are bad for Israel. I think they're bad for their foreign relations. They're bad for their security. I didn't, they... so intense. I didn't, even, I didn't say I have you as if I won something. I said I have you 
we have an agreement there. Yes, we so agree there. Yes. Why do you think? Why do you think they do the civilian? Do, do you believe the lie about security, or do you think that it's? Have you watched documentaries about like what motivates these settlers? I mean, they they believe it's their land. They're not talking about we're protecting the homeland. They're talking about this is our land because of God or whatever. Oh, that's good I mean, for them. I'm more interested in like what because the issue isn't the settlers or them believing that they have God given whatever bullshit to the land. The issue is the Israeli government providing support to them. That's the thing that I think is. And more the Israeli important. government supporting them is a, is a Likud government that has in its in its longstanding program a rejection of a two state solution. Netanyahu briefly pretended to be in 4-1. Um, Obama didn't think he was genuine. And in fact, he proved he wasn't genuine because he told the public in 2014 when he was up for uh, election that I'll, it'll never happen if I'm the leader. But the Likud platform says we're entitled to the to the land uh, because of... Uh, we're entitled to this land, the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. Uh -huh. And we support civilian settlements for this reason. So I, I think at some point you have to just go with, the, with what is like the screamingly obvious conclusion, which is this is like a long-term project of taking the land or revanchism or territorial expansion or ethnic cleansing. I mean, it's just pretty obvious, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, unless, I mean, I mean, the United States never accepted, until Trump, never accepted the security rationale for the civilian settlements. I mean, I think I think that's a, a huge threat. I mean, just look at public mm -hmm. opinion there. They think mm -hmm. Judea and Samaria is theirs, right? It's a democracy. Why wouldn't they reflect, the, to some extent, the will of the Likud Knicks? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't Netanyahu support the views of the people who brought him to power? You know, is Biden going to... Uh, you know, is Biden going to defy the overwhelming position of African Americans? Maybe he will once in a blue moon, but not systematically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it, I, I really think that you're. Un I understand you disagree with it, but I think you're understanding the role of this eth illegal ethnic cleansing project in provoking the public. And um, the, the part of the reason people talk about 48, there are two reasons. First of all, is as I say, they're still refugees, the largest refugee community in the world. Um, and second of all, because the ethnic cleansing project continues uh, to this day with the, the settlements, so. Gotcha. I don't even think we disagree on that much. We just disagree on political conclusions in 67 war. Like, what do we disagree on? Tell me uh, what you think we disagree on. You well, I, mean, I, think, I, think, I think Egypt wanted to destroy Israel. I think there's enough statements okay. by Nasser. I think that it's like very, I think it's like, you know, pretty obvious. Okay, we did, that's definitely a disagreement. What, mm -hmm. we, I think we agree Israel doesn't share our values. The only disagreement is like some pedantic point about like maybe the Lebanese people do more, which I'm not even really wed to. Maybe they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we agree Israel does not share. Your position is Israel is the closest in the region, but they don't share our values. Is that correct? I think they probably would if they weren't in a sea of enemies. I think that okay, they but probably that's, that's a, high, like a counterfactual claim. But they don't as it stands right now, whatever the cause. Correct. Right now, where okay. every nation around them wants to destroy them, they don't seem to, correct? Well, every nation doesn't want to destroy them around them. Well, like they, they, they ha historically they have. Egypt and Jordan yeah, today Egypt. seem to be more chill, but yes. Egypt and Jordan do not want to destroy Israel. Correct. That's why I just said today, now, Egypt and Jordan yeah. seem to be more chill, yes. Yeah. But now, aside from those two countries, I think besides from um, Oman, no other, sure other country in the Middle East, no other countries even, I think, recognize Israel uh, as an actual state. The UAE yeah. recognizes them because of Trump's meme. Did the UAE Look, do the it? Gulf I thought it was just Oman that had done it, but no, like no, one no, of, no, the majority UAE, of them still don't, yeah. UAE does, yeah. <laughs> Look, and, so, and, and I think I think you're, you've read enough about the news, uh, just even if you haven't researched this question in detail, to, to know that the Gulf states take a very different, the Gulf Arab states, take a very different view and a less intense view of this conflict than the um, Levantine Arab states, right? So like, um, yeah, probably look, yeah. one point I'll make to you, because it's, it's, it's a fair point, is mm -hmm. I will say this, this is an important point. So like, and I know this just because of my maternal background, uh, the anti-Semitism in, in the Levant region is like extremely widespread. So this is a, I can't find a more recent poll than this. This is 2006, which is old. But nevertheless, you can see, I just sent this to you. Um, other than Israeli Arabs, so like Israeli citizens, right? Who basically everybody doesn't like Jews in the in, in the Levant and and Egypt, right? This is a problem on the Arab side. I can't. I'm not gonna whitewash. And this includes Christians too. It's like three percent of Lebanese Christians like Jews, and ninety seven percent don't like. It's like you'd never find that kind of affirmative, uh, that kind of negative response rate for anything in a poll. Maybe other than like, do you favor or oppose um, like people who eat babies alive, right? Mm -hmm. um than this yeah so you can check it so the the anti-semitism in the in the region that is a big problem and it can't be underestimated now i think that the hatred of i haven't seen data on this but like do you like the jews or whatever which is a bizarre question that was asked by pew in 2006 
that I just sent to you in Discord. But if you look at the Khalij, the Gulf, um, my very strong, and this is this is supported by news articles and so on. I wish we had polling data, but my very strong impression, anecdotally and also through policy, uh, it being exercised by guys like MBS, is that they do not have this intense emotional involvement or hatred of Israel the way Jordanians do, uh, Syrians do, um, uh, Lebanese do, Egyptians do in in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait or. Um, I mean, I'm sure they're much more sympathetic to Palestine and Israel, but I think the intensity is much lower. And that's why that, you know, that's why this policy, which I'm sure you, you've read about if you follow the news, of normalization with Saudi Arabia was quite uh, plausible, you know. I don't know if it'll happen now, but, um, you yeah. know. Well, I'm pretty sure, isn't there an objection that the Palestinian people don't want Israel to communicate directly with Saudi Arabia before settling relationships with them? Well, I mean... No, of course Palestinians don't want that, but they don't want that. They didn't want that to happen in Jordan either. And yet, the king of Jordan, you know, a dictatorship, they uh, Abdullah uh, normalized relations with Israel in the 1990s with Clinton uh, as the chief uh, moderator. You know, um, uh, so, but I, I think I think I think like if you're talking about the Gulf states, there's just less, there's less anti-Semitism. I'm not saying there isn't anti-Semitism. I'm sure it's way worse than in the United States or whatever. But like. I'm talking about like compared to Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, right? Mm -hmm. Where I think there is a lot of Jew. I mean, the data I just sent you, if you had a chance to look at it, is really striking, really. Um, but here is the one point that I find fascinating, and I think is a, and I'm turning this into back, back to our argument. So Israeli Arabs are the only population. In, so this poll, it's just shocking. I'll just read some of it. It's old 2006, but I cannot find for the life of me a newer poll that asks, do you like Jews of Arabs? But in this 2006, so the dating on it may undermine this point a bit, but nevertheless, I'll make it. Um, Egypt, 2% like Jews. Jordan, 3% like Jews. Lebanon, 2%, including 1% of Shia, 1% of Sunni, 3% of Christian like Jews. 97% don't like. So basically everybody in these countries is anti-Semitic, right? They don't like Jews. It's not about don't like Israel, it's don't like Jews. Then you go to Israel, and the vast majority of Arabs have a favorable view of Jews. Now, we're not talking about in Gaza or the West Bank, obviously. They all, they're again all negative. But Israeli Jew, Arabs, Arabs with Israeli passports and rights under the law are much less likely to be anti-Semitic. The by far the least anti-Semitic population in the region. So my inference from that is that the brutal mistreatment of the people of Gaza and the West Bank checkpoints um, massive poverty, uh, deprivation, uh, indignity is the cause of this hatred. And the, and the example is the Arabs in Israel, which are, who are mostly Palestinian, mostly like Jews. I mean, what's, they mostly like Jews. That's weird. Why are they mostly like Jews? Because they're, they they're not living in these apartheid conditions with no passport, no civil rights, nothing. Um, so that's really a, a foundation of my argument that the Israeli treatment is what causes the hatred without justifying uh, the fruits of the hatred, obviously. Okay. I mean, isn't that weird to you that, like, the least anti-Semitic population is the Israeli Arab population? I mean, these people still favor the Palestinians politically. It's not like they're, like, patriotic Israelis. They don't usually don't serve in the military, you know. But nevertheless, they haven't been mistreated in anything like that way, right? They, they have rights. No one would care. If the, if the situation were just about the Arab Israelis, you'd have human rights groups talking about it, but regular people wouldn't care, right? Because it's obviously not apartheid or anything like that for the Arab Israeli citizens. Um, they don't have nearly as much of an anti-Semitism problem, most like Jews. So... I don't know what is the... Uh, the I don't, I don't know what is the... Um, I don't know what the point we're trying to make here is. No, I'm saying that the hatred is caused by the mistreatment because you have the same people. Okay, who can you explain to me the... can you explain to me why the entire Arab world was trying to kill or pogrom Jews after every single Arab is uh yeah, Arab Israeli war? If it, if the only uh, issue I, was I, I Arabs being oppressed by Jewish people? I think that's tribalism and anti-Semitism and, and so on. And I think you have this problem today. Okay, so then what you just said about the only people that are anti-Semitic people that are being mistreated by the Jews, are that it's because they're being mistreated, that's why, that's clearly not the case then, right? There can be other causes of it. But the point is that the, the Arabs who, who were not ethnically cleansed, so that about the majority were, and then these people were forced into refugee camps or they're still in Gaza and whatever. 
the majority were ethnically cleansed. A lot weren't, right? A lot stayed and became citizens of Israel. And maybe they're discriminated against. Maybe we should talk about it. Maybe we shouldn't. Uh -huh. Maybe it doesn't matter. You know that Israel has offered not, citizenship. It, it, when Israel offers citizenship to Arabs in like territories like that, that they refuse, right? That after the Six-Day yeah, War, uh, no, the vast majority did. That after the Six Day War, um, uh, Israel offered citizenship to, I believe, everybody in East Jerusalem. You're not, you're not changing from from forty eight to sixty seven. It's not very, uh, very helpful. I mean, they, they wanted to annex the land. Clearly, hold that on. I'm sorry. It had. was con it was the exact same in forty eight and sixty seven. In forty eight, no, 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 no. they when, did not offer offer citizenship to, to to the people they kicked out, which was the majority. Well, they took their land and said, "You can't come back." That's after all of them, uh, uh, yes. Law. Well, but initially, Israel did accept. A partition plan that would have had. Uh, yeah, sure. air we agree on that. Okay, so that's a different. What? We agree on that. Yeah, that happened. Okay. The Arabs. So we did agree. Yeah, so the, Israel the, the would have lived in a state that would have been fifty-five percent Jews and forty-five percent Arab Palestinians. So they did accept that initially until everybody went to war with oh, them. But Just they gave them the majority of the land, despite being uh, like most know, of the land was the Negev the Desert. Most of it was the huge de swath of desert to the yeah. south. Whatever. If if you think that the the. Arabs were to blame for 47. That's not an insane view. I'm not saying that the just, Arabs weren't to blame. I'm just saying that Jewish people did seem willing to offer Arab Palestinians equal rights, equal citizenship, and over and over and over and over again, Arab Palestinians have rejected it. If you want me to know, if you want to know what I think the vision was, going back to guys like frickin' Herzl, it was to treat um, people who are Muslim who are living in the area with equal rights under the law. However, to get rid of as many as possible. I don't initially through legal means. That's, that's what fine. Herzl Listen, says. That, Herzl died in nineteen oh four. I don't care about Herzl, okay? He's the founder of Zionism. That's great. Ben, okay, you care about I, Ben Gurion? I, I do, yes. Ben Gurion would be somebody I cared about, yes. During the forty eight war, Ben Gurion was clearly happy to see as many go as possible. He you might say that, that but when Israel declared I don't that see You don't see what? Look, he's. They have to play with the West. They they're, they're relying on the United Nations. They couldn't just exercise a blatant ethnic cleansing. There's some real politics. Hold on. Too. When Ben, when ben Gurion, when when ben Gur first of all, there's no real politics in the '40s. Okay, um, Ben Gurion, when it's they long. what? I mean, we're of Bismarck. Like real politic existed in the 1940s for the Middle East. Yes, from 44 that, to 48. Ben Gurion's a European, essentially. That's fine, but from 44. You don't think to... Ben Gurion had any had any political savvy? They literally, one of the largest fucking terror attacks of the time was blowing up that King David Hotel to cover up crimes right. that the, yeah, so to say that, so like, the Jewish people about, weren't trying, to, the Jewish people weren't trying to win the favor of Britain at that point. They fucking hated Britain because Britain was literally limiting were, Jewish immigration uh -huh, to the area. Right, with the White Paper in 39, you're talking about. Yeah, it, so they were very, they, they committed terrorism against Britain. And yes. Very, they also committed terrorism against, like, British um, um Yeah, so naval, I'm just saying that the uh, idea that, like, Ben Gurion was trying to, like, play to the favor yeah, of the but, British, it doesn't really but, make any sense. He was a smart political actor. He, yeah, he, he had these kind of thuggish elements in the in, in the in the Yeshuv uh, militias, but he also you know knew how to play the Western uh, statesman, right? He was not a fool. Sure, I'm um, not saying that he's just because they the, just because the the, the the militias that came to form the IDF, bro, like, the rambling the is like so on, I can't they, okay. and Haganah, that they engage in terrorism doesn't mean that Ben Gurion was a, a an unsophisticated political actor. And sure. by the way, the fact, the history of terrorism by these groups, shouldn't that, I mean, you condemn the, the um, uh, PLO for their history of terrorism. I mean, uh, the groups that, that formed the IDF were engaged in terrorism. I don't know conceded. if that's 100% true. Um, what? No, no, no. The Ergon didn't engage in terrorism? Hold on. They did. That was no, one of, hold they, on. Stop. They Can, were one of the groups When that you cut formed me off, it's because you know you're wrong. You I understand didn't that? just pop out of the, okay, the sky. Okay, hold on. Stop. They, hold on. Wait. Stop. Cutting me off every single time I go to talk because you know you think it's really correct. Okay, so there were groups that formed the IDF, some of which were incredibly radical. The Irgun was one of them. Yes. Okay. My understanding is the Haganah was not one of them, and I'm pretty sure that was the one that Ben Gurion was part of. I'm pretty sure he was highly critical of the attacks, I believe, in that King David camp, and that there was a lot of disunity among the three initial uh, different forces before the IDF was formed about the use of terrorism or whatever. Yes. So some of it was aspects sure. or elements of terrorism. Sure. To say that all of them were terrorists is not necessarily true, and there were huge divides among those three different groups that went on to form the IDF or whether terrorism is acceptable. were in the PLO, as there were in the PLO, of course. Okay, that's like, fine. There were a lot of Christian secular elements in the PLO. That I don't know why we're talking about like, the PLO right now. No, I'm just saying that I think there is an analogy to be made between the 
the the the Yeshuv and the IDF, frankly, because these these are these terrorist groups form the IDF and the PLO. And I wouldn't say today there's no difference between the IDF and the and like a terrorist group. I wouldn't say that. But the, you I think would also today say there's no the, difference between the IDF and a terrorist group? Is that what you no, said? No, 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 no. I didn't say that. Oh. I said okay, I don't know what we're hold on. The, I don't even know what we're we're hopping around between like so many different points in history. I don't know what the point we're trying to make. Kind of relax, like you seem very agitated. I'm no, not. No, yeah, wait, wait. I am do, agitated. Will you, will you at least accept the possibility that I'm trying? I should let you talk more. I'll agree with that. Will you accept the possibility that I'm trying? That sure, I, I may have a bias. We all have biases. But it's I'm not about biases. You're just you're hopping around. In the scope of my bias, I'm trying to be honest and express mm -hmm. my understanding of the history and the moral issues, and you're just saying, oh, no, you're trying to interrupt to win or some rubbish. I, I just, I don't know what we're talking about when we keep hopping between like, all these different periods in history. I don't even know what the point we're trying to make is. I, I'm not even yeah. sure. Okay, I, you made a point about Ben-Gurion who doesn't do re real politic. My, I tried to my... mention how he, he navigated between like a uh, military that was comprised of a lot, substantially of, of, of former terrorist groups. Yes. And a Western statesman. Yeah, that's sure. that's that's my that's point. Real politics. My initial point was that I don't believe the early state of Israel was trying to win favor with Western nations because it seems like they essentially have been abandoned by them. So to so say that they were like playing no. like on real politic or whatever does that doesn't make sense to me because it seems like that's not correct. What was in, what in part of that is not correct? So by the abandonment, are you referring to the 39 white paper which restricted immigration and ended up being during the Holocaust? Is that, that what you're referring to? Part of it, yes. Okay. Um, that is absolutely true that the British abandoned Zionism in 1939. They imposed these restrictions on immigration. They didn't know that the Nazis were going to exterminate the Jews, of course. It doesn't happen until 41. No, I don't have no uh, idea. Hold on, wait, wait. I don't know why you're bringing up the Holocaust or any of that. I don't know what that has to do with anything. Well, it's relevant to the white paper because, look, the, the, from the Jewish perspective, the, um, the white paper prevented them from going to Palestine during the Holocaust, right? Because the British said you cannot immigrate to Palestine over, like, I don't know, was it 5,000 a year? Very small figure. And then after 45, the British said there's not going to be any immigration. Um, so obviously that led to Jewish death, because if more Jews had gone from Europe to Palestine, they wouldn't have been uh, liquidated in the gas chambers. That's my point. So I, I thought I thought that was what you were alluding to when you said Europe abandoned the yes, Jews. It, yes. And then when they left after the mandate, they just said whatever. Yes. Okay. Well, but... That's not quite true, though. So first of all, the 39 break break was a change in British policy. But, but prior to that, uh, starting with the Force of Balfour Declaration, the British had been very supportive of Zionism and an essential patronage of it because they, they facilitated and allowed the immigration. Moreover, American and Soviet lobbying was key to the acceptance of the partition plan in 47. So no, they, they've always been... Um, got more, you may have read, and that's correct, that the relation with the United States became much closer after 67. That is correct. But nevertheless, Israel always was reliant on uh, Western. Um, After 1940, Israel. what did the British or the West do to help Israel? Uh, again, in 47, the United States and the Soviet Union, they're not really the West Soviet Union, but they aggressively lobbied other nations to vote for the partition plan. And, and, and the partition plan important. was rejected. So nothing came from that. Right, but, it, but it gave their state legal legitimacy. No, it didn't. It, it gave their state legal legitimacy. No, yes, it, it didn't. Did. It didn't. How did it not? Because they, I mean, it, because the only way they got legitimacy was through war. You think they just the, declared independence and they magically had a state because of a partition plan that nobody agreed to? That the, that the Arabs there didn't agree to? Absolutely. You, you don't think the partition plan triggered the war? No. Israel was saying, we, are, we have a state on the basis of this partition plan. Okay, I totally disagree. But okay. that was the, that was their that was a core foundation. For, now they had ideological. I'm sure they si I'm sure they cited to it. Yeah, but are you telling me that if no partition plan was there, you don't think they would have tried to fight for independence in that land? I think that seems quite plausible. They would have, but the but I think the partition plan was the proximate cause, and it gave them legitimacy. Yes, I mean they need it. Look, they're a small country. They need international recognition. But they had no international support. What does the recognition matter without right. any support? In the, in the war, they did. Well, they didn't have military support, but they had political support. What does political support matter with no military support if it's a war? Look, if you want to be a nation, you need to be recognized. You need to have trade. You need to have um, relations, foreign relations. You can't just be LARPing and say, oh, here's our country, and no one recognizes you. But um, that was essentially what so, was happening. There Wasn't there literally embargoes on, like, delivering arms to that area? I'm pretty sure the only sure, way Israel sure. got weapons in that area was, like, covert flights from Czechoslovakia. They weren't okay, even supposed I, to have weapons I, I, really, down there. I really don't think, look, I really don't think that this is, um, uh, 
uh, do you is your view really that that vote did not confer legitimacy to the state of Israel? No, that I think important? it was the, I think it was them fighting that conferred legitimacy to them. The recognition okay. doesn't mean anything. Here's the question. Okay, wait, I, we, we can solve it super easily. Let's say that they would have lost the war in 48. Do you think Britain or the United States would have stepped in to ensure their uh, having territory there? Look, um, the United States recognized Israel during the war. Are you going to answer that question right. or not at all? I I don't think the United States, look, I don't believe in this Jewish conspiracy. Or I'm anything. asking if, if you're going to answer, are you going to answer that question or? No, I, 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 I come on. Destiny, you're, you're really in like this mode where I'm an adversary. I don't think we because you're not answering because you're not engaging with anything I'm saying. You're just like rambling a random shit. You're I, you're telling me that in '48 the political support for them was incredibly important. I feel like with the embargo, yeah, yeah, with the embargo, with the restriction of Jewish immigration, I feel like the political support probably wasn't didn't matter that much because if they would have the lost, restriction of Jewish immigration was abolished. Sure, it, well, eventually, but when they lost the war. I'm sorry. If they lost the war, I'm asking if you think this is a counterfactual. It seems it seems plausible that they, if had they lost the war, there would be some uh, new uh, some new partition plan that was more favorable to Arabs in '47, or that Israel wouldn't have been to say, I don't know. It's, it didn't happen. Uh, nevertheless, it seems very unlikely to me that the partition plan had no <laughs> had didn't benefit Israel. It just seems silly. I mean, like, look. You keep saying those words. It seems silly, but you're giving me zero evidence to. Why do you think? Why do you think? Okay, but why do you think so many countries recognize Israel, like like officially recognize the state of Israel shortly after the uh, partition plan, right? I don't years. know if they. Is it nothing to do with it? Hold on, okay, because I don't remember. United States. I don't remember. Did they recognize Israel? Israel declared independence. Can I hold on? But they declared you're independence. not letting me finish because you know you're wrong. So I so actually now I'm just going to assume I'm correct. Oh God, I was going to ask you just... the I was going to ask you the question, but now I'm probably right. Did they recognize them after the partition plan, or was it after they declared independence? Sounds like it was probably they declared independence. There you go. They, they de okay. They there you go. So then it wasn't the partition plan; it was them declaring independence. So bro, you're okay, bro, bro, yeah. bro, okay. bro, bro, yeah, bro, bro. Okay. They declared independence along the lines established by the partition plan. So, so the declaration of independence was a response to the partition plan. No, that's not true. No. Hold on, why do you think that? Because they cited the partition plan. Wh as where their do you think the where do you think the borders for the partition plan came from? Okay, wh what are we talking about now? The I, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll tell you. The partition the plan the partition was plan, before the declaration. The partition, the partition plan borders were drawn up around the areas that had all of the Jewish majority people living there. So, of course, when they declare independence, these are going to be the borders that they're going to try to defend. It's not because the partition plan said it. The partition plan said it because that's where the Jews were. So, of course, when they declare independence, those are the territories they're going to fight for, obviously. Yeah, okay. Um, here's an example of, of how the partition plan informed the... Um, uh, the Declaration of Independence. So they were trying to figure out what, what, what are you going to call our new state, right? That was one thing they were trying to figure out, okay? And one of the big candidates was Judea and another was Zion. And Israel decided not to call themselves Judea or Zion because according to the partition plan, um, uh, the territory of Zion, namely Jerusalem, as well as uh, most of the Judean mountains were outside of uh, of, of what was lodged them by the UN. So they were very scrupulously abiding to the partition plan in their Declaration of Independence because they realized that abiding by the partition plan was important for their legitimacy and for their prospect of being recognized. They definitely wanted to expand further, but they weren't going to do it uh, con uh, consummate with the Declaration of Independence. I just, like, I'm getting frustrated here because I don't understand why you think I'm arguing bad faith when these are totally reasonable arguments. But, I, yeah. I mean, I can't. I can't present another argument because you told me we can't even consider a counterfactual. So, I, I mean, I think it's. Pretty, no, I think no, it's really no, obvious did, that. Did, if, that, did what I said make? Did the fact that in terms of the literal name of the state, they're like, gosh, we can't use a name that implies we're not going to respect the partition plan. That doesn't show. They're a level not respect of the partition plan is already gone. The partition plan was not agreed to, so it doesn't matter. The Arab oh, states rejected the partition plan. I don't know what like past their 46, declaration of independence is carefully tailored to conform to the borders of the partition plan. They, they, the point is not that they want to follow it. The point is that they, they recognize their legitimacy internationally comes from it. I don't disagree that the borders were similar. But that's because the borders were drawn where all of the Jewish no, populations that's already that's were. That's the partition that's plan that's was not just randomly drawing lines. They were going to take, no, 
yeah, I get that. They were going to take more territory. They're going to win the war and take more territory. They knew that. Nevertheless, they didn't want to be explicit about that in their Declaration of Independence because they got their international legitimacy from this partition plan. Recognize too, this was like the heyday of the UN. Nowadays, the UN does a revolution. We okay, plan. so so you're telling so then World War II. sure. So you agree? So then you're World saying you're saying well, don't talk about it. don't jump so far ahead. You're telling me okay that if the partition plan didn't exist when Mandate Palestine ended and the British left, that the Jews would have just been like ah fuck us and they would have just like been absorbed into some larger Palestinian nation. Do you think that would have happened? That could have happened. That was the plan under the White Paper. The White Paper thirty nine. I'm not asking you about. I'm asking you what do you think would have happened. You, you think that... It's a counterfactual question, I think. Okay, so hold on. So Israel, well, not Israel, but the pre-Israel that already had the issue, they already had their government, they already had their three fighting forces, okay? And they already had their, uh, all of their, like, encampments. It's so funny that you call them fighting forces, but the PLO are terrorists, but go ahead. Um, no, they, some of them, the pre this engaged in terrorism. I'm not denying that. Um, the, um, you think that the, you think that, these people would have disbanded everything and just been absorbed into some uh, proper, larger Palestinian nation. I think they definitely wanted a nation of their own. Um, whether they would have been able to achieve that is a question. That and I you think, think really whether they achieved it or not came down to that 47 partition they plan? Needed, they knew they needed international legitimacy. They knew they needed that. Um, I mean, why don't you think they declared? So you don't think the coincidence of, well, okay, you're, you're saying it's a product of, look, my view is that the, uh, here's my view. The war, the Israel's legitimacy, the notion of Israel being a legitimate state causes the war, and Israel recognizing, Israel claiming statehood causes the war, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first part of it. The second, but what causes that? That It's a 47 partition plan. That's the proximate cause, right? I disagree on that, um, but I guess. I okay, know. we disagree on that, but I, I don't really understand the, the intensity because it doesn't, I don't think I'm making like crazier uh, false assertions. I mean, the, the Declaration of Independence uh, clearly is tailored to conform with the um, uh, partition plan. And it's not that they're going to follow it, but they want to act like they're following it so they can get uh, recognition. I mean, they're going to take, they're going to win the war and take more territory. That's what nations have done in history, right? It's not saying they're uniquely evil for doing that. But nevertheless, they knew that they needed international legitimacy. And to do that, they needed to, they were going in line with the UN. Also, the UN, as I was saying before, we kind of see UN resolutions as a joke nowadays. Which is kind of sad when you think about it, but that is the situation. Right after World War II, there were much more um, puffed up ideas about the United Nations, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I think I think the partition plan is very important for uh, for the Declaration of Independence, and of course for the war, which you don't you don't disagree with the Arab rejection caused the war. So, you know. Okay. Uh, well, anything else? No, oh, I think I think those are the two. Again, I, I, the funny thing is, like you're you're like, oh, you're bullshitting all this. I think we actually agree. We we disagree with the moral and political implications to draw from this. But I think, with the exception of the Six Day War, we basically agree with what's going on. Again, my main points have been, um, uh, one, uh, this this history and ongoing practice of ethnic cleansing. I don't think you disagree with it. You you emphasize the ethnic cleansing of the Jews, which is totally legitimate on the Mizrahim side. I've I've my response to that was that it doesn't matter as much because they have a home that the Palestinians for the most part don't. Um, I think you agreed Israel doesn't share our values despite some quibbling on the margins. You agree on the settlements. Um, I, I don't know actually if you agreed that this you agree the settlements are bad, but I I, I don't know if you agreed that they amount to, they're part of a project to take the land i think you did but i'm not sure is that what you agreed on or no i i'm not even sure at this point which okay, what are sure. we talking about no 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 like I'm settlements now i don't i'm not sure i don't civilian mm -hmm. settlements yeah probably not good yeah okay so what do you think before we wrap what do you think we disagree on what is what is so awful about me because you seem pretty exasperated in this conversation uh i just just the inconsistent arguments the jumping around from year to year the different like standards of evaluating like what the intentions of people were what was going on and, like none of it just makes sense to me i guess yeah, i'm not sure all right well take care do you think I, well, i'm just curious like like just one question we don't have to go back for this for a minute. do you think that initially do you think that um do you think that israel would have lived in peace with the arab palestinians on their land if everybody would have agreed to that territory initially, do you think they would have, or do you think they would have expelled them well, anyway? So, one state, so like, if the Yeshuv's position had been, we will accept a one-state solution 
provided that we're not don't have like Islamic law imposed on us. If that had been the position, would they have lived in peace? I didn't talk about. I said that when Israel declared independence, okay, if everybody around the area would have just been like, okay, fine, that's your territory, fuck it, chill. Do you think that they would have been okay with all the Arab Palestinians living on their land, or do you think they would have expelled them anyway? It's a really difficult question. I, I don't know, actually. I mean, they wanted them to leave in '48. We know that. I don't. Okay. I don't so agree with if I say so, if I say that, like, if they because you keep saying over and over again that in the Declaration of Independence they call out the um, that that UN mm -hmm. uh, partition, mm -hmm. right? They also explicitly because, say they also yeah. explicitly say in their Declaration of Independence that they want the Arabs to stay and to work and build a country with them. So you believe one thing but not the other? Can you tell me why you believe one and not the other? Well, this, or? Is, this is all counterfactual, so it's, it just is interesting. It's not counterfactual. Hold on. No, I no, 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 no. Wait. I, I, the counterfactual doesn't make, mean anything here, okay? I'm just – because you're citing – you said that because something was said in the Declaration of Independence, it must be true, mm -hmm. right? Which is they – at the end of giving their, like, natural and historic right to the land, they also reference that resolution. They also say explicitly in their Declaration of Independence that they are inviting Palestinians to stay there and build a country with them. So do you believe one and not the other or – I don't believe, I, I think that the idea of conformity, okay, this is, I understand the question now. No, I don't think they ever intended, they, when they when the Declaration of Independence was written, they definitely didn't intend to conform to the 47 partition plan. They were merely invoking it because that was the source of their legitimacy in the United States and so on. Like they needed that legitimacy and so they, and the UN had a lot of legitimacy back then. So they, uh, they, they, they imply that they're going to um, abide by the partition plan, the UN resolution. When in fact I'm asking if you think they would have been okay no, with no. all of the Arab Palestinians living in their country. I think they would have been okay with what happened, which is a minority in a, with a large Jewish majority. Well, the uh, wasn't the majority of the original partition plan like 55% Jews, 45% uh, yeah. Arabs? Yeah. So that was that's right. not a large majority. That's. Well, I mean, look, sometimes you have to take half a loaf to get a, uh, if you can't get a full loaf. I think they'd rather have had that than no state, because remember, the policy in 39 was no state, right? So they accepted it. So you think that if everybody would have accepted the territory there, do you think that the Jewish people in their newly formed state of Israel, would they have lived in peace with the Arab Palestinians there, or do you think they would have still tried to expel them? I think they wouldn't have tried to expel them like the way it happened through like ethnic cleansing. I think they would have continued to do what they had been doing, which is buying within the realm of property rights, buying land and uh, expelling people uh, through that means. And I think they would have tried to give people money um, or incentives to leave uh, short. I don't think they actually would have carried out what we would call ethnic cleansing, which is what happened. But I think they would have um, I think they would have tried to incentivize Arabs to leave. Definitely. I think that there would have been an Arab majority, a minority there that stayed as we have today. But I think they would have tried to incentivize the Arabs to leave because they wanted a, a robust Jewish majority in their in their state. But they were willing to have a Arab minority. So that's yeah, that's 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 what I my best guess is. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Well, anything else, sir? I think I'm good. All right. Thanks for the right, thank you for having screaming me on. match. Fun to argue with people. Uh, I do appreciate you coming on. It's been fun. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hope we can do it again. Bye bye. All right. Have fun. Bye. I think when I do, um, okay, when I, after I finish, I'm running out of days. I don't have the time. I think after I do all of my um, reading, I'm gonna, we're gonna have like strict rules for um, conversations. The like hopping around to so many different things and not just like settling a single point before moving on drives me fucking insane. Oh, okay. Um, Jesus. With more structure, yeah. Introducing a path for, oh, I'm just trying to find this speech. I'd be curious. Um, uh, this speech that Nasir gave uh, before the Six Day War, I wish I could find this full speech. In a speech to Arab trade unionists on May 26, Nasser announced if Israel embarks on an aggression against Syria and Egypt, the battle will be a general one and our basic objective will be to destroy Israel. I wish I could find the this whole speech. It would be interesting. But um, 
Nasser said, we knew that closing the Gulf of uh, Aqaba meant war. The objective will be Israel's destruction. There's like a dot, dot, dot here though. So like what's being said in between? I wonder if the phrase here is being changed. I just, I wish I had access to that full speech. The Six-Day War thing is interesting. In my independent research, I've stumbled upon the minority opinion with historians that Israel was the instigator. I mean, it depends on whether you consider the closure of that strait to be instigation or not. I feel like most people internationally agree that closing access to waterways is, is almost like a cause for war, um, that people will go to war over stuff like that. But, and it seemed like Israel knew they were going to go to war over it. They had already had one war over it. So, I mean, like, it seems like they knew it was happening, but, yeah. <sighs> Go to this and skip to rejected Egyptian. The rejected Egyptian plan to attack Israel on May 27th. Egyptian film formed the plan for initiating an attack on Israel in late May. It was rejected by Nasser, who felt that, that despite the rising tensions, Egypt should not attack Israel unless, Egypt attack, unless Israel attacked first. Nasser's awareness of the plan prior to its resignation, a rejection of it, is debated by other historians. Oren states that Amir told one of his generals, the time will be the ones, this time we will be the ones to start the war. This was counter to Nasser's strategy of pushing Israel to start the war. Oren states the Egyptian source are divided over why Nasser did not veto Amir's plan. Oren suggests that Nasser was apprised of the plan but lacked the political strength to override Amir's order. Also, the preparation of an Egyptian invasion of Israel had certain advantages to Nasser. Um, what do you think he meant when he said it's a contentious issue? When you said there seemed to be consensus? Um, I believe that it's it's consensus that like Egypt closed the straits. Egypt wanted to eliminate Israel. Um, I don't think any of these is debated. The contentious issue will be whether or not like a preemptive attack is like ever okay. That's going to be the contentious issue, not over whether or not Egypt was like clearly trying to provoke war. Or if there is debate over that, I just haven't stumbled into those historians. I haven't seen that yet. Uh, link to the full speech here. Oh. Did you see the UN article on the 90% number that he kept citing? Uh, I have not. What you call love was invented by guys like me. Let's see. You're providing, okay, so this is a speech that he's giving, right? Later, the, Yenem, the Yemeni revolution broke out. We considered it our duty to rescue our brothers simply because of the principles and ideals which we advocated and still advocate. We were waiting for the day when we would be fully prepared and confident of being able to adopt strong measures if we were to enter the battle with Israel. I say nothing aimlessly. One day, two years ago, I stood up to say that we had no plan to liberate Palestine and that revolutionary action was our only course to liberate Palestine. I spoke at the summit conferences. The summit conferences were meant to prepare the Arab states to defend themselves. Recently, we felt we are strong enough that if we were to, if we were to enter a battle with Israel, with God's help, we could triumph. On this basis, we decided to take actual steps. A great deal has been said in the past about the UN emergency force. Many people blamed us for the UNEF's presence. We were not strong enough. Should we have listened to them or rather built and trained our army while the UNEF still existed? I said once that we could tell the UNEF to leave within half an hour. Once we were fully prepared, we could ask UNEF to leave, and this is what actually happened. The same thing happened with regard to Sharm el-Sheikh, 
we were attacked on this score by some Arabs taking Sharm El Sheikh meant confrontation with Israel. Taking such action also meant that we were ready to enter a general war with Israel. It was not a separate operation. Therefore, we had to take this fact into consideration when moving to Sharm El Sheikh. The present operation was mounted on this basis. Actually, I was authorized by the Arab Socialist Union Supreme Executive Committee to implement this plan at the right time. The right time came when Syria was threatened with aggression. We sent reconnaissance aircraft over Israel. Not a single brigade was stationed opposite us to the Israeli side of the border. All Israeli brig brigades were confronting Syria. All but four brigades have now moved south to confront Egypt. Those four are still on the border with Syria. We are confident that once we have entered the battle of triumph, God willing. With regard to military plans, there is complete coordination of military action between us and Syria. We will operate as one army fighting a single battle for the sake of a common objective, the objective of the Arab nation. The problem today is not just Israel, but also those behind it. If Israel embarks on an aggression against Syria or Egypt, the battle against Israel will be a general one and not confined to one spot on the Syrian or Egyptian borders. The battle will be a general one and our basic objective will be to destroy Israel. I probably could not have said such things five or even three years ago. If I had said such things and had been unable to carry them out, my words would have been empty and worthless. Today, some 11 years after 1956, I say such things because I am confident. I know that we have here in Egypt and what Syria has. I know what we have here in Egypt and what Syria has. I also know that other states, Iraq, for instance, has sent its troops to Syria. Algeria will send troops. Kuwait will send troops. They will send armored and infantry units. This is Arab power. This is the true resurrection of the Arab nation, which at one time was probably in despair. Today, people must know the reality of the Arab world. What is Israel? Israel today is the United States. The United States is the chief defender of Israel. As for Britain, I consider it America's lackey. Britain does not have an independent policy. Wilson always follows Johnson's steps and says what he wants him to say. All Western countries take Israel's view. The Gulf of Aqaba was a closed waterway prior to 1956. We used to search British, US, French, and other ships. Um, after the tripartite aggression, as we all know, is the tripartite plot. We left the area to UNEF, which came here under a UN resolution to make possible the withdrawal of Britain, France, and Israel. The Israelis say they opened the maritime route. I say they told lies and believe their own lives. lies. We withdrew because the British and French attacked us. The battle was never between us and Israel alone. I have recently been with the armed forces. All the armed forces are ready for a battle face to face between the Arabs and Israel. Those behind Israel are also welcome. We must know and learn a big lesson today. We must actually see that in its hypocrisy and in its talks with the Arabs, the United States sides with Israel 100% and is partial in favor of Israel. Why is Britain biased towards Israel? The West is on Israel's side. General de Gaulle's personality caused him to remain impartial on this question and not to toe the US or the British line. France, therefore, did not take sides with Israel. The Soviet Union's attitude was great and splendid. It supported the Arabs and the Arab nation. It went to the extent of stating that together with the Arabs and the Arab nation, it would not resist any interference or aggression. Um, the question is not one of international law. Why all this uproar because of the closure of the Gulf of Aqaba? When Eshkol and uh, Eshkol was the prime minister of Israel and Rabin I think this is their general, like, um, military leader guy, threatened Syria. Nobody spoke about peace or threats to, peace, uh, threats to peace. What was the threat to Syria here? What are they referencing here? Does anybody know? Whether true or not, I'm just curious about the... Rabin was the assassinated prime minister? Yeah, but that came later, I think, didn't it? Soviet intel that Israel was massing near Syria. Oh, was that the, just the bad Soviet intel? Really, was it? This speech was given on the 26th of May, so. The United States, Britain, in reaction, which is the friend of, uh, do not favor the national progressive regime in Syria. Israel, of course, shares their feelings. Israel and all the United States and Britain. We shall not relinquish our rights. We shall not concede our rights to the Gulf of Aqaba. Today, the people of Egypt, the Syrian army, and the Egyptian army comprise one front. 
We want the entire front surrounding Israel to become one front. We want this. Naturally, there are obstacles at present, of course. Wasfi Al-Tal is a spy for the Americans and the British. We cannot cooperate with these spies in any form because the battle is one of destiny and spies have no place on this battle. We want the front to become one united front around Israel. We will not relinquish the rights of the people of Palestine, as I've said before. I was told at the time that I might have to wait 70 years. During the Crusaders' occupation, the Arabs waited 70 years before a suitable opportunity arose and they drove away the Crusaders. Some people commented that Abdur Nasser said we should shelve the Palestinian question for 70 years, but I say that as a people with an ancient civilization, as an Arab people, we are determined that the Palestine question will not be liquidated or forgotten. The whole question, then, is the proper time to achieve our aims. We are preparing ourselves constantly. We are the hope of the Arab nation and its vanguard. As workers, you are actually building the Arab nation. The quicker we build, the quicker we will be able to achieve our aim. I thank you for your visit and wish you every success. Please convey my greetings and best wishes to the Arab workers in every country. I don't know, man. You seem pretty... He kept saying that in a one-state solution, Jews wouldn't be targeted and they wouldn't be under Islamic law, but also pointed out that Levantine Arabs absolutely hate Jews, which is it kind of, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. What are these targeted ads? Bro, listen, I just wanna go scuba diving, okay? The reality is that um, if you want to goon successfully, if you want to goon so much that you can levitate, you have to cut off the flow of oxygen to your body. And I find that it's easy to, easiest to do this with scuba-related gear, okay? You fill up a tank, put half the oxygen necessary, and then you use that as your breathing apparatus, and then you begin gooning, and soon you'll have powers you never knew, okay? Here's the new poll he cites on 50% Israeli supporting expulsion of Arabs, control F status of Arabs. Wait, hold on. <sighs> Views of the Jewish state in the diaspora. What did you tell me to control F? Status of Arabs. Jewish public opinion is divided on the status of Arabs. Jewish public opinion divided on the status of Arabs in Israel. Nearly half of Israeli Jews say Arabs should be expelled. <clears throat> oh. Isn't that edging? The, um... Don't ever compare gooning to edging. Comparing gooning to edging is like saying people that, uh, is like saying people that climb in parks are the same as people that climb Mount Everest, okay? It's not even, it's not even remotely the same thing, okay? It's not even close, okay? Gooning's on another level, all right? People that edged wish they could goon. Okay. Nearly half of Israeli Jews say Arabs should be expelled. Percentage of Israeli Jews who agree to the statement, Arabs should be expelled or transferred from uh, transferred from Israel. 48% seem to agree. 46% seem to disagree. Okay. 
some big differences in discrimination between like the Dati and the Hiloni. These are different types of, I don't know if these are ethnic things or religious divides, I have no idea. Damn, 53, or do a large number of Jewish people speak Russian at home? Oh, I think it's Yiddish related to Russian. Dati equals religious, Hiloni equals secular. Ah, uh, makes sense, okay. Mm. Yiddish is German. Oh, okay, never mind. Dati used scuba gear. Hiloni used gimp masks. Look at the other way. Palestinians on Israel. Why don't you let me the actual article instead of like a fucking screenshot? The majority support no end to the conflict. At the same time, popularity shifts some crucial long-term questions are similarly out of sync with official PA positions. Majorities in Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem increasingly say that a two-state solution should not mean the end of the conflict with Israel. Rather, around 60% would opt to continue the struggle to liberate all of historic Palestine. Reinforcing this point, around the same proportion now, also say that any compromise with Israel should only be temporary. From 2014 to 2020? I don't know what all of historic Palestine is liberated means. Does that mean, like, not even a one-state solution, but just, like, an Arab state? Palestinian leadership is able to negotiate a two-state solution with Israel. Do you think that this should be the end of the conflict or that resistance should continue until all of historic Palestine is liberated? Resistance should continue. I wonder what that means. But <sighs> boom, 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 boom. Okay. We got so sidetracked on that debate. And I have to do fucking kick or keep. Fuck me, dude. This is the country that shares our values more than Israel, by the way. LGBT rights in Lebanon. No protections against LGBT discrimination. No protections against housing discrimination. No adoption for married gay couples. Militaries don't ask, don't tell. Donating blood from gay people is banned. Gay marriage is unrecognized. Conversion therapy is not banned. Public opinion, the justifiability of homosexuality. They're ranked 71 out of 88 regions. Jesus. Eighty percent of people in Lebanon support Hamas. Yeah, I don't I don't know why you brought up Lebanon. I don't know. Yeah, like even with my limited knowledge of Lebanon. That, that seems like a wild comparison. Whatever. Whatever. Don't know, don't care. Okay. Okay. Hmm. You should check out this book with information. What is the LGBTQ record of Israel? I don't know, let's check. It does Israel um, recognize gay marriage. Same-sex marriage is not legal in Israel either. The Israeli government has registered same-sex marriage is performed abroad since 2006. However, prior to 20, July 2022, marriages performed in Israel were only available from one of the 15 religious marriage courts. 
none of which permit same-sex marriage under their respective auspices. What is this? In July 2022, the Central District Court ruled that marriages performed under an online civil marriage service established by the U.S. state of Utah are legal in Israel, thereby no longer requiring couples previously unable to marry in Israel to leave the country. So if you're gay in Israel and you want to get married, if you get married by the state of Utah from Israel, it's... Okay. Interesting. Oh, this was the other site. Okay, sorry. Marriage is pretty much the only thing they're missing because of religious definitions of marriage, but they have everything else. Oh, do they? <sighs> Support of same-sex marriage is only 36%. Should society accept homosexuality is 47 to 45? Support for same-sex marriage. Perception of, it's perception. Perceptions of local areas is a good place for gay people is only 38%. But they can join the military. It's illegal to discriminate against them. They're allowed to adopt. That's kind of surprising. They can get they can adopt but not get married. The gay marriage is recognized. The state just doesn't sponsor the marriage itself for religious reasons. I wonder what rights you get in Israel if you're married. If that's like significantly different than anything else, yeah. LGBT Kaaba soon. Oh, hold up. Saudi Arabia says it welcomes LGBTQ visitors. Could you imagine if they had like uh, rainbow lights on the Kaaba cube? Bro. <laughs> that shit cray. We haven't made much progress here. Okay, I'm just gonna start reading more. Jesus. Oh, this was the one thing we were looking at. The Egyptians dispute the Israeli account of this battle, but they never did provide their own version of what happened. <laughs> and then the Egypt and then Anwar Sadat's Sad Sadat's half brother got killed in this battle too. This is unbelievable. Um Egypt launched this massive surprise attack on Israel that included over 200 Egyptian aircraft participating in an opening airstrike. The Israeli Air Force base Afir, Afir at Sharm El Sheikh came under attack by 20 Egyptian Air Force MiG-17s and their eight MiG-21 escorts. Not realizing the extent of the attack, Israel quickly scrambled two F-4E Phantom II fighter jets. The Israeli pilots proceeded to jettison their external field tanks and engage all 28 MiGs in aerial combat. In just under six minutes, seven Egyptian MiGs had been shot down, and then the re remaining Egyptian planes disengaged and returned to Egypt. I don't know. <laughs> Egypt, what are you doing? Um, let's see. Simultaneously, 14 Egyptians, uh, two, two Polov 216 bombers attacked Israel targets in the Sinai with Kelt missiles, while another two Egyptians. What the fuck is this shit? Okay. Can you expound on your warrior gene take yesterday versus Philly? No. Okay. Attacked Israeli targets on the Sinai with Kelt missiles. Another two Egyptian Topolev, uh, Topolevs fired two Kelt missiles at a radar station in central Israel. One missile was shot down by a patrolling Israeli Mirage fighter, and the second fell into the sea. You could shoot down missiles? The attack was an attempt to warn Israel that Egypt could retaliate if it bombed targets deep within Egyptian territory. Destiny skipped a critical point from the Egyptian side that led them to blocking the Suez Canal. We're really going back here. 
The Levant Affair was a failed Israeli covert operation, codenamed Operation Sasuna, conducted in Egypt in the summer of 1954. As part of a false flag operation, a group of Egyptian Jews were recruited by Israeli military intelligence to plant bombs inside Egyptian, American, and British-owned civilian targets, cinemas, libraries, and American educational centers. The bombs were timed to detonate seven, several hours after closing time. The attacks would be blamed on the Muslim Brotherhood, Egyptian communists, unspecified malcontents, or local nationalists with the aim of creating a climate of sufficient violence and instability to induce the British government to retain its occupying troops in Egypt's Suez Canal zone. The operation caused no casualties among the population, but a lot of the deaths of four, of four operatives. Two cell members who committed suicide after being captured, and two um, operatives who were tried, convicted, and executed by the Egyptian authorities. The operation ultimately became known as the Levon Affair after the Israeli Defense Minister um, Pinhas Levon, Levon was forced to resign as a consequence of the incident. Before Levon's resignation, the incident had been euphemistically referred to in Israel as the unfortunate affair or the bad business. Israel publicly denied any involvement in the incident until 2005, when the surviving uh, agents were awarded certificates of appreciation by Israeli President Moshe Katsav. There you go. Under cover of the initial artillery barrage, the Egyptian assault force of 32,000 infantry began crossing the canal in 12 waves at five separate crossing areas from 1405 to 1730. You, I'm not reading a whole fucking paper too. Please stop. Holy shit. I don't have time to read about every single conflict, every single massacre, every single paper, every single thing. I'm just, I'm still like 50 years behind. Jesus. Okay. All right. Um... The Egyptians prevented Israeli force from reinforcing the Bar Lev line and proceeded to attack the Israeli fortifications. Meanwhile, engineers crossed over to breach the sand wall. The Israeli Air Force conducted air interdiction operations to try to prevent the bridges from being erected, but took losses from Egyptian SAM uh, batteries. The air attacks were effective, were ineffective overall at the sectional design of the bridges and enabled quick repairs when hit. So right, fierce resistance to the Israeli Reserve Brigade garrisoning the Barlev forts was overwhelmed. Hold on. Okay. It's so my Twitch cooldown appeal refreshed. Nope. I don't even know what this is referencing. If you've been indefinitely suspended from Twitch and at least six months have passed, click here for more information about applying for reinstatement. I still have to wait a month or whatever. This is the exact same appeals thing that was here before. I don't think anything has changed. I don't know. I don't know what they said have changed or what they've said have changed or what, but they, everything looks exactly the same. Jesus Christ, is this quote out of context? Egyptian prime minister says country is ready to sacrifice millions of lives to defend territory. Amid rising pressure on Egypt to admit Palestinian refugees, the country's prime minister, Mustafa Madbali, Bully said it remained committed to protecting its land and sovereignty regardless of the cost. We are prepared to sacrifice millions of lives to ensure that no one encroaches upon our territory. Mad Bully told a gathering in Sinai of military leaders, local tribal leaders, members of parliament, other politicians. Prime Minister said Egypt would never allow any imposed situation or the settlement of regional issues at its expense. <laughs> oh. 
hopefully we'll get to the point to where why Egypt doesn't like um, Palestinians coming in. I'm sure that'll we'll get to that. Ah, uh, fortification on our economy. Four. No, 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 no. Okay, these are just like battle notes. I don't know if this matters as much. Egypt is also intended to land several heli-borne commando units in various areas of the Sinai to hamper the arrival of Israeli reserves. This attempt met with disaster as the Israelis shot down up to 20 helicopters, inflicting... Um, you've read Sadat saying the same thing about retaking the Sinai. Well, but that's about soldiers retaking land that they thought was theirs, not rejecting refugees. It's kind of different, right? Israeli Major General Kaim Herzog placed um, Egyptian helicopter losses at 14. Um, wait, was this guy the son of or related to the initial um, Zionist dude? Or do they just have the last fucking name? Was it, is it Theodore? Fuck. Um, or no, it's Herzl. I'm sorry. It just looks the same. Never mind. Herzl. <sighs> Fucking Jew names. All right. Sinai is with two armies. And the account of his war noted that on the morning of the 7th, the Egyptians lost 280 soldiers, 20 tanks. So this account is disputed. Um, many Israeli soldiers defending the Bar Lev line became casualties, and some 200 were taken prisoners in the subsequent days. Some defenders of the Bar Lev line managed to break through the Egyptian encirclement and return to their lines or were extracted during later Israeli counterattacks. Um, wait, hold on. Okay. Current Israel Israel president is Isaac Herzog. Gotcha. Egyptian forces then consolidated their initial positions on the seventh of October. The bridgeheads were enlarged and additional blah blah blah. The fighting there was conducted at close quarters. Sometimes hand to hand, the Egyptians were forced to clear the town building by building. By evening, most of the town was in Egyptian hands. Meanwhile, the Egyptian commandos airdropped on the Sinai on countering Israeli reserves. The following morning, both sides suffered heavy losses. So he was contradicted by other sources. According to Ab Abraham Rabinovak, uh, only the commandos near Baluza and those blocking the road to Fort Budapest, Budapest had measurable success with the 700. Egyptian commandos that started behind Israeli lines during the war. 740 were killed. Many in downed helicopters. A failed Israeli counterattack. David Elazar visited Shmuel Gonen, commander of the Israeli Southern Command, who had only taken the position three months before the retirement of Ariel Sharon, and met with Israeli commanders. Israeli really planned a cautious counterattack for the following day. Seven Egyptian airbase were damaged, loss of two E4, okay, hold on, I'm gonna, I'm silently reading this, to see if there's anything important here. Fourteenth of October, the Battle of the Sinai took place. Preparation the attack, Egyptian helicopters sent on a hundred commandos. Israeli recon unit subdued them. General Shazli strongly opposed any eastward advance that would leave his armor without adequate air cover. He was overruled by General Isma Ismail Sadat, whose aims were to seize the strategic Mitla and Gidi passes on the Israel nerve center at Rafidim which they hoped would really pressure on the Syrians, who were by now on the defensive by forcing Israel to shift divisions from the Golan to the Sinai. I don't think we've read anything about the Syrian front yet. Jeez. 
Egyptian units launched head-on attacks against the waiting Israeli defenses. At least 250 Egyptian tanks and some 200 army vehicles were destroyed. Egyptian casualties exceeded 1,000. Fewer than 40 Israeli tanks were hit, and all but six of them were repaired by Israeli maintenance crews and returned to service, while Israeli casualties numbered 665. Um, Paul accredited a successful Israeli commando raid. Um, what? Is this how you expect most of the pro-Palestine debates to go? I'm getting socialism arc vibes where literally everyone has no idea save for one or two literal academics. Maybe, I don't know. I'm sure we'll find like super educated people. Um, the reality is, is there's going to be people that are more read on me in these issues and, and they will have better arguments than I have. It's just a matter of like finding those people. Um, but we'll see. It's probably not going to be any uh, influencers or anybody that's on like YouTube or Twitch streams debating, but we'll see. Jesus, okay. That guy made pretty comparable arguments to the ones Lonerbox will make. No, Lonerbox I think is capable of like remaining on a single track and having a much better discussion, I think. Or at least so far, that's what I've seen. At this point, General Sharon. Wow, hello, Lycan. Lycan. Capturing the Egyptian, blah, 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 blah. Well, the Egyptian failed to attack the point in October, the multi-visual counterattack, boom, boom, boom. 20 assigned NPCs. Okay, it's really jets. Do I care about this as much? So refrain from attacking economic and strategic following is Egyptian threat to retaliate against Israeli cities with Scud missiles. A series of tactical ballistic missiles developed by the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The term comes from the NATO reporting name attached to the missile by Western intelligence agencies. Um, okay. You can probably note that. Israel refrained from attacking economic and strategic infrastructure in response to Egyptian threats to fire Scud missiles onto Israeli cities. What is the range of a Scud missile? Do you like pickles on your burger? Fuck no. 190 miles. Damn. Scud A is 110 miles. Okay. Um, does 110 take you all the way? I'm curious. Um, Google Maps Cairo. What do you think is the distance from Cairo to Tel Aviv? If I had to guess, I want to guess 200 miles. I have no fucking idea. Might be more. I guess 250. Um, Tel Aviv to Cairo. Right click. Directions from here. No. Measured distance. To Tel Aviv. Oh my god, 248 miles, okay. So Scud missiles anywhere. Um, Scud missiles, Wikipedia. 110 miles, 190 miles, 370 miles, and 430 miles. I wonder which ones they had. Remember that Iraq launched Scud missiles at Israel during the Gulf War. Not sure how far that is because where they launched from, so it is a viable threat. Yeah, but this was the first Gulf War, right? Which is uh, 90, um, it's not 91, is it? Wait, when is the first Gulf War? I don't remember, fuck me. Heard it? Okay, yeah, 1990. So this is gonna be uh, much later. Yeah, I know it doesn't have to go from Cairo. I was just curious. Um, 
Scouts are notoriously inaccurate and easy to shoot down. Okay. The heaviest air battles took place over the northern Nile where the Israelis repeatedly attempted to destroy Egyptian air bases. Although the Israelis tended to come out on top on aerial battles, one notable exception was the air battle of Mansoura. Mansoura? When an Israeli raid against the Egyptian air bases of Tanta and Mansoura was repulsed by Egyptian fighter aircraft. Let's see. 104th Air Wing, the Egyptian Air Force scrambled its fighters, receiving additional reinforcements on their bases. The battle began at 15, 15, 315 and lasted 53 minutes. The Egyptian commander was Hosni Mubarak. According to Egyptian sources, multiple Israeli fighters were shot down. This is disputed by Israeli sources. See if the page says when each litter of Scud was in service. It's all, if it's possible, if it's only possible to launch it from the Sinai, that would give you an argument regarding Israeli security, maybe. Uh, I mean, if that was true, if we say that they needed the Sinai Peninsula to prevent Scud missiles, couldn't you make an argument that Israeli expansion then needs to happen like 300 miles in all directions? I think that would be a pretty extreme. I understand what you're saying, though. Securing the bridgehead, despite the success of Israel, so having the West Bank, Generals Barlev and Elazar ordered Sharon to concentrate on securing the bridgehead on the East Bank. On the East Bank. Um, the bridgehead is, um, he's referring to, um, there must be like a main or big crossing on the Jordan River, right? Is it the Sheikh Hussein Bridge? Is that what we're talking about here? Fuck. The fuck is this bullshit? East, northeast, I guess, of, okay, east of Jericho, maybe. I'm assuming that's where it is. So in order to clear the roads leading to the canal, as well as positions known as the Chinese farm, just north of Deversor, the Israeli crossing point. Um, the Israeli high command was insistent, believing that until the East Bank was secure, a force on the West Bank could be cut off. Sharon was overruled by his superiors and relented. On the 16th of October, he dispatched Amnon, Amnon's Rishas Brigade to attack the Chinese farm. Another idea forced to attack entrenched Egyptian forces. Um, after three days of better fighting, close quarter fighting, the Israelis succeeded in dislodging the numerically superior Egyptian forces. They lost about 300 dead, 1,000 wounded, 56 tanks. The Egyptians suffered heavier casualties, including 118 tanks destroyed and 15 captured. What is the Chinese farm? Um, what the fuck is this place? It was fought on the Sinai Peninsula, north of the Great Bitter Lake, and just east of the Suez Canal. Near... What? Oh, near an Egyptian agricultural research station. The area was known to the Israeli military as the Chinese Farm, a misnomer resulting from the research station's use of Japanese-made equipment with Japanese writing on the machinery mistaken by Israeli observers for Chinese characters. Duh. Okay. Egyptian response to the Israeli crossing. The Egyptians, meanwhile, failed to grasp the extent and magnitude of the Israeli crossing, nor did they appreciate its intent and purpose. This is partly due to attempts by Egyptian field commanders to obfuscate reports concerning the Israeli crossing, and partly due to a false assumption that the canal crossing was merely a diversion for a major IDF offensive targeting the right flank of the Second Army. Consequently, on the 16th of October, General Shazli ordered the 21st Armored Division to attack southward, and the T-62 equipped 25th Independent Armored Brigade to attack northward. The Egyptians failed to scout the area, and were unaware of that by now. Adan's 162nd Armored Division was in the vicinity. Moreover, all this bullshit. Showing like an Egyptian. Tillowee shelled the Israeli bridge over the canal in the morning, scoring several hits. And launched some raids. They lost planes. The bridge was damaged. Israeli paratroop headquarters, which was near the bridge. Trickle was really forced to be able to cross. Going to Kaim Herzog, the Egyptians continued attacking the bridgehead until the ceasefire. Fired tens of thousands of shells into the area of the crossing. Egyptian aircraft attempted to bomb the bridge every day. After the failure of the 7th of October counterattacks, the Egyptian general staff slowly began to realize the magnitude of the Israeli offensive. Early on the 18th of October, the Soviets showed um, Sadat satellite imagery of Israeli forces operating on the West Bank. Alarmed, Sadat dispatched Shazli to the front to assess the situation firsthand. He no longer trusted his field commanders to provide accurate reports. Shazli confirmed that the Israelis had at least one division on the West Bank and were widening their bridgehead. Um, I'm sorry, hold on. I'm, I'm, I misunderstood everything earlier. I'm sorry. When they're talking about West Bank here, they're talking about West Bank of the uh, uh, Suez Canal. That's what they're talking about here. 
He advocated withdrawing most of Egypt's armor from the East Bank to confront the growing Israeli threat on the West Bank. Sadat rejected this recommendation outright and even threatened Shazli with a court martial. Ahmad Ish uh, Ismail, Ismail uh, Ali recommended that Sadat push for a ceasefire so as to prevent the Israelis from exploiting their successes. Israeli forces across the Suez. Suez. Israeli forces by, were by now pouring across the canal on two bridges. Including one of Israeli design and motorized rafts, Israeli engineers under the Brigadier General Dan Ivan Ev um, had worked under heavy Egyptian fire to set up the bridges, and over 100 were killed and hundreds more were wounded. The crossing, um, the crossing was difficult because of Egyptian artillery fire, though by 4 a.m., two of Adan's bridges were on the west bank of the canal. On the morning of the 18th of October, Sharon's force on the west bank launched an offensive towards Ismailia, uh, slowly pushing back the Egyptian paratrooper brigade. So now we're out of the Suez Canal, I think, into Egypt proper. Well, I mean, the Suez Canal is arguably part of Egypt, but I think onto the African continent. Is that where we're at? Yes. Is this this would be the first time that... Um, I feel like Wikipedia puts too much emphasis on the actual battle itself. Maybe focus on the motives, the start of the fight, the end of it, and the aftermath would go quicker. Yeah, but there are, like, details that come up during these fights that I think are, like, it's just important to get an idea of, like, the overall feeling. So, like, here, my guess is going to be that, like, Israel pushing past to the other end of the canal, I think this is probably for the first time, it's probably a big deal for Egyptian morale. Probably doesn't feel good that you launched an offensive, and a few days earlier, you were actually, like, conquering uh, Israeli territory in the Sinai Peninsula. You probably felt on top of the world, uh, but now all of a sudden they've pushed past the canal further than they ever have before, right? Which is, like, a direct shot then from there to Cairo, which is probably really scary, I would imagine. But, or maybe it doesn't matter, who knows? Um, <sighs> um, slowly pushing back the Egyptian period brigade, some of his units tended to move west, but were stopped at the crossroads in Nefalia. Um, Adan's division rolled south towards Suez City, while Megens, 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 Megens division pushed west towards Cairo and south towards um, Adabia. Adabia? Adabia? Um, on the 19th of October, one of Sharon's brigades continued to push the Egyptian paratroopers north. Sharon hoped to seize the city and thereby sever the logistical and supply lines. Sharon's second brigade began to move across the canal. I'm curious, like, what is the, what's the stop point for Egypt where they're like, holy shit, can we please stop? The fall of Orca caused the collapse of the Egyptian defensive line, allowing more Israeli troops to get onto the sand rampart. There, they rolled a fire in support of Israeli troops facing Missouri Ridge, an Egyptian-occupied position on the Barlev line. Um, that could pose a threat to the Israeli crossing on the same day. Israeli paratroopers participating in Sharon's drive pushed the Egyptians back far enough for the Israeli bridges to be out of sight of Egyptian artillery observers, though the Egyptian, Egyptians continued shelling the area. There's no J sound in Hebrew, so all G sounds are go. Gotcha. As the Israelis pushed towards Ismailia, the Egyptians fought a delaying battle, retreating into defense positions further north as they came under increasing pressure from the Israeli ground offensive, coupled with airstrikes. Shmal Gonan had demanded Sharon capture the position, and Sharon had reluctantly ordered the attack. So then attacked from the south, destroying 20 tanks and overrunning infantry positions were being halted by Sagra missiles and minefields. One third of Missouri Ridge. Why are they taking our names? Why are they taking our words? The Israelis continued to expand their holdings on the east bank. According to the Israelis, the IDF bridgehead was 25 miles wide. On the 22nd of October, Ismaili's Egyptians' defenders were occupying their last line of defense. The Israel renewed the attack. Fuck, it's 5 o'clock. Fuck me, I'm getting... I'm getting triggered. Um, the paratrooper at Jebel, Miriam, became engaged um, in intense fighting, but with their advantageous position, were able to repel this. Attack ended after paratroopers were At the same time, two tank companies mechanized their bullshit. Blah, blah, blah. Edgar O'Balance mentions a counterattack by the Saika, which took place during the afternoon and pushed um, some of Sharon's troops back along the Sweetwater Canal. 
What is happening in, um, I wonder what's happening in, like, the Gaza Strip and everything during this, during the Yom Kippur War. Because this is just territory that's basically held by Israel, right? Are any of them fighting or trying to do anything? Or are they just, like, yeah, I'm not sure. Israeli forces failed to get behind Ismailia and circled the city. The Israeli advance on Ismailia was stopped uh, six miles south of the city. They're busy digging tunnels. Shut the fuck up. The idea failed to cut supplies for the Egyptian second army or to occupy Ismailia. The Egyptians registered a tactical and strategic victory in the defense of Ismailia, stopping an encirclement of their large forces on the east bank of the Suez Canal. Um... Um, you're ready for the debate today. Don't be nervous. It's not that I'm ready. It's just that now I'm like obsessively trying to like, I'm like in the final stages of like my autism game. It's like um, Factoria. I just want to like get caught up. I just want to be current. Um, yeah, but that's okay. We're just still going. Okay. Um, Northern Front, Adan and Magen moved south, um, decisively defeating the Israel series of engagements that they often encountered determined Egyptian resistance to both sides of heavy casualties. <clears throat> What debate? Whatever the Keeper Kick showed on it. Okay, we'll keep showing us tonight. It's really slowly advanced, bypassing Egyptian position where possible. After being denied air support due to the presence of SAM batteries that have been brought forward, Adan sent two brigades to attack them. Brigades slipped past the dug in Egyptian infantry, moving out from the Green Belt for more than five miles, fought off multiple Egyptian counterattacks. The Israelis clashed with an Egyptian armored unit at Mitzeneft and destroyed multiple SAM sites. Adan also captured Fayyid Airport, which is subsequently prepared by Israeli crews to serve as a supply base and a flight wounded soldiers. Here is something that is a little bit interesting to me, and maybe I've missed this. Um, maybe it's been said in the past and I've skipped these articles, I haven't seen them. One thing that's like kind of interesting to me is, is there not that much, like, like from a national level, obviously, Israel is fighting to carve out its nation, these Arab countries are fighting it. Is there a lot of like hostility or vitriol from the actual soldiers themselves to like the other like enemy combatants? Because I feel like I haven't read as much about like crazy like war crimes, rapes, murderings of tons of prisoners of war um, from either from either side here, from the Arab side or from the Israeli side during a lot of these like Arab-Israeli wars. And I would have expected to, um, as opposed to like uh, like I'm pretty sure. Um, no, I don't know that. I do know that like like for instance like the Soviet Union and the Nazis like fucking murdered, massacred, hated, destroyed, like every fucking insane thing. I'm pretty sure these two sides like hated each other with a fiery fucking passion. It feels like I haven't read as much for the individual soldiers, um, but may I could be missing like massacres or powers being killed or whatever. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. It's mostly desert. I doubt there's that many civilians. Yeah, but even for like soldiers, like wasn't it the case after, was it after the six day war when so, no, it was either that or the Suez Crisis. It might have been the Six Day War, where I think Israel marched or told a ton of Egyptian troops to go walk back towards the south. And then I think that's when, and then I read that a lot of those soldiers were killed. But then the claim was that most of them were killed by Egypt because they wanted to kill them coming back because it was so humiliating or whatever, right? But there were also claims that some Israeli uh, soldiers, that that march south of those Egyptian soldiers was also arguably tantamount to death too. So there were accusations on both sides, um, to be fair on that. Although the Egyptian one seemed a little bit more substantiated, but I could be wrong on that. But um, this will 100% come up during the debate during the Lebanese Civil War, bro. This is 1982. I'm not even close to there yet. Okay. Um, yeah. You like egg on your burger? Um, no, that's okay. Well, wait. If it's over hard, I will. Yeah. Um, okay, it's really easy. After being denied, air support due to the Prince to send batteries and we're out forward. Okay, oh wait, fuck, I just realized. Mm. Let's see, overhard is just fried. Uh, overhard should be uh, broken yolk, uh, cooked through. Um,. Um, Adan sent two brigades. Okay, boom, boom, boom. Adan's troops advanced to the Green Belt and fought their way to the Geneva Hills. 
Clashing with scouted Egyptian, Kuwaiti, and Palestinian troops, the Israelis clashed with an Egyptian armored unit at Metzenev and destroyed multiple Sam sites at an also captured Fayyid Airport, which was subsequently prepared by Israeli crews to serve as a supply base and to fly out wounded soldiers. Fayyid Airport. Is that in the Sinai or is this in Egypt? Past the uh, canal. Oof, okay, that's in Egypt again, okay. All right, the ceasefire and further battles. The United Nations Security Council passed 14 0 Resolution 338 calling for a ceasefire, largely negotiated between the U.S. and Soviet Union on the 22nd of October. Um, we're, wait, did anybody try to call a ceasefire when initially when Egypt was taking land in Sinai? Or maybe it's because they're taking it back. There wasn't as much. Um, maybe people didn't want to call a ceasefire as much. They wanted... Um, they wanted Egypt a chance to win their land back, maybe, I guess? I'm not sure. On October 22nd, um, this is going to be in 73, right? The UN Security Council passed a 14-0 resolution calling for a ceasefire negotiated mainly between the US and the USSR. Um, it called upon the belligerents to immediately cease all military activity. The ceasefire was to come into effect 12 hours later. Because this was after dark, it was impossible for satellite surveillance to determine where the front lines were when the fighting was supposed to stop. U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger um, intim intimated to Prime Minister Mayer that he would not object to offensive action during the night before the ceasefire was to come into effect. Okay. Several minutes before the ceasefire came into effect, three Scud missiles were fired at Israel targets by either Egyptian forces or Soviet personnel in Egypt. This was the first combat use of Scud missiles. One Scud target, one Scud targeted the port of Arish, and two targeted the Israeli bridgehead at the Suez Canal. One hit an Israel supply, an Israeli supply convoy, and killed seven soldiers. When the time for the ceasefire arrived, Sharon's division had failed to capture Ismailia, Ismaila, um, and cut off the second army supply lines. But Israeli forces, which is 300 meters short of their southern goal, the last road linking Cairo and the Suez. Um, is it a big? So, um, Arish, okay. Are Scud missiles, when we talk about, like, prior to this point, I guess, in this region, are Scud missiles big deals because it's, like, a long-range, like, surface-to-surface -surface missile that can come from one area, go to another country, hit an area, that I think, up to this point, I think, in this region hadn't been used yet, I think? Or first time a Scud missile... For the first time, three Scud missiles were fired. Israeli targets by either Egyptian forces or Soviet personnel in Egypt, which was the first combat use of Scud missiles. Um, all three targets were in the um, Sinai. So, right. Arish is that is a little port city near the Gaza Strip, right? West of the Gaza Strip, yes, and the Sinai, okay. Several minutes before, the, okay. When the time for the ceasefire arrived, Sharon's division fell to capture. But on his drive south, it left Israeli and Egyptian units scattered throughout the battlefield with no clear lines between them. As Egyptian and Israeli units tried to regroup, regular firefights broke out during the night. Um, Ilazar yeah, reported that Egyptians were attacking in an attempt to regain land at various locations, and that nine Israeli tanks had been destroyed. Um, he asked permission from Dayan to respond to the attacks, and Dayan agreed. Israel then resumed its drive south. It is unclear which side fired first, but Israeli fl uh, field commanders used the skirmishes as justification to resume the attacks. When Sadat protested alleged Israeli truce violations, Israel said the Egyptian troops had fired first. William B. Quant not noted that regardless of who fired the first post ceasefire shot, it was the Israeli army that was advancing beyond the 22nd of October ceasefire lines. 
Um, ceasefire claims to have been broken by both sides during the night. Israel capitalized on the ceasefire break to advance beyond the UNSC ceasefire lines. This is still about 27 October. Adan resumed his attack on the 23rd of October. Israeli troops finished the drive south, capturing the last ancillary road south of the port of Suez and encircled the Egyptian Third Army east of the Suez Canal. The Israelis then transported enormous amounts of military equipment across the canal, which Egypt claimed was in violation of the ceasefire. Generally, I, I don't know how much this actually happens historically, but generally when you call a ceasefire, you're not supposed to be like reinforcing positions or like resupplying everybody to get geared up to fight again. But it seems like realistically, it feels like every time a ceasefire is called, this is essentially what happens. I don't know if that's the same case in all parts of the world or whatever, but um, yeah, it seems like the ceasefire memes are kind of, yeah, are kind of trolly, I think. That's what it seems like, but I mean, you're not actually shooting at each other, but Egyptian aircraft... Um, launched repeated attacks in support of the Third Army, sometimes in groups of up to 30 planes, but took severe losses. Battle of Suez, Israeli armor and paratroopers also entered Suez and attempted to capture the city, but failed after being confronted by Egyptian soldiers and hastily raised local militia forces. They were surrounded and the armored column was ambushed and severely hit, while the paratroopers came under heavy fire, many of them became trapped inside a local building. They were evacuated during the day, while the main contingent of the paratrooper force eventually managed to dash out of the city and make their way back to Israeli lines. Israelis had lost 80 dead and 120 wounded with minimal Egyptian casualties for no tactical gain. Israel made two more probes into Suez, one on the 25th, one on the 28th, but both were repulsed. The UN didn't say Simon Says. <laughs> True. Egypt's trapped Third Army. Kissinger found out about the Third Army's encirclement shortly thereafter. Kissinger considered that the situation presented the United States with a tremendous opportunity and that Egypt was dependent on the United States to prevent Israel from destroying its trapped army. The position could be parlayed later into allowing the U.S. to mediate in the dispute and wean Egypt from Soviet influence. As a result, the United States exerted tremendous pressure. Um, here we go. Egypt's Third Army. This should be probably like, okay. Oh, as well, the U.S. the U.S. Is seeing an opportunity to bring Egypt closer to its sphere of influence, I guess. Um, exerted heavy pressure on Israel to refrain from destroying the trapped Third Army. As a result, the United. How does the U.S. know? about this is it i imagine our israeli generals probably aren't communicating everything going to the u.s it's probably like satellite surveillance and just us keeping track of everything i would imagine it's probably we're figuring this out, this out on our own with our own surveillance um Spies and spy planes and satellites, yeah. As a result, the United States exerted tremendous pressure on the Israelis to refrain from destroying the trapped army, even threatening to support a UN resolution demanding that the Israelis withdraw to their 22nd of October positions that they did not allow non-military supplies to reach the army. In a phone call with Israeli ambassador Simcha Dinitz, Dinitz, Kissinger told the ambassador that the destruction of the Egyptian Third Army is an option that does not exist. Okay, Jesus. The Israeli government also had its own motivations for not destroying the Third Army. These included the possibility of using the encircled Third Army as a bargaining chip for ending the Egyptian blockade of the Bab el Mandel Straits in the Red Sea and negotiating a repatriation of Israeli prisoners of war captured by Egypt. The exhausted state of the IDF, the possibility of humiliating Egypt by destroying the Third Army would make Sadat more bellicose and unwilling to cease hostilities, and Israel's intense fears that the Soviet Union would militarily intervene in the event the Third Army was destroyed were additional reasons for Israel ultimately deciding against destroying it. Despite being surrounded, the Third Army managed to maintain its combat integrity east of the canal and keep up its defensive positions to the surprise of many. According to Trevor and Dupi, Dupoy, Dupoy, Dupi, the Israelis, Soviets, and Americans overestimated the vulnerability of the Third Army at the time. It was not on the verge of collapse, and he wrote that while a renewed Israeli offense would probably overcome it, this was not a certainty. Jesus. 
David T. Buckwalter agrees that despite the isolation of their armies, unclear if the Israelis could have protected their forces from on the West Bank, on the canal, from a determined Egyptian assault, still maintained sufficient strength along the rest of the front. The assessment was challenged by Patrick Seal, who said, okay, don't care about this. Hard talk, no, they give the army eh, it turns to be cut off from Israel, no, no, The destruction there was inevitable and could have been achieved within a very brief period. Shortly before the Israeli army sent, the tank battalion advanced into um, Adabia and took it with support from the Israeli Navy. Some 1,500 Egyptian prisoners taken, and about 100 Egyptian soldiers assembled just south of Adabia, where they held out against the Israelis. The Israelis also conducted their third and final incursion of the Suez. They made some gains, but failed to break into the, into the city center. As a result, the city was partitioned down the main street, with the Egyptians holding the city center, and the Israelis controlling the outskirts, port installations, oil refinery, effectively surrounding the Egyptian defenders. Hmm, hmm, hmm. It's Dupree. Oh, cringe. Post-war battles. On the morning of the 26th of October, the Egyptian Third Army violated the ceasefire by attempting to break through the surrounding Israeli force. Is this violating another ceasefire, or is this still like the same ceasefire? The attackers repulsed by Israeli Iran. Egypt also made minor gains. The Israelis reacted by bombing and shelling priority targets in Egypt, including command posts and water. It's probably the same ceasefire, but this is a different part of the battlefield, I guess. The most heavy fighting ended on the 20th of October. The fighting never stopped until the 18th of January, 1974. The ceasefire existed on paper, but the continuing firing along the front was not the only characteristic of the situation. The centimeter period also on the ever present. But, okay, let's just have this, I guess. Um, by either side. Um, with the fighting not stopping until January 18th, 1974. Um, 56, okay, just trying to remember these other dates, okay. <sighs> the IDF acknowledged the loss of 14 soldiers in the post-war period. Egyptian losses were higher, especially in the sector controlled by Ariel Sharon, who ordered his troops to respond with massive fire, but any Egyptian provocation. Final situation on the Egyptian front. By the end of the war, the Israelis advanced to some, to some positions, or to positions some 101 kilometers from Egypt's capital, Cairo, and occupied 1,600 square kilometers west of the Suez Canal. They had also cut the Cairo-Suez Road and encircled the bulk of Egypt's third army, Israelis had also taken many prisoners after Egyptian soldiers, including many officers, began surrendering en masse in masses towards the end of the war. The Egyptians held a narrow strip on the east bank of the canal, occupying some 200 square kilometers of the Sinai. One source estimated the Egyptians at 70,000 men, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Despite Israeli's tactical successes west of the canal, the Egyptian militaries were formed and organized. Consequently, according to Gamzi, or Gamazi, the Israeli military position became weak for different reasons. One, Israel now had a large force and a very limited area of land, surrounded from all sides, either by natural or man-made barriers, or by the Egyptian forces. This put in a weak position. Moreover, there were the difficulties in supplying this force and evacuating it, and the lengthy communication lines, and the daily attrition of many equipment. Two, to protect these troops, the Israeli command had to allocate other forces. Three, to mobilize the Egyptian bridgeheads in Sinai. The Israeli command had to allocate 10 brigades to face the second and third army bridgeheads. In addition, it became necessary to keep the strategic reserves at their maximum state of alert. Thus, Israel was obliged to keep its armed force the consequ and consequently, the country mobilized for a long period, at least until the war came to an end, because the ceasefire did not signal the end of the war. There is no doubt that this was in total conflict with its military theories. Um, yeah, probably because thus far, Israel's um, military success has usually been on the backs of like swift and violent and like quick, one might even say a blitzkrieg through enemy forces. So having huge swaths of land occupied in unfavorable terrain with huge supply lines over long periods of time doesn't seem to be historically how Israel prefers to do battle with uh, neighboring countries. Egypt wished to end the war when it realized the idea of canal crossing offensive could result in a catastrophe. The Egyptians besieged third army could not hold on without supply. The Israeli army advanced to 100 kilometers from Cairo, which worried Egypt. Israeli army was 100 kilometers from Cairo after their advancement west, from the West Bank, I guess. 
His early army had open terrain and no opposition to advance further. Cairo, had they done so, Sadat's rule might have ended. Initial, okay. Oof, okay. So that was the Israeli, or the Egyptian part. Okay. Syrian attacks. Destiny, not from the West Bank. That doesn't make sense. Wait, what? Yes, it does, I think. Um, okay, let me ask yourself. Why are you sending me? Why do you always send me messages from ask yourself? The West Bank is in the east. It's the West Bank of the Suez Canal. That's where they were advancing from. Um, Somniant, thanks for the invite, but two things. If this is a destiny project, there's no way I'm welcome. I expect you don't ask him. It's not a topic that I know enough about to enter debate. Oh, this is about him joining Kiki. Okay, that's fine, okay. Um, uh, destiny, did you shift your opinion at all about religion's role in the conflict? Uh, basically, every single time I study anything relating to any politics, religion seems to play um, a smaller and smaller and smaller role in most things. I don't know. Everything I've studied so far about this, I, like religion has played almost, maybe has played almost zero role or zero role at all on this. Um, maybe, but I don't know. I don't know. What do I know? Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Okay. In the Golan Heights. It was a factor in deciding whether the Jewish state would be. Sure, if you want to go to like the very, very initial thing of the inception of the Jewish state in Zionism, maybe you could argue that, sure. The way you're looking at it doesn't leave room for the religious incentives to show. Okay. The Golan Heights, the Syrians attacked two Israeli armored brigades, an infantry brigade, two... Okay, what is the date for this? On to the battle of Israeli brigades, some 3,000 troops, the fight, the opening... It must be the same time as... Um, it must be the exact same time that Egypt attacks, right? I imagine it would be coordinated. Um, let me see. I didn't actually write down when the very first, um, October 6th. The core of the issue is not religious. Religion is field of the fire. The foundation of Israel was initially supported by secular Jews since it was thought of at the time to go against Jewish law by creating Israel ourselves rather than waiting for the Messiah. Um, weren't there conflicting views within, um, within early Zionist thinkers, though, about whether or not that was true? W weren't there arguments among Jewish people over that? I don't think it was like the, I don't think, I don't, rem I don't think it was the prevailing Jewish view on that, right? That that was the case? I could be wrong. I haven't studied that part ex um, intensely yet, but. Um, okay. Oh, okay. The initial Syrian attacks. Okay. 
So I'm, October, I'm assuming this is also like on October 6th or whatever. That would be my assumption, but. When the warning by King Hussein of an imminent Syrian attack was conveyed, um, El Azar at first only signed two additional tank companies for the seventh. Uh, um, we'll have 100 tanks against their 800. That ought to be enough. Jesus. Eventually, his deputy Israel Tal ordered the entire Seventh Armored Brigade to be brought up. Efforts have been made to improve the Israeli defensive positions. The Purple Line ran along a series of low, dormant volcanic cones. Uh, tells in the north and deep ravines in the south. It was covered by a continuous tank ditch. Bunker complexity is intense minefields directly west of this line. Oh, okay, okay. The Syrians began their attack at 1400 with an airstrike by about 100 aircraft and 50 minute artillery barrage. The two forward infantry brigades with an organic tank position. Positions and the Golan Heights. A small force dropped by four helicopters. Simultaneously placed on the access road. No, 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 no. Let's see. Is there anything important here? It's 527. Direct operational command of the Golan. Had at first been given to then 188 AB commander Yitzhak Ben Shoham. Um, the Armored School Centurion Tank Battalion was kept in general reserve. Sixteen hundred Yitzhav Hofi. Um, whether secular or not, a battery of religious metaphors and references circumscribed the Zionist understanding of Palestinian ecology and how it ought to be modified. The biblical land of milk and honey slash land of plenty stuff was extremely influential. The agricultural aims of settlers and Israeli state building was conducted through those means. Kibbutz and labor Zionism. That's what uh, Irk says. North would be responsible for the Syrian offensive. It failed to penetrate, but at nightfall, the second larger way was launched. Okay, defense of the Quinitra Gap. On the night of the 7th of 8th of October, <sighs> tank brigades. After this fight, the Israeli brigade referred to this gap as the Valley of Tears. Syrian Brig uh, Brigadier General Omar Abrash, commander of the 7th Infantry Division, was killed on the 8th of October when his command tank was hit as he was preparing to an attempt by 121st Mechanized Brigade to bypass the gap through a more southern route. Having practiced on the Golan Heights numerous times, Israeli gunners made effective use of mobile artillery during night attacks over the Syrian tanks with the advantage of active illumination infrared night vision equipment, which was not a standard Israeli equipment. It's kind of interesting watching this war over the past like 30, 40 years to see like the evolution in technology, like the increased number of troops, the um, more sophisticated tanks and aircraft that are kind of like slowly like rolling into the war. It's interesting. Um, instead, some Israeli tanks were fitted with large xenon searchlights, which were useful in illuminating and locating Enemy positions, troops, and vehicles, the close distances during night engagements negated the usual Israeli superiority in long range duels. 77th Tank Battalion Commander Avigid, uh, Avigdor Kahalani in the Quinitra, Quinitra Gap uh, generally managed to hold a second tank ramp line. Oh, sorry. Um. The afternoon of the 9th of October, Syrian command committed the Republican Guard Independent 7th Army Brigade equipped with T-62s and BMP-1s to hold the gap. The 7th AB could now only muster two dozen tanks. Taking losses and hits by an intense artillery barrage, the Israeli centurions withdrew from their tank ramps. Syrians break through in the southern Golan. The southern section, the Israeli Barak Armored Brigade had to defend... Um, a much flatter terrain... Uh, it also faced two-thirds of the Syrian second wave while fielding, at this time, less than a third of the operational Israeli tanks. Beside these objective drawbacks, it suffered from ineffective command. Ben Shahom initially still had his headquarters in Nafa, far from his sector. He did not realize a full war was in progress and tended to spread the 53rd TB platoons along the entire line. 
to stop any Syrian incursion. Also, he failed to coordinate the deployment of the 82nd TB and 53rd TB. Valley of Tears is so fucking base, wants its own wiki read. I'm not here to read your, okay? Your Jewish propaganda. Israeli strategic response. Oh, okay. Around midnight, uh, Hofi at Safed began to understand the magnitude of the Syrian breakthrough. He warned Chief of Staff El Lazar the entire Golan might be lost. Overhearing this message, an alarmed Dayan decided to personally visit the Northern Command headquarters in the late night. Hofi uh, informed Dayan that an estimated 300 Syrian tanks had entered the southern Golan. Wait, it's Golan. Is it Golan or Golan Heights? I don't know how to pronounce this, actually. Oh, Golan Heights. Good, yeah, fuck you. Yeah. Shocked Paled by announcing the third temple was about to fall. Wait, what is the third temple? <laughs> third temple refers to a hypothetical rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Yeah. Oh, is this just like a metaphor for like we're losing all of Israel, basically? The IF had just made a successful start with Operation Tagar, a very complex plan to neutralize the Egyptian AA missile belt. Overruling objectives by Paled, Dayan ordered to immediately carry out Operation Dugman. Five. Instead, the destruction of the Syrian Sam belt to allow the IAF to halt the Syrian advance. This time, there is uh, no time to obtain recent information about the location of the batteries. The attempt was a costly failure. The Israelis destroyed only one Syrian missile battery but lost six Phantom II aircraft. As a result, the IAF was unable to make significant contributions to the defense battle on the Golan. Over both fronts together on the 7th of cover, over 129 bomb bombardment sorties were flown. It also proved impossible to restart Tagar, curtailing IF operations on the Sinai front for the duration of the war. Less pessimistic than Dayan, Elazar was not ready yet to abandon the Golan Heights. Israeli High Command of Strategic Reserve because the 146th Ugda that was earmarked for Central Command, controlling the eastern border with Jordan. Uh, in the evening of the 6th of October, El Lazar, or uh, okay. Vision would take some time to deploy. Small units could be quickly mobilized, bolster the defenses. The Syrians had expected it to take at least 24 hours for Israeli reserves to reach the front lines. In fact, they began to join the fight only nine hours after the war began, 12 hours after the start of the mobilization. The Golan position had been at only 80% of its planned strength through the defensive phase of a full war with Syria. Northern Command had a headquarters reserve consisting of an unnumbered rapid deployment Centurion battle tank. Um, tank battalion, I'm sorry. Also, the 71st mechanized infantry. <laughs> Uh, 
Ethan and Hila, Hila are addressing the Hila conspiracies live right now, but you need a membership to watch. Well, I can't watch it then, so. Oh. I just gifted you a membership? I gifted your mom a membership. Ethan is telling his child to go watch Hassan. Okay. They're still friends, my dude. Um, Syrian first and second waves had it. So I'm, I'm curious, how does Israel get back the Golan Heights? Because <laughs> it seems like they can't do it by air. I don't know how they would go back in by ground, but... During the late evenings of the October, the NCTB. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, attempting to seal the breakthrough point. I don't know. But they all attempts to preach. <sighs> but the early morning of the 7th of October, all attempts to patch the breach in the main defensive line of the southern sector became futile because also the center and right flank, the 188th AB, it started to collapse. The armored brigade. During that night, it had largely managed to hold its ground against continuous attack, inflicting severe losses on the Syrians with accurate cannon fire, hoping to buy time for reserve forces to reach the front line. Some tank crews sacrificed themselves rather than voluntarily give up ground. Gradually, the fighting subsided. Dawn revealed that the Syrian 5th Infantry Division, under the cover of darkness, had at numerous points bridged the tank ditch and cleared corridors through the minefield belt. The situation of the 188th Armored Brigade was rendered even more hazardous by the presence of its re in its rear of the Syrian 9th Infantry Division. It was decided to abandon the Southern Golan, and that night, many artillery and logistics units had already withdrawn, some slipping through the columns of the 9th um, Infantry Division, others being destroyed by them. Civilian Jewish settlements had been evacuated. The same now happened with most fortifications except Bunker Complex 116. Uh, ben Shahom, with his staff outflanked the Syrian penetration via Western Round and reached the north. The 82nd TB Company. Um, uh, would you have done some research without your mom sucking my dick? No. On the previous evening, destroyed about 30 Syrian tanks. Jesus, okay. For the moment, he could do little more than personally halt retreating troops and vehicles on the more southern Eric Bridge and send them over the River Jordan again. Israeli command feared that the Syrians would quickly exploit the situation by advancing into Galilee. Dayan, in the morning of the 7th of October, called Shalhavet Freer, the director general of the Israel Atomic Energy Commission, to a meeting with Golda Meir to discuss the possible arming of nuclear weapons. of nuclear weapons in response to uh, Syrian uh, Mayer rejected this option. The Syrian mechanized brigades in the area did not continue the offensive but began to entrench themselves in strong defensive positions. They had been forbidden by al-Assad to approach the River Jordan for fear of triggering an Israeli nuclear response. Syrian mechanized brigades did not advance into Israel, whatever that means. Um, and feared an Israel nuclear response. Original Syrian, okay, where are we at? Boom, 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 okay. The original Syrian offensive plan, al Auda, the return devised by Major General Ab uh, Adul Hab Habisi. Uh, Envy, thanks for getting five memberships. Um, um, Normally, there's two things on the lines that at any given moment, just 33 tanks regarding the tank ditch, infiltrations by commando teams armed with saggers, 
plan to quickly isolate these 10 dark platoons. Remember, so what is helicopter going to attack central bridges? Landing during conditions of dust to avoid the IAF would isolate the Golan Heights of strategic reinforces. Israeli Air Force. Night attacks by three Syrian infantry divisions within fragment the weakly held forward Israeli defensive positions to conclude the operation to deter any Israeli attempt to reconquer the Golan. The Syrian 1st and 3rd Armored Divisions would advance onto the plateau this way. It was hoped to take the Golan within 30 hours. Coordination with Egypt forced a change of plans. The Egyptians wanted hostilities to start at noon. In the end, they agreed to a compromise of two. The Syrian helicopter attacks were canceled. Now, in start of successful outcomes, the Egyptians became less committed to the attack. They decided to keep one armored division as a strategic, as a strategic reserve, together with the two presidential guard independent armored brigades, which fielded the most modern tank material. Okay, Israel retakes southern Golan in two paragraphs? <laughs> okay. Um... The tide in the Golan begins to turn as arriving Israeli reserve forces were able to contain the Syrian advance. Beginning on the 8th of October, the Israelis began pushing the Syrians back towards the pre-war ceasefire lines, inflicting heavy tank losses. The Israelis, who had suffered heavy casualties in the first three days of fighting, also began relying more heavily on artillery to dislodge Syrians at long range. Um, on the 9th of October, the Syrians launched a counterattack north of Kanitra. As part of the operation, they attempted to land heliborne troops in the vicinity of El Ram. The counterattackers were pulsed, and four Syrian helicopters were shot down with a total loss of life. Syrian Frog 7 artillery rockets struck the Israeli Air Force base of Ramat De David, killing a pilot and injuring several soldiers. Additional missiles struck civilian settlements. In retaliation, seven Israeli F-4 Phantoms flew into Syria and struck the Syrian General Staff Headquarters in Damascus. One Israeli Phantom was shot down. The strike prompt citation needed better citation. The strike prompted the Syrians to transfer air defense units from the Golan Heights to the home front, allowing the IRF greater freedom of action. By the 10th of October, that's kind of important. Um, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, missiles from uh, Syrian offensive lines struck civilian settlements in Israel. And in retaliation, seven Israeli F-4 uh, phantoms flew into Syria and attacked the Syrian general staff headquarters in Damascus. Ethan from H3 saying Hassan's coverage of the conflict has been fucked up. I doubt that. <clears throat> Damascus is super close to the Golan Heights. You can see the city from up top. Super close from the Golan Heights? I mean, like... It's there, but there's like another major city. It's not super close, no? Damascus. Damascus. Um, Google Maps. I don't believe that, um, I don't believe that Israeli forces had has ev have ever up to this point, I could be wrong, but I don't believe up to this point they've pushed into Damascus before. I don't think we've had like um, Israeli fighter planes bombing anything in Damascus. Um, let's see, I believe that the I think the Golan Heights are, it's like this area here. So you're advancing to like through this road up here to get up here. They got within artillery range. I thought I didn't think that, um, I thought they barely pushed past like this Northern like Golan Heights area. I don't think they pushed much further past before, right? Damascus, Damascus, fuck you. By the 10th of October, by the 10th of October, the um, the last Syrian unit in the central sector was pushed back across the Purple Line, the pre-war ceasefire line. After four days of intense and assistant combat, the Israelis succeeded in ejecting the Syrians from the entire Golan. Okay, I don't understand what happened here. I don't care enough to watch a fuck ton of videos, but like, holding the Golan Heights is supposed to be an incredibly like entrenched and easy to defend position. I don't understand how the how the Israelis just like retake it in like two paragraphs. Um read it then, the Valley of Tears. Does this does this have to do with both back and forth? I can't. Decades after the battle, analysts were still presenting differing reasons. 
uh, for the Syrian withdrawal. In 1990, Patrick Seale argued that the reason why the Syrians were stopped was the superiority of the IAF, which was free to devote all of its attention to the Syrian front. In 2002, Kent Pollock wrote that the Syrian forces did not look for an alternative axis of advance and rolled forward without defending their flanks. In 98, Martin Van Creveld suggested the explanation that on October 8th, though the Syrians did not withdraw until more or less on October 9th, when Israel felt the battle was being lost, it threatened Syria with a nuclear strike. However, a historical review by Avnar Cohen and others found no evidence of a nuclear threat by Israel. Hmm. Okay. Um, Israeli advance towards Damascus. A decision now to be made whether to stop at the post-67 borders or to continue advancing into Syrian territory. The Israeli high command spent all of 10th of December debating well into the night. Some favored disengagement, um, which would allow soldiers to be redeployed to the Sinai. Others favored continuing the attack into Syria towards Damascus, which would knock Syria out of the war. It would also restore Israel's image as the supreme military power in the Middle East and would give Israel a valuable bargaining chip once the war ended. Um, others countered that Syria had strong defenses, anti-tank ditches, minefields, and strong points, and that it would be better to fight from defensive positions of the Golan Heights rather than the flat terrain deeper in Syria. In the event of another war with Syria, however, Prime Minister Golda Meir realized the most crucial point of the whole debate. It would take four days to shift a division to the Sinai. If the war ended during this period, the war would end with a territorial loss for Israel in the Sinai and no gain in the north, an unmitigated defeat. This is a political matter, and her decision was unmitigating. To cross the Purple Line, the attack would be launched tomorrow, Thursday, on the 11th of October. Israel... Israeli advance towards Damascus. Damascus. On the 11th of October, Israeli forces pushed into Syria and advanced towards Damascus along the Kunitra Damascus Road until the 4th of October, encountering stiff resistance by Syrian reservists in prepared defenses. Three Israeli divisions broke the first and second defensive lines near Sasa and conquered a further 50 square kilometers of territory in the Bashan salient. Um, from there, they were able to shell the outskirts of Damascus only 40 kilometers away using M107 heavy artillery. The Israeli army advanced within 30 kilometers of Damascus. On the 12th of October, Israeli paratroopers from the elite Se uh, Sayeret Zan Hanim reconnaissance unit launched Operation Gaon, infiltrating deep into Syria and destroying a bridge in the tri-border area of Sy Syria, Iraq, and Jordan. The operation disrupted the flow of weapons to Syria. During the operation, the paratroopers destroyed a number of tank transports and killed several Syrian soldiers. There were no Israeli casualties. Jesus. Arab military intervention. I feel like the scariest part about pushing towards um, Damascus would be like the angering of other Arab states, that you would start pulling in more uh, people into the war. Although I guess maybe Israel figures if they're going to join, they're going to join anyway, maybe. I'm not sure. Arab military intervention. Um... Yeah, bringing the Soviets in. That's true, actually. The scary part would actually be bringing the Soviets in. That's right. Um. Okay. Um. Okay, as the Syrian position deteriorated, Jordan sent an expeditionary force into Syria. King Hussein, who had come under intense pressure to end the war, uh, told Israel of his intentions through U.S. intermediaries and in the hope that Israel would accept that this was not a casus belli, justifying an attack on Jordan. Expeditionary force into Syria. Okay. Israel, Jordan's trying to play both sides here. Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Moshi. Uh, Moshe Dayan declined to offer any such assurance, but said that Israel had no intention of opening another front. Iraq also sent an expeditionary force to Syria, consisting of the 3rd and 6th Armored Division, some 30,000 men. Uh, Israeli jets attacked Iraqi forces as they arrived in Syria. The Iraqi divisions were a strategic surprise for the IDF, which had expected 24-hour plus advanced intelligence of such moves. This turned into an operational surprise as the Iraqis attacked the exposed southern plank, flank. The advanced Israeli armor, forcing its advanced units to retreat a few kilometers. Um, 
Uh, let's see, Arab military intervention. Hmm, Syria and Iraq sent expeditionary forces into Syria to defend. Um, ba -ba -ba. Combined Syrian, Iraqi, and Jordanian counterattacks but any further Israeli gains um, to defend from further Israeli military advancement. Syrian Air Force attacked uh, Israeli columns, but its operations were highly limited because of Israeli air superiority. It suffered heavy losses of dogfights with Israeli jets. On the 23rd of October, a large air battle took place near uh, Damascus, during which the Israelis shot down 10 Syrian aircraft. The Syrians claimed a similar toll against Israel. The IDF also destroyed the Syrian missile battery or missile defense system. The Israeli Air Force utilized its air superiority attacks to target targets throughout Syria, including important power plants, patrol supplies. Um, geez, okay. Um, Israel was able to launch strikes all across Syria, attacking power plants, petrol supplies, bridges, and main roads. The strikes weakened the Syrian war effort and disrupted Soviet efforts to airlift military equipment into Syria and disrupted normal life inside the country. On the 22nd of October, the Golani Brigade and the Sayeret Metkal Commandos recaptured the outpost on Mount Hermon after a hard-fought battle. Um, that involved hand-to-hand -hand combat and Syrian sniper attacks. An unsuccessful attack to expire it cost Israelis 23 dead and 55 wounded. An IDF D9 bulldozer supported by infantry forced its way to the peak. <laughs> Jesus. It's an armored bulldozer used by the Israeli Defense Forces. An Israeli paratrooper force landing by helicopter took the corresponding Syrian Herman 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 outpost on the mountain, killing more than a dozen Syrians while losing one dead and four wounded. Seven Syrian MiGs and two Syrian helicopters carrying reinforcements were shot down as they attempted to intercede. <clears throat> on the 22nd of October, um, UNSC Resolution 338 called for a ceasefire. The war would finally come to a close on the 26th of October. Israel and Egypt signed a formal ceasefire agreement. A formal ceasefire on the 11th of November. And the disengagement agreement happened on the 18th of January. Of 1970, what? 74, it must have been, right? Jordanian participation. The US pressed King Hussein to keep Jordan out of the war. Um, though King Hussein initially refrained from entering the conflict on the night of the 12th, 13th October, Jordanian troops deployed to the Jordanian Syrian front to, but to buttress. Buttress Syrian troops and Jordanian forces joined Syrian Iraqi assaults on Israeli positions. Hussein sent a second brigade to Golan on the 21st of October, according to historian Asif David. Declassified US documents show that Jordanian participation was only a token to preserve King Hussein's status in the Arab world. The documents show that Israel and Jordan had a tacit understanding that the Jordanian units would try to stay out of the fighting, Israel would not try not to attack them. Wow, secret alliance. Okay. Naval operations. Bruh. Does anybody really care? Do these matter? Whew. How far are we into this? How much longer? Oh, we're almost at the end. Egyptian atrocities. Jesus. Um, Syrian atrocities. Where are my Israeli atrocities? Hello? Oh. <sighs> 
Let me use the restroom real quick. Hold on. Jeez. Okay, I love you all very much on YouTube, but I'm gonna do my um, kick or keep show, so I have to move over to kick. Um, okay, be careful. I'm shutting my YouTube stream, okay, be careful. I'm gonna be on kick. God, this fucking, this the Fabian guys here. Oh, kill me. Oh, well, well, well. Okay, that's cool, yeah, you just, everybody's just fucking ignore me, okay. We'd established a norm of silence, apparently. We did. That's I, I requested that we speak to people, but then Fabian was like, no, I have camera stuff. And then everyone else was just like, I guess that means that no one's- Well, speaking. it wasn't me, it was Lonerbox. Like, Lonerbox is like, shh. I, I blame Fabian. That was me. Who was I was like, whatever, I got no camera way. shit to like, do. Like, I had to, my camera was fucked up. I gotta take a piss. Oh, interesting. Back. I don't sound like Lonerbox. What? Oh, oh hello? You are- oh, Wait, wait, why is Prime deaf? SDL, could you turn your camera on, please? Thank you very much. Uh, Kenneth, how are you feeling? Uh, you know, just methed out, you know? I see you've been doing research. Are you finally ready to educate yourself instead of giving us, you know, kind of shitty contrarian takes? Because at this point, honestly, I don't even need to look at your Twitter or your YouTube to know what's your take on the conflict. I can just see what Hassan said, and then I'll be like, oh, Destiny probably holds a opposing thought or position. Wow, Anyways, base, uh, yeah. true. Um, I, I mean, really, it is. Like, you, are you telling me you've never had a doubt since this conflict began? Like, oh my god, like, all my positions and takes are just contrarian to all these fucking leftists that are pro MS. You never thought that? Not one time? Mm. Or am I reading it to it? I don't define my political positions based on people I don't like, so that's not usually how I think about them. Yeah. Bro, if bro, if you're mm. disagreeing with Hassan, you're probably fucking right. Like you're talking about like he's not even smart enough to be called a midwit and he's a far leftist. Like come on. Damn. That's what do you say to that, Carlos? 
that, that, that's like, like that's okay. you could just accidentally argue. be right, even if that's not like your how you're defining your political philosophy. Like, don't get me that's wrong. That's how I define that's, my political. You know, I hate you. I hate everyone <laughs> to the left. I hate every statist. You know, I hate you. But you fuck it. Fuck. Come on. And am I tripping? Oh, but if I were to go, well, no, I mean, okay, listen. Other, than, you know, Hassan is Hassan, whatever, right? We don't have to agree with him. But if I were to go to your YouTube channel, I think out of all the videos you made on the conflict. Each, like, maybe one or two of them don't involve Hassan, and the other one is you talking about leftists and their unhinged takes when it comes to their support of Hamas. So I'm happy that you're actually, you know, doing some research. I'm impressed. Well, Before most you. of Anyways. my disagreements in haven't been about the conflicts, but about their coverage of the news, which obviously I disagree with, right? And then the yeah. way that they find well, them, you know. Do you disagree with? You know what? Can I say that again? You've inspired me. I'm going to get up again. I'm going to go put eucalyptus in the essential oil uh, diffuser so I can deal with you fuckers. Thanks. Uh, I was just asking what examples of something that you disagree with from the coverage. Um, the framing of every single Palestinian death as a civilian death. The framing of the IDF as indiscriminately killing civilians. Um, obviously, the initial coverage of the hospital attack. Um, and then the propaganda that's being spread right now that, like, uh, for instance, for that German Israeli girl that she was like taken to a hospital and everybody was getting along and um, Apparently now there's like conspiracy spreading that all these civilian deaths just were due to crossfire Between Hamas and the IDF shooting it like all of these things are yeah, those are four or five. I think yeah I mean, did you just see did you just see uh, the IDF? Uh, targeting a refugee camp claiming they got a senior Hamas commander Because listen, I don't even have a problem with you covering you know, the unhinged takes or some of the misinformation that's being spread by one side or the other, but it just seems like there's an incredibly heavy bias where it's only covering, you know, the shit that Palestinians are getting wrong or people that are pro-Palestine because when it comes to the Israelis and what they're doing, you haven't really been covering shit when it comes to them. So, I don't know, but you claim, you know, you claim you don't have a side, you claim that you're just seeking the truth, so let me for you. Thanks. Anyways, this is not about you, Kenneth. Did you start the timer, by the way? Don't start the timer when I'm doing all of this, because we didn't even get into the show. Uh-huh. I haven't started anything, don't worry. Okay, we well, started now. <clears throat> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 17 of Kick or Keep. Today, we brought together seven wonderful contestants. They'll be going head-to-head -head in an elimination-style debate. Ah, did I say elimination? No eliminations this week, ladies and gentlemen, yes. It'll be more of a podcast. We'll let people go back and forth. Just, just don't fucking talk over each other. That's the only fucking rule, right? But at the end, we're still selecting a winner, right? And chat, that's on you. But we're all Wait, real quick. Wait, so then different. do we have a timer or no? We just like... No, I'd still like to time the topic because I don't want us to like just stay on one topic for two hours and then that's the end of the fucking show. So let's still do the timers. But it's going to be like 25 minutes for all the rounds pretty much. We're not going to decrease. Okay. With all that being said and done, I'm your host, kick.com slash Arantos. That's Q-O-R-A-N-T-O-S, live right now. Joining me is my co-host, uh, Destiny. You want to say hi? Hi, what's up? I'm it's Destiny. Okay, there we go. Before I do the introductions, I want you guys, you know, say a little about yourself and also tell us what your position is because I'm curious, right? You lean more towards, you know, being on the Palestinian side or the Israeli side. So, to the right of destiny, we've got Dylan Burns. Introduce yourself, please. My name is Dylan Burns. I'm an American political Twitch streamer and, uh, I guess you could say, amateur war journalist. My positions, I think, for the American political spectrum are definitely more pro-Palestinian. But saying that I'm pro-Palestinian does not mean that I need to align with a lot of the authoritarian uh, nation states like Iran or groups like Hezbollah that back uh, a lot of the militant groups that are fighting into the Gaza Strip right now. Um, there you go. There we go. Thank you for the intro. To the right of Dylan Burns and above me, I repeat contestant, the one and only, ladies and gentlemen, Fabian. Did I get it right this time? Fabian. There yes. we go. Fabian Maybe. Liberty Scott. There we go. Introduce yourself. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Scott from Fabian Liberty. I mean, find me on YouTube and Rumble. I'm an anarcho-capitalist, which is basically like mm -hmm. the most extreme form of libertarian. Um, 
So I, I find myself in a very weird position um, because I hate all nation states. So fuck the state of Israel. Um, and yet what I mostly find is a, an old trope of Marxist organizations supporting an oppressed class of other socialists spewing a bunch of communist propaganda and bullshit history and very little people actually understand the conflict. They just kind of understand that pre-programmed oppressed oppressor narrative. And so despite the fact that, you know, I'm very critical of Israel um, and then there, I think there are a lot of things we should be doing to try and stop them and better things. I find myself more often than not trying to combat um, socialist agitprop misinformation and just all around bad takes that you should always expect from anybody that labels themselves a socialist or anything further left. Okay, there we go. Thank you for the introduction. To the bottom of Destiny and to the left of Prime, we'll get to you. Crowd favorite, Loaderbox. Introduce yourself, my man. Hey, I'm Lonerbox. I uh, generally lean more towards the Palestinian side, although I do believe Israelis have a right to live where they live now and live there in peace. Um, I think for Palestinians, I think the question is fundamentally, it's not about who has an innate right to what land or tracing back some arbitrary point in history. To me, it's a question of human rights. I think Palestinians have a right to self-determination, to civil liberties. I think refugees have a right either to return or to reparations or restitution. I think they are owed a lot of uh, reconciliation. How we get from here to there, I don't know. I guess we'll figure out in the panel. There we go. Thank you for the introduction. To the right of Loaderbox and below Dylan Burns, we've got Prime Keynes? Keynes? Which, which one is it? Whatever you like. Um, okay, but uh, uh, thanks uh, for having me here. I hope you all can hear me uh, well. Um, just uh, take a moment to uh, you know thank my. Uh, fellow uh, contestants hey scott um uh loaner box i haven't seen you in a while tom i love you i miss you sdl so and nice to meet you quibble um but uh, and thank you for inviting me so much uh, um so my name is prime kai uh p-r-i-m-e-c-a-y-e-s you can find me on twitch and youtube and uh simply put my position is free palestine from the river to the sea thank you mm, my man oh wait uh, <clears throat> below loner and diagonal to prime we've got Ted Kiz, ah, so my bad. Quibbles over coffee. Go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Cool. Um, I'm Quibbles over coffee. I'm broadly pro Israel. Um, I'm not sure if the question was in reference to what America should do or what Israel should do. Um, in terms of what America should do, we should continue to fund the Iron Dome. Um, we should probably try it. I mean, you know, I can list a bunch of different things, but I, I don't want to do that now. Um, and then in terms of what Israel should do, I think they're going to have to do, unfortunately, an occupation um, of the Gaza Strip. All right, there we go. Thank you for the introduction. To our penultimate contestant, to the right of Quibbles, we've got SDL. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Mom. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Aiden. I run the channel Sucked on Left. And yeah, I'm pretty pro-Palestinian. I think the root cause of the violence here is the occupation. You don't have to support Hamas to say that. Um, the only way that you're going to see a long-term end to this is an end to the occupation. There's a reason that though Israel has bombed Gaza five odd times in the past two decades, shit hasn't worked. Uh, the vast majority of those deaths, some of like 80%, are not even military-aged men much less militants, but not even military-aged men. Uh, I think it's this is pretty close to uh, ethnic cleansing. Just one last stat before I go. 1.4 million people have been displaced here. We bombed Serbia for displacing 200,000. Mm. Thank you for that introduction. Last but not least, Tom motherfucking flu. Flu? Flu? Bro, why can't I read? Foolery. There we go. Introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, my name's Tom. I go by Tom Fuller Show on YouTube and Kick. I don't know that I'm pro one side over the other. Um, definitely out of all the people here, I'm probably the least educated on this topic, but I'm arrogant enough to show up for a panel anyways. And so I'm here to solve this crisis with you fine people. Thank you for the introduction. With that, ladies and gentlemen, let's get on with the motherfucking show. So question number one. And by the way, let's see. Uh, listen, if you if you feel the inclination to jump in, you know you can jump in. You know what I mean? Chilling, okay. it. this, it's it's long form. You know what I mean? It's yeah. long form. Is it? Yeah. We don't. Yeah, we don't mind it. This episode. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, 
following the October 7th attack and the subsequent counterattack by Israel, can violence or armed resistance ever be justified as a means of achieving political goals for either side in this ongoing conflict? Let me start with you, Loner. What's your take on this? Um, yeah, I think Palestinians have a right to use some degree of violence. It's a fucking military occupation. Um, I don't think that means that you're okay to go and kill civilians in a festival in the middle of a field. I, I much prefer the kind of like Mandela ANC style of going for like sabotage of infrastructure rather than targeting people because then you don't have to deal with the problem of uh, having to spend like a hundred years reconciling for all the pain and death that you've caused like trying to end the occupation. Um, Israelis, I think they have a right to go after Hamas. Uh, I don't know what proportionality looks like exactly, but um, yeah, they have some right to do something. They can't just sit there and take it. All right, Fabian, go ahead. And by the way, feel free to fucking cut each other off if, you, if somebody says something okay. you disagree with, right? Like, Tom, this ain't one of those typing. Kiddo. Tom, can you typing? Just so you know. Yeah, it's true. Just Thank you when you're typing, please. All right, Fabian, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I largely agree, right? I, I think, you know, justified is a question of, uh, is a different question of than what should someone do? And I think we should maybe, like, separate those two things, right? Like, I agree that, like, attacking infrastructure, government installations, government employees um, is something that Hamas, maybe not Hamas, because Hamas has kind of like lost most of their their rights, uh, justifiably so. Um, but Palestinian organizations um, that haven't committed terrorist attacks have, have that right. But it's it's not a good tactic, right? Like it's, it's a really bad idea. Um, it's, it's not gonna help anybody. And if you're a consequentialist in your framework, um, we can, still hear someone else typing. Um, if you're a consequentialist in your framework, then then you kind of have to look at that and go, okay, well, if it's only going to cause more problems for everybody, um, then then you would probably have to say that it's unjustified. So anybody that's saying that it is justified, it's very interesting because uh, you know I would I would then question what their moral framework is because they're kind of proving to not be a utilitarian or consequentialist, and so I'm I'm wondering where they're yeah. where they're getting that justification from. But yeah. So, I'm just curious, is there uh, anyone on the panel who thinks that it's a good idea um, or justifiable to attack civilians? Um, it depends on who you define as civilians. This part's very important. Just right? regular, like, normal Israelis, people living on a kibbutz. Again, again, you have to define what that means, because we can understand that the settlers are armed, the settlers are attacking and clearing out villages themselves, right? And someone can call them a civilian, but they are not. Uh, so uh, they are um, uh, active participants in this violence. And so if the... Uh, so you're uh, saying... Were to, if the Palestinians, I'm going to answer your question. If the Palestinians yeah. were to attack uh, those settlers, armed settlers, who um, uh, shoot, kill, rape, murder these uh, individuals, yes, it's perfectly justified to uh, fight back. So I just want to be clear. Are you saying, when you say civilian, uh, when you say um, settlers, are you saying solely the people in the West Bank are you saying people in the West Bank also Israel proper? Are you saying West Bank Golan Heights? What are you saying? I'm, I, I, that's, that's like I said, there, this is the, uh, a good question because uh, as you're uh, properly pointing out, um, not all settlers have equal like access to Palestinians and, um, and not all settlers uh, are even armed. Like there is, this is a spectrum. So I'm not exactly sure where that line is. Uh, but certainly the ones who are actively... Well, it's a relevant um, line. You uh, should have an answer to the question of where the line no, is, right? I, I, no, saying, no, 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 sorry. Well, I'm not going to pigeonhole. I understand a spectrum of uh, of, uh, of violence that's being ha done here. Some people are doing it... Right, happily, but I'm asking whether or not you're willing active, to condemn uh, uh, hold the murder on, hold of on, children. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'll answer your question. Excuse me. So I can okay. understand that there's a difference between uh, these two. Now, if you're asking me exactly where is the line, no, I don't know where exactly where the line uh, is, but um, uh, there is there are active militants, um, settler militants, and they certainly are, are justified targets. Can I, let yeah, me ask, wait, 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 hold on, let me ask, let me ask a clarifying question. Okay, just, you know, okay. So for the purposes of this conversation, I think all of us can agree that when somebody says civilians, I think all of us agree that we're talking about uh, citizens of Israel that are not engaged in direct military or violent confrontation. So for instance, 
I would be shocked if anybody in here was opposed to Palestinians in the West Bank enacting violence on aggressive settlers using firearms to clear out camps. I think everybody in here is, would probably say there are justifications for that type of counterattack. I think we're probably. I think the point of the question was to get more to like, for instance, the people that were partying at the uh, festival. Would these types of settlers be okay to enact violence against on settlers. behalf of the Palestinians? Stephen, you're incorrect. Those weren't settlers. Those were people yeah. in Israel proper. What? Those people were in Israel proper. Um, they weren't in Gaza. I'm sorry. I understand what you're saying. Um, you're there right. are some people, um, some, a lot of Palestinians. There are people in the West Bank. Sorry, That's hold on. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. One sec. Just to be clear. There are some people that would consider all Israeli citizens settlers. So... That's what I'm saying, like the, the, the wording that we use, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying civilians um, that aren't engaged in direct military op occupation, because when people say violence is okay against settlers, there are a lot of people that consider every Israeli citizen a settler. So that's what I'm trying to, yeah, clarify, right? So Yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah. I think, okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming I, I in that. and having to give definitions because leftists want to subvert things. I want to there's ask a, you, no, I want to ask you that. Prime, when it comes to definitions of settlers, I mean, you said sat, so when you say settlers, you always qualified it with settlers who are engaging in violence and attacking Palestinians. Well, that doesn't matter if they're a settler or not. Like, even if a, a civilian does that, you're okay to defend yourself against them. So um, I know legally just being a settler, like a nonviolent settler, makes you a civilian. You're a civilian if you're a settler in the West Bank. Um, that's like international law. Do you agree with that? Or do you think the settlers, like, it doesn't matter if they're attacking Palestinians or not, just them being there makes them fair game for attack. What do you think? Yeah, uh, it's a tough question. I think overall, um, uh, I, I think that being part of the settlement movement is a violence being done to the Palestinian uh, people, right? Like uh, you are uh, uh, justifying and participating in the system. Just as a real uh, quick clarifying I, question, I'm sorry, just when you say settler movement, do you mean only people in the West Bank or do you mean all Israelis? Uh, I guess right now I'll just talk about uh, the West Bank. I'm more familiar with that rather than like what's happening in Israel proper. So I'll just speak to that. Um, so you are uh, uh, like actively participating in that. Um, and I don't want to whitewash that, but uh, I don't know how we can just like uh, as outside observers say it's okay to shoot like um, some kid who happens to have grown up in a settlement. I, I don't see how that can be uh, a proper target. We, you kind of showed your own contradiction, though. <laughs> wow. I, well, like you, you're saying there, there's a line uh, that, that you can't define of where someone stops being a civilian. And then you said, but if they're participating in the settler movement, well, well, they're not. So like, like, what is it? Is, is it, is it a person that goes to homestead property in an area and, and chooses to build a home, right? Are they in no longer a civilian because they're an adult participating in the settler movement or, or, or is it, or do they have to be someone that is actively armed? Like you, you kind of can't have your cake and eat it too. And kind I'm, of like wink, wink, nudge, to. nudge, violence is okay against all of those well, people. I would then be like, what, what, totally what not. Did I, okay. What did I just say? I, I, ju I made it very specific here. I said that like, I don't see how we can justify a person who is, who is simply uh, there and not actually doing active uh, violence, right? Like, or sorry, um, shooting someone, right? Because uh, to be clear, right? right like, that, who is it, like I said, uh, you contradicted yourself because you also said, right? Being yeah, sure, someone. whatever. Yeah, sure, sure. But anyway, I, I said that th those individuals um, who aren't doing that, uh, like, I, I don't know how we can justify um, attacking uh, them, right? So that would be uh, uh, problematic. What do you mean by I don't know how we can justify? It almost seems like you wish that you could find a way to justify attacking these people, <laughs> but that you can't actually logically he just say it. Like, justify it. You just mean it's well, unjustified. He's, all he's, saying he's not justifying guy, it. Nice, yeah, so all I'm doing is understanding that there's a, a that we we as observers want to look to see who is the good guy mm -hmm. and who is the bad guy. We want to establish lines and and uh, draw mm -hmm. and, and draw them in the sand. I understand that these things aren't are true in conflict zones, that uh, there are injustices that happen all the time to various degrees. Some of them might require an armed response, right? Um, and others, uh, it, I, I don't know, especially for the, the Palestinians, I don't know what, what they can do, um, but uh, that an armed response wouldn't be uh, necessary or justified. As simple as that. Okay, you also said that- um, I mean, It's as simple as that, but can you just say it would be unjustified? to attack people that have not attacked anyone else that have simply been a quote part of the settler movement and have built homes there. I'm sorry. That, that would be unjustified to attack those people. Can you just say it is completely unjustified to attack people who 
have done nothing other than protect their homes. Armed people that have protected their homes, but have not actively gone out and attacked any Palestinian people that have just moved into that area. Is it unjustified to attack them? What does what protected their homes mean, right? So if a Palestinian... Yeah, see, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Is that like yeah, you can't I'm just sorry, unequivocally say it would be wrong I, to do I, that. You won't, you won't put no, it's me not in complicated. a black white line. You can't you kill won't peaceful do that. people. It won't happen to me. I get you, Scott. I have a yeah, experience yeah, you won't go you in a box. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Okay, hold on, wait, wait. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, hold on. Just right, to, so you wait, 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 wait. Wait, okay, hold on. So just as a quick thing, okay? Um, the steel man argument for Prime Kai's position is, let's say that you're a bunch of Arabs, you live in an area, IDF forces come in, gun you down, kill everybody, blow your shit up, and then other settlers, under the protection of the IDF soldiers that murdered all, or cleansed all of the uh, ethnic Arabs that live there, now they build properties and homes and they live there, and then the IDF pulls back. Mm -hmm. Are the people that are now building houses on the bodies of your dead family members, are they enacting any form of violence, or are they safe despite the fact that they were put there with violence? That's like the steel man version of Prime Kai's argument. Yeah. So, I mean, if we take that, like, I would be all for, I would, oh, dude, I would love if people took a libertarian position of understanding property rights and actually went in at an individual basis and said that certain individuals had their homes stolen and that it's stolen land. And that the first thing you do is say, hey, look, I have the deed to this home. Please move off of this land. This is legally mine. And, you know, you have no right to be here. And then we escalated until a form where eventually we had to go to violence because they refused to move. Yeah. Yeah. I would love that. If if that was the case, but I know that that's not the steel man position because that would require prime guys to be. Yeah. Can we have a clarification? That, of that can't be the steel man position. That would be mine. <laughs> Wait, hold on. That is, that is literally the steel man position is that there might be quote unquote civilian no, no, no. settlements in Wait, the West bank, but those be. are put there on the auspice right. of IDF violence, right? That's the whole point. So Stephen, where would that be? Right. And the, the solution to that would be what individual specific location property, are you talking right? about? Like, like what I'm, I'm talking about the expansion of settlements in the West bank. Right. What specific expansion? What specific settlement? I, I don't know like the 40. name of the specific settlement, but the territory of the West Bank wasn't within the original Israeli borders defined after the War of Independence. Right. So, are you saying? So, are you every, saying that, every that single, the existence? Every single Israeli settlement, all of them, literally every single one. The only reason why that territory exists is because Israel has drawn armistice lines over it after a prior war, right? The Six Day War. So, are you saying? Are you saying the influx of 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 Jews, or are you saying? the area C as a concept, right? Like the, the area C as in, as in like it is controlled both militarily and civilly um, by the Israeli government is a separate question than whether or not there's an influx of Jewish people. So I'm which saying one of those that are you, are you every discussing? single Jewish settlement in the West Bank is arguably- But when you say settlement there, like my point is like, there's a difference between like, if people purchase land, this is Fabian's point, people purchase land gainfully, rightfully from people, um, from Palestinians, um, and then they purchase that land and they, then they live on that land. Like, what's the problem mm -hmm. there as a Jewish person? Like, why is it different for a Jew to do yeah, that than for a Muslim to do that, it? Because you're, you're, making, you're making an assumption that I think maybe is, again, another, another part of this socialist agit prop and murky waters that so many people have to dig through in order to understand what actually happened, is that, yes, you are definitely describing the way some settlements have been established. Also, other settlements have been established by people like kind of cheekily, peacefully moving in and then causing problems. And then the, they waiting for the Palestinians to attack and then wiping out that section and then being like, oh, all this new land is up for grabs. Right. And then there are other sections where individuals have gone to Palestinians, purchased land and then moved in and lived in that land. And th there's no stolen land involved in this process whatsoever, unless you believe that a Jew existing on the land taints the land itself. Yeah, but I think Prime is yeah, saying I mean, that he doesn't believe in violence against these people unless they're actively involved in violence themselves, not just by being on the land in and of itself. Right. Because if that, you said that, then... I, I, I would assume that, that, really that as well. And, that is and then well. I was yeah, like, hey, can clear. you say that? And then he wouldn't. Fabian, that's not quite true because right. there are examples where it actually has been stolen land. So the most famous example, the most recent one was in uh, 2017. It was in Mona, um, right? So that was an example of land that was just literally yeah. taken. I said um, there are examples that there are and just that, that started squatting. Right, like, right. You, and could, you could go all like, the way, Israel, you could go all the the way back. You could go all the way back to like the British mandate and say and like and if you really looked, you know, enough historically, and there were documents, right? Like uh, the Britain controlled areas, uh, you know, that have been left from the Ottoman Empire. I'm sure there's tons of land there that has been stolen from somebody or was public unused land. It like you know everything. Yeah, but I'm 
saying if you want to be properly ethical, it has to cases. go by a case by case basis. Yeah. So there's like, a difference between uh, an, my point is there's a difference between an outpost and an actual settlement. A settlement is a place that um, there are like genuine property rights of the people there. An outpost does not. So there are outposts that exist. Um, again, Modus. Okay. Most, okay. Most well, just to be example, clear, those property, rights, rights, yeah. those property yeah. rights are devolved yeah. under military occupation, though. Exactly. That's why they're not recognized okay. internationally. That's why they're illegal. They're illegal to Israel, but they're illegal to everyone else. Uh, okay. I think as a, as a quick, Scott. yeah, so yeah, just yeah. as a real quick thing. Your whole thing buying, is buying, 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 talk about Israel or anybody buying, else. Like, buying land and territory, right, is not necessarily a bad thing. Buying land and territory that you have like an unrecognized military occupation over is quite a bit different, especially when you're buying land from people that everybody agrees you've ethnically cleansed already from their homes and territory. Scott, like, I just want to, I just want to, um, like try to address your point directly. What I was trying to say, um, when you asked me that question, right? Like, will you sign on to this statement? I wanted to uh, show just how difficult it is just to just make any sort of blanket statement. So when you said, because before you said like uh, uh, an Israeli who is defending their home, right? Uh, is that person different from a person who's, who goes out and attacks Palestinians in another village? Well, if what I was trying to say is if a Palestinian comes back to that home and uh, says, hey, this is my my place, um, and that person, the Israeli, pulls out a gun on them, and then the uh, Palestinian escalates, like, is that justified? So I was just trying to, like, okay, hold on. complicate let me, the situation. Let me, let me, let me be as fair as I can. I what you're saying. And I, and in let fact, me be as fair as fact, I possibly I, can. I, I just don't... I, and in fact, I'm signing on more to uh, what you're like the homesteading uh, libertarian view of, uh, of this, right? So like, I'm trying to like build a bridge here. Go ahead. Right. If I can be as fair as I possibly can, right? Will you sign on to this statement? A person purchases property from a Palestinian, has a deed that shows that they purchased property from a Palestinian to move into an area for whatever reason that they desire because they like that. Maybe they're, maybe they just fucking love Palestinian people, right? Maybe they're just fucking the, you know, some, some super hardcore Tel Aviv lefty that just, you know, lives in solidarity with the Palestinians, right. And wants to live amongst them and they purchase land. Right. And, and then they live in their home and they have firearms and they've never used those firearms unless someone came in to raid their home they gainfully purchased. Is it wrong to commit violence against those people? Is it unjustified in that specific yes. example? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So we have a we have a we have a, we have, a, we have at least that includes some the area of where there are some people in the West Bank that it is unjustified to attack by your Absolutely, definition, yes. which means that a blanket okay. attack on quote unquote settlers in the West Bank is, is, is not justified. Absolutely. It needs to be looked at individually. You need wrong? to look at property disputes. Do you think that those Jews have done something wrong, Prime? Uh, which Jews? The Jews who are purchasing that land. Uh, from a you Palestinian? mean the uh, Jews? Uh, just <laughs> it out? From a Palestinian, certainly not. I mean, if a Palestinian wants to sell their land, and then, uh, yes. I mean, okay, I so if like in area C... Not a gun, so, gunpoint, yeah. So... I just want to clarify, if in Area C, a Jew wants to purchase land and they are a citizen of Israel, you are okay with them purchasing that land? Yeah, if they, if they got if they okay. get it, if they're not, if like, it's a fair uh, deal, obviously, right? If there's like pressure on this uh, Palestinian to sell, like the IDF is saying, we're going to clear this place out. And then some Jewish settler uh, comes in and it's like, oh, I'll, I'll give you some money for this, right? In that case, it's not so much. But in, but if it's just a regular... Okay. And that would be a case... Like, <laughs> absent <laughs> coercion. Absent, absent, absent coercion, coercion, but like... Absent coercion. But there's always going to be like some limited level of coercion. I just want to clarify what we're talking about. We're talking about, about. we're talking about Jewish people purchasing territory with no coercion from a group of people under indefinite military occupation. Just to be clear, that's what you're this saying. Is, this okay. is the problem I have with In this, area though, C, is that correct. it's kind of impossible to remove the coercion from the element when there's IDF soldiers on the beat, when the Palestinians in occupied territory are going to be treated by a separate set of laws than Israeli citizens, and they're going to be treated differently from the government than Israeli citizens. I think that state of conditions in and of itself is coercive to the Palestinians to make them want to leave and go to maybe to the diaspora overseas if their families are in France or in Germany or in the United States. 
To speak to that briefly, yeah, I think the so, rate of approval for there building, anything? but the rate of approval for building on Palestinian property, something like two percent. Like Israel overwhelmingly denies the ability of Palestinians to build their own shit on their own land because they don't want more Palestinians there. But like, where the, are you it's so obvious about? in where? in the the West Bank, they don't have exactly. control I over. I believe that number. I believe that statistics on Jerusalem. If you're talking about, if, about Jerusalem, that's certainly uh, that. I mean, I, I don't remember the exact statistics off, off the top of my head. But that wouldn't shock me in Jerusalem, but that's a very different conversation than West Bank writ large. <clears throat> my understanding is that in, like Ramallah, for example, right? My understanding is that for the West Bank, any sort of construction has to be done under the approval of the Israeli military because it's a military. They, like they're the controlling government of that area, right? Not just in East Jerusalem, but in literally all parts of the West Bank. No. Not in all of it. In in area C, that's true. In area B, it is militarily controlled by by Israel. It's not civilly controlled. So there are certain uh, cases in area B in which that would be the case. Um, in area A, that it was not true at all. So in most of the cities, um, which the majority of people live in, um, in, in in West Bank, um, that is not the case. All right. Does anybody else has anything to say before we move on to the next question? Any last stakes? I just want to remind everybody that in the beginning I said that. Palestinians can bomb uh, Israeli government buildings. I just, in case anyone accuses me of being too pro-state of Israel, just to I just read that specific example. <laughs> yeah, just to read the permitting thing. It's two percent of Area C, so the area under Israeli control. But so, like again, that's the sort of example of the coercion here. That if Area C expands and if Palestinians can't build there, then the amount of area that they get to control gets smaller and smaller and smaller. There's clearly a structural violence going on here that doesn't justify violence against individuals, but maybe does justify violence against the structures. So I'm, I'm curious. Do you have do you have the numbers what do you mean by violence for the Israeli the approval there? process? Isn't it like ninety four percent? I feel like I've seen these numbers before. It's very 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 high yeah. on the Israeli side. It's yeah, like, just, can you can exact you, inverse? Like send. Like I also think it'd be worth that I, area C one. I think it'd be worth I was going to ask as well. Okay, just, what percentage? Sorry, what percentage of settlers, like settler land, is actually just Jews purchasing the land from Palestinians who own the land? Because I thought uh, wasn't quite a lot of this land that was devolved to settlements actually unregistered land that was obviously taken under um, Israel during the occupation. Do you know? I mean, like most uh, most of Israel, well, that. most of of, of current day Israel, Palestine, Assyria, Palestine, whatever you want, was was you know just unused land <laughs> like most of it is public land that no one's been living on that's what like, i thought it, there's yeah. a lot I of it was, yeah. there's a large portion of israel that is like is unairable until people come there and build infrastructure or there are swamps or there is desert right um and specifically in the west bank yes you know the, the 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 land is a little bit better but it's still i mean like when you when you look at the best maps available in terms of like as as the zionist movement come in and with with each process there's still tons of public domain land that nobody's living on and then people go and live on it but that's why when we're talking this uh, argument about jews um buying up land from palestinians individually like maybe even under occupation maybe you can make an argument for that but i feel like in most cases it's it's settlers who are taking this land because that land was taken by israel in 1967 and that's like and that's where the majority of it comes from and i'd say that so the majority of cases that's why settler so, presence would be unethical, right? Yeah, so what's your view on what should happen on that land? Either land swapped, because those people are not going to want to live in a Palestinian state, or um, you withdraw. Probably I'd withdraw no, the I'm outposts saying, 100%. I'm saying but, prior, prior to the settlements, like prior to Jews moving in there, what well, should have happened to that land? So in 67? Yeah. Well... I think initially it wasn't even, it wasn't even, wait, Jesus Christ. I think, <laughs> I think even um, initially it wasn't even legal by Israeli standards for them. They just went there of their own accord. They just wandered in there themselves and kind of did it independently. So I think if Israel maybe just kind of enforced some rules there and said, wait, this isn't actually like going to be ours forever. Why is it on Israel to do? Because they're occupying the territory. Okay. So it's Israel's job to forcibly remove any Jews who want to go into the area. Yeah, to occupy to occupy territory if they want to if they want to like a path to statehood for their neighbors then yeah unless they just want to leave have the situation we have now, which so is you expand okay, elements so you, for you like 50, 60 that, years. Okay, so it is your stance that that in order for Palestine to be a separate country, it has to be an ethno state with no Jews. I don't say it needs to be an ethno state. First of all, okay, wait. Do you, sir, do you think these settlers would want to oh. live in a Palestinian state? Well, I'm, I'm asking, like, these are, these are not Israeli. I'm not saying it time. needs to be an you're ethno state. I'm Jews. saying, I'm not, it's not about the, it's not about, they could be the same ethnicity. It's that you're settling in occupied territory. 
okay, where the people who live there don't not, have self-determination. Is, they have no say you over... Wouldn't make the same, you wouldn't make the same claim about all of the, the, the Palestinians who post Nakba were, were, were leaving Israel proper and going into the West Bank. So I'm curious, what's the difference there between Jews moving into the West Bank and Palestinians moving into the West Bank? And why? Because one, one group moved there as refugees, the other one moved there as settlers. So is your claim that the Jews in the 1940s and 1950s and 1960s were not refugees? The ones in 67, the ones who moved into the West Bank, I don't think they were refugees, no. I'm asking prior to that. Were like, they? At the beginning, at the beginning of the of the founding of Israel. Is you can ask me a completely different refugees? question if you want. No, yeah, I think the Mizrahi and North African Jews were refugees, but that's a completely different question. Okay. Well, and even okay. refugees don't Wait, have the right to even refugees don't have the but, right to go and like take other people's lands. Like that's that's not you the don't right. Have a right to to say, yeah, yeah. But like this, about again, other people's land. So refugees, I, I would imagine you have a right to be a citizen in Israel because that's like a country that <laughs> that wants to take Jewish people. So why would it be? Why is it such a uh, crazy idea? The idea that an occupying state, while well, occupying territory, should stop its own citizens or its own people from going there and settling on the territory of the displaced. Yeah, my point if is during like during World idea. War II, we had the standard in Germany, and we just started having random like American nationalist colonies all across Germany. We would expect the American government to expel them. The point I'm or trying when to we occupied like Iraq and Afghanistan, would it have been okay for me to just go in there and like set up a fucking the little is, tent? The and... point that I'm trying to make is is that I don't like Obviously this idea not. that Jews are by definition Israeli. That's a bad idea, right? They're, no one's they're just that Jews. They should stop Palestinian. Like, no, you kind of are. They, they, they should stop this, Palestinian this Arabs who want to go be settlers too. No, like, you're trying to make it. You're trying to make it. No, you're trying to make it an ethnicity argument. I'm saying I can apply this to anywhere. In occupied fucking Afghanistan or Iraq, it wouldn't have been okay for me to go there and just set up house under that regime. The point because is that you, same thing. You with, seem to have no problem. You seem to have no problem with an influx of Palestinians into this area, whether it's in 48, whether it's in 67, but you seem to, to have a very large problem. Because with they were forced there. Jews. I seem to have That's no problem with delineating the difference between settlers and refugees. Yeah, I don't have much of a problem making that separation. Okay, I have a question, are, I have a question, quibbles, quibbles. I, I yeah, have a question, it. just, you know, there seems to be, I, I'm trying to understand, is it, is it, is it an anti-Semitic thing? And I'm not accusing anybody here of anti-Semitic, anti-Semitism, just more, Kind of like a broad cultural thing. Is it an anti-Semitic thing, or is it a timeline thing, like 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 a certain distance in terms of time? Because like the way that I see it is like I agree, right? Like individual property um, that was owned, you know that that you know in forty eight you had fleeing Palestinian Arabs, um, you know if they can prove or show in any capacity that like they owned this portion of land and that it wasn't just unused land, that it's their land, not the settlers that came afterwards land. But, but it seems to be that there's like this weird thing where Israel is held to this like super libertarian property idea perspective that like no other country is held to. Because like, as far as I'm concerned by this logic, and I agree, most of you probably won't, all of Northern Georgia, every white motherfucker that lives there needs to get off of their land right now because then the Cherokee nation in 1850 that was forced to walk the trail of tears, they, they homesteaded land. They had a post office, they had property deeds. They did everything they could to prove that that is their land. And so like, you don't like, if you live in Northern Georgia, okay. you're not just, I, I got to stop land. Yeah, land. Yeah, you, know, you, know, you know that every left on here is pro reparations. I, I guarantee it. Right. Like, so, the so, like no, prime, Ka, prime Kai or loaner box, do you oppose me. reparations? I know. Right? Is He's a totally asking the question to you because you're going to agree with him, right? And we're stepping into disagreement. Well, I'm not going to agree so with him. So do either of the lefties. I'm not going to agree with him. Oh, Talk about, I am not going to agree with him. The, po the answer to the question is no, it is not anti-Semitic for people to be concerned about the Palestinian right to lands, even post-48, even post-67. There is a very real concern that there is a large number of people who have been forced out in, uh, during the Nakba. There is a very real concern that, yes, Palestinians have a right to live in this area. But I, uh, what I contend with is I think this idea that Jews don't have a right to live in the West Bank, which is a very important component of our historic lands, um, I think that is, a, that is a crazy idea. And I think that it is just as absurd to say it about Jews as it is to say it about Palestinians. Okay, I mean, first of all, not, not for, first of all, no one gives a fuck but, about what's in, what your Dunlop, important historical Sock line. But also, was, sorry, was, sorry, was sorry. actually answering my question. Like Sock Dunlop was actually answering my question, and you just latched onto the anti-Semitic remark. Like, like 
is there any way Stockton Love could finish? Because like I think well, preparations sure. I mean, are I, different. I, I mean, yeah, it sounds like Loderbox was going to Loderbox was going to give the same answer that historical land, whatever, is not the important thing here. Like Israel is unique in part because what other countries are doing th settlement like Israel. Part of the reason that we talk about it this way is it's so rare nowadays. A lot of settlements like this died in 1960 during decolonization, but Israel's didn't. Israel's has been going on for another 50, 60 years. That's why. We only talk about Israel in that sense. People did talk about stuff like this, about like French colonies and British colonies in random far off countries where they set up their own little tiny ethno state of British only or French only, and they get to run the whole country from there. Yeah. Like that. And I just want to say as a quick, as a, as a quick, as a, as a quick, wait, 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 hold on. As a, as a, French a, colonialism. A, wait, wait, well, hold on. Just as a quick thing I'd like to throw in here too. I also think it's okay. We can meaningfully talk differently about the Palestinian peoples because while the rules of the world might have been con uh, like conquest and conquer and take the territory, um, and I think it's 1945, like the UN has an official charter that a whole bunch of countries around the world sign on to that actually like explicitly gave people the right to self-determination for people to live on land and to exist there in a way that like the Cherokees or native people in North America didn't. So I think it's worth speaking in a world where all of us try to abide Mr. roughly Mr. by inter international law, the UN Charter explicitly in chapter one, article one, whatever, like explicitly states for people to have a right to a self-determination of people in a land. So that would make it a little bit different but than like North America stuff. All right, hold on. Wait, 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 Tom, Tom, hold on. I want to shift gears slightly, okay? We've been on this topic for a bit. On the same like sort of topic. I want to ask you guys this, right? Do you believe in a two-state solution? If yes, what are the rightful borders between Israel and Palestine? Quibbles, I want to start with you. Okay, I want a clarification. Um, when you say believe in, do you mean I want it or do you believe, does that mean like I believe it's as possible? In, I wouldn't say want Whatever it. Whatever you in, want like, it do to think, be. Do, do you think, no, no, do you think, do you think that would be the best solution if there would be two states? I think the best solution to try to get to in the period of the next 40 years is eventually to have Gaza be an independent country, have much of the West Bank, but not all of the West Bank be an independent country, and have particularly the areas that are closest to the border um, of the settlements folded into Israel proper and have that be a third country. Okay. Um, but I think it's going to happen tomorrow, and I think that it's going to take a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, struggle. And I think it's going to require that there's an occupation of Gaza for a long time to get there. And I think it's going to require that, unfortunately, many hundreds of thousands of people are going to die. I think it's going to be screwed for a really long time. Yeah. So when you say the settlements should become part of Israel proper, um, I guess that would also mean the West Bank would be kind of disconnected, right? Because those settlements run in between. Yeah, that's why, communities. that's why I clarified. Yeah, so thank you for I, I, just explaining why people are saying, getting for reasons no, no, that no, are that's not that's, and why, that's, cool. that's fine that's why i clarified i was talking about the ones that now we are know specifically on the border right there's a, the, the overwhelming majority of settlers um are within a mile of the border some like 90 percent are literally within a mile of the border so those settlements that are very close to the border that are there for primarily for fiscal reasons i would put them in a separate category than the ones that are there primarily for religious reasons which are much further inland i don't know so and even in camp david the settlements it, then running between communities were uh, prevalent enough that it would have kind of disconnected the West Bank. So I can't imagine a settlement now would not include that, though, unless you wanted yeah, to it, dismantle some of them. The answer is that there's going to be some number of Jews that are folded into that that, that Palestinian West Bank, and there's going to be some number of, of, of Palestinian non-Jews um, that are folded into Israel proper as a result of this. The this is going to be complicated. There's a reason it's going to take 40 years to get to it. Um, but I do think that that's the closest to a reasonable solution that I can think of. And again, it is not happening tomorrow. And again, it's going to be incredibly bloody to get to it. So I would Wait. say two things. The first, yeah. um, the only ethical solution um, that, that, that doesn't violate anyone's rights is that the state of Israel, the nation state of Israel dissolves. Um, and that, you know, private property rights and anarchism is given to everybody. But, you know, kumbaya, la la land, fucking utopia shit, right? So I would say that, you know, a proper, you know, a, a better situation tactically towards reestablishing property rights um, would have to be a two state solution, much like was offered. I would say, you know, 67 borders is probably the closest we'll get. I'm going to just disagree with many of the, the pro Israel stands in terms of, of, of um, you know, the West Bank areas, I think those should be under um, the Palestinian Authority. Um, and and most of those people will probably have to flee because when you have a majority Muslim country and you're a Jew, you can pretty much expect that 
you know, that they'll kill you. Um, Can I ask you a quick clarifying question? Because I'm actually not sure. When people um, say, just as a quick question, I'm not sure if you guys know this. When people say 67 mm-hmm. borders. Do they mean like 48 borders or do they mean like post six day war borders? Like what are they talking about when they say no, pre-67 no, no, borders? Pre-67. Okay. Gotcha. Just make sure. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, sorry. So 67 borders pre yeah. So um so I would say that as well as like what was offered in 2019 to the Palestinian Authority that they rejected which is 67 borders and um you know um joint control over all holy sites in Jerusalem um was offered and and so you know it's been offered multiple times I believe. Um and so like that I think that's probably the best deal. Yeah, the 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 2019 like perfect deal or whatever. That was the just Trump that never deal. got to talks. The Trump yeah, just deal. never went to talks. Yeah, yeah. yeah the Trump deal. The they one, just immediately were like, no, fuck okay, you. We everyone everyone right. Google the map for the Trump peace plan and uh, wonder, ask yourselves why the Palestinians weren't interested in that. Just Google the am map. I, am I incorrect? Am I incorrect? Well, that it was, have you the seen Trump them? Was not the Trump deal was 2020, but there's a good reason Palestinians were never going to accept this, right? Have you seen the map? You, you know, people literally it looks like someone just like flicked paint on the israel map and you've got fucking palestinian territory right people have literally posted I mean, memes I'll, I'll of like here. subdividing california with vision for peace up top because of how fucked it is where you like you carve yeah. out like the, the, the top the like the eight red counties in california and it looks the fucking same well, it's it's a joke the, it's one of the things so, that i find when, a little bit frustrating so, so what i'm referring to is before like before a map before any deal before anything was put forward right trump said um, well, I don't know that it was Trump specifically. I can't remember exactly who it was, but they were t- speaking about 67 borders and joint control. And then the P- Palestinian Authority, without ever seeing the deal, said that they needed to reject it. Um, just um, as a quick thing, because I just so, look this up real like, quick, just as a real quick, looking up this, looking at the borders that were proposed for this, um, the amount of territory here allotted to the Palestinians seems significantly less than what existed in 40, from 48 to 67. And it looks like the Palestinians weren't even consulted when it came to... Um, doing this proposal. So it's not surprising that anybody would. Yeah, it was an this. untenable solution. Yeah, it's, it's, I will it's say a that the map, Regardless, map itself, the, the 2019 it, deal is not, is not the point we look of at what maps, I'm saying. Like every deal since so, um, Geneva has been a whole horse was, shit would never happen. That was yeah. the deal. That I will the say, deal. so there's a couple of things. Yeah, yeah. The I, first I, thing, I have no problem. Wait, hold on. Fabian, 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 one second. We'll, we'll stalk it. Let him finish and then you could go ahead. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay. There's a couple of things. The first thing that I will say is that the, the idea of having, I mean, this is this is exactly what Lunarbox was saying earlier, and he's, he's totally right about it. The idea of having these um, you know, territories that are that are not actually connected is a really dangerous idea. The, this is why I think that the idea of Gaza um being the same country as West Bank, I think is just untenable. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, but the second component that I, I do think is worth, worth pointing out um, is that when you look at maps like this, it's very similar to like the Electoral College. Republicans will constantly look at like an Electoral College and be like, oh, look, at the whole thing is red, right? Except these tiny little cities. Well, yeah, but the cities are blue, right? So like similarly, well, yeah, if you look like a, a, at a map like that, what, what it's saying there is the majority of the areas that people don't live in are going to end up being under Israeli control, which makes sense from a military perspective, because from a military perspective, that is somewhere that you're able to shoot off rockets from. And so it has a lot of military implications but has very little implications in terms of the daily life of many of the people who actually live in cities. Is there anybody who thinks that the West Bank I don't support this. should this. be one state while separated like that? Say it again? Is there anybody who does think that the West Bank and Gaza should be one state while separated like that? Yeah, that was, the, that was, that was what the Trump peace bound was. Yeah, that was, that was up until like this month the broad view of a lot of people. It's, it's very recent that people believe that Gaza um, and the West Bank need to be considered to be like separate things. Um, that is not something that either the Palestinian or the Israeli side were in support of up until this month. Um, and that's pretty remarkably changing. I'd not heard other people talk about that um, until this month. Well, is the three-state solution gaining traction amongst politicians in Israel yeah. and Palestine? I would say well, so. I mean, like, I, certainly, I figured that they were going to redraw borders solution, to where they would actually connect in some way. I would say... Or that they yeah, would well, be. Well, yeah, senior Israelis are talking about just kicking all the Palestinians out and they've drafted up plans so, and crossed it out, but yeah, that's the plan that's rising in their I, minds. So, or that. so real quick, I just wanted to go back look, look, real quick, real quick. I had not looked at a map. I had only read from sources without looking at a map. I was wrong. I just wanted to publicly take that L because I don't want to I don't want to bullshit and what if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, right? That's all I wanted to say. Sure. Continue. Sigma Okay, it doesn't have to get quiet after that. Like you don't have to make this worse for me. <laughs> <I> was, <laughs> <laughs> this moment will never come again. So I'm just gonna hit sit here and enjoy it. We're, we're, but uh drink you have it done in, that yeah. like multiple times on your show. Don't I know, I know, I know. I'm just messing with you, friend. I always take um, my L's publicly, all right? I don't try and like wash over them. Fuck off. Oh. 
You're good. All right. All right. Let me ask you this, right? To what extent, and this is something that we've seen plenty, and this is something that I'm sure a lot of you guys have spoken about as well, but to what extent does media bias, both internationally and within the region, perpetuate or exasperate the conflict? And how can this be rectified for a fair representation of the situation? Because I'm sure a lot of you have, you know, some takes on the coverage of the conflict on both sides. Mm. Can we start with Destiny? No, let's start with Jackson Henkel. No one should listen to Jackson Henkel. Then you can say whatever else you were going to say. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on. What's your problem with Jackson Henkel? Jackson Henkel is communism an communism that, that we're done. That's it. Terms. That's retarded. Ah, yeah. stop, there bro, no problem. bro, bro. Fuck the American. Oh my God, communism, terrible. Like, no, wait, quibbles. What's your problem yeah. with Jackson Henkel? That Jackson Hinkle like regularly, just in, in, constantly, in terms of the the um, uh, attack on the hospital, in terms of lots of stuff, he's just like constantly saying complete. That was supposed to be a throwaway, but yeah, he's saying complete bullshit all the time, and it's just yeah. like okay. 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 is a habitual okay. grifter. Uh, all right, one second. Yeah. How would how would how would someone like Jackson Hinkle be different? to someone like Ben Shapiro and his takes and his coverage of the conflict. Because I think that Ben Shapiro at least attempts broadly to be truthful, even if he is biased. Mm. That's different than Jackson oh, Hinkle, cool. who is both biased and doesn't even attempt it? to be truthful. Can wait, I, can I, can I, can okay. I draw a difference? Can wait, I draw a difference? Wait, 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 real quick, real quick. Just in terms of expanding what he's saying. I think the difference is Ben Shapiro, like, let, let's say there's a, a fight where five people bring guns on one side and five people bring guns on the other side. Ben Shapiro would report this as, wow, five really bad dudes like uh, showed up with guns and they managed to get killed by like good guys or whatever. He would never report that the other five guys had guns. He would only report one side of it. Jackson Hinkle would claim that 4,000 brave men were surrounded by like five murderers. He would completely fabricate the story. That's the difference. Ben Shapiro There's doesn't that. seem to outright lie, but he selectively chooses facts so much that the stories he tells are essentially dishonest. But it's not usually with an outright lie. So one is a I mean, little dishonest, the other is an outright liar. What Quibbles just said is, with Ben Shapiro, yeah, he tries or attempts to be honest. Wait, do, wait, hold on, hold on. Yeah, Does anybody else on this panel like him? I never said Ben Shapiro no, tends to be clear. I never said Ben Shapiro tends to be honest. I said Ben Shapiro usually won't fabricate fact. Uh, Jackson Hinkle will, has no obligation to be truthful in anything that he He'll show you a video from 2014 from Syria and claim that it's uh, IDF soldiers killing Palestinians today. He would do something like that. Ben Shapiro will say something like, uh, Arab nations attack Israel for absolutely uh, no good reason. He'll say something like that, uh, right? Ben Shapiro, ben Shapiro would also say there's 40 beheaded babies and provide absolutely no proof. But Loner, you wanted to talk about uh, Quibbles and his take that Ben Shapiro is more honest and wouldn't lie as Jackson Hinkle would? I did not no, ben Shapiro, ben Shapiro, ben Shapiro does, ben Shapiro does lie do. sometimes. Jackson Hinkle lies all the time. That's, that's all the difference is. No, but yeah, we're, we're just, just one last one. And, and, uh, and Jackson lies with a lot more impunity. Yeah. Hinkle is also he like does a lot more openly a grifter. So. Like he he went from being like a Warren Stan in 2018. He was an ML in 2020. He was a conservative communist in 2022. And then he went on fucking Fox News and was promoting George Soros controls the world. There's a deep state run by the FBI with George Soros conspiracy theories. Oh, the guy oh, is like God. either insane or a grifter. Like those are the two options. Uh, yeah. I mean, like there's 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 a fine line between like. Uh, okay, uh, Prime far wanted right, to insult Destiny. Right I want to hear about that. And done with Jackson. To be fair, that's not. Prime wanted to insult no. our grift. Like the like the far Prime right fascist Destiny. is like barely indistinguishable between the tanky. Let's be honest. Wait, hold on, okay. Slicker. Okay. Okay. Wait, wait, hold on, Quibbles. One second, Slicker. What do you want? Nice to meet you guys. Uh, I just want to come in here and say that you know I've not been watching too much. But, you know, i got to say something. I'm a threat. I am. I'm not trolling here. I'm not messing about. I feel like I'm a threat to society. And you know why? I don't know. I don't know you guys. One second. Let me just put you guys up. Nice to meet you. You bald head blinds know. people as you walk by? Bro, shut up. You're white. You're a cracker. Shut up. No one's talking to you. Okay. But I want to jump in straight and jump in. I want to jump in and straight talk. I want to talk and say some things, right? Number one, Destiny. Destiny, this is at you. You little cook. Look at me, baby. Now, let me ask you a question, right? Why does everyone here think they are eligible to say Hamas is a terrorist group? Let me hear that shit. Let me hear that from you guys. Why are we allowed to say Hamas is a terrorist group? Yeah. Because yeah, in their yeah, original ahead. charter, it seemed as though they were advocating for the destruction of Jewish people all across the world. Okay, well, I actually did hear that. That's, uh, okay, I think that is wrong, but that's the only reason <laughs> why they are... No, no, but that's the only reason why they are labeled as a terrorist group because of what they said about the Jews. That's well, not the only reason. They also no, no, engage... No, 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 listen to me, listen to me. Okay, you don't okay, want me to answer? Okay, go ahead, listen. yeah. There are okay, other okay, reasons too, to but yeah, go ahead. 
Okay, all right, okay. But listen to this. We shouldn't be saying that because we don't know that what what they're going for. We are not in their footsteps to say that they are a terrorist group. Now you know why. Listen to this as well. Destiny, you are a Palestinian. Your mom and your dad just died. Hamas comes up to you and says, "Oh, we're gonna go invade Iraq, uh, Israel." What are you gonna say after your mom and dad just died from Israel attack? Uh, I don't know. I guess I'd say, yeah, "Well, we I'll go be a terrorist like too." I mean, what do you want me to say? Judgment will not come. Until Muslims fight the Jews, when the Jew will hide behind stones oh, and get trees, the fuck out of here with that. Oh my bro, God. bro, bro, bro! You know what? You know what? Let me say something. Let me say something about this guy. Let me say something about this guy. Easily, easily. No, no, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Slicker. Wait, wait. Slicker, slicker. slicker. Hold on. Fabian, you just quoted. So that's just the 1988 with, charter of. No, no, no. You just quoted it with no context, with no background. You just said no, but this is the context makes. The trees and no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, wait, hold on. The Muslims to kill the hold Jews. Hold on, hold on. First of all, first of all, makes sense. First of all, first of all, we act as though Hamas was just created out of nowhere, out of the blue. First and foremost, no, I you wouldn't know. have. It. Yes, you fucking do, because you fucking act no, as though so Hamas just came out of nowhere just to fucking go out of Hamas because he wanted a group that was Islamist that would cause problems with the Palestinian Authority, and then his dumbass let it get out of control. Keep I'm going. a fucking libertarian, okay? But when somebody comes on here and tries to act like fucking terrorists, start pieces of shit. It's fucking stupid. And oh, you no, where is your, wait, 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 wait. Where, where is your energy for America, for Europe, for even Israel? Where's your energy for saying that? We you know what the whole me. world. You, listen, you white shit. You don't, don't talk to me like that. Me. But for My all energy, your, all your, energy, right all, your energy, right all your energy, all your energy, all your energy. I'm giving shit. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. If you're gonna talk about Hamas, first everyone in this world, everyone in this world should start talking about what America and what Europe has done to the or everyone. But because of white people dying in this world and this woman that's died, they don't want to show like IDF don't want to show pictures of any of the kids that died in Palestine. They don't give a shit. A lot of the people who died. In Israel, were like Thai migrant no workers. A lot of them as were an Iraqi, as an they Iraqi, weren't all white people. As an Iraqi that seen the dirty, scummy Americans invaded, and no, even Ukraine, Israel. even no. Ukraine wanted to jump in and invade Iraq. Slicker, when did you well, live in Iraq of, again? When did you live in Iraq again? It. Slicker, for no, how no, long? No, we, hey, we you guys are racist. Oh, listen, listen, we listen. Well, because racist. because a white because white right. people are we dying and getting people. invaded, we should tear for them. Go suck my dick. I don't give a fuck about you. Fuck you. And if you think Hamas is a terrorist, is, just is look at yourself in the mirror because you're living in a terrorist ass country, bitch. After, West side. After we're done with West the formative libertarian you, versus right, whatever this is, can we get back to something? All right. Yeah, and, like, and this, all first right. of all, and this homeless, I, I and this, and this guy, right. this, this electrocuted looking ass motherfucker saying Jackson Hinkle is a fucking, whatever you yeah. said, talking He's a Nazgul. He literally listen, quotes LaRouche. LaRouche is a far-right fascist. You know right what is? You know what? You're not the He's Jackson. probably an FBI officer. Right? He went on uh, Fox News. You know what? He promoted yes. white supremacy, promoted the deep state. Listen, 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 listen. You know what? You know what? I'm going to say? I respect him. You know why? Because he's against America. I respect him for that. And not you guys say that shit. Not you guys say that shit. You don't see that shit. I don't any motherfucker right, right, in this right, world right. that talks shit about Jackson right Hinkle, you ain't promoting or helping anyone in this world other than sitting here begging for money like Destiny just That's trying to really farm this shit. Can you point to which causes right. Jackson Hinkle has promoted? Can you point to one okay, well, right. Listen, What's listen, listen. Jackson, listen. Quick, at, the the day, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the charity is. is the charity no, 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 stop, stop pivoting, stop listen. pivoting. Name one thing that he's actually promoted for the benefit of Palestinian people. Besides posting on Twitter, name one concrete thing that he's promoted. The charity is. The charity is of him exposing the world. His own charity. government. He's, He's a, bro. He could die from this retard. He He's not gonna die from, from anything. Bro, okay, Come on, the not, victim complex. Bro, Come on. Says the guy bro. that's a Discord mod. Don't talk. I'm not talking to you. But I'm saying it to this fat fuck on the right. I'm telling you that he could die from this. It could be a threat. I'm telling you, it's dangerous. No, no, you Americans would do that. All you guys are acting on violence. It's a charity. All you guys are. So true. Enough. Okay, guys, just got wrecked. Enough. Enough. All I'm gonna say is that was enough. You brought, brought Adam, why were you oh, nodding man. along with much of what he was saying? I know you don't agree with him, so why were you nodding? What I'm what I'm going to say is this: when somebody when somebody labels Hamas as terrorists but failed to recognize the IDF and what they've done in Gaza, what they've done to Palestinians, and refuses to acknowledge the war crimes that were committed by the Israelis. You know, I can't really take you that serious. If you were to look at the idea and think there's no, that? You know what? Just as a you quick thing. Well, well, hold on, wait, wait. Just as a quick thing. Just as a quick thing. Q, Q, the reason why people have an issue with this is here's what it looks like when you go to 95% of Western people and you say, hey, 
Here is some irrefutable evidence that the IDF was shooting civilians at long range. They killed civilians for no reason. Do you know what 95% of people say? They go, that's really fucking horrible. Those soldiers should be punished. Here's what happens when you show videos of, you know, like murdered, broken, you know, uh, German girl bodies being thrown around trucks being spit on, okay, by Gotham City uh, inhabitants. And you say, hey, do you think this is bad? This is what you guys do. We don't understand. Well, there's an occupation. Sometimes, you know, the Southern people might be. Uh, it's not always yeah, bad. You gotta, there's a context behind everything. There's a context behind everything. That's the issue. That's why, that's, that why that's, 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 why that's, that's why people, that's why people have an issue. That's why people have an issue with the. Oh, no, you didn't keep talking about it. About that's the issue. I just. That's the reality. That's the reality, okay? That's the reality. That's the issue. That is the issue. No, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Who did it? Wait, one second. Who did it? Who did it? Who did it? Hold on, Fabian, stop. Fabian, stop. You act as though the fucking people that support Israel don't say, do you condemn Hamas? The first fucking thing, when you point out all the fuck shit, all the fucked up shit that right. the idea did, the of first thing they say is, do you condemn Hamas? You condemn Hamas? Because because people you ask that because it's a layup. That's why people there ask it. There have been Jewish terrorists in the West Bank. If you asked me to condemn them, I would immediately condemn them and we would move forward. It would take literally 15 no, no, seconds to get back. It's okay, literally, it's let, literally, let me speak I to that. I saw all over Twitter all of these I, lefties that were like, Hey, white people, do you commend, condemn this mass shooter? And we're like, yeah, duh. Obviously. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, you know, I, then we move forward. Like, well, so let me, let me speak to that. I'm going to be the minister. I'm going to everybody. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Don't speak over me, you fucking cunts. When you act, right? When you fucking act as though all Palestinians support Hamas, all Palestinians are extremists. But Who you turn a blind eye. Shut the fuck no up when I'm talking, that. nigga. Let me finish you what keep, I'm saying. You when you look at the Israeli government, lies hold on. No, no. Well, well, you just acted as though all Palestinians and all people that support Palestinian no, liberation. Nobody said that. Q, you're actually, fighting. You're yes, boxing you shadows right now. You're fighting ghosts. That's what he just did. That's what he just because they're like, yo, when it comes to us, we condemn all people that fucking do extremist acts. We condemn them, but you guys say, what about Israel? These people are fucking oppressed. These people get to do this. You literally just said this. You can't gaslight me, you stupid fuck. Q, you, you, Q, Q, Q. This is, hold on. This is this is the difference. When America, when America, when America, when America, when America, yeah, you will. Okay, listen. When America does stuff like Abu Ghraib, people are ashamed. They hide it. When it comes out, not only is the entire world looking at the United States, it is crazy. The support in the United States for foreign wars falls off a cliff. Okay, when Hamas abducts, mm -hmm. burns, beheads, murders, and rapes people and brings back their villages, the Palestinians there cheer. It's a big difference. Let me ask you. Let me careful. ask you about these. Oh, That's not fair, Stephen. I don't. I don't like that. Yeah. No, no, I'm no, careful, you don't like no, it. It's no, totally no. fair. We saw the videos. Okay. No. No. It's not fair. No. no, it's not fair. no That's not fair. We saw the people outside. Here. It's not fair. Wait, wait. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. And the reason it's not fair. Quibble, stop. Quibble, stop. The reason it's not fair. Okay, go for it. Make the stop. You could also see the videos of the Israelis celebrating the deaths of innocent civilians in Gaza. You could see those videos too, but you don't talk about that. I'm sorry, wait, which ones? Wait, wait, which videos? The government it's... is leaning extremely far Karantos, right. Karantos, which and videos? Karantos. people are pro-fucking You just make shit up. Okay, yeah, there you go. How can you right. make it shit up? Wait, how am I making okay. shit up? Did where, you see where, the where, yeah, where did, did you see the men? Did you see the head of security in Israel fucking armed settlers in the West Bank? Or did I make that up? I'm what asking you, you where are the video? Did I just make that up? Oh, okay. So. Did I make Krantos, that up? Can I just, 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 can I Why are you dodging it, pussy? I got it. He's dodging it. He's dodging it. He's dodging it. Wait, wait, wait. You know, I'm not, I'm not, hold it, loner. I'm not letting it go. I'm I'm being autistic about this. Fuck this. Destiny, did you not see the video of the head of fucking defense, Israeli defense, Ben Giver, arming settlers in the West Bank to forcibly take fucking land? From Palestinians, did you not see that? Yes or no? To take uh, I haven't seen it, but the videos that you're are? talking about they're not the same thing as what I was just talking about. What were you talking about? I was talking about murdered civilians being trucked back to towns where everybody is cheering and celebrating, and then spitting on the body of murdered civilians. If people in yeah. Israel are doing that, maybe if they are, man, that would be really fucked up. And you know what? If I saw it, I say that is insanely fucked up. I would super condemn that video. Do videos like that exist? Are we claiming that? The situation of the people in Gaza is equivalent to the situation of the people in Israel. Yes or no? I just there you know. go. No, we're not. I never claimed no, that. It's, it's an absolute. It's a valid point. It's a valid point. So, 
No, okay. he's the one who makes the equivalent like because the actors. But here, wait, wait, no, no, wait, Q. Then we agree, Q. Then we agree, Q. Then we agree. The Palestinian people celebrate the murder of civilians. They love it, but they've got a good reason to. That's fine. That's your argument. I can hear that. Okay. Israelis celebrate the murder of innocent Palestinians too, but you ignore that fact. You ignore the fact that they select extreme far right people into their government, people that are pro exterminating Palestinians, but you ignore that as well. If Israel's so pro exterminating, wait, Palestinians, why don't they just kill a whole bunch of fucking more? Why are the death tolls so fucking shitty on the Israelis? Wait, wait, you, wait, wait, hold on. Weren't you? Weren't you the same person that was questioning the death tolls anyways? You're like, wait, 3,000, 4,000? Oh, no way that is true. Where I never said I was that? questioning death tolls. I said I was questioning when all of them are called civilians. But I'm asking you, let's say Israel just wants to murder Palestinians. Why wait, wait, no, okay, okay. Oh, wait, you don't have an answer for that? Oh, gotcha, okay. No, 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 no. You're wait, not wait, gonna you, answer wait, you have an answer to my question then? Oh. So when oh, we see 4,000 deaths, are you saying they're all Hamas? Are you saying they're majority Hamas? I'm not saying they're I all Hamas. They're... I'm not, I never said they're all Hamas, but I said definitely they're not all civilians, <laughs> okay? Okay, no, okay, then give me a split in your opinion, right? In your educated opinion, since you know so much about this conflict, right? How much would you say is civilians versus terrorists? I can't possibly know the answer An to that. Ongoing conflict. So, just to give a context number, just to give a context number on the on the named and identified bodies by the Ministry of Health in Gaza, only one in five, twenty percent, hold up, are military, are military. Hamas. Hey, Your let me finish. Military aged men, okay, men eighteen to thirty five, only one in five. The overwhelming okay. majority okay. Fucking left. are not that that possible soldiers. Wait, hold up, hold up, hold up. That oh, exact God. same source that you just cited lies yes. about the hospital bombing, right? Ooh. The, I don't know. I don't. The there's like a same, time, there's no, a timeline no, no, reconstruction no, no, there that, that relates to the crazy. translation of the doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't that fucking know. Really but much. what I would they point lied, to that was the largest conversation that happened. This entire like time. In terms of the response of Israel, the largest thing that, that they that they pointed to was that specific bombing, and they were lying about it. Well, that is true. And I would be careful. I would wait, wait. Well, that is true. I'm pretty sure Zelensky himself co-signed that there were Russian missiles that had launched that had landed inside what was it Russian Ukrainian territory, and then we found out later on that they were actually Ukrainian missiles that fell short of a Russian target and bombed their own stuff in Ukrainian territory. And I'm pretty sure Zelensky himself co-signed that message and went public. So I'm not trying to say that we should believe Hamas because I generally uh -huh. don't, but I'm saying they are the only ones that can reliably port deaths in Gaza just because they do tell some lies doesn't mean every single thing they but say will be a lie. That's not true. And the additional Long data I would just give is that the in previous conflicts, the true. numbers they've the, given the, the, aligned the, almost entirely with the UN's true. numbers. Amnesty that's Amnesty that's International, all. that's oh not true. Amnesty International and also the IDF will ultimately come out with numbers that are generally considered to be ser uh, serious and real. That is not something that they've done yet, oh. and the reason they've done you it yet is because it's not something that is bullshit and then be like, but IDF is going to be pretty The IDF ones consistently, the IDF numbers, it's not they're going to be the IDF, like, they don't the have IDF numbers the consistently, do. the IDF numbers consistently, one, they wait longer, and two, they line up broadly with UN numbers. So yeah, I think listen, that they are significantly listen, listen, so the Ministry of Health than Hamas. That's the defense for, question. That's the defense for the, the IDF original, numbers and the Hamas numbers are good. So moving back to the, the Hamas numbers, only one in five said, are military aged men. The IDF okay? numbers if they identify like dead, or, one in five are all military aged men. That's like the maximum number out, of militants. And if that's, you want like, to throw out the IDF numbers and only use okay. Amnesty International, that's fine. We can only use Amnesty International. They haven't come out with numbers yet because they don't know yet because it's an ongoing t uh, conversation. Listen, and this whole I, thing, I, I thing you're you're is you're 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 for I, jumping I the gun and saying bullshit, and you're very this is the reason. Right now. Right? But, but, so okay. there, there's, there's a couple of issues here. Number one, we're way off topic, but fuck it. Number two, um, when you talk about death tolls, when you talk about numbers, when you talk about these things, it is it, 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 devoid of any context. It is a very kind of sneaky way of talking about this situation. Because I agree that there are absolutely better ways for Israel to fight in terms of co conducting warfare against Hamas. But you are talking about a group of people who, so for this, this recent refugee bomb, right? As far as we know, right? Israel could be lying, the, deputy, the former deputy prime minister, when he came out to speak about the recent refugee camp bombing, could be totally lying. But according to Israel, they made telephone calls for two weeks straight, and then they knocked on the roof a half hour before the bombing, right? And, and they were telling people over and over and over again, you have to leave this area. There is, there is a facility at the bottom of this building that is Hamas, and we are targeting a specific commander. Leave the building. They give them two weeks, and then they knock on the roof a half hour later, right? And then they blow up the building. And what happens okay. when they blow up the building? As According to Hamas, right? According to Hamas, 
over 50 people last i checked right before the 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 stream so i mean it could have the death toll could have increased over 50 people are dead so that israel could kill a couple of hamas people and a specific commander and so when you talk about like well look at the death numbers and you don't talk about the fact that Hamas says it's psychological warfare. Israel's lying. You have to stay here. You have to be our human shield. They won't bomb this building so long as you're here. They're just making up things to scare you. They're not even going to blow up the building anyways. And and Israel does everything wow, I they can to the evacuate these subs. people. And then 50, 60 people die. Yeah, the, the numbers are going to be different when this is a pattern that occurs in this area. There are plenty of things we can talk about doing warfare better. But 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 again, I, you know, SEO, I've already tripped you up on this multiple times, which is your only solution is to do nothing and to just let Hamas have power. So just sticking on the death numbers, right? Like the, the, the even the rate of civilian casualties by like Hamas's incursion so far from the ID bodies was one third military. Israel's bombing is so fucking bad at targeting militants. That's at best one fifth. So Israel is performing worse on a kill for kill basis than fucking Hamas. Wait, wait, wait. Can we? Hold on, wait, wait. I've never. Wait, 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 wait. I just want. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. I just wait, wait. I want to hear this. I want to hear the answers because I've never, ever, ever heard somebody actually respond to this. I'm actually genuinely super curious. Okay, we everyone in here agrees that Hamas intentionally operates outside of civilian infrastructure, right? Is Israel just never supposed to counterattack Hamas if they constantly and consistently operate out of civilian infrastructure, or what is the solution there? Do it in a way that I'm curious. I want. I'm curious. I think Loader's giving the better. Why? Why is every pro Israeli person talking? Let's take the fuck out. Let us deal talk. Yeah. Let us deal talk. I want to hear what the yeah. I want to hear the answers. I'm super curious about the answer to that. I want to give it to Loader because he's given a better one before. But okay, Loader can answer too. I don't care either one. Yeah. I just want. I want to hear the response. I'm curious what the response is. Yeah. What was my answer to that before? I could have sworn. I we had this debate like a week ago. Whatever. No. No. Wait. I'll. I'll. I. No. I'll own the position. Like. Yeah. If. Um. And this is the case in international law as well. If civilian infrastructure is being used for military purposes, it ceases to be civilian infrastructure in the eyes of international law. Um, so, it, like, if there's like rocket, like, to the point that Hamas will like literally commandeer people's houses to use their rooftops as military bases, like temporarily. So, okay, wait, hold no, on. Yeah, Loner. I don't have an answer for what Israel should do. Wait, to wait, that. Loner, Loner, let me hard. ask you a couple of questions. Well, because, I have an answer. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. Quibbles, one second. Quibbles, one second. Quibbles, one second. Quibbles, one second. For Just for you, Loner. Apologies, Quibbles. I'm really curious because we had a conversation fine, about this, right? So when you say it ceases to be civilian infrastructure, right? Mm. I have a couple of questions for you because you said last time we spoke about this, these people, as in Palestinian civilians, are willingly offering themselves as human shields. They see no. it as martyrdom. You, you Some said of them that. are. Some of them you are. Said that. But not all of them. That's not like the rule. But we've seen all examples right. of that, yeah. All right. So, so are you saying that they're being held there by force then? It's a dictatorship. Yeah, well, of if, they, if they're being commandeered, yeah, if the house is being commandeered. That means they're being held there. Yeah. So okay, okay. So no, let's build, hold on, hold on. Let's hold on. Let's build up on this, right? So they're being held there by force by Hamas to be used as human shields Israel. against Israel, and then Israel looks at that and says, "All right, you're being held there by force. You're pretty much a hostage. We'll still bomb you regardless." That's why they knock. Oh, what? Oh, oh, what? oh they my God. Thank you for knocking. Thank you. Thank you for knocking before you blow me the fuck up even Dang. after I get the stage. What's the alternative? I'm being held. Wait, 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 Q. So wait, Q. The next Q. Q. We all agree. Q. Wait, wait. Hold on, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, hold on. Okay, there's a big waste of time. All of us agree that using civilian shields is bad. We all agree with that. It's and all of us agree that killing civilians sucks. Okay, but then the question is, and I'll pose it to you, Q, or SDL, or Lonerbox. What is the alternative? The alternative is getting to your targets in a way that doesn't disproportionately kill or harm innocent civilians. So do you think... Wait, wait, wait. Okay, I just want to build on that. I want to build on that. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, quick, quick, quick. I just want to build on that. Wait, hold on. No, it's not space. I just want to... I just want to build... I just want to build on that, okay? So Q, then are you co-signing an IDF ground invasion to Gaza? And do you think that would result... And do you think that would result in less civilian deaths than what's happening now? I 100% believe that the civil, first of all, civilian deaths would be inevitable if you do it even in that I'll be right back. Somebody tell me if he answers this question, less. okay? It'll be, wait, I'm answering you fucking retard. <laughs> okay, don't, he, he's trying to pull a fucking XTC on me. It's not gonna fucking work, right? Anyway, Live. The answer, the answer is simple. That's a really nice answer, chair. The answer is Sorry, simple. Either ways, right? Either ways, it's people not. are going to die. Either the ways, people are going to so fucking bad. die. Shut the fuck up.
Bro, I'll fucking mute you, Perma, you fucking idiot. All right, he's back. Okay, let's wait for the retard to put on the headset. Okay, did he get right, I like your chair. Uh, all right, debuff Tassan. Debuff Tassan, let me fucking answer you, right? What, I've, what I was saying is, regardless, you wouldn't escape civilian casualties or civilian deaths. But one would be extremely less compared to the other. So You think a ground, ground invasion, invasion would be less civilian I deaths? Ground, I, I wouldn't say a fucking ground invasion where you send hundreds of thousands of fucking soldiers. Then what's the alternative? I say send specialized... I say send specialized... Like a raid? And get after, and get after your fucking targets. You send, tw right, you send 20 sp good men from Game of Thrones into Wait, Gaza City and raid? try to fight that way? Motor yeah, bombs, instead of fucking dropping raid. bombs and we killing fucking miles 50 to tunnels. one, I'd rather fucking do that. Bro, the point is you that they're all dead. Yeah, You're sending them on suicide. Motor bombs said some are not getting I need to insult motor bombs for this cringe. Motor bombs said some cringe. Real quick. You said that they should just do, like, yeah, you said that they should just do, like, yeah, you said that they should just do individual, like, incur, like, individual, like, um, uh, attacks on individual locations, right? Okay, I don't know if you're like autistic, but I said it like it was a question. I asked a raid because it sounded like it was oh, a I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, let I'm me sorry. let me let me let me let me clarify a few things, right? So, it's all right. so the problem is is that and, and Q and I'm not even trying to be insulting to you. I, I promise, right? Like no a worries, lot of people no have like it watched. They they haven't been in the military that, or they don't have a lot of military knowledge, right? Um, or right. or know a lot of people in it. So they're, they're you're you, a lot of times people's views of the military is made by Hollywood. And or or like or like successful raids by the Navy SEALs. So the first thing we need to understand is that like America's Navy SEALs, Green Berets, Marine Force Recon, like these people are are some of the are are, are a very small efficient groups, and they're some of the best in the entire world. And and even though IDF has its own SF, they don't fucking compare. Now Israeli intelligence is okay, right? Israeli intelligence is pretty good. Um, compared to U.S. intelligence, or at least what we know. But here's the problem with that concept, is there's really only two ways to do a non-ground invasion where you raid um, specific areas. So so option A is something like Mogadishu in 1993. And, 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 and we saw how successful that was, which is not fucking at all, right? Yeah, we um, killed you niggas. You know, trying, trying, to, trying to do multiple, several raids in an area um, in, 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 and, and trying to go door to door, going through like the fatal funnel of fire. Um, IDF is basically going to lose everybody and have a lot of six unsuccessful missions. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and they're not actually going to be able to, to get their targets. Right. So they're just going to throw IDF soldiers to the wolves and, and get killed. Um, and they have to go in, in a very large force, um, in order to do that, because you're talking about a very densely populated area right you can't just it's not like it's not like it's osama bin laden in somewhere. pakistan or something where you're like taking people by right. helicopter yeah. in the middle of fucking yeah. nowhere right yeah what you can't you can't do that like the navy seals did so, so all right all right two, all right wait, wait that Thank option you. two which is that. give me give me and, a solution then give me a different way as yeah than the solution are, the solution is solution. targeted strikes on buildings that you believe hamas is operating out of and if civilians aren't allowed to leave then that's on hamas that's exactly what israel's doing i don't know there's a better way right now I've stated I've stated that what the the type of warfare that Israel commits I think is likely the most ethical form of warfare that we see in the world. And yet there is something that I think Israel absolutely should be taken to task for and the United States should be using whatever power soft power it has especially in the UN to try and force this which is that forcing people to southern Gaza, right? Um, where they have limited resources, limited water, and then still, and then Hamas moving installations into southern Gaza, they are ping ponging refugees into areas to be bombed within Gaza. Fabian, um, and the uh, reason and, and it's and it's it is completely unethical. They need to be setting up blue zones. The reason they need to be the reason that blue they're... no listen no 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 I'm going to finish this. They need to let they need to be set up. Nope, I'm going to finish this. They need to be setting up blue zones within Gaza or refugee camps outside of Gaza if they're going to be if they're going to go on an, an intensive bombing campaign followed by a ground invasion so that refugees at the very least it may not be the best place it may not be the greatest oh, place. at the very least they have a means of not getting fucking bombed after they get cleared because 
it is it is all it has been true before the October seventh attack. Roughly eighty five percent of people that were in this quote unquote air, open air prison were able to get passes to leave Gaza to go to work. Fabian, can I just ask a quick question? Can, can I just ask a quick wait, 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 Can I ask a quick it's question? Wait, wait, just a super refugees. ultra ultra quick question about this. If Hamas won't let people leave buildings that are getting bombed, why do you think they would let people leave to go to refugee camps? So it's it's not a matter of whether or not Hamas will let people leave. I understand what you're saying and that there will be people that will ideologically stay there and there will be people that are forced to stay there. But you cannot take the moral high ground when you are ping-ponging people within this small isolated Fabian, area Fabian. that with limited resources, then when you say, look, we have okay. a place for them to go to, it's not our fault. Hold on, Loner. Hold on, Loner. Let's go ahead. Today's the 31st. Today's the 31st. The shooting happened, the attack happened on the 7th, right? And so we, it has been a very long time. Everyone expected for, for Israel to invade by now, but they haven't invaded by now. And the reason for that is because they've given it's a because long the US said, time Please don't fucking invade. People, okay. The reason is that they've given a long time for people um, to, to move south um, so that they can have a, an invasion specifically of the north. Why do they have to attack the north specifically? Because that's where the tunnels are. There are 300 plus yeah, no, miles of tunnels in Gaza. And it's so given that, at all, they're not able, they're not going to be able to, to, to have uh, a, an attack against, uh, against Hamas. They're not going to be able to ever probably um, destroy all, any, all of Hamas. The, not, the, when not, we were talking about not, the Taliban. You're not answering even, what I said like, though. You're not answering the critique that they should be setting up some form of blue zone or refugee camp. No, but the point is the point is the other thing okay, you're completely you ignoring just, is that okay. part of the reason Fabian, they haven't can't invaded yet make, is because there's a hundred thousand soldiers at their northern border and Hezbollah and, and Lebanon you can't are fucking eyeing them real close. Okay. You can't just like make um uh, a, a refugee camp in somewhere like Egypt, which won't take them. Right. And the reason that Egypt won't take them is Egypt. because they're there's concerned. A whole okay, peninsula I understand. Like I'm sorry. I'm sorry, not Sinai Peninsula. The, the desert. The Sinai so is Egypt. Sinai is Egypt. You mean I, I know. I said. I, I don't know. I know where... And then I said, "Sorry." Immediately corrected myself. I'm saying immediately okay. to immediately okay. to the east of if them you is put desert them, that okay. you can set up areas. Okay. The if you put them in Egypt, there's going to be an expectation did, they can no, stay in I'm Egypt. I'm not after. saying put them in. I'm trying Egypt. to explain. You were annoyed at me for not directly answering your question. Egypt I'm trying to directly answer them. your question. Okay. Exactly. Can we, can we let they can't finish? put them in Egypt because if they left them in Egypt, there would be an expectation that they'd be allowed to stay in Egypt after this was all mm -hmm. over. You can't put them into Israel proper because there would be an expectation to be permitted to stay in Israel proper after this is all over. And so therefore, they have to stay inside of Israel proper, or excuse me, in, in, inside of Gaza proper. Um, and so that but means no. that they're either going to be in the northern of Gaza, which is where the majority of them live currently, or they're going to be forced south, which is a no, horrible no, situation, is obviously. No, but that's why they've been given nearly a month to do so. That's insane. There are plenty of places nearby that you can house refugees. Would it be incredibly Where? expensive? Would it be would it be one of the most insane fucking tasks that you could ever take on? Absolutely. Right? But what Israel is asking after? Israel is asking for billions of dollars. People are going to give them hundreds of billions of dollars in order to deal with this situation. And it would be, and, and I, I guarantee you, you the US, it, the US and a lot of other places, even though I'm against them being involved in any capacity, would be willing to give a lot more money if Israel was moving people into safe zones and was removing the blockade. Right. That's why they're trying to allow people to go south because that's the closest to a safety that they can provide. They can't allow people to be in Israel they're, proper they're because then they will in the stay south. in Israel. They're, I understand they're, they're not bombing. Okay, the south. hold on. Wait, 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 w
sorry, excuse me. The entire yeah. occupation um, is not um, genocide in that, like, we got to get the number down to zero right now. This is an ethnic cleansing campaign. It's, uh, mm. uh, and uh, the results are We're doing a terrible that job. people. Well, they've only displaced 1.4 million people. Yeah, like, you know, yeah, when the Rohingya just, genocide like, happened, it was only 1.7 million. The majority of the Palestinians are losing out. 300,000 more, then we can call it the G word. There are still, that's not true. What? Wait, hold up, hold up, SDL, you just lied. Hold that's on, not true. Is it, wait, hold they on. didn't try no, fucking that's not talking true. quibbles. Wait, stop quibbles. There being 1.4 million. Did I not say stop? Or was I speaking <sighs> Chinese? Meow ma. Was I was I speaking Chinese? Mandarin? The fuck? Prime, go ahead. I had a hard time hearing you with the face diaper on. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it, it's called a mask. Something you fucking retards don't know about. But my bad. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. So there are millions of. Um, uh, Palestinians living outside within uh, the the Palestinian diaspora, right, mm -hmm. um, uh, in neighboring countries. This is an ethnic cleansing campaign. The point is to uh, at least, like for like the West Bank, to make it so miserable that you leave, that you leave, um, and, and and to say that well, Israel just hasn't wiped them all out by now, so I guess it's not uh, genocide. And so, what does that mean morally? It's still an ethnic cleansing campaign. Let's not make any mistakes about that. Um, and and they are uh, bombing uh, the south. Like we're getting reports of, uh, of like bombs saying the south. Like families yeah, doing what Israel told uh, uh, okay. that, yeah, during Israel told them to do, leaving the north and still being hit um, uh, uh, down in the quote unquote safe areas. Now, as far as I know, what Destiny said is correct in that like they're not mass bombing the south, right? It's not the same. But people are dying there when they were told this is the safe area. Thank you. Well, I just want to say that's probably why there's a problem with blue zones is that historically, even since the 50s, when they were going after like Fedayeen fighters, it was in refugee camps because that's where they operated from. So that's why mm -hmm. the blue zone is not yeah. necessarily, you can't really have a blue zone because they're, yeah, um, that's one problem. Look, 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 there's there's no perfect solution there. Like, I, I absolutely agree that the Palestinian Fedayeen, you know, was operating out of refugee camps as well as in Jordan and almost, you know, fucking... <laughs> almost fucking overthrew a monarchy there and then had to get kicked to another country where they started another war and displaced the million Christians, you know, but nevertheless, you know, like, I do agree that there, there, there's no perfect solution here. But the thing is, is that I, I don't think you get to take the moral high ground as Israel um, when you are, when you have people isolated into this area. Like, I agree that, like, I, I think there's which also this ridiculous kind of counter argument, which is like, oh, we'll just open everything up and it's like, cool. And then we'll get the fourth intifada or maybe this will be the third one or, or whatever. Okay, and like so every again, goddamn how, discotheque Israel, in fucking Tel Aviv will get blown up. You know, like there, there is there is a what kind would of Israel do to have the moral here. high ground over the terrorists? To have the moral high ground over the terrorists is very different than having the moral high okay, ground fine. over the moral high over, ground. Like, yeah. right, Right, like, over who, like, I don't think, exactly. Well, Wait, hold on. Yeah, actually, I'm curious. You're asking who, who do they have the moral high ground over? State of Israel. <laughs> I'm asking, okay, okay. We can LARP, but I'm curious what your actual opinion is. Like, what do you think that they have to do in order to well, have the moral I, high I ground you. in I, this I said conflict? That, that they need, even if the blue zones are unsuccessful, right? Because the, the amount of money that they cause and, and the difficulty of running them means that only a limited number okay. of people are able to achieve them, right? at least trying to have areas that are guaranteed safe and then asking the rest okay. of the world for help specifically with those blue zones, right? Okay. Gives so them when the there are those go, blue we're zones, doing the best we can. Okay. When from those blue zones, Hamas starts shooting rockets at innocent civilians like in Tel Aviv. From Gaza? That's what I'm saying. In those blue zones, right? Now they're blue zones. Now you're no longer allowed to, Israel's no longer allowed to attack those locations. When all of the people who are the, at the highest level of Hamas start shooting rockets mm -hmm. from those locations, what exactly should Israel do in response? Okay, so, so what, you, what you've done now is, is like we're, we're moving, like we're, we're moving to like the, well, now the, the new what if is once the blue zones fail. You're saying this is the how you get to the moral I, high ground. I'm right, trying to right, understand right, right. the moral the high ground here, right? Right. So the, the, difference between, the difference between the two examples of no blue zones versus failed blue zones is that failed blue zones is an attempt to give the Palestinian people a place to go that isn't forcing them into a country that doesn't want them, forcing them into a region that they may have to bomb later, right? Et cetera, et cetera. It is an attempt to the best of their ability to give them safe 
harbor. I think the issue is, just as a real quick, just as a real quick, real quick, real quick. The, one of the big, one, wait, 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 real quick. One of the reasons why people, Israel included, and other countries, believe it or not sometimes, try their best to follow international laws because when conflict happens, they want to be able to appeal to people like the United Nations or the international community, broadly speaking, for support. So we can say that Israel attempting to set up blue zones might be a show of good faith for them in order to uh, garner more support from the international community. However, if it is the case that Israel believes that Hamas intentionally operates with civilian infrastructure, Right now, Israel can bomb Gaza and say, well, look, Hamas is there. If Israel sets up a blue zone and then, Gama, uh, and then Hamas is operating out of it, and now Israel, Israeli soldiers are going into blue zones to kill people, they might destroy all goodwill they have in the international community because now they're seen as attacking refugee camps that they themselves have said are safe. That could be an issue that Israel would have with setting up specific blue zones outside of Gaza City for, a, for, for civilians that are intermingled with the terrorist group so much that you can't tell the difference between the two. Right, right. It, so the, the question then becomes of like, this is a question of tactics in the future of like, under the assumption or like the, the what if of what if blue zones fail. I agree that there are, there are ways that this could get worse for the nation state of Israel. I don't give a fuck. What I'm saying is, is that when you're bombing people and you don't give them anywhere that is like absolutely safe to be. Okay, right? so you're asking and for it, branding. You're, I understand that. I understand that Israel is doing more than most countries would do in terms of warfare to be ethical. But there are still lines <laughs> that 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 they can that they op, that not only can they do better, they absolutely should be doing better. I think not just a, more. They're not just more. Right? right? It's a change. completely unreasonable standard compare in comparison with the way other countries have been treated when they have had a direct attack on their citizens like this. It's absolutely wild, the different standard that Israel has held to. And I don't know if it's anti-Semitism. I don't know if it's because there's like this weird symbolic idea of what Israel represents in the Middle East. I don't know what the reason for it is, right? But it's just, it's very strange. What uh, there's a massive difference between unprompted like, ago, but yeah. like, like terrorist attacks on one country and then other countries Ar where they actually have like a very long history and they're like extending yeah. borders. What do you mean unprompted? I, wait, do you not think that the United States uh, made a bunch of decisions that directly led or indirectly led, you could argue, to 9-11? Uh, to uh, okay. Maybe. I Dude. wouldn't say it's the same I, I wouldn't say that those are the same at all. We're we're talking about well, some are actually like violent attacks. These are actually like back yeah, I, and I forth actually, violent attacks. I agree. Within, it wouldn't uh, be the same, right? Because another. the brutality um, of October seventh just does not compare to the brutality of a uh, of yeah, September but we, 11th. We, right? I think in both cases it was pretty clear that the response that the military response didn't make the world safer. We Sorry. live in the post nine eleven military response world. Are we all safer for it? Is Israel safer for it? Are Americans safer for it? Okay, honestly, uh, wait, wait, that, you, that, that, that's an that argument that I'm much more interested in than, than, than you just, you just made a moral grandstanding. So, so Aris, Aris, oh, okay, one at a time. Okay. This is not oh, multiple so forever Aris, wars. Okay, you made a blink this is not multiple Q, forever which one of us can go? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, Fabian, go and then Quibbles go after. Okay, okay cool. go. To, to say that the military response made us less safe, right, is a condemnation of the specific actions that occurred in the Iraq and Afghanistan war, of which you will find very little argument from me. But to say it as, but when you say it this way, we all know what you're actually saying, which is that any military response makes us less safe, as you have said in the past on other panels with me, and your only response is to have no military action against Hamas, which is absurd, right? So I agree with you that the Iraq invasion was No, stupid. that's wrong. So Based every time you've asked this question, uh, I say, like, mm -hmm. stuff, stuff to the degree of maybe what loader box you're talking liar. about, target, target attacks on individual locations. I've said that type of military response might solve, like, in the very short run, some level that's of violence, but, but it won't solve the so long run that's violence. Wait, no, wait, 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 Quibbles. Loader box was Go saying ahead, we should target. So I think what I've said like in the past, military function, right? So I think what I've said in the past is that when it comes to criticizing the Israeli military, it tends to be over like 
kind of details. So when I've read like some case law on about uh, when their investigations into the 2008 war, um, it seemed to be the case that the critiques of Israel was that occasionally there were acts of recklessness like when they hit targets that had no clear or no discernible military use, like the uh, sewage mm-hmm. treatment plant, or there was um, this thing like roof knocking. People always talk about roof knocking is, uh, as far as I've seen from investigations, is basically useless. It's indistinguishable if you're in a building from like explosions going off all around you. So there's not really much point in it. Or they've been criticized for oh, their war warnings and their phone call messages not being very coherent but it's things like that it's like they no, just like tangible things bullshit. compared to L- L- comparing it to like um, just, just to, to try say and get this knock, so to say that roof knocking oh my god oh my god shut up shut up i'm just, just quoting the investigation from the international court like we're trying to get back to the question which was like what types of response are acceptable right and so loader box you were trying to say that these types of targeted responses on like individual buildings that's maybe the i don't know if you described that as the right approach but you were i thought you were leaning that direction earlier that seems like fine. No, or but if they, do, the wait, arc- if they do what you just said, though, the problem is, is that Hamas embeds their uh, military activity and their military infrastructure in civilian infrastructure. So, tar- like they yeah, could be, tar- you, you, we don't know. They could be every target they've hit could have had Hamas infrastructure or personnel. That could have, that's feasible, right? Feasibly, if like every what for and every still one a lot Hamas of civilians fighter, would die. there were still like four like civilians like immediately in the radius. Maybe it's not just but, about fighters; it's about infrastructure. It's about rockets. It's about, lo- it's about launch pads. Them. It's about stockpiles. It's about communication. It's from the centers. Gaza. It's, it's from the release about, data. Right. It's not it's just about Hamas. proportion. It's, it's not just about Hamas. proportions of people. It's, it's also from Hamas. it's not just about proportions of people. Even the strike today in the refugee camp wasn't it because they said there was like a big part of the tunnel network underneath it. So it's targeting tunnels. It's about targeting. Yeah, but the argument really I, I, I just, just want to be clear. Yeah, when it the comes to that how I was we're doing, Fabian, every single time, no, is that none of these worked in the long run, right? Israel has bombed Gaza a half Why a dozen are you times. All of these military operations together as if they're the same thing. It's this very simplistic view of military operations. Okay, has any of them right? worked? Like, what is different about um, this actually, one? Why will this one work? Have worked, right? Like one of the one of the problems that you're having, right, is that like you're looking at this from a purely ideological perspective. Israel is looking about looking at survival. I asked you a concrete right? question. Which of them well, have worked? Don't answer wait, with ideology. Answer, well, tell me actually, which one I would worked. tell all of them because Israel is still standing. Israel, <laughs> when Israel responded, oh why, why is that? Wait, how are you laughing at that? Wait, 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 hold on. Wait, 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 the only reason that Israel exists today is through extensive military action. Whether you talk about the original independence of 48, whether you talk about the expansion of border 67, or whether you talk about the repulsion of dozens of different types of incursions from PLO people on the borders, from other Arab nations attacking them over and over and over again, that is the answer. That is the only reason. So when you ask, has Israel's military Israel's action worked so far? Even the Arab states would agree, yeah, that's the only reason. That is the reason why Egypt now recognizes Israel as a nation. That is the reason why Jordan now recognizes Israel as a nation. You can laugh at it, but that is true. We're talking about why I laugh? Why I laugh? It's just why, so why I laugh? Oh my God! Why I laugh is because that's also the reason why Israel is under threat, right? Like these actions we're talking about. No, are also reason, the Israel's reason under are, threat. Are, are fighting. Yes, the reason why Israel, under, why Israel doesn't uh, feels like it's uh, this is, under this siege. It always tells us within its propaganda that it's under siege from all this sides. Is, yes, the, dude, this is why it's you're under talking threat, about a bunch of people. Actions. Hold on. talking you're about a bunch of people. Hold on, wait, 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 Israel's decisions up till now have led it to be um, under threat. Now, I'm not saying that uh, uh, it, these people should be killed or wiped out or anything. I'm saying that um, uh, the political and military decisions have led to this. Expelling the, the Palestinians have led to this. These military actions that Eris is talking about, hello, Eris, nice to see you again, um, uh, have uh, put them in this situation. And so when I laugh, I laugh at that to say that, well, that's why Israel is still standing. Well, yeah, well, well, Israel uh, Israel didn't have to take this path. Israel could have been a cosmopolitan, multi-ethnic um, country. It had that ability. Wait, but when? Wait, wait, when did it have that ability? When did it have that ability? It tried that. It didn't before, really work out Before it expelled the Palestinians. Re- wait, like, when? Wait, 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 just follow this. Wait, when did, it, when did, when did Israel have the ability to be a multi-ethnic paradise? 
before Never. it started Never. ethnic cleansing people. There, like, no, uh, stop, sorry, wait, 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 no, like, okay, wait, wait, there's, a, there's a very, there's a very niche period in the British mandate between 20, I think, Aris, you can correct me on this, 20, 1925, 28, between that period, when Britain tried to set up a um, national assembly system where there was basically like um, one national assembly would be Arab and the other one would be 50, 50 Jewish and Arab. I uh, think the Arabs, wait, wait, wait so, just let me finish a fucking sentence. Like the Arabs initially said, um, no, I think they were, maybe it was the one where they were close to considering, but then the Zionist side said no, and then it was, it was never, it was never going to fucking happen. But yeah, anyway. But yeah, yeah there was one period where there could have been a binational one. There was not one. There was not one. There is not one period. It is not true that there was one period. There is not one period. There is not true that there was one period. That is that like, happened in 2020. Wait, hold on, wait, 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 Quibble, you need to chill with the Japanese too, brother. Just, you know. Well, hold on. Quibble's barely got any of his own time to talk, to be fair, okay? Prime go, and then Quibble go. I've given him time as well. Prime go. Okay. I'm saying there's a chain of events here. I'm saying that if when you say that, uh, Israel um, uh, is standing because of all these military actions that uh, gives the impression that this was the only path that that they must have taken this uh, brutal path uh, to have to still be existing. I'm saying along the way, there have been political decisions, right? Many of them, hundreds of them, thousands of them. Um, where uh, a diff where there was there was a different path, right? That could have put us in a more equitable situation. We haven't taken that, and here we are. So to say that, like, well, Israel's still standing. Well, the the path the path that it took led to October seventh, right? Now I condemn the Hamas attack, right? I, I condemn like the the slaughter of civilians, all that done, right? But uh, uh, like, let's understand this. Um, in uh, what was it? Um, so uh, in twenty eighteen to twenty nineteen, in Gaza, they had the March of Return, right? It was a peaceful protest, exactly what uh, people were saying that you got to do. Uh, 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 tens of thousands of people uh, participated in those. Well, the, what was Israel's response? It had snipers lined up on the wall of Gaza shooting at the civilians. Uh, uh, like 200 uh, uh, plus people. Point. Can we start on the first point? Die. Hold, excuse me. Shut up. What, Knock what it year off. was this in? Hold on. 2018 to 2019. It was like. Uh, Can you provide like a source the, for like uh, sure, snipers yeah, yeah, explicitly I, targeting civilians in that protest? I can when the UN investigated, on. only 20498 were found to have been a threat we stay to the on soldiers. The first so. point? Yeah, yeah, hold on, hold on. I'm going to. I'm, I'm going asking to, uh, when was shut there up, a time Quibble, when they Quibble, had shut the fuck up. Quibble, let him finish. So, um, Prime, um, up, so um, there was a, the great march of return, right? So, 20 to 2019, the response was um, the those civilians were shot at. Okay. And then um, uh, the UN puts a report in 2015 that says by 2020, Gaza will be uninhabitable, right? That's a UN report. And now in 2023, when nothing happens, right? Uh, uh, when when uh, the indignities um, and uh, the lack of resources and the lack of employment um, and the lack of care um, uh, festers for this long, then October 7th happened. It shouldn't have happened the way it did. Absolutely not. But these are all from political decisions, a chain of events. So I condemn that chain of events. That's what I'm saying. Done. Lovely okay. man. Squibbles, go ahead. You just said like 15,000 things. I'm not going to respond to I all of them. Like I know Eros is already. Prime, I know no. Eros is already looking up the, res, the the thing where you said that they targeted civilians. It's obviously not true. I'm sure I'm sure Eros is looking it up though. So the broader point is when you make this claim that Israel had this option, this moment in its history where oh my God, it could have totally have been all kumbaya and lovey dovey and everything would have been great, and you're talking about 48. You're talking about a time when a bunch of literal Holocaust survivors literally left the camps and literally on foot walked all the way to Israel in some cases, okay, and were literally still in their stripes from Auschwitz, okay? You're talking about a time when upwards of 900,000 people across Wait, is this true? Did people walk to Israel from Europe? Is every this... single other country in the entire Middle Is that actually Middle true? East, I feel like okay, I would have read that if that was actually homes, the case. Does anybody know okay, if that's the case? To go into this one tiny location, okay? One that sounds like a really, of the amount of land, a really far um, walk. all of Israel proper and also the West Bank and also Gaza, um, one fourth as much land as the land that was stolen from them across the rest of the Middle East, okay? You're talking about those people 
who were immediately, as soon as they declared independence, okay, attacked by literally every single neighbor that they have. The idea that they had this moment for kumbaya is just on its face absurd, and you should be ashamed of yourself. Hey, so are you it. saying that? Are you saying that? Yeah, the Jew, are you refer, wait, wait. Are you? Are you ref, sorry. Are you referring to the Jewish Exodus? Because that that happened after independence, yeah. not before. It Wasn't happened it? directly it was over like a after. It was very clear that it was already on that trajectory. But no, wait, wait. So, but do you think oh, so? Holocaust already, survivors, there were, there were, Holocaust there were survivors multiple who are still, so yeah. Holocaust survivors who are still yeah, in their the stripes. Do you think right. that's like? Do you think that's like an accurate characterization of like? Yes. The, yes. the, the standard Israeli who was there in forty eight. Yes. And, and many of the um, rep, not by forty eight, no. they weren't literally in their stripes. They were obviously still people who were escaping the Holocaust in forty eight. But yes, they are. It is yeah, literally and some of them were armed, and some of them were terrorists who attacked the bridge, and some of them committed it's, it's massacres. And there you see, yeah. I don't think. Wait, 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 real quick, real quick, real quick. Hold on, wait, wait, just a quick, just a quick. Wait, wait, it was created was ethical. The foundation, the creation of the majority of countries is usually a very unethical process. Also, hold right? on, just as a quick, just as a quick, just as a quick, wait. Right? Oh, so, I'm so I, stupid. Yeah, oh, wait, wait, hold on, wait, wait, I'm sorry, wait, wait, hold on, I'm sorry, wait, wait, just a real quick, real quick, hold on, real quick fact check, okay? Uh, something if I'm wrong, my understanding is in 1948, the vast majority of Jewish people that are in Rizzo were absolutely not World War II Holocaust Rotor survivors. Those people didn't start immigrating into uh, uh, into Israel en masse until after Israel won the initial mm -hmm. 48 War for Independence. So the initial people there were, we would call them settlers, right? Or people brought in under the auspice of British, uh, the Palestinian mandate. Okay, all right. From where? So, so there, there's, there's, a, there's a... Well, there's from a where? From all of Europe, from the, from the United States, or people there, from all over the... Yeah. Hold on. There's, there's, there's something really important because I, I actually kind of disagree, Harris. I think it is actually important to talk about the founding, the, the founding oh my of God. Israel because I think the founding of Israel is likely one of the more peaceful um, nation states founded in the world. Um, you know, you have the Jordan, Jordanian mandate. People were fleeing from the Holocaust. So I don't think that was the, the, the majority of mandate. Jewish people yeah, in yeah, Israel, though, where people like fleeing from, from the, the Holocaust. British, I don't think that's true. The mandate for Jordan. You have a mandate for Palestine. You have a mandate for Israel. All of all of these, this area is kind of simultaneously promised to three people. You have Jewish Zionist movement that is mostly socialists coming in. Actually, if anything, and as well as individual Jewish Zionists. And yes, there is there are. Scuffles. I think if you anything, know, more of them would have been coming from the there, Russian there, Empire, there right? Wasn't Jews that the huge in, explosion of Jewish people land, prior to the Soviet Union? I think may not be there. Well, no, it's it's it starts off as scuffles, right? There are absolutely Palestinian Arabs that move Why? to areas that move to areas where Jews move because everywhere that Jews moved in Israel was an area where the population increased because they gave these people jobs and they made the land more arable. And yes, then you have things like the Jaffa riots that really kick off tensions between these groups. And yes, you have the British doing things. But another thing that's important to recognize is, you know, um, Destiny says, well, look, these, you know, to, to fairly, because Quibbles is like, uh, you know, like, invoking imagery of everybody being like a Holocaust survivor in there, which is a, a little bit over the Hagenau top. were still in their right? stripes. Right. Yeah. Sorry. right, but the, the other the thing that's important came, to know yes, is that the other, thing, thing, in their the other thing, literally true. Uh, the Haganah? Yeah, yeah, sure. Were the Haganah still in their stripes when they were killing people in the fucking village? I'm sorry. No. I know that's not true. So listen, is it? Many listen, people, listen, okay, listen, okay specifically, also, what, what I think he's referring to is in... It is almost, It's it's so close. So, listen, it's also important to know. Actually, I feel like the leftists here should really give me reparations in the form of extra time was, to talk as payments of patriarchy. It was also important to note. I'm trying to. It was also important to note that when we talk about Holocaust survivors, it was the British that had established the White Papers in 39 that made it incredibly difficult for Jews and Zionists that were escaping growing tensions in Europe to go to Israel where they could buy fucking public land. I agree. Open they, borders are based. We shouldn't have an ethno state that keeps people out of like coming into that. Okay, country. so then stop trying really to bad, stop right? the Jews from moving into West Bank. If you believe that, <laughs> stop trying to stop oh the Jews. Oh my God, man. Wait. Yeah, I agree. If that's, Quibbles, that's the Quibbles, only reform wait, if you want to go back to that. Quibbles, if you want to go back to that. if you want to go back to that, Quibbles, if you go back to that, that argument, if you want to go back to the argument about assuming that not wanting settlers to go to the West Bank is just an ethnic argument, if you were actually asking that question in good faith, you could just say, okay, let's say assume the West Bank is a state. Should Jews be allowed the right to immigrate there? You could ask me that, and I'd say, yeah, they should be. Of course, they should be allowed to. No one's entitled to an ethnic state, but you're not going to ask that because you just want to assume that. You're, you're not isolating the variable. Okay. The problem with Jewish settlers going to the West Bank is it's occupied territory, okay. not because they're fucking Jewish. Jesus Christ. Is Gaza, is Gaza occupied territory? 
Yes. Legally, according to some organizations, yes, because of the blockade and I'm the control you. of the airspace. But I'm asking you. And is what it, and is sure. it controlled by so, Israel? Yeah. Sorry. The answer yeah, for the Gaza border is border clearly yes. Okay. Yeah. The answer is clearly yes. Airspace, yeah. The border. Yeah. 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 It's just so quite yes, because they control the border. No. Pop the, and, and the day-to-day -day 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 life is controlled by the Hamas. They hold control the population registry. They they control who goes in and out. They control what goes in and out. They control the maritime border. Hold on. Yeah. And hold on. Wait. 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 Regardless of that. Hold on. Regardless of that. Israel has literally gone to war at least twice over the closure of the uh, Suez Canal for Egypt. Okay, so Israel clearly recognizes, along with the rest of the world, that blockades are a cost's belly for going to war. That that is a reason it costs for war. So if, yes, if you are having a total blockade okay, so on a population, occupation? in a way, yes, of course. If it's an extended blockade where you're controlling everything going in and out of a certain population, right, it's essentially an occupation. Yes. An occupation. So did we? Okay, that that is a. That is a very interesting view. So you think that anywhere, anytime that you that you blockade someone, it's that's not an occupation. It's not an interesting view. You're just getting fucking, you're just okay. quibbling as your name suggests. It's a, the blockade is one term. of like five variables that makes an occupation. It's okay. It's, it's, I think the idea that any blockade is an occupation. Just over the language instead of the issue. Like, particularly Whoa. given that the blockade in this particular case is not even done exclusively by Israel. What did that have to do with, like, I was asking you about settlers, I'm sorry, but. Yeah. Like, so the, can you tell the other side? Talking I want to talking right now. If just you're talking around. about Gaza, which is a place that is an ethno state, which has forced out all of its Jews, or excuse me, rather, Israel has forced out all of the Jews who are living in, in Gaza, right, in order for Hamas to take over, because they were concerned, they correctly were under, understood, that if Ga uh, Gaza were under the control of Hamas, immediately every single Jew who was living in, uh, in Hamas-controlled Gaza would be killed, right? Given that, they forced out all of the Jews. So I'm asking, do you think that that was an appropriate action for Israel to do? What, to remove the settlers from Gaza? Yeah. In and of itself, I think it was probably the right thing to do, but not the way that they did yeah. it, no. The unilateral disengagement was, was a it bit right? fucking Why crazy. was this the right thing to do? Because they were there illegally. Wait, they were there illegally? Yeah, we can move on, it's fine. Yeah, they no, were hold there on. illegally. Move on. They were there illegally. So you think that, oh, hold on. So you think oh that God. the Jews should be kicked out because they were against Hamas law? Either way, I think it's we've established against... that, that ethnic cleansing can money. happen for okay. the sake of peace, right? No, okay. It, if uh, you were inside uh, somebody's ethnic... internationally defined territories, undocumented, illegally, or any other way, all countries would kick them out. The United States does it. Canada does it. Germany does it. Every other okay. country in the world do does it. it Why do the Palestinians not have the right to do that? Okay, so do you think it is appropriate? Like, everyone here seems to be like, ooh, let's do open borders, right? Do you think that it is appropriate for what? Jews to move back into, uh, no. into Gaza now? Uh, for Jews to move back into Gaza is probably not a smart idea, but are you talking about Israeli settlers or just like Jewish people, period? No, I'm saying Jews, not Israelis. Should they be Jews. permitted? Of course they should be yeah, permitted be to go the there, yes. Of course, fire, Jews should be permitted, but when we're there. talking about the pullback, the Israeli government pulled back the settlements. Yes, they weren't Israeli settlements, they were Jewish settlements. They were still illegal settlements. Yeah, but we call right. them Israeli because they're Jewish. But I think the that's, the, that's the that's point that he's trying to make. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. We call them. Yes. Hold on, wait, wait. Let's be clear. We call them Jewish slash Israeli settlements because the Jewish people going there are not like randomly stumbling into Gaza from some other part of the world. They're Israeli people that are moving from Israel to Gaza. That's what's happening. That's why they're considered Jewish slash Israeli settlements. But that's why they're by Israel. A, a huge okay. portion there of them, a, yeah. I, I would agree with you. But there was a consecutive, like, uh, Gazan Jewish presence that has been there for hundreds of years. There might, yeah, well, that, very, there might be some very small there might be some very small numbers there might be some very small numbers but the issue is that the ownership of Gaza by Israel it's not official territory right these are still armistice lines right so they don't really even 100% shouldn't even have control of that territory but they do they have a full embargo there so the idea of Israeli citizens buying territory or moving into there is kind of just as reprehensible as the West Bank it's weird to be buying and moving into a place buying territory and moving into a place in a place you have like under military control essentially yeah, no, so I, so I thought the issue was that they were extending oh, the border, and that's why you guys would have issues with Israelis moving over there. But if they're just moving it's there, not that. they not just don't like in any they just way. don't like Jews. How does this make sense? Oh, do we just wait, all it just has don't nothing like Jews? to do. Hold on, wait, 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 wait. Where does hold on the anti Semitism? No, you don't like Jews living in the West Bank or Gaza. That's something that you don't like. The problem Jews isn't hold on. I don't, I don't even, like wait, Israeli wait, wait. settlers in the, in the Gaza Strip. Yeah, what the, why did the Jews why did the Israeli settlers go there? Did they just go there because they are Israelis? They're Jews. That's my point. No, they're coming from Israel. Israelis. They went to Israel they're coming and then from into Israel. the Gaza Strip. They went Israel and then into the Gaza Strip. For what reason? To when build you're settlements. Talking, okay, when you're okay. talking about these Jews, you are pe talking about people who are literally explicitly refusing to join the, the, the Israeli military, refuse to vote in a, Israeli elections. You're talking about people who are radical, radical Jews. They are, are not, not radical Americans. Israelis. 
yeah. the radical Jew. That's fine if that you're you say that. The, if, you're that's... The no, if you're talking about the settlements who are on the border of the West Bank, that's different than the ones that are inside of Gaza. They're that's, not the same. It doesn't, to call it, them Israelis is, is flatly wrong. Do they enjoy protection from the IDF? Everyone did. Whoa, uh, when whoa, 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 okay. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Then in that case, everyone okay. Did. I, I, okay, time, okay, okay. I am about. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, time, let's just clear this up. You just said everyone is. I will fully <laughs> concede to you. Is there examples of the IDF shooting on Israeli settlers that are encroaching on Arab Palestinian yes. property in the West Bank? Yes. They forced out all 9,000 of these people from Gaza. From the yes. from Gaza, yes. They forced those out. That's not the same as right. everybody there has equal protection and rights by the IDF. That's not true. Equal protection is different than whether or not these people were Israelis. No, they... Hold on. I, this is You can't be putting forth this argument in good faith, okay? The settlements in... Let's talk about the West Bank. The settlements in the West Bank from no, Jewish... we're not people, talking about the West Bank. We're talking about Gaza. Okay, from Gaza? Then it's easy. Gaza is occupied territory. Forward. Those are armistice lines that were won militarily that aren't internationally recognized. Israel shouldn't be having people move into there. Full stop. Easy. But Israel isn't. These are people. These are Jews. That's the point. They're not Israelis. Who subsidizes the settlements? Wait, wait. Did, wait were, were they, they live ever there? They live there the Gaza, whole time. Not the Israeli government. Certainly not the Israeli I government. I asked you in West Bank. Who, who subsidizes not, the settlements? No, he's asking. Well, he was talking about West Bank. This is my okay. point. We're talking about Gaza. I actually don't know. I don't uh, know who supported those settlements. The answer is that it's oh, private funding. Uh, Eris, I, I was going to give you a response, and uh, it's Usually a clip of you called me out. No problem. <laughs> Look, uh, like I said, I brought up uh, March of uh, Return um, in 20 to 2019, right? I put a, a link within the uh, the chat section here in this uh, Discord uh, to Haaretz. Um, it shows it interviewing an IDF soldier who was there. Oh, my God. Harvest stop. Night. These are the worst things ever. Don't Not yeah. the videos no, of the no, one on. interview. Wait, no, no, no. Okay. Excuse oh, me. No. Let me respond. You can respond afterwards, right? So he, he interviews them, and he talks about, like, uh, how, uh, like, what he was doing. And uh, mostly, they were targeting uh, the knees of people uh, who uh, were, were uh, part of this protest. Who were they targeting? Okay, they were targeting ma you major insiders. Me, right? what, what makes a major, major, excuse me, shut up, hold on, shut the fuck up, thank you. Um, the, what makes a major insider? A person who is like, has their back to the wall, like the, the, the wall between Israel uh, and Gaza, and who's holding a microphone, or megaphone. That is a major insider. They, uh, 200 uh, plus people were killed, 8,000 wounded, they were hitting ambulances. They were uh, when 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 people came and got wounded. So this was a, a whole operation that happened over the course of a, a year and a half. So yeah, okay. this if you happened. Have a source, if you have a source that extends beyond some random dude, okay, then I would like I to have hear more, it. Sure, if I got you plenty have of those. One those, random one, one, dude, one, then I'll condemn your I, one random sure, dude. Sure, I got your plenty one of them, no problem. Dude, but I'm like just giving you a direct, okay, I'm giving you a person who has got direct testimony of exactly what was happening and okay. uh, an article I'll talking about that situation. That are, but I guess that's not good enough. No, I can give okay. you another one, like but you're bullshit. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Can you just DM that to me because it's not loading for me? I've got evidence. I've got evidence. I've got evidence from insiders that prove that the American government has alien bodies. Sure, Why are we no, doing this? Hold on. On these okay, hold on. Stop, 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 stop. Okay, wait, hold on. Okay, stop. Hold on. Okay. All right. Okay. Prime Kaiser is talking about the 2018 to 2019 Gaza border protests. Okay. This was the great, the, uh, they call it the Great March of Return. Okay. Like three different, uh, two international organizations, okay? Human Rights Watch, uh, Amnesty International, and then Bet Salem or whatever, however the fuck you pronounce it, and UN officials all agree that IDF forces on the uh, walls of this protest were basically shooting and killing protesters, probably for no good reason. I think there were about 500 killed. Uh, the IDF claims that it's because they've been throwing rocks and shit. Most independent investigators said there was like one or two of those deaths that were just been militarily. Seems like the IDF probably actually acted completely improperly Wait, which, okay that's yes thank you which just called the, the you can look up for oh, the you don't, you don't know google google Wait, the Wait, great no, google the sources. google the, the i'm telling you google great march of return okay or 2018 2019 gaza border protests okay there's several international organizations going this okay Wait, well, I just correct. I need to. It was uh, happening for a year and, and, and a half, and he doesn't know what it is. Amazing. I need to. I need to correct something from earlier. The uh, the, 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 the original sentiments in Gaza were the, the original. You weren't fucking listening. You were up the, your own ass. Sorry, I'm done. The original. So, the, 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 thing okay. that I was, <laughs> the first. Uh, the first proper settlements in Gaza after '67 were established by the labor government, not by private owners, anyway. Um, well, and, and to speak to one thing, Eris, when I looked up the list of population, uh, there's a wiki, wiki page for population settlements of the, the population statistics of the settlements in Gaza, and all of them seem to have been created in the 1970s or later. So maybe there was a community hey. there that was then organized into the settlement, but 
Um, well, yeah. I mean, these are all Jewish settlements, right? So like they get mushed together. Yeah. That's a, they don't end up at separate settlements. So looking, looking at it per settlement is just not going to get you anywhere. You have to look at it as individual Israelis, individual Jews in the region. But regardless, I completely agree with the pullout of Gaza ideologically. Um, I don't know if I agree with it after the consequences of October 7th, um, but I'd certainly agreed with it when it happened. Uh, the point that I was trying to get across is that sometimes you have to do population exchanges uh, for land for the sake of peace to prevent something that's far more har harsh and far more dangerous. So um, it's also why it's somewhat disingenuous when you talk or you call Israel an ethno state when basically every state in the Middle East operates off of demographics. Right when we saw the consequence of those types of demographics on October seventh, so it's just it's very strange to hyper focus on that when the entire reason why we removed Gazans from the area were because they were Jews. There was no investigation on like, okay, which one are you? Are you descendant of this indigenous person, or no? Did you come with this group, right? Or are you from this group? There was nothing. It was just Jews. You're gone, and I think that that's totally fine because I think that that was deserved. The, that land should go to the Palestinians, right, for the sake of peace and I do think that the West Bank should but like this idea that somehow demographics and somehow like ethnicity is not is just like a unique thing that Israel cares about is just not not true it's a norm for the region and it's a somewhat needed norm because of the historical animosity between different ethnic groups of the region I'm fucking confused because yeah. nobody's pushing back on the fact that she just said that it's the norm for the region to be like fucking ethnically based when like 99% right, of the world. Yeah. Q, 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 Let's say Israel just rams fucking Jewish immigration for 20 years and in 20 years there are 80% Jews living from the, from the river to the sea, 80%, 20% Palestinian. And then they say, all right, we're going to free Palestine. It's a free Palestine from the rivers of the sea, one state, we all get voting rights. Would that be cool? Well, if they just like displace all the Palestinians and leave No, like, no, no, if they just like them stay. Lonerbox is saying, what if so many Jewish people were in Israel that by the time that population blew up such that if all of historic Palestine was then made one state, what if there were so many Jewish people there that Jewish people would still represent an 80% majority compared to 20% Arab Palestinians if Gaza and the West Bank were incorporated in Israel proper and everyone was given equal rights? Would you that's be okay with that? Exactly why, that's exactly why they had a problem with the initial Zionist migration, right? Because it was changing the demographics of the reason and re and they had very good reason to be concerned about that. Sure, but I thought, yeah, what, what is Q's answer to that? The box, yeah, what is Q's answer to that? Would he be okay with that? If the demographics heavily favored Jewish people, such that 80% were Jewish, 20% were Palestinian Arab, would that be an okay one-state solution? How the fuck is it being done is the question. It's be, it would be done, done, it would be done by... To Israel. Yeah, it'd be, be done... To say they built three fucking Israel. massive cities sure. and filled them with Jews. And Jews all over so the world continue Jews to migrate to Israel. Israel. Yeah. yeah, and then they just say, okay, now it's one state, we'll call it Palestine but there's like 80% Jews living there now. Who gives a fuck? As long as you're not killing the Palestinians, right? You'd be okay with that? Okay. Okay. What? Wait, what? You... Palestinians are not okay with that. You, th the, you think this the Palestinians is, would be is... okay with that? <laughs> with being that 20% you... minority in Palestine? If it's, if it's, first of all, if it's cold. I'm Palestine, just going to give the answer to you. They would not be okay with it. They no, would no, be no, very the majority of Palestinians will only accept a state where they have the majority control. That's a statistic. Okay. A majority of Israeli Jewish people also support removing all Arabs from the country. It's like 40 okay. to 50 percent. Absolutely. Wait, are you saying the that's a Kahanist perspective? Are you saying the majority of Israelis are Kahanist? Yeah, no, 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 wait, wait. wait. The, polling. the polling data shows that I think around like 45 to 47 percent of people in Israel, or might even be a little bit over 50, support removing all Arab Palestinians yep. uh, from the region. However, an even higher percentage of Palestinians poll favorably. I think it's like 75 percent that action should continue against Israel, even if they had a one state solution to continue to expel Jewish people from the region. So, I mean, like both sides fucking hate each other. Whoa. Okay. Well, to speak um, to that a little bit. The thing that is of, being. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Well, I was, but the, fine. The thing, this idea that we shouldn't push back on this is, is I think we kind of already saw some of it, but it's really, really important to also understand the historical context in the sense that when, before the, is, before Israel is even a state, right, the British are having to step in to separate and, and, and make it illegal for Jews to move into areas where they are afraid that there will be too many Jews in an area, which would thus make it a majority Jewish area. 
it is it is the British with the white papers that are intentionally making sure that only that Jews only settle in certain areas because of the historical fact that Eris and Loader Boxer is discussing. Wait, which is that wait, Fabian, are you, you saying that to, the fault of this entire conflict between two indigenous peoples fighting over land is actually the actual colonial the power, colonized? Britain? Britain? Right? That's I, 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 I place large, wait, wait, hold up, hold up. I, wait, 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 hold on, wait, 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 hold on, no, real quick. Wait, 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 no, no, no wait, hold on, no, just real quick. Why? Because wait, hold Fabian on. Hasn't spoken wait, wait, wait. Because that was an insanely ridiculously. <laughs> that was a that was a ridiculously pro-Zionist take. Britain did not materialize out of nowhere the desire to create Israel. Okay, this was through insanely aggressive, quasi politically militant wait. action by pro-Zionist okay. people across Britain in order to get things like the Balfour Declaration to actually be declared so that they can have a place in Palestine carved out for them. That didn't come out of nowhere. It wasn't just Britain that did that. To be fair. What do you mean have a place in Palestine carved out for them? As in Jewish like, Zionists wait, prior no... to the Balfour Declaration okay. were trying incredibly hard to what? get Britain to try to carve out some place that they could be moved to that the Jewish people could have a country for. And it ended up being sure, in the Middle sure, East. Sure, sure, sure. So so what who who is going to take over Palestinian uh, Palestine and Syria? Palestine, Palestinians, the people living there, the Arab Palestinians. OK, oh, so the Palestinians who have never had a king. And have never had a ruler in that area. Why does that matter? Hold on, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But at the same time, from the 30s to the 40s, didn't the exact same thing happen in um, happen in Syria and Iraq? Isn't didn't literally both of those groups of people protest? That it wasn't that the impetus for the 36 to 39 Arab revolts is that they saw other Arabs in the region revolting and then getting their own states. So if those guys could do it, why couldn't the Palestinians, the Arab Palestinians? Right. The Brit British promised people this power or this this these states of their own, so long as they. Uh, so long as they work to overthrow the Ottomans, right? Uh, that was like, one of the, the promises deal. made, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Like, so the, but I'm the just saying that other that Arabs that didn't have groups. their own individual states, I don't think the Iraqis or the Syrians didn't have their own individual states, but they managed to revolt against the British people that were in the territory, and then they got their own states. So the Arab Palestinians probably right, thought they right, could have right. theirs too. Right, but, but see, here's the thing, is, is that these people who have never had a king, never had a government, and never had power, the British said... You can have this area, an, an area in the region. And they said the same thing to the Jordanian monarchy. And they said Made the it. same thing to the Jews. And so the question is, is why is it specifically problematic for the Jews, but not for the other two? Because the other two had already been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. So had okay, the Jews. And the Jews were living in Judea. They were living in Judea. Thousands of Jewish people in the region. At the, there were Jewish. The there movement. were Jewish Palestinians. Yeah, right. There were, but they were very. And, they were a smaller minority compared to the Arab population that lived there. Right. Yes, you're right. And also during during the Roman Empire, you had roughly That's two up. million people living in a region. And after the diaspora, after they were forced out, those numbers dwindled to a few hundred thousand all the way no. up until this time. I totally agree. And if we want to do a panel, and if we want to do a panel criticizing the Romans expelling Jewish people from Palestine, <laughs> we can do that, but that's not what we're talking about right now. Jesus right? Christ. Okay, no, what the no, point no, is, no, when you're no, talking you're, about... You're trying to dismiss, dismiss, you're trying to dismiss the, the idea, idea of, of like why power and states were established in the region. No, I'm not trying it to dismiss the idea. I'm just saying that, listen, if you want to talk about like ultra-historic people's rights to some land, that's fine, okay? But the difference is, is that the Arab Palestinians were already there. The Jews had already been expelled. The Arab Palestinians have been living there for at least what 500 okay, years at so least then, right so yeah okay so steven yeah how long after you've been ethnically cleansed from a region do you cease to have claims to that area do your your descendants cease to have claims to that area i don't know how long it would be but if you're already completely gone and another group of people is already there but they probably are not completely gone, gone. They, careful they no no you're no, not they, completely they gone. were essentially six hundred thousand of you there you're not completely gone. hold on wait wait wait, wait 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 there uh, were six hundred thousand uh, uh, jewish palestinians yes, no Yes, six, six, thousand. six, six thousand. Stop. Not wait, six hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. The no, Al, Al no. Wait. In forty-seven, prior to the to no, prior no, to no, this, no, not forty-seven. There were before the Balfour Declaration. Yeah, you guys are de dealing with different time periods. Yeah, stop. Hold, the whole, the, wait, the whole, the whole, the whole of the Palestinian exodus, okay, in forty-eight was about seven hundred thousand Arab Palestinians. Okay, there's no way there were six hundred Jewish uh, Arab Palest Jewish Arabs or whatever there prior to Not Britain shipping people in. Six hundred thousand Jews. No, in forty-seven six, there were six hundred thousand Jews. You're, 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 no, six hundred times. 
But, like, talking about, but we're talking about the Balfour says, Declaration because that's when Britain started allowing them to move we're, in. We're talking before what, Britain, what, okay, in what, like 1800 no. or whatever, there were like 6,000 yes. Jewish people. Six oh oh oh. Wait, what year? Before, wait, wait, oh, before, yeah, before, before Britain started Eight. bringing all of them in, that was the thing. That's why the Arab Palestinians were mad there. It's because Britain had a mandate on the territory, and then a whole bunch of Jewish people started moving in. That's why the Arab, the people that were, had been there for hundreds and hundreds of years were getting upset, right? It was like 2 to 3% of the population was Jewish. That's why they were upset. An area that, even during Roman times, could have supported 10 times the amount of people, right? You, you this is kind you want of to know another reason why they're like upset. So it's like, what it's year like, are we talking if about? Your argument, if your argument is that like that the Palestinian people deserve a state because they live in the region, so that, that that's that's the the right to statehood. Then like, why does that not apply to to Jews that move there later? Like, what is what what right do people have? to a state is it an ethnic right because if no it's no like the right hold on right, we can wait wait wait, like, wait, wait, wait we don't have to guess the right is the u.n charter okay in, in the 40s said that a group of people living in an area okay have a right to self-determination that they have a right to not be military infringement or other people will conquer so, them so then you're pro state of israel being established in this regard because they the group idea of people is that there's no palestinians area. there and they deserve the right to self-determination and they also haven't been absorbed into other countries yeah also right? and also well, well let's say we get to let's say we get to 1917 right like, yeah let's say we get to but let's say regardless we're, okay. the main reason why they were upset not just because of de demographics issues that the area in general operated uh pre pre-israel palestine operated in a very feudal like system that was a carryover from the ottoman empire so all these mm -hmm. the majority of land of the arab lands were not actually owned by those individual arabs who are working the land they were owned by these wealthy arab Arab landowners yeah. those and what was starting to happen was wealthy Jewish groups or um, just fun lots of fundings from Zionist groups over Europe would start buying the land whereas the the indigenous or Palestinian Jews as you want to call them for this time period were mostly poor very religious could not afford to do so so they start buying all of this land from the rich Arab landowners and then they start kicking the so-called serfs or peasants or whatever you want to call them who were working the land at the time or mostly arabs right off of the land in order to have jews work the land instead right so that's how that operated right so legally they were technically correct right when it comes to like purchasing land or so i think we can all agree that morally it's like pretty abhorrent um so they had complete they com had complete no. right reasons for that but regardless i i can't believe i'm saying this but i really think when it comes to the current issue and the current situation of what's going on discussing the details of this history is somewhat irrelevant um Agreed. and which feels like a lot coming from me but it, it's somewhat irrelevant right like when we're trying to actually talk about yeah, what's that's... going on with israel and what's going on with with palestinians because palestinians are, are very divided themselves on how on how to look at the past regardless so right it's, now it's, you have it right now you have a country the country of israel which is an established country according recognized by the majority of the world right with that is a u.s and major western ally it is a western liberal democracy okay it participates in liberal western traditions of freedom of press religion lgbt rights okay it's the only country in the region that releases private documentation to scholars every 20 30 years which is no, something i'm personally that. really passionate about okay and um, and you could say that these things are not are irrelevant. They are not irrelevant, right? It's an established nation, right? And even the nations around that are not democratic have a right to exist, right? If you believe in any country has the right to exist. If you're an so, anarchist, fine. You could be er consistent. Eris, no, well, I'm just saying that Israel's here. existence er is right now. No, okay, one second. I'm going to finish. You weren't here. I, give me some reparations as a leftist. Come on. Okay. So, I mean, for being a woman. Um, so... Uh, when it comes to looking at this entire thing, you have to understand that Israel's entire existence, this is an Arab-Israeli conflict from an Israeli's perspective, right? So Israel's entire existence is completely at, it is literally hanging by a thread right now. And this is how every Israeli feels, no matter how extremely lefty, no matter how much they've fought for Palestinian rights regardless. So this is something that you have to consider. If you, How do you think the United States is going to react if they think that they, their entire country might get wiped off the map tomorrow? Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, here's the problem. Was, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask this question uh, to you all. Was South Africa a democracy during apartheid? Was the United States a democracy no. during uh, American when, apartheid? Okay, during when Jim Eris Trump, says, you have hold on, Eris on. Says I literally just stopped. I literally just stopped talking. Let him cook, Prime Go ahead. 
To be fair, um, you asked the question and then got mad when he I, I, yeah. I don't understand why you ask a question it if you is, don't want to answer. Well, shut up, Quibbles. Obviously, I was continuing talking. You can answer after I've uh, done talking. You get this. Shut the fuck up. Thank you. Uh, any which way. So, yeah, um, when you have a, 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 a portion of your population, ethnic minority, a larger ethnic minority, who cannot fully participate within that society, what people need to understand is that during apartheid, during South African apartheid, during American apartheid, that this is a uh, not a passive thing. Simply laws that exist in the air, um, and uh, uh, and you know people just like exist in this atmosphere and just uh, go by it. It's an active kinetic thing. So uh, the population uh, takes part in um, uh, denying people the, their rights, enforcing those racial laws. So what I'm saying is that like you can say that ooh, yeah, in Israel you have a vote. True. Yes, they have. What racial laws does they, Israel they have? have hey, hold on, hold on, Eris, please. Uh, you can say that. Just like, keep have a making an analogy. Shut it's up! Not true. Shut the fuck up! You can't do that. You can't ap- accomplish that. Shut the fuck up! Thank you. Anyway, I've right. been shut I'm, up. I'm literally almost done. I've been quiet this entire time. So shut up. Thank Let you. Let him. Um, him. Uh, so you can say that they have these structures, and they do have those structures. But if those structures don't actually uh, um, uh, aren't open. To uh to the people, right? To millions of individuals, when they're locked out of that, is that actually a democracy? Is it or is a mock uh, a mockery of that? So so like uh, this gets trotted out. Uh, Israel is the only liberal democracy uh in this area. I say that's actually a lie. If you if you look at how it runs, right? Uh, how it enforces its laws brutally, then it's it, it certainly is not. So you I want to ask the now, argument now, the United States. Now, Hold on! Okay, I was cool. I was like we've one heard, sentence. We've heard it. I was one sentence. I was one sentence from finishing. So shut the fuck up! I'm gonna say that sentence. So you said once again, fifteen sentences ago. Right, shut the fuck up! Thank you, dumbass. Come on. Okay, Brian, so, please. So, so just so my last sentence. Like, so I, I, I'm, okay, I'm just good. saying what I uh, what is the was the American apartheid during that where we a democracy was South Africa an apart uh, during that apartheid okay. were there? I've heard your there question. You You're just repeating yourself. I've heard just the question. Saying, I am Here's the apartheid the queen. I feel like I'm an authority here. Here's the response Whoa. to the question. Are you ready? Cool. Okay. If you're talking about the West Bank, obviously. That is an occupation, and obviously it is not de- democratic. If you're talking about Gaza, obviously that is a dictatorship of Hamas, and so no, it is not democratic. You're talking about Area A of the West Bank, which is controlled by the Palestinian Authority. Obviously, that has not been elected either for a very long time. Therefore, that also is a dictatorship, a much better dictatorship than Hamas, but still a dictatorship. If you're talking about Israel proper, Okay, in Israel proper, 20% of people in Israel proper are Arabs. Okay, there's an Arab on the Supreme Court currently, there's another prior. Okay, there are, there is a, as a proportion, larger number of Arabs who are in the Knesset than there have ever in the history of the United States been black people in our Senate. Okay, it's also true that there's a larger number of Arabs as a proportion of the, of the society. Um, but like the idea that it's not a democracy, okay, is silly. Are there problems? Absolutely. It's a very is it a democracy? Just like the yes. This all or nothing. Mean, democracy just... doesn't mean perfect. It just means right. yes, it is a democracy, right? That's it's just a, it's just a yes or no. Hamas is not right. Fatah is not right. Lebanon, right? There are other places around this that are not. But yes, Israel is a democracy inside of Israel proper. It's also relatively. We need Lebanon to look at this relatively Denver, compared to the compared to the other countries in the region. It's insanely democratic, Florida. right? And I'm like a fucking massive critic of Israeli policy and the Israeli government, right? There's a lot of structural racism within Israel, just like there's a lot of structural ra- racism within the United States or Canada. There's a lot of dark past, but that doesn't mean they lose their democracy card. That doesn't mean that they suddenly don't get any credit for the fact that they're the only Middle Eastern country that releases their documentation openly to scholars every 20 years. I have never gotten any documentation open from Jordan. Why don't they give it? Egypt doesn't give it either. Why did these things are relevant, right? These are things are relevant. We should care about this. I'm just saying. I don't know when, why, like, just one because there's flaws that they somehow just, just the, lose the, that card. It's just flaw such, being such a strange a, idea. A massive military occupation that's lasted for decades, right? That's killed uh, thousands of people. Right? Said that's said that's 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 place. That's that's yeah, I know. I get you. I get you. Not that flaws exist. I'm getting that. I'm just like remembering what the flaw is. It isn't that like it isn't that like like places are being gerrymandered. That's not the flaw, right? The flaw is there's a massive. Wait, I thought America was committing a genocide against trans people. 
What? What? I don't, okay. I, I, I just, Arizona, that's always what I've been hearing. I'm just going to say, sorry, just for, 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 for right. prime, sorry, the reason, the goal. reason, Rich. The reason people the reason people call Israel apartheid is not because like they're saying it's like South Africa exactly like it's an apartheid state. They say it because the occupation is uh, has made the state so embedded in Palestinian affairs, especially in the West Bank with the settlements and with the fact that you know they've already annexed parts of it. They have they clearly have ambitions to annex more. Is that it, we're all is that they already live in a one state reality? And if you think of it in that way, then it's um, if it's functionally kind of just like one state anyway, then that's why they see it as apartheid because that's where you actually do have unequal rights. That's the argument they would generally make, but well, I don't know if I, I agree. agree with they that 100%, should accept I was one of these uh, fucking deals and, and govern themselves. My response well, to that which which deal should the Palestinians have accepted? Fucking if you're going, one of them. Which one? Okay. Wow. Jesus okay. If you're going know, to... Which one? Item from one fucking 67, okay. you know what I mean? Fucking one of them. 67, what, 67, when they told, 67 when they told fucking <laughs> Egypt to take Gaza and Jordan to take the West Bank back. The Palestinians should have accepted that. Proud yeah, three state solution. Yeah, never gonna, I'm, 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 I just want to say the only reason people, why we know that Israel committed an ethnic never, cleansing in 1948 is because they released their documentation. To this day, Jordan has not released any oh, of their okay. documentation about what they've what done. Do you think this is that good? Jordan These are the norms of the region. So when you use these terms and you don't apply them equally, it seems really strange. I am a lot of places in the Middle East are not democracies. They suck. Egypt is Egypt a Holocaust. I don't. So it's uh, Egypt, the Holocaust state. So loner, I have no idea about the history of Egypt, so I literally cannot tell you. Um, they but, forced um, out more Jews than that, Germany. That's great. I mean, that's are awful. they a Holocaust? <laughs> state? Excuse me, that's awful. Me, wait, that's wait, awful. wait, 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 wait. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. Egypt killed more Jews than Germany? No, forced, no, not killed. Forced out a larger number as a percentage okay. of their Jews than did Germany. Okay, wait, wait, okay, wait, wait, wait. A larger number a as a percent, a larger out. number of percentage of their population. That's a way different statement than what's an issue made. Okay, gotcha. Right. Fuck with your points. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I meant percentages. I apologize. I meant percentages. If I a lot of them. countries have really percent. fucked up ethnically bigoted stuff yeah. in their past. The yeah, argument like, that we're making here is Israel continues to have fucked up ethnically bigoted stuff right now. Yeah, and to be clear, I don't sign on to what Lorna Black says. Right. If you're I, going I, to I make the comparison, I, like three people are talking. Part -time, I just want to be. This is I just want to be clear that yeah, I don't sign on to no one can hear you. Please stop speaking. Yeah. If you're going to make the comparison, yeah. Go okay. Ahead. If you're going to make the comparison to apartheid in relationship to the West Bank, I think that may be somewhat legitimate. If you are likewise willing to make the comparison of Ethiopia or Iran or any number of places across both in Northern Africa and also the Middle East, which forced out as a percentage of their Jewish people, a larger percentage than did Poland or Germany. I agree. I agree. That's not apartheid. Okay, that I would agree. be like a removal. That would be, uh, that would be persecution or ethnic cleansing. That wouldn't be apartheid. I don't, I don't know that history. Does, does anyone in this chat support, support ethnic cleansing? Hey, 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 one out of fucking time. What's it's not fuck? a matter of whether or not you're talk. It's not a matter of whether or not you support ethnic cleansing. It's a matter of whether or not you're willing to condemn with the same level of, of forceful uh, terminology the, the ethnic cleansing of the rest of the Middle East as you're talking about. In the 40s? You think I would support the Middle East in the 40s? There's the ongoing to great. It's not a matter uh, of whether uh, a lot of those places were monarchist fuck. Oh. Oh there God. is the ongoing to great conflict, doesn't get any attention uh, within the Western media. Yeah. And yeah. thousands of people are dying, um, and it's an ethnic cleansing campaign. I, I uh, condemn that just as much. I want to bring more attention to that. So I'm 100% with you that a lot more uh, countries need to be condemned. And I'm certainly willing to con condemn America. So I don't know what this argument is. So like, I, I and I disagree with Lorna Box talking about, well, like well, Israel is a little different from South Africa. I think actually the structures that we see in South Africa are very much mirrored within uh, Israel, at least uh, within the West Bank. So I'm actually perfectly comfortable. With it's a very clear difference, things. right? It's, it's not clear, based right? on a racial group, but, like, it's based on a national group, right? I don't have the same rights as you in, in the United States. Yeah. Sorry, what, excuse um, me? When I what? go to the United States, I don't have freedom of movement, right? I don't have the right to do a bunch of things. So am I being discriminated? Is that apartheid against you me as a Canadian citizen? You have freedom of movement within the, or the United States. What are you talking about? I don't think- Well, she's not a citizen. She's, she's so, yeah, Canadian. We're talking about, okay. it's a bit yeah, different when you're talking about people living like, in their like, homes, that's, right? That's okay, like, but you can, but when you're in yeah. the United States, you can freely move in the United what, States. What what she's saying is there are restrictions- The reason why it's different is I would call it an illegal occupation, right? That's like a much better descriptor than apartheid, right? Because Arabs within Israel are treated on the whole equally. So it's just dishonest. It's so dishonest to what happened in South Africa. 
completely bullshit. Okay, so one, one, the so, Constitution extends to people within America, right? So even if you're not a citizen, you still have uh, rights. You still have protected rights. So let's put that aside. Talking about um, uh, is Israel, that true? Right? Talk- Non-citizens no. have the same rights as American citizens. I don't not believe that's true. Not the same. The Constitution no. does extend to them. Yes, they do. I'm just saying. Don't I don't have believe the same so. Right. No, they have, they have they have freedom. They they can't work with the occupation. It just doesn't work time. together. Prime, prime, so, prime, okay. even, so, prime, even the prime, 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 prime. Even the people who make the apartheid argument are not saying it's analogous to apartheid South Africa. They're calling it apartheid. They're calling argument. it apart. No, they're fucking retarded. They're they're calling it apartheid because it's um it's a crime. That's why they're referring to international law no, against the crime of no. apartheid. I'm That's what they're saying. The yes, there is. That's why, no. Okay. Well, all right. I'm making my argument. I don't care about their argument. Then I'm making my uh, argument, right? I'm just, so if you okay, think it's that's just fine. me, that's fine. I'm saying that, like in apartheid, for instance, uh, they gave you uh, passes, right? And those, and and every one of the the blacks, right, had to carry these passes, and the passes determined your movement. Um, uh, if you uh, had uh, were the wrong age or like I don't know your birthday was wrong, whatever the fuck, like you couldn't go this place uh, to to point A or rather point B. The same thing is true within uh, the West Bank, right? They have checkpoints all over the place um, to break up commerce, to break Passport. up movement, and they don't allow people. Uh, uh, t- uh, uh, to move around, they have separate roads, right? They have the uh, the Jewish roads, uh, the the highways, and then the dirt. Um, uh, uh, separate IDs, separate IDs as well. Sorry, yeah. Okay, okay. It's I'm just weird. saying that's really good. That's, your, that's, that's really good. That, that's really good. That's really good. That's your take, Prime. But I'm just saying the steel man. That yeah. Would okay. Actually make I, right, this, so, excuse it. me. Then I then I edited. Oh then I'm God. talking I'm about sorry. myself. Was I like, I'm was making I like it. Three words like into a sentence. Wait, Prime. Prime. Let loader. Prime. Prime. Let loader go. So. The reason, so the steel man of people calling it apartheid, and the reason Bet Salem and Amnesty uh, and Human Rights Watch call it apartheid is because they're referring to it being a crime under international law, and because the crime of apartheid has not been recognized that many times since South Africa, it's got quite a lot of wiggle room for interpretation. But what they generally refer to is. Um, it's the practice. It's like a legal, like a practice that happens under territory that they have a level of control of. And I think the level of control they have under the occupation is enough that it's like quite similar to it happening as if it would under one state. That's that's the argument they give. Anyway. Lona Box, how, how does that level of control? What are the mechanisms of those control? Can you explain those what? mechanisms to everyone? What mechanisms? What the apartheid the me- mechanisms? You're saying that. Yeah, you're saying that there's a, a level of control within the West Bank, right? And because of this control, like well, people call it apartheid. Right. So what are those mechanisms that, that people are saying? The so even even in Israel proper, I think there's a law where um, I think the nation state law was what was kind of where why Bet Salem kicked off with it. I think mm-hmm. um, the checkpoint system and like the like the policy of like generally like Hafrada, I think it's called. And then um, more there's the, even in Israel proper, you could argue there's a um, there's a uh, law which allows developers to reject people's rights to um to build up property in certain areas if they think uh for ethnic reasons j- just on the grounds of ethnic reasons sure. and they would say okay, that I'm like falls under the legal definition of a system sure. uh implemented sure, with the intent bank, to maintain like um a, a domination of one group over sure. the other can you yeah. describe the west bank because that's what i asked you about well yeah the west bank would be the west bank would probably be the um the splitting up of communities the fact that an israeli can drive like through um uh, Israel and the West Bank without having to like go through checkpoints or the fact that um, there's like some and some towns there are even like separate road systems for Israelis and Palestinians and I think uh, you could also make the argument that the unequal yeah, distribution of certain roads too. yeah that's why it's called apartheid apart yeah yeah apartheid yeah. Um, yeah and then there's also the uh, unequal distribution of rights to develop land and to build on land in West Bank that's like a big one because I think Israelis get approval quite a lot for building in uh, their parts of the West Bank and Palestinians get very low rates of approval. So, yeah, there you go. Okay, yeah. And so yeah, I think the action, issue is that when you... Up to, uh, like uh, like the, the, the level of violence um, by the state against uh, civilians, correct, right? Um, uh, uh, the, the fact that um, uh, the settlers, right, um, uh, can enact that violence and there'd be like no uh, way, like civil way for uh, Palestinians to uh, get um, remuneration or anything like that, right? Like that would be... Um, I do think you have some options for recourse as a person of the West Bank if you're attacked by a settler. I don't think it's just like they can just murder anyone. 
uh, while it's while it is so true, that, well, wait, wait, real quick. While it's true yeah. that you can't just like indiscriminately murder anybody, it does seem to be the case that there's a history of IDF soldiers killing civilians. It gets investigated, um, even by the Israeli military. They determine that improper actions happen, that somebody's killed indiscriminately, and then the punishments for the soldiers are some are unbelievably soft sometimes like to the course of like one or two years of like you're either suspended or like in jail for less than a year for like murdering civilians which is pretty crazy yeah so. and also the fact that like if you're like an outposter you might even have more rights than a that somebody lives in the severe. west bank i think we can yeah. all agree that the yeah. consequences yeah. should be yeah. much yeah. more severe yeah. right uh israel yeah. has a lot of work to do in how it treats a lot of its populations Right. Yeah. Um, well, I, the using I'll, the term apartheid is something that I disagree with. I do agree that it could become apartheid, and there's especially with the national law that happened yeah, in the, 2018. The I think that it's I'm, getting I'm saying much closer there. That I have. So, one sentence. It, one sentence. All I'm saying is the that, like, that I have if you is don't, if you don't agree, the that I'm saying. Uh, one sentence, uh, one sentence, one sentence, one sentence, one sentence. You cannot. Okay. Okay. Both of you. Both of you are getting fucking muted. What the fuck? You guys fucking stupid prime. Chill out, man. Let, let Quibble talk, by the way, please. Okay. Go ahead, Quibble. Okay. The frustration that I have is that when people call it apartheid, they are by definition calling the entirety of it Israel, right? So you can't simultaneously believe that the West Bank is not part of Israel and also call it apartheid, right? It's If you want to call it an occupation, valid. But there's a difference between occupation and apartheid. Apartheid requires that it's the same country. No, it doesn't. Not legally. What? No, what are you talking that's about? That's why it's illegal. Absolutely. That's why it's an appeal no, to a legal okay, definition. That, the, the, the crime of apartheid, that, the crime of apartheid is not what happened in your own country. Okay? All I want to say is, not a is quibbles. It's just a, what? It needs to be a system. Wait, there needs to be like wait, one state. Okay, in, in, order for it to, there has, in order for something to be legally considered legit, right, there also has to be legal precedence. So what legal precedence has there been where a country um, has been uh, guilty of apartheid against non-citizens? Well, that's why I said there's a lot of well, that's that's why I said that there's quite not a lot of wiggle non-citizen. room in it because there hasn't been much unique. precedent, right? That's well, why, and I think that's also, I think, wait, wait, and or oh, second, and because yeah. Israel is unique in this situation, right? That like this form of like extreme occupation for an extremely long period of time, something that we have very rarely seen. Except, I don't know, like what East East to like like uh, Indonesia, maybe I don't know any yeah, other. Most examples countries literally like just genocide or kill those those populations yeah. instead of well, instead of do this, yeah. right? So I like yeah, and, and that you was, can literally you can yeah, look at all of those in situations. So I don't understand what what you expect in a lot of these so, situations. A lot of times, the- Israel's Israel's back is completely against the wall from their perspective, and that's why, like, I always ask, like, what do you expect them to do? Because I had a lot of expectations. I was a leftist Israeli, right? Just like the majority of the Israelis that got killed on October seventh, right? I had a bunch of you. Stop rolling your eyes. That's so disrespectful. I will absolutely right? not do that. I will not do that. I'm gonna roll my fucking eyes. Thank you. Okay. God, you know that. So, fuck okay. that. Fuck, no, like, so, from the UN no, charter, no, no, the crime so against what happens, uh, humanity of apartheid... No How dare you just roll your eyes like, like at that I will do that. I will okay. do whatever I want with my face. You do not control How that. I'm stop. Stop. Don't get to you colonize you my face. Don't get to colonize like my face. The largest killing of Jews since the holidays. Okay. okay. Go yeah, stop trying that. Stop not not okay. So from the UN Charter, right? In the, the, crime, the crime against uh, humanity of apartheid <laughs> civil being committed during an occupation Good. that is governed by international. She was in the middle of a law. sentence. First Article yeah, Three of finished. International Convention. She was literally in the middle of a yeah. sentence. She was not okay. finished. Brian. She ca- attacked me. She was in the middle of sentence of attacking me. Because so then I stepped in. So shut up. You not attack yeah, people. Yeah, and I will roll this my eyes again. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to colonize my eyes. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Please, wait, wait. Sentence. Stop. 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 <laughs> Quibble. Okay. Uh, Eris, uh, finish your point and then Prime go afterwards. Please don't interrupt her. Um. When... So... There was like this major attack on primarily leftist Jews and leftist Jews... Pri- primarily, sorry, leftist Jews, leftist Israelis, right? Because when you're talking about Israelis, they're most, uh, when you're talking about leftist Jews in Israel, obviously they're all Israelis, so we need it interchangeably in this situation. But they're always, like, they were making tons of allocations. One of the things that they, they were the one that pushed Ariel Sharon to leave the, to leave the party and supported him in leaving the, um, the party of Likud in order to even make uh, to pull out of Gaza and to make that peace allocation, right? Um, 
there were a bunch of other instances. Uh, they, they were the ones that pushed, and it's a bunch of the people that actually got kidnapped were peace activists who were constantly trying to push for more um, people in Gaza because there's a huge unemployment rate in Gaza, and that's what leads to a lot of the radicalization that happens there, right? So they were pushing for more permits to go work there. This is not, you can keep rolling your eyes, but these are like real policies that were pushed for. And what ended up happening is leftist Israelis got completely humiliated on October 7th, because what happened with those people, those Gazans that were given those work permits, okay, a huge portion of them were literally using it to gather intel, to take pictures, to gather intel about how many civilians and how many babies and how many, um, and how many women were in each village that they wanted to attack. And this is, you can look this up yourself. This is just like given evidence. I don't think this is so funny, you know? Right. I don't know, like I, I, I don't know like why, Everest, why, why you're laughing Everest, at this. Let's let Prime reply. Uh, sure. Prime, go ahead. Thank you. Ignoring that, um, back to what I was actually responding to, uh, the apartheid, right? The crime against humanity of apartheid is capable of being committed during an occupation that is governed by international humanitarian law. First Article 3 of the International Convention on the elimination of all forms of uh, racial discrimination obligates states to prevent, prohibit, and eradicate all practices of this nature. Uh, racial segregation and apartheid in territories under their uh, jurisdiction. So, um, so you are a pain uh, to the law uh, now. So, okay. Uh, when you say no, yeah, and, and the law, Thanks. and the law, as as many Ooh. different organizations have established, this fall, uh, uh, falls under apartheid. Okay. And so, the, so when you all say, I was trying to say quibble, and now quibble's talking. What? Uh, no, quibble, co co quibble. Don't let's not do this again, please. Try and go. Thank you. So, uh, uh, when you say like you don't feel. Like this is um, apartheid, right? I don't care about how you feel, whether it's apartheid or not. Well, what I'm saying is that there are actual practices that are murdered in both. And if you don't think uh, these are uh, the same, I think what it means is that you're not uh, familiar with South African apartheid. The mm -hmm. mechanisms of control used against the black population there are mirrored um, in the methods of control used against um, uh, Palestinians. That's well, I don't think that's true because there's Palestinians that are actually in government in Israel. There's like yeah. they they have freedom. They're able to vote. They they engage in democracy. Like the Supreme it's Court. Not, yeah. It's yes. It's not it, like when you're talking about the mechanisms of control. They're not really as so, similar. If you're saying so, okay, so is the standard of like any crime. Right, that the facts of the crime must be literally exactly the same, or it's no, not no, it's not crime, right? exactly the same. But when we use the word, that's checklist. what we're referring. Wait, wait, I think, to. I think, hold on. When we talk about, I think, I think, say okay, apartheid. I, I think when so we talk if about we say the word, that's what yeah, we're referring. To. I think when we're talking about apartheid, if we're being good faith, okay, I think generally when we talk about what we feel like apartheid is if you have a country and then that country has policies that are literally separating out racial groups in terms of the rights allotted to them, right? This is the this is an, a horrible thing that all of us should be opposed to. I think the difference is that for Israel, these are occupied territories. The situation is quite a bit different. If this was a one state thing and it was all one country and they were giving explicitly different rules for Arab Palestinians, I think all of us agree that would be horrible. We, I'm sure most people here would say, like, yeah, we can call that apartheid. But we're dealing with like a military occupation of military borders, armistice lines. It's a bit different, I think. Well, let me yeah, ask you then, on, but it's, Justin. It's, you think, but Prime, that's please. these organizations. Prime. Prime. Wait, Prime, Prime. let somebody else get it. Oh my Hold God. On. Oh, shut up, Quinn. So, <laughs> yeah, what's up? So, so I was going to ask you then, so with what you just said, mm -hmm. let's assume Israel annexes all of the West Bank tomorrow and everything else, all else equal, everything else stays the same. Yeah. Would you call it apartheid then? Absolutely. But I think so that's probably just why like, like Israel practice. wouldn't want to annex. Like, if you yeah. gave Israel the opportunity, well, yeah, this is the one state solution. If Israel had the opportunity to annex both territories, Israel wouldn't want to because they don't want to give equal rights to those people, right? I just want to say, so mm -hmm. um, outside so, of all the dipshits on Twitter, that is generally the argument that people like advocates give when they call it apartheid. Is they're saying it's just like it might as well be because of how it functions. But, yeah, because yeah, because yeah. the issue is because the military. Because I I think in the original definition of apartheid, I don't remember if they're trying to cuck out to extend it more because they want to condemn Israel or whatever. But I think I think as part of the original chapter that talks about apartheid it's the um it's the uh, intent to have like an extended like racial separation the, 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 like you're trying to establish something over a period of time which is what south africa is what, what like 50 years or whatever is, yeah. is what you're trying to do yeah so for israel right if we were in you know 1970 right or 1975 and we call this apartheid that's stupid 1980 probably stupid 99 2000 2023 where we've had these armistice lines for like 50 years six years well now it starts to feel a lot different i can understand why people are like is this apartheid it kind of feels like it. there's still military borders and it's an occupation not official territory but yeah it gets a little bit murkier but it, the problem 
with people like throwing it out as being apartheid, apartheid, apartheid. It's not, the, the problem isn't really the apartheid. The problem are the military borders and the lack of actual permanent borders. That's the real problem, right? Because if the actual states get set up, then the apartheid problem is simple. That's an easy problem to solve, right? Well, that's the, that, so I think the big I, I reason, wanna... the, re the big reason behind people going for the apartheid thing is they want to use it as a prerequisite for like they did in South Africa, which is voting right. Like under... they want a one state. Yeah, yeah I understand, I understand, I understand that way. I, I understand why well. they want to do that's that. Perfect. But the issue then is that, that, that people and people all over the world are doing this is they set up this issue as being an Israel versus Palestine issue when they talk about it being apartheid. But that's not the issue. It's not Israel versus Palestine. It's Israel versus the Arab world. That's the issue. And when you only frame it as Palestinian oh. rights, you miss the entire point of like, why it, this is such a conflict, right? Destiny, you've, you've appealed so to the UN many times in this conversation, right? You've appealed to the UN many it, times. When the UN so says, I, I, wanna, right, I, I just, I Googled it and right okay. there, the UN says that this is apartheid. Why do you disagree with that? Because I just, I think it's a stupid analysis of the situation. It's a military occupation. I wouldn't so, expect them to have the okay, same so, rights. So it's how you feel, right? Not like whether like the UN, which you've uh, appealed to many times before. Uh -huh. uh, it's just, you feel that it's not an apartheid, not that like, it hasn't been adjudicated are you stuff, capable right? of engaging with any of the mm -hmm. rationalization i just gave or are you just going to say like so it weird. feels and like that means my <sighs> argument is incorrect no no you said no that's Hold on. hold on, wait a minute, no, no, wait, wait, I did not say, hold on, let me, no, no, wait, I can restate it, I can restate it, yeah, I can restate it. I didn't say, I feel like it's not a part of so it's not. What I said was, apartheid is generally what I would imagine would be uh, levied towards a state that is enforcing racially separate po uh, policies with people that live in their borders. That was the issue with South Africa. South Africa's not a military uh, uh, occupation. South Africa was black people had fundamentally different rights, codified in law, and enforced with the military. Ver the tens of thousands of people died during apartheid, right, political violence. As as opposed to that but the difference is for the, the problem the problem stop the, pro stop the problem with israel and and palestine isn't that it's apartheid the problem is that it's a military occupation if the military occupation ends the apartheid issue goes away but the apartheid issue will never be solved while it's a military occupation so focusing on the apartheid part is stupid that's what i'm saying so okay yeah, all right fine but it's that you're saying it's in your opinion mm. All I'm saying, kill me. I'm gonna kill myself. I'm gonna kill myself. I'm killing myself. Oh my god! Oh my god! That's all over me. I'm on the twentieth floor. I'm going overboard right now. I'm leaving. Destiny, destiny, destiny. Look, I just restated what you said. Destiny, destiny, destiny. Look, I just restated what you said. That's your opinion, correct? Right? Then fine. Then I will say, just state for the record, for the audience, that's your opinion. Correct? Right? Then fine. Then I will say, just state for the record, for the audience, that the UN says this is apartheid. That the definition I gave you before hey, under international hey. law says that uh, if it's under- yes, I have no problem, under, Prime, yes, I will say, I think the UN calling this apartheid is fucking retarded. I think it's a stupid thing for the okay, UN to do. Agree, and I think no it And I think, yes, and I think it moves all of us farther away from the actual solution. Okay, wait, hold on, 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 of well, course. the UN, me, the UN only convicted me, like ten percent of the Nazi officials. Okay, okay, the UN's so, not right. Everybody. Oh, let me. I'm, I'm going to step in. I made the I don't the Human line. Rights Council right now is a rant. Come on, we can all agree that the UN is not right. Hold on, right? Iran is not right. the only human rights council. Hold on. The UN. The UN. Wait, this is a really short thing. I'm going to cut in and then we die. The UN making a claim about an actual statistic is different than the UN making a claim about like definition. Wait, stop. stop! One and then the other. One and then the other. Jesus Wait, fucking Christ. You stop. Jesus. Okay. Fabian hasn't spoken in a while. We'll let him so go first. Fine. All right. So, as I was trying to say, um, you guys are going to hate me for this, but it's important to, to point out. Um, so, what has just happened in the last 15 to 20 minutes, and this is why it's really important, and, and I'm speaking mostly to the audience because I know all of you are going to hate me for this. But it's really important that you that you understand what you actually saw, because what you actually saw is the dialectic process taking place before you, right? What you actually saw is how leftism destroys these conversations, because aristocracy and quibbles over coffee are, are, are they're talking about two specific things. They're talking about a double standard where Israel is judged by, by, by this extreme standard that historically all of these other nations aren't and trying to and, and Eris brings up this idea that like. This is an established government that is a liberal democracy within the area. And so once she says liberal democracy, right, what the leftism speaking through prime guys sees that and goes, ah, there is a way the, the, I have, I have, I have, I have, I have this thesis, which is that there is this contradiction, right? There's this contradiction between the, some people saying apartheid and this idea that it's supposedly a democracy.
And Eris tries to stop this to say, hey, look, if you're going to be this nitpicky about it, about what is a liberal democracy in the region, not actually engage with the conversation, but instead try and subvert the conversation with language games, then like we could do the same thing about the U.S. or any other country. And he forces this he forces the, the, the antithesis, this idea that actually it's an apartheid state. And what it does is destroys the quality of the conversation so that he can infect it with leftist philosophy instead of actually engaging okay. with the arguments okay. that are put forward before him. And so, that is why we are in this shit show right now. Okay, Fabian, that was great. That, that, was a great that, that was a great spot to end Quibbles. You wanted to say something. Uh, by the way, after Quibbles yeah. is done, then we're going to you know, get to our closing remarks and then we're going to pick a winner because, cool. yes, there will be a winner for this show. Quibbles, go ahead. Cool. Okay. The first thing that I wanted to say um, was very simple, which is when the UN gives us statistics, those are broadly statistics that can probably be trusted. That's different than when the UN tries to define terms, right? Those aren't the same thing. You can trust them in relationship to their facts and not agree with their opinions, right? Those are two different things. That's the first thing. Um, the second part is I just want to like double down on, on a lot of what Fabian said there, which is that like, yeah, there is a double standard here. And it's weird that there's this constant conversation trying to parallel um, the acts of, of Israel, which is doing the thing that is, though obviously not perfect, a heck of a lot better than what any other country in the totality of the Middle East or Northern Africa has done to their Jews. The only reason this is still a conversation in 2023 is because they were still happening. To do what SDL did. They refuse to do what everyone else did across the entirety of the Middle East, which is to create an ethno state by forcing out everyone who wasn't part of their ethnicity, right? And that's why, to this day, 20% of people in Israel proper are Palestinian. That's why they have someone on the Supreme Court. That's why they're a democracy. That's why they were part of the governing uh, majority uh, up until the recent past, right? This is something that is fundamentally dissimilar to anywhere else in the in the entirety of the Middle East or the, Northern Africa. And so it's frustrating that undergirding all of this is the fact that Israel is being punished today because they refused in the past to do something that was as awful as other countries surrounding them did. Thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of episode 17 of Kicker Key. Prior to ending, I'll give you all, you know, 30 seconds or so to give closing remarks, starting with Dylan. Go ahead. I didn't get to really say much of anything this show because of my internet connection. Uh, but what I will say is something I didn't get to say the whole time, which is mm -hmm. I don't think I trust this Israeli government to engage in any type of offensive operation anywhere, especially if it extends into a long-term occupation. This is the Israeli government that failed to defend its own people in southern Israel. This is an Israeli government which built up the security apparatus for the last 12 years under Netanyahu, and it failed. This is the same Israeli government which ruined its relationship with its uh, reservists and with its military through pushing through the judicial reforms. And I'm supposed to trust an Israeli government that its own people doesn't even trust to manage an occupation where it's clearly, to some extent, if you listen to Benny Gantz or you listen to Netanyahu or you listen to the officials close to him, are in somewhat engaged in a kind of post 9-11 bloodlust that many Americans might remember from the Howard Stern stream, which happened dur uh, during 9-11 as it was going on, uh, which is a lot of anger, which is lo leading to loose terms of engagement, which is leading to going headfirst without a plan. The Israeli government still has yet to define exactly what it's going to do after it takes over the strip outside of eliminate Hamas, which is an international organization. All right. Its leadership is in Qatar. How is it going to do that? That's my question. All right. Thank you, Dylan, for that closing remark. Fabian, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm Fabian Liberty. Check me out on, you know, Rumble on YouTube, Fabian Liberty. Uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, kind, I, I in, in many ways, I, I, I kind of sit in the center, and I, and I still do after all of this. You know, I, I think that there is massive, massive propaganda, I think, is the biggest takeaway we should take as a closing, and that we should all be very, very careful um, about what it is that we share, what it is that we believe, and how quickly we share stories. Um, I think, you know, if there's if there's any one thing we can think about from either side, right? I mean, I think the hospital story was an example of that, that I think a lot of people saw, you know, the baby beheading story. You know, we still don't have accurate information on many of these things. And I think we should recognize that as the world is shifting, as as war is shifting, 
from like, you know, industrial era empires moving into the atomic age, but instead global hegemonic kind of structures that are like based upon, you know, the reserve currency of the U S dollar and oil and, and connections and networks that we recognize that information warfare is, is it, is at an all new height that never existed before and throughout the social media landscape. And so, yeah, I get it. Talk, 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 fuck you socialist. Um, and, and, and so like what I think is like, yeah, so I, I would said say, 30 seconds you know, talk, minutes. Talk. 30, guys, quick reminder again. I said 30 seconds, not 30 minutes, okay? So, loner, closing remark. 30 seconds, please. Uh, it's been a bit wacky seeing a lot of Israeli politicians and right-wingers basically turn into Howard Stern after 9-11. It's been maybe less surprising seeing a lot of pro-Palestinian people turn into fucking bin Laden after 9-11. Uh, ultimately, I think both groups obviously deserve peace and dignity and self-determination and human rights and all that shit. Um, hopefully, after this, if Hamas really does get the fuck out, then there can be elections and Palestinians can have be represented by a more unified, better leader. And maybe finally the Israeli government can actually decide what the fuck it wants, tell us what borders it wants, stop expanding settlements. Uh, <laughs> who knows? There we go. Thank you for that closing remark. That was closer to 30 seconds. Uh, fine. You could um, take two minutes. You could take three minutes, actually. You know, I, I'll give you five <laughs> minutes. Go ahead and give us your closing remark. Thanks so much. Um, find me at twitch.tv or youtube.com. Um, Prime Kai, P R I M E C A Y E S. Love to have you. Um, I want to just extend uh, you know, a thank you to the people who participated, even the ones on the other side. Thank you, Eris. Thank you, Quibbles, right? Even though I, I told you to go fuck yourself a few times. Um, thank you to my good friend, Scott, who I deeply love, even though he said all those things about me. Um, but shout out to all of you. Uh, I stand by what I said. I believe um, Israel is an apartheid state. Uh, and I would like a, a, a peaceful, equitable way of ending this, but it's not going to end peacefully while the occupation is happening. And that's really unfortunate. Free mm-hmm. Palestine from the river to the sea. Thank you. Lovely. Oh, Quibbles. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm Quibbles, uh, whatever. Uh, the broader part that I want to talk about is a lot of this was sort of, I think, a a conversation that was worthwhile and an interesting conversation, but wasn't necessarily contextualized from the perspective of where we're actually coming from. Um, With the exception of Eris, I believe literally everyone else here is an American. Um, And so I think that it's worth thinking about when we're talking about foreign policy, um, these kinds of issues from an American perspective. Um, And so when I think about what America should be doing, um, I would say that, you know, the first thing that I would say is like, obviously the Iron Dome is exclusively defensive. Um, and so we should be continuing to fund the Iron Dome and we should probably extend more more funding towards the Iron Dome. Um, and the second thing that I would say is that just as a reminder, the reason that Hamas did this entire attack to begin with on October 7th um, was because there was a concern about Saudi Arabia and Israel going to uh, becoming more peaceful um, and a broader power change away from Iran, um, who's their largest backer. Um, and so when I think about that, sort of backdrop of this, I think that it's really important that America um, stay resolute um, in its support um, of peace between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Um, And so those two things I would say are the the most important things from an American perspective. Beautiful. Thank you for that closing remark. SDL. Go ahead, my man. Oh, I can't hear you. I I can't hear you. Is he he deaf on my end too? Or yeah, like, he's muted everywhere. I think. Yeah, he's muted. I think his mic's muted or not plugged in or something. As Dale, you lost your privileges. It's over. It's over. <laughs> not gonna get it back. GG's. Oh, wait, say something. Wait, he, he, yeah, just, he just had it. it. He, he just left. had it. <laughs> wait, he just had it. Yo, as oh, okay. speak up again. It works. It works. Say something. All right. So I was gonna read from the special reporter on apartheid to close out. They say, quote. In the Palestinian territory occupied by Israel since 1967, there is deeply discriminatory dual legal and political systems that privilege the 700,000 Israeli settlers living in the 300 illegal Israeli settlements in East Jerusalem and the West Bank, living in the same geographic space, but separated by walls, checkpoints, roads, and an entrenched military presence 
There are more than 3 million Palestinians who are without rights, living under an oppressive rule of inst institutional discrimination and without a path to a genuine Palestinian state that the world has long promised is their right. That's why we call it apartheid, because de facto, it is apartheid for sex, for, sorry, oh my God, for 6 million Palestinians, um, for millions of people who now have after Israel's bombardment of Gaza, been displaced. There are 1.4 million people displaced in Gaza. 700,000 of those are children. If you want to help them, you should donate to PCRF, the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. You can find it, easily access it, and the aid goes directly to keeping children alive. Children in South Gaza are only drinking half a liter a day. Give money. Beautiful. Thank you for that closing remark. Uh, Stardust. You've had plenty Hi. to say. I don't know if I should. I, I don't know if I should even give you a closing remark, honestly. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Ahead. I don't know. I, I came to I came to join this panel because I was super super interested. I messaged uh, Carantos during. I was like, oh, you know, I've been like covering this for like the past week. Um, and uh, and he was like, yeah, just join. We're in our last round. But yeah, obviously things were heated, so I couldn't really get a whole lot in. I guess if I were gonna um say a couple of things on this, I would say, um, you know, my opinion is that no one has like a unique right to land purely because of their ethnic background or because of how long their ancestors have been there. Um, like we could, you know, imagine if, you know, you had um, immigrants in America, and sometimes you do have this, where people um, are, you know, say like, oh, your ancestors didn't contribute to the society. Like, why should you be here? Why do you deserve the, um, you know, the results of the toils of our ancestors, you know? Um, so, so I don't think that any, I think basically whether your ancestors were existing on the land prior or not, um, everybody has a right to exist and to have a home as long as they don't infringe on other people's rights or uh, their safety. Um, neither side in the conflict is completely guilt-free. Um, I think Israel obviously needs to stop occupation. Um, and I think ordering the evacuation of the Gazans uh, needed to be better coordinated. Um, if you look at like a partition in India um, and the mass migration that followed because of that, um, that ended up in like millions of deaths, right? Um, so I think that there could have been better coordination with the evacuation of Northern Gaza. Um, it would have taken, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, it would have taken longer, but it would have been worth it. But um, either way, I don't, I, I understand why Israel needs to get involved. Um, you know, there's, there's no other, there's no other choice in my opinion. They need to get involved, so. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that take. Uh, Tom, go ahead and bless us with your closing statement. Yeah, just super happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Wait, that's it? Oh my God, I love you, man. You're that's fucking it. amazing, bro. Yeah, hey, <laughs> hey, 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 you hit me up later. I got you. Uh, Eris, uh, uh, please go ahead. The first thing I want to say is uh, I think Israel-Palestine, um, I'm hoping that the reason why it doesn't get a, it gets so much attention is not because of anti-Semitism, um, but uh, is actually because it's a symbolic demonstration of a land back movement, which is right now um, a massive idea um, uh, that's being perpetuated in universities and intellectual circles and like online in the, uh, on the left. Um, and it's almost become mainstream now. Uh, and you have two populations that argue over whether or not who is more indigenous. Um, they both have their own arguments, whether or not you agree with them, I think is somewhat irrelevant because I land on where Stardust is, that I don't think it matters where your ancestors are from. Um, I think we should uh, admit that this land back ideology uh, is racist, is dangerous, and directly led to the disgusting genocidal acts of Hamas on October 7th, which has been cheered on by mainstream leftist organizations. Um, the uh, the largest university in Canada, the largest university, mainstream university in Canada, all its student unions came out supporting the attacks on October 7th, right? This has been a regular issue throughout um, throughout basically the entire West. This, it, to me, that is the larger, the much larger concern here. Um, there is this very dangerous ideology that if you have had your land stolen in the past, that somehow that justifies what you do, that who this entire conversation started in the beginning with Prime making claims about, um, uh, about who is a settler. And that type of language is... Uh, is dog whistle language. I consider it dog whistle language, and I think this is how uh -oh. we should start talking about it um, because it is dangerous. And I'm telling you to anyone here, okay, you are probably on stolen land, and it justifies 
um, your ethnic cleansing, it justifies your genocide. And it's something that we need to stamp out that type of ideology. It's dangerous re regardless. And this idea that Jews should, are, should be more scared of the right wing is something I categorically reject now after what happened on October 7th, because uh, yeah, because obviously that was, I mean, tons of lefties have told me that that's exactly what decolonization looked like. So um, that's my largest concern. Um, and oh, uh, also other other than that, I hate the, oh, the current Israeli government. Okay, it uh -huh. fucking sucks. And they have a huge part in play of why they let so many of their own people die on October 7th. But that's it. Beautiful way to close your clo uh, closing statement. Uh, thank you very much. Is there a poll in chat, Lusty, for the winner? Because we are selecting a winner. There is indeed a I'm poll. Like a, That's how we I'm decide like who wins, Israel or Palestine. World peace is being decided by this poll. Read your Good case, luck. ladies and gentlemen. Read your case. I'd, li I'd, like to, I'd like to point out that I believe this panel has been an apartheid panel, as I was the only person that got bitched at for going you over did all the fucking seconds, talking. All right? <laughs> no, Q was doing the whole like hurry up thing with his hands, so you know I felt the pressure too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, you know, we're, yeah. I'm just yeah. saying, I'm just saying, you know. And yeah, I also I didn't throw get that in, special Jew treatment, you know, it's fucked up. Can I just throw in really quickly? Hey, they pay the that, most, you know, Muslims, oh, yeah? Muslims were colonizers for a, like a good part of history oh, as well. Oh come so, on! So, you know, the I mean, the term shit. Palestine is an imperialist term, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So. Okay. Who cares? I mean, the whole yeah. thing of this debate was that was um, Quibbles bringing up all these bad things the countries have done in the past. Okay, are we here to condemn the actions of Iran in the 1950s? Or are we here to talk about something in 2020? Iran just killed a, ki a kid no, with, who is 16 for not wearing. Yeah, and that sucks. But are, like, can, is it possible to condemn multiple that things at the same time? Am I am I living in a world where you can only oppose one country at a time? Come on. No, you can oppose multiple was, ones, but it, there are standards that are not this... being held across the board. So. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The one about is the what I think, at this point. The like, double think, standard think, is that there's... The I double think standard had a part time. One no specific standard. quibble is silly. So I'm saying that one quibble many, that has five and a half million people in apartheid. Am America like, was part of that's it too. Like, not what so I fucking I'm said. Not, you weirdo. Not make, <laughs> I'm not just saying that's Israel. Okay. Certainly not. There are many countries uh, oh, that have well. done this. So, the very fact that there are as many people as there are that uh, live in the West Bank is because yeah. there hasn't been an ethnic cleansing. Right. And so, yes, you're right. The number is much higher today uh, of people than it was. What do you think an ethnic cleansing is? It's when you move people, yeah, no, not so actually, take down their actually, numbers. That's what I was going to say. The reason Gaza is. Wait, could you, would you make the this thing? Would you say that, that there wasn't a. Higher, so, so Quibbles, you're wrong on one thing here. I'm so sorry. You're You're doing something. They're doing you, something you are, that other countries aren't doing, which is to try to protect those civilians. And that's not something that is happening in Egypt. That is not something that happened in Iran or Iraq or Jordan or Lebanon or Ethiopia. It is by different. Okay. Quibbles, yeah, quibbles, I just want to be clear that this is not on Israel for that the fact that they didn't that they didn't kill this population or they didn't completely kick them out. They did kick them out. This is established in yeah. 1948, right? This is established history, right? The reason why they still exist is not because, um, yeah, we can give credit to Israel for not bombing the shit out of them like tons of countries have done, sure. But the primary reason is that they have not been absorbed into um, uh, into other Arab countries and they haven't been given their own um, their own country because of various reasons from Israel to the UN to their uh to their own um, corruption within their own government, lots of t t tons of different reasons. So it's it's just I don't want to give Israel right, credit talking or somehow. Yeah, yeah Quibbles, I'm Quibbles, saying, I'm saying, Quibbles, I need I'm to Quibbles, I need to correct here. one thing. One thing, ethnic cleansing it does it does include like forced deportation, forced population transfer. To no, I agree. Regions. Everyone else, yeah. About yeah, that's, yeah, that's all it is. That's yeah. not what it includes. If you're yeah. talking about forty-eight, if you're talking about the Nakba, I agree with you. My point is that everything that is going on currently in the West Bank, though awful, is objectively less awful than simply forcing all of the Palestinians living there out of the West Bank and making it part of Israel proper, but that doesn't make which it is good, what right? precisely okay. happened agree, right? to the Jews across the rest of the Middle East. But you agree it doesn't make yeah. it good. So like, like we, we understand that there's levels. To I'm problem. just, we get that though, right? The I understand. Is that I, I, think I, I agree with you, Quibbles. Right. I'm just frustrated that there's not this this equivalent like rage and there's not a recognition that the reason that this is even a conversation today is because they did the right thing or at least the comparatively better thing in the past compared to everywhere else in the rest of the world. Okay, world. hold on. Stop. Listen. Okay. So you're, wait, you're wait, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. This is like the... Okay. 
I'm a huge Israel stan, but this is the worst argument ever, okay? This is like being in court confronted with a woman that I've raped 20 times and me saying like, listen, the only reason why this bitch can accuse me of rape is because I didn't cut her throat, okay? Can you really be that mad at me? That's This is the wildest argument in the fucking world, okay? Nobody it's is- not a No, matter. hold on. No, it's Israel not doesn't get defense. credit for not genociding all the Arab Palestinians. You're never gonna get credit for that. So that's what you I'm want to get credit for. deserve credit. Okay, then, saying, okay, but then, then saying, saying that like, the well, the only reason we have to do- The condemnation, no one is condemning them for committing genocide. I'm just saying that like, you can't, Israel doesn't get credit for not genociding the Arab Palestinians. You are, you're saying like, well, that there's not a condemnation. The, I'm not asking for credit. I'm asking for condemnation. There's what? not a condemnation that is coming to the equivalent degree of all of the rest of the countries that did something significantly worse. Okay, wait, 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 hold on, wait, 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 to be clear, hold on. There was a condemnation, okay? It was called World War II. We invaded Germany and we fucking destroyed them, okay? There was a condemnation of Japanese Germany. There's the Chinese. We invaded. We're not talking about Poland. I thought you were talking about the Holocaust, right? Ethiopia. Oh, right. talking about the Jewish no, exodus about from the, the Middle East and North Africa. I'm talking about the exodus of Jews across all of the Middle East and also Northern Africa. Sure. And that was all. about Egypt. Oh, yeah, but sure. everyone, so for, okay, but just a few things, Quibbles. First of all, everyone agrees that that was condemnable. Second of all, Palestinians didn't do that, okay? So that's another thing. And also, you keep yes, on saying, you be, you, you, you've, been, you've, been really, you've been really frustrated this whole uh, conversation about bad equivalencies. I mean, we can even go down that road because as far as I know, I know this from reading fucking uh, Benny Morris, is that for the Nakba, they were, mo like, they were mostly kicked out either because people came to their villages with fucking guns and said, fuck off, or because they knew about massacres and other deportations were happening next to them. That's not equivalent to the Jewish exodus, which was people fleeing, per people leaving because of persecution. Some people were forced out of the Middle East and North Africa. Most of them left voluntarily. So that's a bit, even, I can even say that's different, even though they're both deplorable. I don't think it's fair deplorable. to call that voluntary. I really don't think it's fair to call that voluntary. I think, was, well, also, I, I think, I think it depends. It wasn't wait, equivalent wait. to the Nakba. I'm just, that's it, all I'm saying. It definitely wasn't, but I think that there are definitely it, different types of, like, groups of people we can talk about. For instance, like, before 48, I'm pretty sure the majority of the Jewish people that were down there were fleeing from, like, uh, the Russian Empire. And I think they were, like, blatantly doing, like, pogroms and, like, anti-Semitism yeah. was rampant yeah. pre-USSR. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, so, uh, yeah. I would say the same thing yeah. as well, but I'm also just saying is, like, you've been, I, know, I normally wouldn't do this, but it's just because you've been really frustrated by people drawing equivalencies all the time, but you seem to be perfectly happy to act as if the Nakba no, and the Jewish Empire. I'm, not, like I'm, the same thing, I'm saying okay. so the Jews uh, post World War II. Listen. Post World Listen. War II, the Jews were in like refugee camps for like four years after that, and then yeah. you know when some of them tried to return Quibbles. to their homes, they would get. I think my frustration. Yeah, get... Also, wait, real quick, real quick, real quick. Speaking of refugee camps, Loner Box, congratulations, you have won this episode of Palestine Holy versus shit. Israel. So all of those Palestinian kids, and I'm sure you're going to forward your $500 worth of gifted subs to from Kick, okay, are going to be so happy, okay? The children of Gaza are eating tonight. Thank you, Loner Box. I just wanted to close that officially, announce right. the winner so that Q can, I know he's tired over there. He's probably got a lot of military operations to prepare for tomorrow. Okay, I know you feel very strongly about this. And I know that uh, okay, Hamas well, recruits okay, well, from all over the well, world. Well, so, well, you know, I want to uh, give you an opportunity to... Um, the point, so wait, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me speak up for my son. Listen, I'm fucking sick as fuck, okay? So I just showed up because, listen, I got a job to do and I did it, okay? At Loner, congratulations again. Uh, Thanks. I'm, expect I'm expecting 250, you know what I mean? But like, for you, I'd give you a discount, like maybe 150, yeah, it's okay, but guys, I appreciate all of you for coming on. I'm sure this conversation is going to continue, so... Uh, you know, enjoy. Yeah, the point that I was trying to make there, the point that I was trying to make oh, there is that I think that we often, I think it's very like convenient often that we Jesus. talk about things from a particular like timeline. We talk about like the number of people that were that were here in 2024 20, or in 48 or in 67, whatever it might be. And one of the things that we often do that is very convenient is we make this conversation be about Israel-Palestine rather than being about the Middle East as a whole. If you look at the Middle East as a whole, the, the narrative of, of you know, Jewish oppression of non-Jews is a ridiculous type of narrative oh, to be making about the Middle East as a whole. And so it's frustrating that the conversation ends up being exclusively about Israel-Palestine and specifically about the West Bank and Quibbles. specifically about Area C <laughs> and not about the religious sites in Area C Quibbles. or in Area A, Quibbles. of which there are many, and the Jewish access to those places are Okay, we got very, the point! Loaderbox, respond! Quibbles. We got it, we got it, we got it! Loaderbox, go! Yeah. Quibbles. What's Quibbles. that? Wait, wait, you ready to respond oh. to that? 
Wait, you just listen to Okay, I'll just fuck it. I'll just okay. I think I'll just go back. I'll just say I think oh, I think the please. reason I think the I'll just say something relevant. I think I think the reason people get more incensed about forty eight uh, the Nakba than they do about the Jewish Exodus is just because one of those refugee crises was solved, the other one wasn't. The Jews they got yeah, and, airlifted the fuck out and they got citizenship right, in Israel. Palestinians don't. Brutal. That's why people get that's why people get fussy well, about I don't, Israel. 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 Israel.
anymore? Should we be providing them with artillery shells when I think their rules of engagement are quite loose and their military Wow, Sophia, thanks for the five gifted blunt. kick It's subs. pretty sick, in my opinion, from how you see how Israeli soldiers have interacted with locals in the West Bank, with how they've interacted with locals at pro uh, Palestinians with protests. I have been given no reason to trust an Israeli government that currently isn't even trusted by its own people. And we can see the polling changing. As more time separates October 7th to today, we see the amount of uh, Israelis who are ready to go into the Gaza Strip shrink, 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 with at this point, the majority of Israelis from the last poll I saw that was published by Haaretz showed that a majority of Israelis wanted to hold off an invasion out of concern for the hostages. So. I, I don't want to make the same mistake that we made after 9-11 and a bloodlust. Um, I think that there is a huge silver lining with this situation, and maybe this is just cope on my part um, because of all the awful shit that happened. But uh, there, as luck would have it, uh, this the biggest disaster in Israeli history um, happened during a right-wing government, and the entire uh, right-wing in Israel uh, really... Uh, relies off of two things, the religious argument, um, which is not what wins them, right. which makes them very successful, and but the security one. The security one okay. is something that works on a huge amount of Jews for all very obvious reasons and a very good reason to be concerned about that. Uh, so um, Israel's entire purpose for existence is to prevent another Holocaust. They completely failed on October 7th, and it was, and it was it wasn't just Hamas, right? It took eight hours for the army to go. It goes, it takes 10 hours to go from the north to the south of Israel, the entire country. It took eight hours for the army to just show up in uh, some of the villages that were being harassed by Hamas. That's insane, right? And the reason why it took them that long was because they were up, they were up in the north uh, protecting uh, settler, I'm going to call them settler terrorists, uh, um, who were being violent and basically asking for trouble in the West Bank, um, instead of protecting actually actual Israel, um, Israelis in Israel proper. So I asked people to have, look at the situation with a little bit more nuance. I appreciate that you mentioned that tons of Israelis do not like the Israeli government. They are blaming um, a lot of the actions that were, uh, uh, the, a lot of the decisions that were made by the Israeli government and um, for the losses of what happened on October 7th. So uh, try to, Israel is as complex as a, a society as the United States is. Um, and, uh, and so it's very unfair to just suddenly throw, and this is something that I just, I, I, Dylan, you are not doing this. I just want to be clear. I don't, but like there is this attitude where uh, Israelis are all painted with like the settler uh, label. Um, and uh, and it's just so disingenuous and it's so dangerous um, because that type of ideology is what led um, and allowed people to celebrate and engage in the attacks on October 7th. Um, I don't think that what, critical theory in U.S. colleges is what motivates Hamas. I, I have some real, I do not think that the, the land back ideology is the key motivator of people joining Hamas in the $900 per person Gaza Strip. Like, come on, it's like they're fundamentally reactionary religious, very far right. They are not at all drawing from the same strains as people in the U.S. left. Do you think it explains the leftists who support Hamas? Uh, no. The reason that the like those really? portions of the what? left, though those portions of the left support Hamas in part because of like the decolonization narrative, but the broader left okay. supports Palestine so has that the for a very long used time to justify genocide and and tons of n dangerous abuses of what happened on. So if you if you like just to give an idea of this, when you look at polling of, say, anti-Semitism in the United States, say the question, do Jews have too much power? It's 10 percent of people on the left. It's 50 percent of people on the U.S. right. And the left That's is not the way, way, way The anti-Semitism anti of the left isn't, me. the anti-Semitism of the left isn't traditional like blood libel and Jews have too much power and all that. It's um, being so in their minds, anti-colonial and land back and anti-America to the point that they will side with any opponent of America, even if it means religious fundamentalists who want to kill all the Jews. That's why you get people like Judith Butler saying Hezbollah and fucking Hamas can be considered like left wing, right? This is like, so I'm obviously I can't prove this, but this is just a feeling I have. I feel like if a one state solution were set up, I feel like if through some amount of time, some amount of terrorist activities and some external pressure from Arab states that like mass pogroms or assassination or murders of Jews started happening within Israel, I feel like most leftists would either be quiet or they would celebrate and say it's in response to all of the oppression that had been previously, previously experienced by Palestinians. I don't think that's, that's much of a stretch to say. Yeah, most leftists is completely absurd to say. Like the whole point is that the like when you look at the anti-Semitic protests, they were routinely condemned by even stuff like DSA, which represents the overwhelming majority of the U.S. left. 
Like the and and the broader left. Once you get into DSA celebrated it. DSA no, no, they didn't. The national statement denied it. The national statement denied it. The national statement denied it. Connecticut DSA did. Yeah, Connecticut DSA is fucking insane. And what I'm trying to point to, you just said the DSA didn't, but we just demonstrated that they did. So every day I get messages from Jews, socialist Jews that have been ostracized from their own communities because of this. Like this is a severe issue when that you, the left has to deal with. When okay, you look at the SDL overall SDL. left, the proportion of anti-Semitism is extremely SDL. small. What's if so you, frustrating here is that we talked SDL. just earlier in this conversation about and how Israel is getting into a disastrous ground war. Stop. That stop. Just let, let, let me speak. speak. Okay, you've spoken valid. for an hour Rebels, over the past conversation. When you look at what the right of the United States wants, they are calling for blood. Trump got up on stage and said that for every gallon of American blood, we should, I'm sorry, for every drop of American blood, we should spill a gallon of their blood. And he was saying that in support of Israel. He said we should support Israel 100%, 110%. He supported everything they did, said completely said fast. You look through his C-SPAN you know shit, he right? wants. <laughs> You're here. Uh, the point more broadly is that Donald Trump, exactly. a, the, possibly the next president of the United States, yeah, maybe in Liberty is really representative the, of the Republican Party. The next president of the United States very possibly wants Gaza wants Gaza flattened. OK, Lindsey Graham said that Gaza should be flattened. When you look at the response from the right, they want Israel to do something so that is so insane that it might destroy Israel. When you talk about Israel having a risk of being destroyed aristocracy, the right is the one that runs that risk. It's not the colonial activists in the left. To. Like, I don't know who you're I talking to, though. No one on this panel is in support of Trump. There's literally not one of us. And and no one let here me, is in support of, 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 like, of, of, of anti-Semitism. Okay. So I don't know why. Anti-Semitism so and the threats it, to Israel come disproportionately from the right within Israel and within the United States. Yeah, That's the uh, argument. So Aris brings up this Israel are not the same. It is not true that the majority of American threats to Israel are coming from the Republican Party. That doesn't mean that it's a defense writ large of the Republican Party. They do a lot of other things that are terrible. But it is not true that the listen, majority of threats to the listen, country of Israel are coming from the right today listen, in the United States. Listen, 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 listen. This is a really important okay, thing that we have to understand. First, we need to understand that when we talk about the majority of opinions of any political group. Okay, he's about to go on some rat shit. Hold on, um, real quick, because I have to leave. That's not, I, can't, I can't stay here for 20 fucking hours. Um, this thing, okay. Oh, I finished reading most of this, thank God. The Yom Kippur War. Apparently there were big memes with, apparently there were big memes with Ethan that I missed. Go listen to his song. Go listen to his song. Actually, you know what? Go listen to his song. People say, I need to go listen to his song. This is bullshit. Please go listen to his song. Who fucking, by the way, yells at people in chat, calls them Zionist genocidal monsters for suggesting that the hospital wasn't bombed, okay, by the IDF, which is the same fucking thing that Hassan's fans come and tell me Oh, he figured it out. Oh no, Ethan figured out that it's not just random crazy Hassan fans that are doing random crazy things, but it's actually all coming from the man himself. Oh shit. So fuck that. Go listen. Oh, there's like a bunch of clips on this. Fuck, hold on. Was this the first one? Was this Go we listen to Hassan. Me. So fuck that. The PLO is the PLO is a lot better than Hamas, although Hamas has a lot more support. PLO is not taken seriously when compared to Hamas. Hamas has more support than the PLO. Okay. Uh oh. Just like ultimately, even if it wasn't Israel that bombed this hospital, which I do maintain it is, okay. But even if it wasn't, I, I don't know if this is it. Okay, 500 of the last confirmed kills did not come from Israel. So what, are you just mad only when Hamas kills people then? Because that's what you're saying. I'm mad when all people die, but I don't think, it, I don't think he, he or many people seem to care when Hamas kills a bunch of their people. I mean, that's what I'm saying. At that point. You know what I mean? You're saying literally, I do not care when Israel kills someone. That's... 
that's not at all what it's saying, actually. I only care when Hamas kills someone. That's basically what you're saying. You're like, Palestinians, Israelis, I don't give a shit if Israel kills them. I only care if I suspect it's Hamas. Because, like, if you're going to get mad, and be like... First of all, this hospital thing is so fucking dumb, okay? The original accusation is that an entire hospital was exploded, killing every fucking body there. Yep. Okay? It just didn't happen that way. And it's important to talk about. People say, oh, it was bombed the day before. Dude, it was... Okay. It was hit... In the chat the What is this? Um, Jesus. Uh-oh. Look at this. Boycott Teddy Fresh with a picture of a Palestinian child holding a teddy bear. <laughs> what the fuck did we do? Oh, they found the subreddit. What did Uh-oh. we do? Instead of contributing towards another Porsche Taycan or 9 million house. Motherfucker, Hassan owns the same fucking car I do, dipshit. Oh, shit. So when he donates money, he's a saint. When I do it, I'm a greedy fucking... Whatever the fuck, capitalist, uh, genocide supporter. <laughs> what What are you talking about, man? Uh, Ela lied. Ethan needs to wake. In oh shit! In the chat, the was this word just um, Whatever the fuck. Oh, you're saying IDF didn't bomb it because Hamas was firing ho uh, rockets from right next to the hospital. And it actually misfired and fell into the hospital. Oh, okay. I thought that he was, uh, oh, okay. Wait, oh, he totally misunderstood? Oh, that's f actually, now I feel fu that this was fucked up. Hold on. Never mind. Yeah, you're still a piece of shit genocide uh, denier. Okay, well, he didn't really walk it back, did he? 100%. But no, it is not a fucking misfire. <laughs> Bro, it was. It's just, you know what I mean? It's not a fucking misfire. You know, and here's the irony. He's so passionate. People who say, you should, maybe this wasn't by IDF. Genocidal. And now, when I want to talk about it and correct the record, now all of a sudden it's not important anymore. Oh, you're saying IDF didn't bomb it because Hamas was firing ho uh, rockets from right now. Okay, one more, one more clip. <laughs> you know, what is this? And like, yeah, me and Hassan are friends, and we'll probably talk this over event uh, eventually if we, if and when we bring back if leftovers, <sighs> but. Oof. Oof. Well. <laughs> Jesus. Okay, let's see what these are talking about. Less evangelical yeah. than almost all of the other fucking Republicans okay, that right. have that have run for president in the past. He moved the embassy to East Jer to Jerusalem because he's a liberal. <laughs> no, you're not. Okay. He no, cut off all aid to Palestinians he because he's a liberal. Listen, Why are we trying to sign logic? What's relevant? You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to follow up with me real quick, but it's real simple. Okay, okay. He's a fucking narcissist, right? He doesn't hold any of his fucking opinions oh because God. they're real opinions. It's not just Trump. It's, like, it's literally every Republican. Can we stop making this about Trump? Trump? Lindsey Graham said flatten Gaza. If you think every fucking Republican wants to yeah. flatten Gaza. Like you're okay. insane. Lindsey Graham you're said it and insane. did a single Republican condemn him? Did a single Republican condemn him for that statement? Can you name one? Can I name no. one? Like, because don't they don't give a shit right about saying that you should level Gaza. It? He was, on, he was on Fox News. He was literally on the most important okay. conservative channel. In the, oh, oh okay. My. Okay. Let me let me bridge the divide here. Number one. Okay. I know the interview you're talking about. It's not just him though. Tom Cotton said they needed to quote unquote bounce the rubble. You can find any number of statements from different legislators uh, in Congress and the Senate from the Republican Party saying crazy shit about Gaza. But it is true that probably not every single Republican elected or otherwise wants to do that. It is true though that if somebody in the Republican Party does say that they want to do that, they're going to have zero repercussions for. It, and it's in the standards of the because Republican no Party, gonna perfectly for culturally fine. Okay, the context Sorry, of I didn't, all I didn't, Republicans... Hold on, I didn't, all what did you say at the end? That I'm said that in, within the standards of the Republican Party, it is perfectly culturally acceptable to say what Lindsey Graham said about Gaza. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's that's true. So <laughs> about any place in the Middle what, East, what, honestly. Like Santos is doing. What Santos is doing currently is also acceptable, right? Like literally lying on your resume is acceptable for the Republicans. The point is they don't yeah. condemn each other for any any actions. But, no, 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 quibbles. They do. They do. Right? Like if if uh, like a lot of them came out to say lie. like I am I am totally like pro-abortion uh, or pro-choice, uh, um, and I'm like uh, pro-LGBT. I love the transes, right? You're going to get pushback. Like that's like that's not true. So there is like within 
uh, the P Republican Party like a, a, a policy window that they're allowed to play in, right? And being cruel to Palestine is w certainly within that policy window. I agree with you. There is certainly and, and, an Islamophobia side. stepped There's out of that window. There's an problem in MAGA. And That's definitely true. I don't understand why. Trump, like, Trump is yes, pro-choice. It is so easy to say that there's an Islamophobia problem in the far right and even in the moderate-ish right. I don't know why it's so difficult to make a parallel statement about the issue of anti-Semitism on Islamophobia the left. It's not large, all you should all fear Islam. Problems. Like it's a fucking it's savage and barbaric religion. religion. Fuck off. I oh my god. I I okay. do think there's I do think about Okay, sorry, I'll let you finish. There's a difference between saying that there that that writ large the problem of anti-Semitism, like the violent anti-Semitism of of America, of Tree of Life, which I'm a member of, right? Like that's different than the anti-Semitism that we're talking about in the context of Israel Palestine. There's like different type like white supremacist anti-Semitism is not the same as like the the far left anti-Semitism that we're articulating here. I think that if you yeah, look obviously. at certain sections it's of the far standards left, the exact same. If you look at certain sections of the far left, like that one local DSA chapter, you can find anti-Semites, you can find people at certain rallies that are anti-Semitic, but when you look at the halls of Congress and you see what, for example, Ilhan Omar said about All About the Benjamins, she was dragged through the mud. There was questions within the Democratic Party of whether they should continue to, to stand with her and support her. I agree. I'm and a that was about that was about a question around not a war, but around the influence of Israeli lobbying money in American politics. We're talking about now we're talking about American politicians saying to level an entire city, bounce the rubble. Certain American political commentators on the most popular news networks in the country saying, what's okay. the, really the difference between like Palestinians and terrorists? The cultural standards in the United States and how we view Palestinians versus Israelis and what we're willing to accept when it comes to civilian casualties is absolutely different. An American in this Congress can say, an American in Congress, and a congressperson can say, flatten Gaza. If somebody said that on the other way, they would immediately be expelled from Congress. This is not a conversation that's happening in America writ large. It's a conversation right now. Mm -hmm. Everyone here currently is on the left, with the exception of Fabian Liberty, who is, though not, you know, left wing, certainly oh, yeah. not MAGA by any yeah, stretch of the imagination. Yeah, it, this is a generational and divide. So the idea, very important. And so the idea that we can't have a conversation about the anti-Semitism specifically in the left when we're talking to people who are on the left is we crazy. Can. Sure, you, you want me to shit on Lindsey Graham? I'll shit on Lindsey Graham for you. You want me to shit on Trump? I'll shit on Trump for you. But we should be able to talk about the actual we, topic you, you that is actually affecting the people we're that correct. we're talking about, which is the left. I agree. I agree. We should be able to talk about that and in and, and direct terms, right? Like there were some things uh, that were upset. And I'm sure you can give me like a whole list of examples um, since October 7th um, by those major groups um, that were anti-Semitic. That... Okay, listen, I love you guys. I'm going to go do stuff. Okay. I'm just going to rub 10 hours today. Fuck you guys. Um, I think tomorrow is, I think we're done with the major conflicts now. I think tomorrow is Camp David Accords. Um, oh yes, this is done. Um, History of Israel, Camp David Accords. Um, yeah, and then just 30 years of history from the 70s to the 2000s, I guess, and all this, yeah. Oh, we're actually almost done with the whole Oh, we're almost there. My God. Maybe tomorrow? If I do like, if I go like eight hours of straight reading tomorrow, um, maybe. Maybe. Although there's a lot of like random uh, massacres and shit. <sighs> okay. Two Lebanon wars, the intifadas. I'm pretty sure the intifadas will be covered here. All right. Well, I love you guys. It's been fun. I will be back. Um... Tomorrow. Do I have any appointments today? Fuck me. When do I have to leave? Um.
On the fourth, the night of the fourth. Okay, we got days, three days, four days of research. On the last day, maybe I'll do, um, for my debates. Fuck me, this whole, oh God, my debate kind of shit is gonna be, yeah. All right. Ripper and a cappuccino, poppuccino, hop. Oh, happy Halloween. Rap, uh, Ripper and a cappuccino, poppuccino, hop. I will see you guys, um, yeah, tomorrow. Peace out.